The Electric Company's public information program brings you your Better Living Radio Theater in its salute to the American home, its family, and its way of life in this bright American future. The tubes in your radio, the power behind this station which brings you this program, the nightlight at your child's bedside, the giant motors that drive the machines to mold our steel and power your production lines, the current that pops your family toaster, foods, aircraft, railroads, automobiles, and ships, electricity always at hand, day or night, with its economy for lower costs to you, with rising efficiency through its own research, with its growth to match the nation's needs at all times. Electricity is at work to bring you better living. This is your narrator, Wendell Niles. And now our Better Living Radio Theater brings you The Floating City, the dramatic story of great ships like the United States, which reflect the struggles of our electrical pioneers and mirror our electrical civilization of today. This is the fifth in a series of broadcasts at this time to show you how Americans in a free nation have worked to bring you better living today. In fact, the highest standard of living in the world. Later you will hear from today's guest, Mr. Newbold Lawrence, Vice President of Operations of the United States Lions. And now your Better Living Radio Theater presents today's story, The Floating City. Aboard the SS United States at sea, Monday, July 7th, 1952. The liner United States streaked past Bishop's Rock at 5.16 a.m. Greenwich Meridian Time early today, setting a new record for the transatlantic crossing. The time for the new American Queen of the Seas for the 2,938-mile crossing was three days, ten hours, and 40 minutes. An average speed of 35.59 knots, or about 41 land miles per hour. She's the Queen of the Seas, an American ship built with materials from 48 states. Her parts constructed in more than 800 plants and factories from coast to coast. She is larger than a great skyscraper, and she handles with a wheel no larger than the size of your automobile steering wheel. She represents the work of tens of thousands of American workmen in every state, plus the unseen miracles of electric power. Ours is an electrical civilization, reflected in our great ships, as other civilizations have been reflected in the ships of the time. The Egyptians and Phoenicians... The Greeks and the Romans had cultures in which slavery abounded. Their ships were propelled by slaves, chained to long oars, with occasional help from sails. The Vikings, and later the English, Spanish, Italians, and eventually the Americans were men of sail. As time and man's intelligence progressed, building larger, faster ships for war, for cargo, for passenger service. Then, as the machine age began to dawn on land, the seamen found the old ways passing. In 1838, aboard a whaler bound for Nantucket, the lookout calls... Smoke on the horizon! Smoke on the horizon! Where away? Three degrees starboard. Looks like a ship of fire. Aye. I sight the smoke now. Mate, put on all sail. She'll need help from us. Ahoy there! Ahoy! What ship are ye? Serious, 17 days out of Queensland. Do you need help? Not now. Aren't you a fire? We're under steam, trying to make New York. What happened to your spars? We're burning them for fuel. Ran out of coal this morning. Under steam, and he's burned his ship to get her to port. We thought you were a fire and in distress. Should have used help a few days ago. The bewilderment of sailing man at steam power had begun back in 1703, when German river boatmen smashed Denise Papin's small vessel propelled by steam. 
Robert Fulton, the American pioneer, often found the paddles of his Claremont smashed by angry sailors as the successful paddle wheeler plied between New York and Albany. But steam could not be denied. Steam had begun its rule of the sea, and as steam engines improved in design, as the screw propellers came into use, only the clippers offered a brief challenge. But by the 1880s, steam was ruler. Our ship's logs tell us that the Servia was the first ship with electric lights, and soon it became common on other great passenger ships of their day. But the impetus for the greater, more widespread use of electricity on shipboard arrived in 1897, when Charles Parsons proved the value of the steam turbine in his ship, the Turbinia. The turbine was far more economical and efficient than the older steam engine. The electric companies began to use turbines throughout America to meet the increasing demand for lighting and electric power for farm and factory, home and transportation. And men began to dream of the all-electric ship. In 1909, aboard a Navy destroyer in New York Harbor. Good evening, sir. Can I give you a hand up? Uh, no, thank you. I think I can make it. Ah, here we are. Uh, my name's Fassett. I've been expecting you aboard, Mr. Fassett. I'm Cummins, the chief electrician of the ship. Oh, well, shake hands. Chief Engineer and I have orders to give you the run of the engine room, Mr. Fassett. I don't care about orders. I want your permission. You're the man whose help I'll need. Mine, sir? In what way? Don't ask how I arranged it. But I want to study a ship like this to find out whether we could put a turbine generator aboard to drive her. To drive the ship? That's right. The turbine runs the generators. The generators run motors. And the motors run the propellers. Run her by electricity? Instead of steam? <laughs> you Navy men are all alike. Steam is the be-all and end-all. Well, have you ever been in a storm at sea? No, but maybe we'll get into one before we're through. As soon as I've stowed this gear, I'll come below and I'll look you up. Well, Mr. Fassett, three weeks at sea and what do you think now? Can you run a ship this size with a turbine-driven dynamo? I haven't changed my mind at all, Mr. Cummins. I'm sure we could run a battleship with turbines and dynamos. And now we're back in port, what'll you be doing? Talk to the admirals in Washington. I do not think it right to call us unfair, Mr. Fassett. We know everything that steam can do. Your turbine electric drive is untested. But you could at least give us a test, Commodore. We can't run the risk. I have just come off one of your Navy ships. I saw her turrets turned in firing practice by electricity. I saw many other major operations performed by electricity. And not once, Commodore Burlingame, did I note a failure. You're a persistent man, Mr. Fassett. Very, very persistent. It's easy to be persistent when one is asking for fair play, Commodore. Now, you've already installed a marine engine on the Cyclops. The Neptune has been built with a geared turbine to drive her. All I ask that you give us a chance to install a turbine generator on the Jupiter. One single small collier among all the Navy ships. And if I say no? I'll be back again and again and again. I've waited two months for this interview with you. <laughs> Very well, Mr. Fassett. I'll show you that the Navy believes in fair play. You'll be given permission to put your turbine generator on the Jupiter. He's going to be built at Mare Island in San Francisco. Do you know Commander Kern for the Jupiter personally, Commodore? Mm, yes, Admiral. He's sailed under my command at least twice. Always a very steady, reliable man. But this enthusiasm, does he grow enthusiastic about everything? No, sir. Maybe there is something to this turbine generator matter, Admiral. If Kermf likes it, maybe there is. Burlingame, I want you to order Kermf off the Jupiter at once. You're removing him from his command? No, I'm transferring him to another ship. I'll let someone else command the Jupiter and see what he has to say. In fact, we'll change all the officers on the Jupiter. Another set of officers took command of this test ship. and Their reports were even more complimentary. The electric industry had won a great victory, for within a short time, turbine generators and electric motors were installed on a great battleship of the United States Navy, the New Mexico. Today, in the world's great ships, turbines and dynamos share the burdens of power, 
for propulsion and operation. In the Navy in early June 1942. Large enemy attack force sighted southwest Midway Island. So far, the Japanese Navy has allowed itself to be pressed into the service of the Japanese Army. Our small naval forces, still crippled by Pearl Harbor, have turned them aside at Coral Sea. But now the attack is on, because next morning... Main enemy attack force sighted northeast, midway. Five carriers, four battleships, nine cruisers, 34 destroyers, plus transports and supply ships. This is it. The Japanese Navy is out to win control of the northern and central Pacific, perhaps even the eastern Pacific, with the possibility of attacks on Hawaii and Alaska. The electric magic in plane and ship radio has warned of the danger. Hurriedly, almost our Navy's whole remaining force in the Pacific is summoned to Pearl Harbor. Even the damaged carrier Yorktown is recalled from the Coral Sea and pressed into service. And now, not a turbine must falter. Not a one of our thousands of electrical devices aboard each of our ships must fail. For failure to stop the enemy can lay our western defenses wide open. You know the end of the story. The great Japanese threat was turned aside. The first decisive defeat the Japanese Navy had suffered in 350 years. The battle ended the Japanese enemy activity on the Pacific Offensive. And in time, as our Navy rebuilt and added to its strength, the offensive was ours. Today, while our Navy remains strong, we talk of our peacetime floating cities like the United States. The United States is steered, lighted, air-conditioned, kept in communication with land and other ships by electricity. Without this great modern miracle available all over the nation, we'd never have been able to build her as she is today, the queen of the seas, for better living. And now, today's guest in our Better Living Radio Theater, Mr. Newbold Lawrence, Vice President of Operations of the United States Lines. What you have just heard is true. Without electric power, our nation would not be the proud possessor of the fastest ship in the world, the most modern passenger liner, at the same time the greatest single naval auxiliary, the SS United States. Electric power aboard this ship makes for better living whether there are passengers or troops aboard. Unlike a hotel, the superliner United States cannot obtain electric power from a station miles away. It must generate its own power and must maintain a service so reliable and flexible that there can be no failure since no modern ship can operate without sufficient electric power. In other words, electric power aboard a ship must be as dependable and as efficient as that being supplied to Americans ashore day and night by the electric power companies of America. I know of no single factor that has contributed more towards making our country the greatest in the world than electric power. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. You have been listening to Mr. Newbold Lawrence, Vice President of Operations of the United States Lines. The Better Living Radio Theater has brought you The Floating City, the fifth in a series of broadcasts at this time, presented by this station and the Electric Company's public information program. Now, this is your narrator, Wendell Niles, inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when your Better Living Radio Theater will present another program in this series. Till then, wishing you better living.
Listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. This is your Rexall family druggist with a message that will save you money. Tomorrow morning at Rexall drugstores everywhere, Rexall's world-famous one-cent sale begins. From then on through Monday, October 23rd, you can buy two regular guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus one cent. For example, the regular price for the 100-tablet bottle of Rexall aspirin is 54 cents. During Rexall's one-cent sale, you get two bottles for 55 cents. That's right. Just a penny more buys twice as much. What's more, this offer of two for the price of one plus a penny applies to literally hundreds of items. From vitamins to mineral oil, from cold cream to iodine, from shaving needs to Christmas cards. And what's more important, these are Rexall products, and you can depend on any drug product that bears the name... Rexall. Good health to all from Rexall. Now your Rexall family druggist brings you another half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Diamond Detective Agency, we can solve any crime but television. Diamond, stop clowning and get right down here. Well, Sergeant Lovelum, what's the matter, Otis? Didn't the zoo pick up your option? Oh, now quit that. You gotta get right down here. Something terrible's happened. They haven't made you commissioner. Worse than that, Lieutenant Levinson's been kidnapped. Diamond to see you, Captain. Hello, Collins. Sure. All right, Diamond. Uh, Otis just called me about Walt. Now, look, Rick. I know Walt's a personal friend of yours. He's a good friend of mine, too. But this is police business. A cop's been kidnapped. Diamond was a cop for six years. I don't need a case history, Sergeant. Oh, get off it, Charlie. I'm down here to help. Of course you are. But there's one thing I won't stand for, Rick. The way you operate. Well, what's the matter with the way I operate? I know how you feel about Walt, and when a guy feels that strongly about someone, he's liable to do a lot of things to get a few answers. Oh, for Pete's sake, Charlie. What are you going to do, hold a tea party and hope someone will spread some gossip? That's not fair, Rick. Well, if you think I'm going to sit back knowing that Bert Fisher's got... Who said anything about Bert Fisher? Well, nobody had to say anything. Pretty obvious, isn't it? Walt sent Bert's brother Art to the electric chair. Bert swore he'd get Walt for it. Fisher dies tonight, doesn't he? Yeah. Sure, I think it's Bert Fisher, too. And we're going to do everything about it we can. Bert's been in Detroit, hasn't he? Yeah. I've got a call into Detroit. Should be hearing any time. This phone call you got saying they had Walt. I didn't have time to trace it. The guy hmm. said Walt was being held, and when Art Fisher dies tonight in the chair, so does Walt. Charlie, I'm going to work on this thing whether you like it or not. Yeah, that figures. But I promise you, Rick, I won't save your skin if you get out of line. Hmm. Any leads yet? No. We're rounding up the usual stoolies. Well, I know a couple of boys who might have a few angles. Who? Nobody who would give you any information. These guys aren't stoolies. They might tell me because I think they like me. You see, Charlie, sometimes it pays not to be a cop. I'll expect any information you get, Rick. Oh, sure. Well, I'll see you later. Uh, Rick? Yeah? Be a good boy, will you? Uh, Collins, if we don't find Walt by 11 o'clock, can you hold up Fisher's execution? No. Oh, it's swell. I'll keep in touch. Hey, Diamond, do you think you can do anything? And I can try. Do me a favor, Otis. Okay. Get me a complete background on Bert Fisher. Everything. All his friends, his record, as far back as you can go. Gee, Diamond, I'm scared for the lieutenant. You're not alone with that one, Otis. In the Bowery, living in a broken-down rooming house, was a man. Twenty years ago, he'd come to the big city with his trumpet tucked under his arm. He'd started playing with little combinations along 52nd Street, and pretty soon the word got around. Everyone came to listen to him. They called him the Dean of Jazz, and the title stuck. Then one night he had an argument with one of the Fusari mob. 
And the next morning, we found him in an alley, half dead, his face beaten to a pulp. It was a long time before the dean could get around again, and it was a lot longer before he could play his trumpet. And by then, no one would have him. He couldn't make enough of the horn, so he tried crime. And that's where I met him. I did him a favor, and a short time later, he went straight. He'd still kept his underworld connections, but he... he wasn't a stoolie. I'd just done him a favor once. Uh, Richard Diamond. Well, hello, Diamond. How are you, Dean? Like to see you. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of figured you would. Dean, uh, you ever run into a guy named Fisher? Bert Fisher? How about a drink? No, thanks. Skull. Oh, man, it's going to be hot today. This, uh, Bert Fisher grabbed Lieutenant Levinson... Says he's going to kill him. Well, I can't help you. Oh, Dean, I just need one little lead to get started. Yeah, sure. Whew, I wish I had a fan in here. How's business? Hmm. It isn't. Well, I make enough to pay the rent. How about a few bucks to keep you going? Well, I ain't proud, but it won't buy you anything. The lieutenant's a good friend. Yeah, yeah. Word got around this morning. Yeah. Here's ten. Buy yourself some groceries. Oh, thanks. You did me a favor once. Forget it. Bert Fisher's got a lot of rough hoods working for him. They're most all from Detroit. But they kill the same as anyone from here. Mm-hmm. Dean, do you know anything at all? I might. Who wants to die? Blow pretty good. <laughs> sure, me and Bix. Well, I'll see you around. Yeah, thanks for the ten. Oh, uh, Dean, about eleven o'clock tonight, play a few bars of the funeral march. Oh, uh, Diamond. Yeah? You, uh, you remember this tune, don't you? as any name can be. You got it, pal. See you around. Fifth Precinct, Sergeant Lovelum. Oh, this is Diamond Otis. What did you find out? Oh, I got reports on everybody we know is connected with Bert Fisher. You want me to read them off? Anybody on that list named Mary? Mary? No. These guys are all named Hallelujah or something. Look, uh, check all of those names and see if Fisher or any one of his boys ever knew a girl named Mary. Then after you do that, I'll... You'll what? Holy smoke. I'll talk to you later. Dean! 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 The Dean had blown his last note. He was sprawled face down on the dirty carpet, clutching the shiny trumpet. A thin line of red was spreading out from a bullet hole in his chest. And the open window sent me across the room in a hurry. I looked out on the fire escape to see a man drop to the alley below. We both fired a split second apart. He staggered as my slug knocked him against the building... And then before I could try again, he disappeared around the corner. I turned, looked down at the dean, and wondered if Gabriel was getting a lesson in jazz. Diamond, I warned you before you left here Okay, I... okay, Charlie. A nice guy's been killed, but all the crying in the world isn't going to help. Hey, 
I got something, Diamond. Let's see. Good grief. He's got the whole department working for him. Come on, Otis. What have you got? Uh, is it all right, Captain? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I should be in the second-hand business. Report on one of Fisher's old mob, Lou Baxter. Only one of the whole bunch who had a girl named Mary. Mary? Who's Mary? Charlie, look at this picture. Lou Baxter. I've been looking at it all morning. Oh, take another look. This is the guy I shot climbing down off the fire escape after he killed the dean. What? Holy smoke. You know where you can pick him up? Oh, he's a local boy, all right. Didn't go back to Detroit with Fisher. I've had a call out him since 10.20 this morning. Hey, what about that girl, Otis? Name's Mary Sinclair. Uh, used to go with Lou Baxter, Captain. No address on her. Mary Sinclair and Lou Baxter, huh? Well, it's the first lead we've had. I'll get the boys on it. Charlie had his methods and I had mine. Otis got in touch with the musicians local, and in half an hour, I had a list of all the places the dean had worked since the union had a record on him. I started checking. Dives, restaurants, jam joints. Questioning owners, bartenders, waiters. No one knew a girl named Mary Sinclair. Around three o'clock, I wandered into a place on 52nd Street known as the Red Parrot. Hey. I'm uh, looking for information. You a cop? Private cop. Mm Mm-hmm. You, uh, remember a guy who played here last year? Trumpet man, the dean? Sure. Everybody knows the dean. Something wrong? Uh, the dean got himself killed. Oh, no. See, that's too bad. Real nice guy. You ever know a girl named Sinclair? Mary Sinclair? Uh, no. No, I don't think so. Oh, uh, okay. Hey, mister. Yeah? Why don't you ask it? He's the boy with the fingers playing the piano. He knew the dean pretty well. Thanks. You, Ed? Yeah. What can I do for you, Pops? I understand you're a good friend of the dean. Sure, we're compatible. But I ain't seen him in a while. You looking for him? No, for a friend of his. A Mary Sinclair. Cute chick. Uh, where can I find her? Why do you want to find her, Pops? The dean was murdered a few hours ago. She used to live over on 47th Street, 69 West. That was a year ago. You sure about the address? Couldn't forget it. We had a few balls up there. She was kind of a flip. We had a little combo in here, pretty crazy, too. She used to come in and listen. Real hep on jazz. Knew all the old-timers by name, like the dean. Remembered when he was tops, before he got hurt. Did you hear him in those days? Yeah. I played with him a lot. Used to watch him real close sometimes, after hours. And the boys would just sit around and blow because they felt like it. The dean used to lean back and close his eyes and blow things like he was getting the word from the other side. It was great. Might have been the greatest. Well, you all got to go on ahead sometime. I guess it ain't so bad, though. The harp's a real wild instrument. I left the piano player and headed for the address he'd given me. There was a good chance Mary Sinclair wasn't living there anymore. But it was the closest I'd come to any kind of a lead. When I got there, I held my breath and looked at the mailbox. Score for Diamond. Miss Mary Sinclair still lived in the building. Before we continue with the adventures of Richard Diamond, here's your Rexall family druggist. And tonight I have money-saving news. For tomorrow morning at every Rexall drugstore in the country, Rexall's famous one-cent sale begins. The sale where you get two fine-quality, guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one, plus one cent. Exactly how does that work? Well, for example, the regular price for a pint bottle of Rexall's Milk of Magnesia is 39 cents. But during the one-cent sale, you can buy two bottles for 40 cents. Why, that means... A penny more buys twice as much. Exactly, ma'am. What's more, you'll find some 347 of these twin bargains in our stores. 
Everything from Rexall rubbing alcohol to stationery, from Rexall foot remedies to Rexall dental products. Plus, 85 other sales specials you can't afford to miss. Well, I'm putting my pennies to work tomorrow. Then use a lot of them, ma'am, for every one of them doubles your buying power. Best of all, you'll be getting Rexall products, and you can depend on any drug product that bears the name Rexall. And now back to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Yeah? Oh, hello. Uh, Mary Sinclair? Yeah. Whatever you're selling, I'll take a dozen. I'd like to talk with you. I'd like you to. Some other time. I'm busy right now. I'm afraid this can't wait. It'll have to, baby. Give me a call. Plaza 45466, Mr. Uh, Diamond. Okay, doll. Call me tomorrow, huh? You got your foot in the door, honey. Old habit. Can't seem to break it. Well, I'll break it for you, honey. Your whole leg. You'll be sorry, doll. Mm. All right, baby. Make it quick, huh? What do you want? Let's talk inside. I told you. Yeah, yeah I know. It's cooler in here. The coolest. But it won't be for long. Where's Lou Baxter? Who? You know, the boy you used to run around with. I ran around with a lot of boys. Ever since I was in grammar school, I ran around with boys. It's a hobby. Where's Lou Baxter? Baby, I don't know. You want to twist my arm? Go ahead, it might be fun. He just killed the dean. He did? Shame on him. Forget it, Mary. Hey, Lou. Get out of the way. That's the guy who put a slug in me. Looked like you're in pretty bad shape, Baxter. Doctor's coming. But he ain't gonna be able to help you. See, honey, you should have come back tomorrow. Shut up. Well, wouldn't have been half so painful. I want Bert Fisher. Well, good for you. Get away from that door. Now, walk into that other room. Drop it back. Uh, you didn't want to play. Oh, you shouldn't have done that, Charlie. I needed him alive. That's gratitude for you. I knew you'd get into trouble, Diamond. So I tailed you from that last bar on 52nd. Is this uh, Mary Sinclair? Charmed, I'm sure. Ought to stay here. Call the wagon. Right. There's a doctor coming up. I doubt if he's legit. Wait for him, then bring him down to the station, Otis. Right. Come on, Miss Sinclair. Sure, honey. You know, Mr. Diamond, I think I'll have to break that date for tomorrow. Here are Baxter's things, Captain. Watch, wallet, nothing much. Yeah, let's check the wallet. Hmm. Book of matches. Danny's Diner, Route 51. Check on that, Otis. Right. Nothing much in the wallet. Social security, driver's license, some money. Quite a lot of money. Want to take a look? Yeah. No addresses, huh? Uh, here's a ticket to a shoe repair shop. Uh, nothing much here that would give us a lead. Mm. Yeah? Danny's Diner is about 160 miles out on Route 51. And guess who runs it? Who? Chino Amalo. That does it. Call the authorities in that area. Right. Chino Amalo. Mm. Eight years for armed robbery. Used to work for Bert Fisher. Yeah, maybe this is it. What time is it? Uh, going on seven. This better be it. We only have four hours, and you've got to drive 160 miles. Captain Collins talked to the sheriff's office and set up a rendezvous with him near Danny's Diner. Then we piled into a squad car and roared across the 59th Street Bridge for Route 51. Step on it, Otis. We're to 180 now. Then do 90. It's getting late. Now, Rick, uh, you think we should bust right in the diner and take Amalo? No. Amalo doesn't know me. Never seen me. You stake out your men around the place and I'll go in. Give me a couple of minutes, then you come in, work on Amalo a little, and then leave. If he knows where Fisher is, you'll try to get in touch and I'll tag him. Something for you? Uh, yeah, uh... uh... A cup of coffee and a piece of pie. You got raspberry, chocolate, lemon, peach, custard. Oh, uh, raspberry. Yeah. Hmm. Here you are. Uh, where's the closest gas station? About a mile down the road, but I think it's closed. It's after 10. Closes at 10. Oh, uh, thanks. Miss? 
A miss. Yeah. Where's Tino Amalo? In the back. You want him? Call him. Sure. Hey, Mr. Amalo, someone wants to see you. Okay, be right there. Yeah, something I can do. Oh, what are you doing way out here, Captain? This your book of matches? Yeah, that's the name of my place. Huh? These matches on Lou Baxter. Baxter's dead. Oh, that's too bad. You're not going to tie Baxter up with me, are you? Lots of people come in here and take my matches. If Baxter came in here, you saw him. You're an old friend. Well, sure, I, I know, Lou, but I ain't seen him in years. We got word your old boss is in town, Bert Fisher. Oh, is that right? You know where we might find him? No, I haven't seen Bert in years either. Look, Captain, I've been going straight. Sure. You're uh, a little out of your territory, ain't you? This is unofficial. You're in my jurisdiction, I'd haul you in. Look, I tell you, I'm going straight. I don't know nothing about Lou Baxter or Burke Fish. Okay, Amano. You may hear from me again. Uh, nice seeing you again, Captain. Now, uh, miss. More coffee? Yeah. Where's the phone? Right over there on the wall. Is there another one? In the kitchen, but you can't use that. <laughs> hey, you can't go back there. Honey, it's the police. You stay where you are. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is Tino. Let me talk to Fish. I... Hey, what are you doing? Don't move, Amalo. What is this? Cover up that mouthpiece. Cover it up. Okay, okay. Now, when you get Fisher on the line, say what I tell you. Hold that receiver out so I can listen. Look, friend. You I... look. Say one thing wrong, and I'll use this gun. Your cop? None of your business. Well, look, look I. Hello, who you want, Amalo? There he is. Tell him you just heard Baxter was killed. Hello. Tell him, tell him. Uh, hello. Look, I just uh, just got news that the Baxter was killed. Yeah? Okay, anything else? No, that's all. Uh, no, no, that's all. So what's the matter with you? Uh, nothing, nothing. Okay. You got any more news? Keep in touch. Hang up. Now, where's Fisher hiding out? <laughs> Get up. Where's Fisher hiding out? You dirty flat foot. You nearly bust my jaw. Only nearly? Where is he, Amalo? Well, you kill me if I tell you. That's getting late. Are you going to tell me? Okay, to... okay. He's, he's in a cabin about a mile up the road. Come on. You're going to show us. It's just around that bend. Yeah, we better get out here and walk. How many men has he got in there with him, Chino? Uh, two. Now, whose cabin is it? Mine. Otis, get out and tell the rest of the men to douse their lights and come over here. Right, Captain. Uh, here's a piece of paper. Draw us the floor plan of that cabin. Here, I'll give you some light. Okay, go ahead, Amalo. How many rooms? Uh, three. Uh-huh. Hey, we're all set, Captain. Okay. One big room with a door here, a kitchen here, and a bedroom here. Oh, where's Lieutenant Levinson? I've only been up there once since they got in. He, he was in the bedroom. Now, how about closets back down? Uh, one closet in the main room here, one in the bedroom here. Let's see, a broom closet in the kitchen and the back door here. Has it got an attic? I don't, no, no. Where's Fisher's car? Parked around the back in the shed. Okay, I'll have the men stake out the place. You're going to take me up there, Amalo? Me? He's going to take us up there. You're a civilian, Rick. If there's any shooting to be done... If there's going to be any shooting, I'm going to be in on it. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Who said I was going to take you guys up there anyway? I did. I, did. I told you everything I know. I ain't going to get my head shot off. You're going to walk us up there, Amalo, and you're going to knock on that door. No, no, no. And no. you're going to get them to open up. Look, they're loaded with artillery, shotguns. When the door opens, you duck. Okay, suicide. You heard what the captain said, Amalo. I'm a civilian. Without a badge, I'm allowed to get pretty nasty with you. Look, you can't make me do something I don't want to. I know my rights, Captain. You know something, Rick? I think I'm catching a cold. I can't hear a thing. All right, now, wait a minute. I'll go check the men. I, uh, trust you'll not take advantage of the prisoner, Rick. I couldn't hear if he yelled or something. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, okay. Fine cop. All right, let's go. All right, men. Yes, sir. Listen now. I'm going to put Diamond... Three of you take that side of the house. Yes, Three okay. take the other. Uh, yes, sir. You and you go around in the back to the shed where the car is. Yeah. Otis? Yeah? You and this man cover the front, but stay out of sight. If it comes, it'll come in a hurry, so close in fast. Yes, and look, boys, the lieutenant's in the back room, so try and be as careful as you can. All, right. All set? Yeah. Let's go, Amalo.
There it is. Light in the front window. Yeah, it's ten minutes of eleven. I hope their watches aren't fast. Keep going, Amalo. Okay, Otis. You two drop here. Right, Captain. Good luck. What are you stopping for, Amalo? I, I just remember they told me to yell if I came up. If you try to pull anything... No, no, no. Honest, honest. They told me to yell. Okay. You stay here. We're going up on that porch. Count 20, then yell. And play it smart. I won't fool with you, Amalo. Okay, okay, Captain. But I'm scared stiff. You're not alone. Come on, Charlie. So this, so this guy's trying to put yeah. it on a lamp, see? You know what he's worth, Get on that side of the door. Hey, Bert! Bert, it's me, Chino! Hey, Bert, I gotta see you! You alone? Yeah, yeah. Can I come up? It's all right, Animad. Okay, come on up. Get him right back! Why are you doing one going in the middle. Take out! Okay, okay! Don't shoot anyone! I'm hurt! See you, Walt, okay! Walt? Well, it's about time. Get these ropes off me. You okay, Walt? Yeah. Thanks, Charlie. What time is it? Eleven o'clock. Happy birthday. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Once more, let me remind you that tomorrow, Rexall's mighty one-cent sale begins. The sale where you get two guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one, plus a penny. For example, the pint bottle of MI-31, Rexall's famous mouthwash, regularly costs 69 cents. Tomorrow, you can get two bottles for just 70 cents. And remember, there are some 347 of these twin bargains plus 85 other super specials. Make your pennies by dollars during Rexall's one-cent sale. Tomorrow through Monday at Rexall drugstores everywhere. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards, with music composed and conducted by Frank Worth. Dick Powell can soon be seen in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Wilms Herbert, Bill Johnstone, Sidney Miller, John Stevenson, Arthur Q. Bryan, Virginia Gregg, and Jay Novello. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this same time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Remember, tomorrow starts the four biggest bargain days in the year. Rexall's nationwide one-cent sale. The sale where you get two top-quality guaranteed Rexall products for the price of one plus one cent. Remember, tomorrow, Friday, Saturday, and the following Monday, just step inside a Rexall store where you buy twice as much for a penny more. Your chime master, Robert Young, is expecting you tomorrow on NBC. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. New York Police Department calling. Mr. Dollar, will you accept the charges? Uh, yeah, put them on. Just a moment, please. Ready with your call to Hartford, Connecticut. Go ahead. Hello, Dollar? 
That's right. This is Sergeant Papish, robbery. I have a notation here. You're the one to contact in the case that came up. Allied Adjustment Bureau? Well, I've done a lot of work for him. What's it about, Sergeant? Well, we've recovered a mink coat you were looking for about six months ago. Oh? Yeah, stolen from a party named Jacoby in Rochester. The Jacobys are in Europe right now, but the furrier's already identified it as the one he sold to him. Jacoby? Rochester? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. It was insured for $5,000. There's some other things taken in the same hall. A watch, rings, bracelet. That's a job. So far, we just have the coat and the girl who was wearing it. What does she say? Nothing. So far, she's got a couple of bullet holes in her. Maybe I better get down there, Sergeant. Room 212, Sergeant Papish. Right. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in the transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Allied Adjustment Bureau, Markham Building, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Rochester theft matter. Expense account item one, one dollar and sixty-five cents. Person to person collect call from Sergeant Papish, New York Police Department. Item two, thirty-two dollars and fifty-six cents. Train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City after clearing authority to resume on the Jacoby case. It had been stalemated six months before when the Rochester police and I were unable to recover any part of the item stolen from the Jacoby residence. I arrived in New York at 1.35, dropped my bags off at the New Weston, then went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station. Uh... Hello, uh, I wonder if you could help me. I'm looking for Sergeant Papish. I'm Papish. Oh, Johnny Dollar, Sergeant. Oh. Thanks for coming down, Dollar. I have a chair. Oh, thanks. Your mink coat's in the crime lab. They're looking it over. Uh-huh. We still haven't found out much about the girl who was wearing it. What's her name? Yeah, just Jane Doe for now. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we're waiting to hear from Washington now. She's been unconscious ever since we picked her up. Pretty bad shape. Now, what exactly happened? I came in as a complaint about uh, three this morning. A woman over on 57th Street telephoned about a disturbance. The prowl car went over to the address and found this girl lying in the entrance to the apartment house wearing the mink coat. She'd been shot twice. Uh-huh. No one in the apartment house seemed to know her or had ever seen her before. We asked about the neighborhood and no dice. But we did find out how she got there. Oh, huh? The lady across the street said she saw a man drive up sometime after midnight and unload the girl from his car. She, uh, was able to give us a fair description of the car and the man. Yeah. Nice. But nothing definite. No license number or anything like that. Could be any car and any man from what she said. Got an APB out, of course. Was there a purse or anything? Nothing. The dress she was wearing came from a store downtown. Hundreds just like it. The coat was the only item that might have helped, and it turned up listed in the stolen property file. How about jewelry? Small diamond ring on her little finger. When I looked over the list of things taken in that Jacoby robbery, it doesn't fit any of those. You can look at it if you want to. I'll take your word for it. I suppose the insurance company paid off the claim. Yeah, the whole thing. Well, at least we have the coat back for you. Maybe we'll get a line on the other things when this girl regains consciousness. If she does. 
pretty bad, is it? Yeah. Nice looking girl, too. Only about 25 or so. Excuse me. Sure. Robbery, Sergeant Pabish. Oh, let me get it down here. Two thirteen West. Right. Okay. See you there. Bye. Just got an answer from Washington. They able to identify the girl? Yeah, dress and all. She had a postal savings once. Name's Eileen Madden. You mind if I go with you? Yeah, come on. Maybe you'll get back all of your loot. I accompanied Sergeant Papish to the address for Eileen Madden. Turned out to be a fairly nice apartment in a fairly nice neighborhood. By the time we arrived there, a full crew of technicians were at work giving the place a complete check. Sergeant Papish introduced me to a tall, heavy set man. This is Mr. Dollar from the insurance company, Walt. Sergeant Walter. All right. How are you, Sergeant? Oh, fine. I'm afraid we haven't done any good for you so far. Haven't found anything here to go with that mink coat. Oh. Have you talked to anybody around here yet? Just getting started on it. The lady who lives across the hall might be able to help us. Where is she? In there. Her name's Ethel Stromberg. Mrs. Okay. I'll take it here. All right. Uh, are you Mrs. Stromberg? Yes, I am. I'm Sergeant Papish. This is Mr. Dollar. How do you do? How do you do? How is poor Eileen? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. Oh, dear, that's terrible. It's just a terrible thing. Where is she? I'd like to go to see her if it's possible. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Well, thank you. What an awful thing. How did that happen? What's that all about? Now, maybe you can tell us something about her, Mrs. Stromberg. Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. How long have you known her? Well... I moved in here about five months ago. I met her the very first day. Mm -hmm. Nice girl? Oh, yes, very nice, very nice girl. Quiet, she minded her own business. Do you know where we can contact her family? No, I can't help you there, Sergeant. I, I know they live somewhere in California, but that's about all. She talks about them now and then. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Did she talk about any of her friends to you? What do you mean? Well, she's a pretty girl, young, boyfriends, maybe. Yes, she did talk about them now and then. You suppose one of them had something to Mrs. do? Mrs. Stromberg, Eileen Madden was dumped from a convertible last night after she'd been shot. A witness described the car as possibly blue or black in color, white top, white sidewalls. She said it was a late model Cadillac or Buick. Do you know if any of Miss Madden's friends drove a car that comes near that description at all? Why, yes. Yes, I saw him pick her up one night. I was just coming home. Uh, saw who pick her up, Mrs. Stromberg? A man she called Bill. Bill who? I really don't know his last name. She didn't introduce me to him. But she talks about him. He drove a black Cadillac. Can you tell us what he looks like? Well, he seemed very tall. As tall as Sergeant Papish here? So about your height, very nice looking. He seemed quite big. Husky, sort of. Very nicely dressed, too. What color was his hair? I don't know. He always wore a hat. I, I think it was dark, though. His eyes? I don't know. About uh, how old, would you say? Oh, I'm no good at this, but uh, I say between 30 and 35. Mm, seems to fit what we have from the witness. Yeah. Uh, this bill, would you say he had money? Oh, yes, I would say so. He drove that nice big convertible. He always dressed so nice. And he gave Eileen pretty nice things. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Eileen would usually run across the hall and show me when he sent her something nice. I don't remember her ever showing me any jewelry. I just talked to the hospital. How is she? Just coming around. I think you'd better go over there and talk to her if you're gonna. Is she bad? They think she's dying, Mrs. Stromberg. She'll make it? Uh, hard to say right now. Sometimes they rally. She must have been in their doorway a half hour or better before we got to her. Mm -hmm. She said anything, Doctor? No. You might have to wait a little while for her to come around. 
see. I tell you both. Ask what you have to know quick. Two minutes is about all I can give you with it. Sure, Doctor. Oh, better put your cigarettes in that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All right, miss. Okay, boys. Is she conscious? Yeah, she can hear you. Are you Eileen Madden? Is Eileen Madden your name? Yes. Yes. You're seriously hurt, Miss Madden. Can you tell us how it happened? Miss Madden? Bill. Bill shot you? Yes. What's Bill's name? Where can we find him? I... 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 Doctor, watch. <coughs> Nurse, hand me that. Sorry, fellas. There was nothing I could do. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good anytime, and the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> With our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Eileen Madden died at 3.35 in the afternoon without giving us the full name of the man who shot her the night before. I stayed with Sergeant Papish and Sergeant Walters as they continued their investigation of her death and the appearance of the mink coat covered in policy number 27M55567, issued to Roland J. Jacoby, Rochester, New York. The apartment where she had lived yielded some information. Here it is. Letters from Robert J. Madden in Riverside, California. Looks like her father. Okay, we'd better notify him. This might be the best lead. What's that? This picture. Found in one of her closets. Let's see. Hmm. Dollar. Oh, thanks. Love, Bill. He loved her all right. Yeah. Anybody identified this yet? That Mr. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time you got? Oh, half past. She said she'd be here at six. Anything on the bullets? They didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army 45. The old 1911 model. Pretty good gun for killing. What gun is it? Oh, I got the wrong room at first. Oh, come in, Mrs. Stromberg. You remember Sergeant Papish and Mr. Dollar? Yes. Do I have to answer more questions? Not many more. Oh, I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Eileen. Did you get in touch with her family? Business office is doing it right now. Oh, dear, what a terrible, terrible thing. Mrs. Stromberg, have you ever seen this man before? Oh, yes, that's Bill. The man Eileen's been going with? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac convertible? Yes, that's him. But did he do this terrible thing? It looks that way, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear, dear. <coughs> Sergeant Pavish. Yeah. 
Yeah, right. Goodbye. Did Eileen Madden ever mention to you that she had been married? Why, no. She never did. Was she? In the state of New York in 1951. Just found out from vitals. Divorced? Yeah. Her ex-husband's name is Bill. Bill Powers. <laughs> Sergeant Papish, this is Mr. Dollar. Uh, how do you do? What's the matter? May we come inside, Mr. Powers? Sure. Well, what's this all about? Do you know a woman named Eileen Madden, Mr. Powers? Yeah, sure. We were married once. Why? Eileen Madden was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. Eileen? Yes. What? Are you sure? I... We checked her prints. Oh. oh. Shot? Yes. Who? Oh, what happened? I... Well, how, how could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I, I can't believe it. I mean, dead. Have you seen her lately? Well, yeah, I, I saw her last week. Had a drink together. Are you sure it's Eileen? We'd make sure before we came around to news like this. Uh, Mr. Dollar represents an insurance company, Mr. Powers. Miss Madden was wearing a stolen coat when we found her. Stolen coat? Yes, a stolen mink coat. Was uh, she ever in trouble anywhere? I don't care what she was wearing. Eileen never steal anything. She was a fine girl, a wonderful girl. I was a fool to ever let our marriage go on the rocks. <laughs> Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? Where? We need a positive identification. Sure. Sure, Sergeant. I'll be right with you. Want to smoke? Thanks. Well, he isn't the bird in the picture. No. Did you see the car in the driveway? Yeah. 51 Caddy Black Convertible. On the way to the city morgue with the ex-husband of Eileen Madden, we tried to get more information from him regarding her activities up till the time of her death. But power seemed so distraught that he could only speak of their short marriage and the reason it had ended. It was an old and especially sad story of a man who couldn't provide well enough for a beautiful wife. However, once he'd seen her body at the morgue and identified it, he seemed to get better control of himself. We all walked across the street for coffee. I hope you get whoever did this, Sergeant. I hope you get him fast. We sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Eileen? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. Oh, you're just interested in that coat you say she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I'm just looking for the facts, Mr. Powers. I'd like to prove what you just said as badly as you'd like to have it proved. But we have to start somewhere. You can understand that. I, I suppose so. You told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Did you know that she's been going with somebody else? Sure. And uh, you know Bill? Bill Chambers? Yeah. Well, I, I, I don't know him, but she talked about him a lot. Is uh, this Bill Chambers, Mr. Powers? Yeah. yeah that's him. I thought you knew You're that. sure this is him? I'm sure. This picture was in her place. I went there one day and saw it and asked her who he was. I mean, told me all about him. What did she tell you about him? Why, she said she was going with him. She she told me that he wanted to marry her. Said he had lots of money. Did she tell you where he works? No. Or what kind of work he does? No. You know where we can get in touch with him? No, I don't know that either. I say... Do you think he might have done this to her? We'd like to talk to him. Well, I, I know she's been going with him for a few months, what she told me. And you've been seeing her the same time she was seeing Chambers? Well, yeah, yeah, that's right. She didn't want to marry him. She wanted to marry me again. Do you know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Cadillac. Thought you never met him. 
Well, she told me about his car. <laughs> it's another thing. I went out and bought one myself. I thought it might do me some good with her. Mm-hmm. Were you at home last night? Yeah. Can you prove it? Yeah. <laughs> I was home. She was out getting killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. They listed 24 persons who more or less fit his general description. It took two days to locate and talk with all of them. Neither Mrs. Stromberg nor the witness who had seen the body dumped from the car could identify any of them. An all-points bulletin regarding the suspect and his car had been issued as soon as we learned his name. Same results. Nothing. On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two more items that had been taken in the Jacoby robbery. There they are. Huh. Watch and ring. Jacoby stuff? Case numbers on the watch checkout. The ring's engraved. Where'd they wind up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor says it was sold yesterday. Man who sold them signed the buy book James Agenian. How about his description? Fifth chambers down the line. Well, at least he was still in town yesterday. Yeah, but his stuff's been on the hot sheet for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. Probably trying to raise cash to get out of town. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Gave him an address on Polk Street. A vacant lot. If he keeps on trying to unload it, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. Well, they found his car. Where? Used car lot in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 51 Cadillac convertible for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported that the man had seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification of William Chambers. William Carlson, alias William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron, male, Caucasian, age 33, 178-61. Let's see, 14 arrests, two convictions, both car theft. Quite a lad. Aren't they all? <laughs> Doesn't look like a killer, though, does he? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search to locate William Carlson, alias William Chambers, extended to all parts of the city. The associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All of them denied having any knowledge of his whereabouts. In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with the Jacoby theft were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Each of the pawn shop proprietors identified the mugshot of the wanted man. He'd used different names in each instance. The handwriting was the same. Each address had to be checked out. I went with Sergeant Papish to the one he had given on 78th Street. It was not a vacant lot. Hello? Hello. We're looking for William Courtney. You found him? Huh? Cops? Yeah. Come on in. Hold still. I'm clean. Checked me through the buy book yesterday? Yeah. Your name's Carlson, isn't it? William Carlson? Yep. We've been looking a long time for you. I know. Yesterday, I decided I'd let you find me. I gave my right address. You want to get your hat? Sure. Look, I didn't mean to kill Eileen. I, I didn't mean to at all. I want you to know that. We'll talk about it downtown. No, no, we won't. I'm not talking to anybody downtown. I'm talking to you two right now, and that's it. So you better listen. Okay. I've been doing pretty good with these house jobs. Real good. Enough to buy myself a nice car, get some clothes, get around a little bit. I work all alone. I met her. I liked her. I wanted to marry her. I did. I, re I really did. We went out the other night, and I gave her the mink coat for a present. I thought that had sent you. She didn't want to take it. She told me she was going to marry some guy she'd been married to before. I... 
I'll let her have it. That's all? That's all. That's it, mister. I could have run. Sold my car. Been getting rid of a lot of odds and ends I have around. I decided not to, after all. I don't want to run. Okay, let's get with it. I remember, I let you get me. I wrote my address right down where I knew you'd check it out. Okay. And there's no more talking. You two got it all straight. What's the matter with you, anyway? You got it all? I mean, about everything? I... Yeah, I've got it. Okay. Hey, wait a minute. You sir. guys are too late. I... I took it when I heard you knock on the door. Where's the phone? It's too late, I tell you. It's in my stomach now. It's too late. Not for me, brother. I handle plenty of babies, just like you. Not too late. Grab him, Miss. Yeah, I got it. Ah, shut up. You're going to stand trial, baby. Sergeant Papish had handled attempted suicides. A lot of them. And in the five minutes before the arrival of the emergency ambulance, he managed to force William Carlson to take an antidote that saved his life. of the Jacoby theft items were found in and around the apartment of the suspect, along with other stolen property listed with the New York police. All of the articles on the enclosed list have been impounded and will be available following the trial of William Carlson. Expense account item three, hotel and board while in New York, $88.65. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $155.42. Remarks? Please file a copy of the above report for the information of William Powers in regard to his ex-wife, Eileen Madden. I think this is what he wanted. Well, that's it. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment... Plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Virginia Gregg, John McIntyre, Jim Nusser, Jeanette Nolan, Victor Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Why let your floors get scuffed up? Beacon Wax stops floor scuffing. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis.
detective as well known as Mike Shane is in the limelight pretty much of the time. This evening, Mike is not in the limelight, but behind the footlights. Or rather, he is just about to be. A new review is opening at the Empire Theater, and for reasons still unknown, Mike has been asked to attend the rehearsal. Right now, Mike and his pretty associate, Phyllis Knight, are waiting at the stage door. Yes, what do you want, son? We'd like to see Miss Beverly Pryor, please. I'm sorry, son. Rehearsal going on now. She asked us to come. It's business. Oh, business. Well, then, I guess it's okay. Come on in. Miss Pryor's dressing room is number four. Well, thanks. Mike, how long is it since you've seen Miss Beverly Pryor? Oh, years. (laughs) Ten years. We got to be good friends when I spent a couple of vacations down in New Orleans. Seems to me she could have told you what she wanted over the phone. Well, we'll know in three seconds. This is dressing room four. Come in. Oh, my. Hello. You old darling, let me give you a... <laughs> Bev. My good gracious. Beverly. Oh, pieces, Mike. It's so wonderful to see you again. <laughs> Oh, I'd almost forgotten you were so handsome. Uh, yeah. Oh, I almost forgot, too. Phyllis, I mean, uh, Beverly, I want you to meet my... I mean, uh, I want you to meet Miss Phyllis... Oh, Mike, you haven't gone and got yourself married. No, Miss Pryor. Not yet. I'm Phyllis Knight, Mike's associate. Oh, uh, just in a business way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) How do you do? Beverly, I didn't know you'd gone on the stage. Oh, I was always good at dancing. You remember, Mike. I've got a specialty number in the review. Oh. South American dances, rumbas and sambas. Do you like my costume? Oh, sure. It's uh, <clears throat> very colorful. <laughs> Shows off my legs very well, don't you think? Uh-huh. <laughs> you remember what skinny legs I used to uh, have. Miss Pryor, Mike and I don't want to hold up your rehearsal. Oh, no, no, that's right. Beverly, you said on the phone that you were afraid of something serious happening. Somebody connected with your show. Oh, oh yes, I, I was pretty scared yesterday. Some changes are being made tonight, and, well, I think things will all straighten out now. Well, what was wrong? Well, maybe it was my imagination. We've all been so nervous and hot-tempered. Yes? Well, I thought somebody was planning a murder. Somebody would... Mm-hmm. What made you think so? Hiya, beautiful. Ready for your spot? Larry says you're going to follow up. Oh, come team, in, then. boys. I want you to meet an old friend of mine. Mike, this is our comedy team. Sweeney and March. Mike Shane and Miss Knight. Hello. Is the salt set to the pepper? Shake. <laughs> How do you do? They're just dandy, snug as a rug in a bug. <laughs> you get the switch? Snug as a rug. <laughs> All friends of Bev's, huh? Uh, well, you believe me, this little gal's going places. You know, this show's just third base for her. Next strike will be home plate or Hollywood. <laughs> yes, indeed. Sweeney thinks he can sell me to Hollywood. If he'd stick to comedy and forget the age of you. Wait, well. you wait, you'll see. I'll have Sammy Goldwyn and Louis B. strangling each other for you. Hey, come on, Sweeney. We're late for us. Okay, yeah, we'll be seeing you. Yeah, uh, sure. A <laughs> slap happy pair. Mike, why don't you and Miss Knight go out in the wings and watch their routine? Well, I want to get your story first. Now, who was planning a murder? Oh, it's all straightened out now, Mike. After rehearsal, we can have a little supper and I'll, and I'll tell you all about it. Now, go on, Scoot. I've got to finish dressing. Well, all right. Well, what's the matter, Angel? Haven't you anything to say? Angel. Your vacations in New Orleans must have been very pleasant. Oh. <laughs> yes, very pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> Did I miss a joke? You missed something. <laughs> oh, the hotter a woman gets, the more she freezes. <laughs> Okay, Sweeney, let's take that railroad spot again. All right, fine, you all set? Let's go. Right. Uh, It doesn't really matter, Mr. March. Any train will do, but I must have a ticket for Hollywood. Well, I understand that, Mr. Sweeney, but I can't let you have a ticket unless your trip is essential. Uh, What sort of business are you in? Oh, well, I'm president of the 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company. 12 Flavors to a Foot Sausage Company, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, we manufacture a sausage that's 12 inches long and contains 12 different kinds of meat. Well, what's the advantage? What's the advantage, Mr. March? Just this. If you're slicing a piece of our sausage and someone comes up to you and says, no matter how thin you slice it, it's still baloney, they're probably wrong. It may be liverwurst. Oh, oh, come now, Mr. Sweeney. After all, how can I give you a train reservation for something like that? Well, if you must know, I've got to get to Hollywood to see my doctor. Oh, oh, you have a serious illness, do you? Yes, I suffer from very bad attacks of bakery face. <laughs> bakery face, Mr. Sweeney? Yes, you see, under uh, my doctor's orders, I wash my face in baking powder and lemon juice. Well, then what happens? 
by breakout and cupcakes. <laughs> Mr. Sweeney, it seems to me that the thing... Wait a minute. What's, what's going what's on? Mike? Mike, it's the old man, the doorman. Yes, and he's pointing into that dressing room. Come on. Estelle! Estelle! She's murdered. Wait a minute, I see her. Hell, I see her, Mike, in the dressing room. All right, stand back, everybody. Stand back. You're not coming in here. Who says we're not going in there? I do. I'm a detective. Dad, you keep him out. I sure will. Oh, it's not a pretty picture, Mike. Stabbed in the back right at her dressing table. Hmm. Done with a huge knife. A special kind of knife with a gold hilt. Mike. Yes? Look the mirror right above her head. Oh, some letters and lipstick. Yeah, she tried to tell us something. It spells B-E-V-E. -E. The rest of the letters are just a red scrawl. Oh, I'm afraid we know where they were meant to be. B-E-V-E. -E. R-L-Y. Beverly. Beverly Pryor. <laughs> return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, since we told you last week that post-war gasoline was here, many of you have already tried a tank full of the powerful new 76. But just in case the Minuteman in your locality hasn't been able to supply you with the new 76 gasoline, be patient. As fast as the modern 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company can make and blend it, our tankers and trucks are hurrying post-war 76 gasoline to you. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing its arrival. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tank full of the new 76. Performance of the new 76 gasoline far exceeds pre-war standards. You'll like its lighter, faster, more powerful action. And you'll like the price, too. It sells at regular prices. No increase. So, to make your old car act like new, put in a tank full of the gasoline of the future, the new 76. Now going on sale wherever you see the sign of the big orange and blue 76, your Union Oil Minuteman Station. Mike's backstage visit to the Empire Theater has taken a grim turn. Mike and Phyllis have found a girl stabbed to death. Behind a closed door in the Dead Star's dressing room, Mike and Phyllis tell their story to the inspector. And that's about it, Inspector. The old mm -hmm. fellow who watches the stage door discovered the body. We were out in the wings watching a comedy routine when we heard him yell. The murdered girl is Estelle Carroll, Inspector. She was the dance partner of Vic Hunter. Carroll and Hunter, they're listed on the billboard. Yeah, sure, kids. But this gal, Beverly Pryor, you say she called you here tonight because you thought a murder was cooking? How does Beverly know so much? Well, you see, Inspector... I see plenty. I see in that mirror right above Estelle's head the letters B-E-V-E -E, written in lipstick. Estelle tried to write the name of a murderer. I was coming to that. Just give me time. Now, Phyllis checked through Estelle's purse, and according to Estelle's driver's license, she was five feet four inches tall. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm six feet tall, Inspector. Yet these lipstick letters are three or four inches above my head. Now, I've heard you, Inspector, lecture your boys on the squad. That a person will usually ride on the level with his eyes. Sure, it's a safe generality. Well, then, Mike, you think somebody else wrote the letters B-E-V-E, -E, huh? Some tall person to give us a false clue? That's possible, Phil, but we can't prove it. No, no, but I would like to see a woman who has been stabbed in the back rise clear out of her chair, take a lipstick, and scrawl some letters 12 inches above her eyes. All right, while we're on the subject of clues, what else have we got? Well, I searched her dressing table. It's just the usual stuff. Except for one thing, this old-fashioned locket necklace. Mm, smear of blood on the locket. Mm. Yeah, from the murderer's fingers, probably. We found it thrown in the bottom drawer. Yeah, uh -huh. but more important, Inspector, look at the inside of the locket. There, you, you can see a patch of glue and a trace of paper sticking to it. Yeah. Well, there was a photograph pasted inside this. And if we can find out whose photograph it was, I think we may know why Estelle was murdered. Okay, let's start asking questions, beginning with Beverly Pryor. No, oh, if you want, Inspector, I'll go get her for you. Thanks, Phil. Hmm. Mike, has Beverly seen the body and this writing on the mirror? No, no, we kept everybody out of the dressing room. Good, and I think I'll drape this towel over the mirror. Just as well if Miss Pryor doesn't see our own name on the glass. Or any of the others, for that matter. Hmm, this is a peculiar-looking knife. Gold-painted hilt. Must be a theatrical prop. Mm, probably. Whoever the killer was, he or she must have stood behind Estelle as she sat at the dressing table. And while they were talking, plunged the knife in. Assuming the killer was supposed to be her friend. Well, sure, sure. There's no signs of a struggle. 
And no closet for a murderer to spring out of. And this may be this window here. Seems to open into an alley. Well, we checked it, Inspector. It was locked. Uh, Miss Pryor, this is the Inspector of Homicide. How do you do, Miss Pryor? If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, no, no, of course not. You want to ask me how I knew there was going to be a murder? Yes. Well, I, I didn't know. But I saw something during rehearsal last night. Well, that's why I telephoned for you, Mike. And what did you see, Beverly? Well, I, I was standing in the wings, waiting to do my number. Estelle was out front rehearsing her solo. She was supposed to do pirouettes clear across the stage into the opposite wing. And, well, just as she reached the curtain, I saw a long, thin sword slide out through the curtain. I, I screamed and, well, Estelle stopped. That's all that saved her life. You didn't see who held the sword? I, I couldn't. Did anyone else in the cast see who it was? Well, I didn't tell them. I, I said I screamed because I saw a rat. May I ask why the deception, Miss Pryor? I didn't know who it might be. I, I mean, I wasn't sure. Maybe I just imagined I saw a sword. The stage lighting is so uncertain. Yet you took it seriously enough to ask Mike to come here tonight. Beverly, we want you to examine the knife here in Estelle's back. Oh, it's... it's ghastly. Yes, but do you recognize the knife? Is it a theatrical prop? Yes. It's... it's from Harry's act. Harry? Harry Frizee, the magician. The famous Frizee. Would he have any reason to kill Estelle? I don't know. Okay, let's find out. Let's talk to everybody. Oh, I come next. Hey, me. hold on. Come back here. Yes, yes, sir. Who are you? I'm uh, I'm the doorman, sir. I was just passing. Oh, yes, and you're the man who found the body. Yes, sir. I had a telegram to deliver to Miss Carroll and her partner. I thought they were both in the dressing room. When I opened the door, man alive, there she was. You didn't tell me anything about a telegram. Well, uh, I, I forgot. Here, I got it in my pocket. Let me see that. Oh, it's addressed to Vic Hunter and Estelle Carroll. Yeah, two or three telegrams in the last uh, couple of days. Think so? Oh, Sergeant... That's Inspector. Check with the telegraph office. I want the texts of all wires received here in the past week. Right away, sir. Inspector, listen to this. Yeah. Carol and Hunter have booked you three weeks, Club Belvedere, starting next Sunday. Stop. Top deal. Regards, sign McGlynn. Yeah, I have that telegram, please. Huh? I'm Vic Hunter. Oh, Estelle's partner. Mr. Hunter, do you know if Estelle had any enemies? No, not real enemies. She... Well, she had several bad quarrels the last couple of days with March and with Beverly. I huh? heard that, Vic. You know it wasn't Beverly's fault. Estelle was jealous. She knew Beverly was going to steal the show. Don't be silly. Nobody can steal a show from Estelle. Then why did she tell me she'd fix it so I'd never dance again? Okay, okay, okay. Estelle was jealous. Let it go with that. Now, what about this fight with March? All right, I'll tell you. I suppose everybody knows about it anyway. I was trying to get Estelle to marry me, but she kept turning me down. We began a fight. I told you, Mutch, you were wasting your time on her, but no, no, you wouldn't listen to me. You even had to take our paycheck, my paycheck, to buy her an engagement. She gave it back to me. Yeah, she gave it back. Look at your money. Don't worry about your money. Quiet, quiet. Did any of you notice anything strange in Estelle's action the past few days? Did she seem afraid or worried? No, no, just her fight with Beverly and Mutch. Mr. Hunter. We found a necklace and locket in Estelle's dresser, an old-fashioned gold chain and locket. Yes, she always wore it. She called it her good luck charm. Whose picture did she keep inside the locket? Why, I think it was a man's photograph. I assumed it was some fellow she was or had been in love with. She never told you his name, Mr. Hunter? No, Estelle was very closed-mouthed. Mm -hmm. I want to establish the time element in this case. Estelle and Mr. Hunter finished rehearsal, and then went back to their dressing rooms. For some time during the next 15 minutes, the murder occurred. Now, during those 15 minutes, where was everybody? Well, I was in my dressing room. Part of the time, Mike and Miss Knight were visiting with me. And Sweeney and I were just buzzing around. We stopped in and gabbed a minute with Beverly and her pals. Yeah, well, we're in the clear. A comedy guy couldn't carve a hole in a gal's back and then go out front and panic him with gags. Sure. We'd be laying turkey eggs all over the place. I'm not the one to say that you didn't, Mr. Sweeney. Huh? Didn't which? Say, listen, if you mean that Inspector... Our... We were going to talk to the magician, the famous Frizee. Yeah, it's about time. Anybody know where we can find him? Well, he was in his dressing room a few minutes ago. I'll show you where it Never is. Never mind if you'll just tell us. Oh, all right. You go right down here. The famous Frizee's dressing room is the last on the left. Okay. Thank you, Beverly. You kids got any ideas yet? I have. Huh? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know why none of these people voluntarily mentioned the famous Frizee. They know everybody in this theater is under suspicion. Yet nobody refers to the magician, mm. the owner of the knife which stabbed Estelle to death. Right. Well, probably because none of them noticed the knife. Aside from Beverly, I'm not sure the others even know how Estelle was killed. Mm, one of them does, Mike. Huh? He said a comedian couldn't carve a hole in a girl's back and then go out and do a gag routine. Swing. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's see. 
This must be the dressing room here. No answer. Well, there's his costume on the chair, but no Mr. Frizee. That's blame funny. We haven't seen him anywhere around the theater. He just disappeared. Mm, it's not surprising for a magician. <clears throat> hey. Hey, that window curtain. It's blowing. Yeah, and the window's wide open. And an alley right outside. I'll bet he ducked out the window and up the alley. Oh, great. Now I'll have to drag out the old net. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Low gear for a moment, Inspector. Look at that sword rack on the wall there. Sabres, swords, daggers. Yeah. In several blank places in the collection. The rack is minus two daggers. The same type that killed Estelle. And also minus two swords. Swords. Oh. Huh. Oh, what, Angel? I just remembered. When I went out to get Beverly for you boys, I found her in Sweeney and March's dressing yeah, room. Yeah, and... and... I saw one of those swords on top of their trunk. Uh-uh. And last night, Beverly saw a sword come out of the curtains intended for Estelle. Mike! Mike and Fetch! What's about it, Beverly? What's wrong? I just got a phone call. A man told me he knew who killed Estelle. Huh? He asked me to meet him in my hotel room. I didn't know what to do. Well, I said yes. Could you recognize his voice? Oh, I think so. He was trying to disguise his voice, but it sounded like... Like Harry Frizee. Frizee, swell. Then we know where to find him. Oh, I'm scared, Mike. Everybody in the troop knows I called you in tonight because I knew something. Maybe he's trying to lure me outside. That's exactly what he's trying to do, Beverly. Now, you're going to stay right here. We'll keep that appointment for you. Give me the key to your room. Uh, here it is. It's 9.05. Frizee is right across the hall, number 906. What time did he say to meet him? At 9.30. And it's 9.10 right now. Okay, Inspector, we've got ourselves a date. Ninth floor. Room 905, that would be this way. Yeah, yeah, here we are. That's for Z's room across the hall. And a light shining over the transom. Okay, let's talk to him in his own room. We may get a chance to see something. It's funny. His lights are on. This is another vanishing act. Let's try the door. Unlocked. More than that. Look at the doorknob. And my hand. Ugh. Blood. Mike, is... is that the famous Frizee? I'm afraid the word is was, Inspector. It was the famous Frizee. In just a moment, we'll rejoin Mike Shane in his adventures. How about it, friends? Have you gotten your first tank full of the new 76 gasoline? It's available right now at no increase in price at many Minuteman stations. The new post-war 76 is freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company. That means you're getting the benefit of the latest in war-proven refining methods when you get the new 76. It's lighter, faster action beats all pre-war performance. You'll notice the difference as soon as you come down on the accelerator. So for a real motoring thrill, get a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. If your minute man doesn't have the new 76 today, please be patient. Our tankers and trucks are making deliveries with all possible speed, but some outlying districts of necessity take longer to supply. But whether you're able to buy the new 76 right now, or whether you have to wait a few more days you'll find it the gasoline you've been waiting for. It's the new 76 gasoline, now going on sale at your Union Oil Minute Man stations. For the second time tonight, a murderer's knife has struck. The prize suspect, the famous Frazee, has been killed. Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have just completed a search of the dead magician's hotel room. Ransack, turned upside down, pulled apart. I wonder what under the sun the killer was looking for. Well, we haven't the foggiest idea what to look for or what's missing. Mm. But at least this time we know the motive. Frizee was killed because he knew the identity of Estelle's murderer, huh? You can't even say that, Phil. Huh? Don't forget Frizee's knife was found in Estelle's back. He may have committed the first murder tonight, then somebody else killed him. Oh, 
I want to take a really good look at that body. Hmm. Still wearing his overcoat, so he had just come in. Wound on the back of the head showed the murderer first tried to put him out quietly. Hey, Inspector. What? His wristwatch, it's smashed. Yeah, it stopped at, let's see, 8.57. 8.57? Inspector, when Beverly rushed in and told us about Frizee's phone call, remember I looked at my watch? That's right, you said it was ten minutes past nine. Hey, hey, then Frizee was already dead. He wasn't disguising his voice on that phone call. Somebody was trying to imitate for Z. And I'll bet you that somebody made the phone call from right inside the theater to get us out of the scene for a while. Well, if you're right, Mike, it's a darn good thing I phoned the sergeant to bring these people here to the hotel. Hey, kids. Yes, what? Angel? Y- you notice that for Z's right hand is closed tight, in fact, awfully tight. Yeah. You suppose maybe he's got something in his fist? Well, we shouldn't disturb the body till the coroner gets here. Go ahead. Perhaps if I just pried his fingers open. You're right, honey. Mm, Let's see it. A photograph, a tiny round picture of a baby. Yeah. And look at the back of the photo. Dried glue. This is the picture that was torn out of Estelle's locker. Inspector, I've got everybody outside for you. Sweeney, March, Hunter, and Sprayer. Okay, Sergeant. We'll talk to them one at a time. Bring in Sweeney. Yes, sir. Mr. Sweeney. This thing gives me the creeps. When are you guys going to stop finding bodies? Mr. Sweeney, you have one of Frizee's swords in your dressing room. Mind telling us what for? Oh, that. Well, March and I borrowed a couple of them from Frizzy. We were cooking up a burlesque on his magic act. Oh. We figured we could get some laughs. Yeah, I it. see. And now, uh, will you look at this photograph here? Sure. Do you recognize this baby? No. That's all, sir. Okay, Sergeant, bring in March. Mr. March. Mr. March, would you explain why you had one of Frizzy's swords in your dressing room tonight? Sure, we've had him a couple of days. Sweeney, now we're going to do a takeoff on Frizzy's act. Oh, yeah. That checks up. Do you recognize the baby in this photograph? Mm, no, sir. Okay, thank you. That's all. all right. Sergeant, Mr. Hunter. Yes, gentlemen? Oh, Mr. Hunter, we found that photograph which was missing from your partner's locket. You have? Good. Yes, yes. Here, this is it. A baby's picture, and as uh, we recall, Mr. Hunter, you said that there was a man's picture inside. Well, there was the last time I saw it. She must have changed photographs recently. Do you know who this baby might be? Not the slightest idea. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Will you send in Miss Pryor next? Oh, yes, Inspector. Yes, I will. Excuse me, Inspector. Yes, Sergeant. One of the boys just came from the telegraph office. Here are the copies of all the telegrams sent to the theater. Swell. Then hold Miss Pryor outside till we've read them. Yes, sir. Let's see. The first wire is four days ago from Chicago. Regret to inform you your father passed away last night. Stop. Will you attend funeral? Sign Norman L. Tyre, gang cop and tire attorneys. Well, the second wire is a duplicate. Two days later. And the last is dated yesterday. No word from you, so funeral tomorrow. Stop. Have been named administrator of your father's estate. Stop. You are again beneficiary because of John Jr., Signed, Norman L. Tyre. John, Jr. Again beneficiary because of John. Well, maybe I'm crazy, but I say the baby in this picture is John. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Back at the theater, I asked everybody if Estelle acted in any way peculiar the past few days, if she'd been frightened or worried. Yeah, and they all said that she was not upset. Well, then that's our answer. Inspector. Yeah, Mike? Somebody had better go back to the theater and pick up Dad, the old doorman. Now, Dad, now I want you to be very careful. How many telegrams did you receive addressed to Estelle? Why, three to Estelle and one to the team of Carol and Hunter. Uh Uh-huh. Now, um, you all remember that I asked uh, whether or not Estelle had shown any signs of being worried or upset? And you all said no. Yes, yes. That's right. Three of these telegrams told of her father's death. Well, she certainly didn't say anything or show any signs of grief. The answer to that is easy, Mr. Hunter. She never saw those telegrams. They were deliberately withheld from her. But, but uh, I delivered them. At least I gave them to Mr. Hunter. You're right. I did withhold them. I didn't want Estelle to go to pieces and ruin our act. How long did you and Estelle work in that act, Mr. Hunter? Over three years. And during that time, your impression was that the locket she wore as a good luck charm contained a photograph of a man? Some fellow she was or had been in love with, I think you said? That's right. You're lying, Mr. Hunter. What do you mean? Does this look like the photo of a man? It's a baby. Estelle's baby. I don't know. I told you. You told us a lot that you didn't mean to, Mr. Hunter, but you didn't tell us that Estelle's baby was your baby, too. That you and Estelle were married, that you that you had the killer. I didn't. Oh, yes, you did. And you killed Frizee because he knew. Frizee found the baby's photograph. How, I don't know, but that doesn't matter. 
Brazil put two and two together. You had to kill him. I can only guess at your original motive, but uh, that's something I'm quite sure the inspector will ring from you when he gets you down to police headquarters. <laughs> There it is, Angel. I know, Mike, but I still don't see how Hunter could expect to get away with it. But didn't he know somebody would check up on those telegrams? Well, certainly, honey, but he miscalculated on one thing. Hmm? He didn't know a private detective was going to be backstage right after the killing. He didn't have time to plant the telegrams in Estelle's purse or dresser. Well, I don't understand how that would help. I sure it would. Then he would have played it differently. Hunter would have admitted the marriage. He would have told us Estelle and he were planning to leave the show because Estelle had come into her father's money. As I see it, the reason he had the killer was because she was going to divorce him. Oh, that would cut him off from Estelle's inheritance. Yes. Mike. Yes. Thought you'd like to know we just got a confession. Seems Estelle was planning to divorce Vic. And... Ah, just what I finished telling Phil, Inspector. Oh, oh, but there's one thing, one thing. How did Hunter make that phone call imitating Frizzy? From the theater, Mike. He called Beverly to give himself an alibi. He wanted us to think Frizzy was still alive while Hunter was in the theater. Mm-hmm. Well, that's the one question that worried me. <laughs> okay, Inspector. Thanks a lot. Mm, Michael. Uh, yes? Uh, there's one more question, and it worries me. Hmm? When you were down in New Orleans, just how friendly were you with Beverly? Oh, why, Miss Knight. Well? <laughs> Uh, I may have an eye for figures, but, Angel, you certainly haven't got a head for them. <laughs> How old would you say Beverly is right now? Mm, 22, 23. She's 22. I told you I knew her in New Orleans ten years ago. Yes, ma'am, we were the scandal of her grammar school. My chain, you deliberately led me on. You allowed me... Oh, <laughs> come here, you big lug. Oh, oh, Bev... What? I mean, the angel. Remember, friends, the new 76 gasoline will give you a driving performance that will make you think of jet propulsion. Watch for the signs to go up in your neighborhood announcing the first shipments at your Union Oil Minuteman stations. Then, for a real thrill, drive in for your first tankful of the powerful new 76 gasoline, freshly blended from the huge 100-octane refineries of Union Oil Company, now going on sale at your Minuteman stations. Tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. The characters of Sweeney and March were played by the comedy team of Sweeney and March. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil. Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. If the chimes shudder a little on Sunday afternoon, well, they know there's mystery in store Sunday with men of action like Mike Waring, better known as the Falcon, who brings his fearless and romantic touch to the solution of another mystery. After the Falcon, it's high adventure. Then the big guy steps in. The new private eye, Charlie Wilde, concludes with a few casual homicides. The chimes mean mystery and action this Sunday afternoon on NBC. Transcribed. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, 
the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the adventure of Stamped for Murder with that brilliant, eccentric, private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. The instructions for this morning, Archie, your notebook, please. First, Mr. Salensback. Inform him that the Long Island peafowl he sent were most unsatisfactory. Peafowl's breast flesh is not sweet and tender unless it is well protected from all alarms, especially from the air, to prevent nervousness. Long Island is full of airplanes. Look, Mr. Wolf, I... I shall uh... want a dozen chickens that have been raised on blueberries and a fresh-killed lamb for tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Wolf, please listen, there's... Uh... Mr. Goodwin, be quiet, and then dinner on the following day becomes a problem. Mr. Wolf, dinner any day is going to be a problem if we don't pay Sausenbach's bill. Then pay it. With what? The bank account's empty. Ridiculous. They were $4,000 yesterday. But you bought that shipment of orchid bobs from wine old Gluckner. Mr. Wolf, we need money. You've got to stop eating and drinking beer long enough to earn some... Phew, you're an alarmist. Will you, for the love of heaven, stop turning down clients and turn an honest dollar? I've got a couple of prospects right outside the door. Send them away. No, sir. Send them away. Tell them I've gone to Egypt. Nothing doing, sir. Confound you, Archie. Obey order. Send them away. Miss Kent, Mr. Rodman, come in, please. Thank you. you. Confound you, Archie. You're mutinous. Yes, sir, and you're stuck with it. This is Miss Gloria Kent and Mr. Rodman. They arrived as advertised with a pressing problem. Good morning. You people are here by sufferance only. I shall speak to Mr. Goodwin about it later. Yes, indeed. I don't like pressing problems, Miss Kent. What are yours? My father. Indeed? I'm on a court of domestic relations, Miss Kent. What did your father do? Beat you? Withhold your earnings? Discourage your suitors? Mr. Goodwin should have informed you this office does not undertake cases involving marital or family problems. But that's not... If Mr. Goodwin had not been beguiled by your pretty face... He might have warned you and avoided this embarrassment to you and annoyance to me. Now, 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 take it easy, take it easy. How many times have I told you you don't know how to handle women? Then suppose you let Miss Kent handle me. Well, it's simply this, Mr. Wolfe. I had some money my mother left me. My father's just spent it without my permission. I want it back without a scandal. Thanks, Miss Kent. How much? How spent? Ten thousand dollars. Father bought a treasure map. Indeed, from whom? A pair of swindlers named Cross and Halleck. They've driven him crazy, talking about fortunes salvaged from the SS this and the SS that. He's got a map and old letters he studies. He's childish. Many fortunes have been recovered. Many more are weight on the sea bottom. How do you know your father has been duped? Well, I know. You do, Mr. Rodman. Yes. Cross and Halleck bought some old letters for me, written by my grandfather from Hawaii. They used them to manufacture the map and evidence. And that's what they sold to Kent. Father thought he was being so clever. He had the paper analyzed. Of course, the document research laboratory said the letters were genuine. They were. But something new had been added. I'd have never known if Mr. Rodman hadn't told me. You are a party to the swindle, Mr. Rodman? I was not. I never knew what they were up to. Mr. Wolfe, you've got to help me. I can't do anything with Father. I can't convince him. Even Mr. Rodman can't... No, Miss Kent, I'm sorry. This is not for me. But you must. You must. Not in my office, madam. No tears. Please, please, Archie, stop her. Okay, okay, okay. Archie, when Miss Kent has finished her disgraceful exhibition, show them out. How dare you walk out on the... Easy, easy, easy. I know him. I know him. You don't. He gets into a panic when women cry, or else he's curious about what Fritz is cooking for lunch. Now, just uh, wait a minute, please. Oh, aren't you ashamed of yourself walking out like that on that poor kid? That hysterical gamma. (laughs) She's lost all of her money. She needs help. I charge high fees, Archie. So charge a small fee. Do you want her to starve? Good heavens. Starve? How monstrous. I'm not kidding. While you'll be in here smelling your dinner, she and her father will be starving. I thought you were bringing me a paying claim. Well, this is different. She's, uh... Beautiful. Archie, you're impossible. 
Oh, very well. Go back into them. Get names, addresses, facts. I am not committed to Miss Kent's case, but we'll see. Be a tribute I pay for your weakness for a pretty face. <laughs> Rodman and Gloria Kent were gone, however. So all I had were the few facts they'd given me before they met Wolf. I felt guilty about that when he came back into the office and sat down in his specially built chair. He closed his eyes and I glared at him. Well, how much of you is awake? Mr. Wolf? Uh. Well, they disappeared. Did you tell me you were going to help this girl just to get her out of the office or did you mean it? You're a gadfly. No, sir. No, sir. You made a promise and you're stuck with it. What did you get from Rodman? Name, address, occupation. He's a librarian, that's all. Very careless, Archie. You missed a significant point. Such as, uh... How did Rodman discover the letters he sold were being altered by forgery? And used for swindle. How did he locate the dupe, Mr. Kent? Uh, I guess you're right. I'll ask him next time. But uh, what about now? Are you going to get Gloria's money back? I assume you call Miss Kent Gloria solely in order to annoy me. It does. Stop it. Get Cross and Halleck. On my way. You'll find them at the Hotel Bogart. <laughs> Wrong, sir. According to my notes, their address is... Never mind their address. The Hotel Bogart is the headquarters for successful confidence tricksters. They celebrate their victories there while the money lasts. You will possibly find Cross and Halleck drinking whiskey or lunching... Probably both. I located Cross and Halleck in the hotel bar and lured them back to our place on 35th Street. Wolf was sitting behind his desk with his hands crossed on his impressive middle, at peace with his lunch and the world when I ushered them in. He sat bolt upright and scorched me with a look. Good afternoon, Mr. Wolf. The tall one's name is Cross, the short one is Halleck. They uh, want to help me invest my money. Gentlemen, Mr. Nero Wolf. Huh? Who? Nero Wolf? Hey, what is this? Confound you, Archie. How drunk are they? Not too drunk for business. Let's get out of here. Come on. Wait a minute. Chill, duck, decoy. You want me to keep him here, Mr. Wolf? Not by violence, Archie. Come back here, gentlemen. Unless you want seven years in the state penitentiary. Unless what? You got nothing on us, Wolf. Nothing. I have the Kent case. The Kent case? That's a laugh. We're sitting pretty, sitting pretty. You are not, sir. You imagine you possess legal immunity. Mr. Kent believes you are grotesque balderdash and will not sue for fraud. Miss Kent cannot sue because she is reluctant to accuse her father of wrongfully obtaining her money. Ergo, you think you are invulnerable. Now, listen. But you forget me. I'm a detective with a fee to earn. A big fee. Quiet, Archie. I am determined to get that fee. Therefore, as Miss Kent's agent, I can and will bring action against you. I'm indifferent to her tears or her father's disgrace. I'm indifferent to anything outside of money. You will return the $10,000 to me at once, sir, or you'll be in jail by morning. You mean that? I do, Mr. Cross. Alec, come here. Come on, honey. Uh, okay. Here, Mr. Wolf. Alec and I have decided we don't want to get in any trouble with you. Here's your ten grand. Uh, let's have it. Give the dough to Kent, Mr. Wolf, and get the letters and map back for us. You've got a reputation for being tricky, but honest. We trust you. Come on, Alec, let's go. <laughs> well, how about that? Preposterous. No, sir. Take a look. Ten thousand dollars. Genuine coin of the realm. That man crosses a fool. Does he imagine I am to be fooled so easily? What do you mean he left the money? He surrendered too quickly, Archie. Too easily. And that money in the envelope he was carrying all ready to refund. Why? Well, maybe he's got a better sucker. I heard him mention a Ben Sanford. Nonsense. Does he need Kent's forged letters and map to cheat this Ben Sanford? Couldn't he prepare another set? Uh, I guess you're right. Something's fishy. In any event, it's no concern of mine, thank heaven. Uh, why not? I'm not committed to Miss Kent in any way. As a favor to you, I undertook to regain her money. I have done that. You may take it back to her and obtain the forged papers in return. But, uh... Silence, Mr. Goodwin. Go to your redhead charmer. Leave me in peace. I intend to spend this afternoon with my new world atlas. <laughs> Oh, 
I left him 3,000 miles up the Amazon with his magnifying glass and drove up to East 69th Street. The Kent house was a broken-down little brownstone, and as I went up the stoop, the door opened and Gloria Kent burst out like a skyrocket. Hey, Miss Kent, easy, easy. Let go of me. Let go. What's wrong? What's wrong? Wrong. Wrong. Nothing is wrong. Nothing at all. Well, how about seeing your father? You want to see my father? Come inside. Oh, for the love of heaven. Come inside, Mr. Gooden. I'll introduce you. He's in a back room. Come right through the living room. What else came through this living room? A hurricane? No, Mr. Goodwin. Something else. There's my father, Mr. Goodwin. What in the devil? He's dead. His throat's cut. Father, this is Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. He and his boss refused to help while they could. Maybe he can help you now. Stop it. All I'm good for now is revenge. That's all, Stop Archie. it. Stop it and look at me. When did it happen? I don't know. When did you find him? Just now. Keep looking at me. Who went through this house like a hurricane? You? No. Where did you go after you left the office? To the laboratory. What lab? Document research. The place that checked the map. How long were you there? Until an hour ago. I was with Mr. Rodman. Keep looking at me. And then? I had lunch. With Rodman? Alone. And then I came home. All right. All right, now listen to me. I want you to go to Mr. Wolf's uh, house right now. Have you got cab there? Yes. All right, take a cab. I've got to stay here, but I'll call Mr. Wolf and tell him you're on the way. Now, get. I called Wolf, told him everything, and he instructed me to advise Inspector Kramer, who arrived with the homicide squad. I gave the inspector everything while the squad photographed and measured, print dusted and detected. At 3.30, Kramer took me back to the house on 35th Street for a fight with Wolf. It's a great story, Wolf. Great. Kent buys a phony treasure map. Everybody knows it's phony except Kent. But Cross and Halleck try to buy it back, and Kent gets himself murdered. Did you find the map and letters in the house, Inspector? No, no, I didn't. The killer was after the map. The phony map? Certainly. Why? Well, if we knew that, we would know why Cross and Halleck so willingly paid back the money and why Kent was murdered. Maybe it's not phony. I'd better see the girl now. Oh, you fancy her for the murder? Well, I'll know after I ask a few questions. Tonight. She's had a shock, Mr. Kramer. She needs rest. Look, Wolf, I want her. Why bother with her when there's so much to be done? Yes, such as? Cross and Halleck, find them. And the mystery man they spoke of, Ben Sanford. These are the men you want now, not this poor, overwrought girl. Yeah. All right. The girl will be here for questioning tonight, though, huh? Tonight, Mr. Kramer. Okay. You'll hear from me later on. <laughs> well, you buffaloed him out of that, okay. Say, uh, why don't you want her questioned? Is she guilty? I don't know. Well, what did she say when she got here? She said nothing. She never arrived. She never what? She never arrived. Well, then why did you tell Kramer she was resting? Would he have believed the truth? <laughs> she must be found. More important, we must learn why forged letters... And forge map of producer's turmoil. Find the killer and you find the map. You said so. I said the reverse, which is an altogether different statement. Archie, I want a photograph of that map. Get it. Oh, sure, sure. Any particular camera you want me to use? You'll find a photograph of 200 Vanderbilt Street. Are you kidding? The lab cannot check the authenticity of old papers without photographing them in ultraviolet light, infrared light, and so on. If this document research lab has examined those papers, they will have photographs. Get them. He got out of his chair and waddled back to the house elevator. It was four o'clock and time for his regular afternoon session with the orchids. I drove down to the document research laboratory on Vanderbilt and got such a shock that I grabbed the office phone and dialed Wolf at once. Mr. Wolf, Archie here. What's the matter? Are you lost? No, sir. No, sir, but I found something. Photographs? No, Mr. Wolf. I don't think you'll ever see any photographs of the Kent map. I don't think any were taken. Indeed. But uh, guess who runs the document research laboratory? No, 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 no. Don't guess. You probably know. A man named Ben Sanford, and he's sitting right here looking at me. Bring him home with you. Home? 
but it's four in the afternoon. This is the sacred hour when you pray over your orchids. And Mr. Sanford can join the ceremony. Hey, how about this place? How about it? There must be a million flowers up here. <laughs> no, not flowers. Orchids only. Mr. Wolf has 10,000 plants. <whistles> never saw anything like it. And you never will again, brother. Hey, uh, what, uh, what kind is that on the bench? Oh, that. That's our pride and joy. Oh, don't it go some Harianum. Above them, the Van Petersirana, and the pink ones are the Silogiani uh, Pandoratas. Now, the large object, mulching flower pots, is Nero Wolf. Mr. Wolf, Ben Sanford. Good afternoon, sir. Hi. I came along to be obliging. I've got nothing to say about anything. How much have you offered Cross and Halleck for their treasure map? No comment. Mr. Sanford, I'm going to make some assumptions. I assume that you are not, in fact, a document expert, but an accessory to the fraud of Halleck and Cross. No comment. And you actually prepare fraudulent maps for those swindlers. And then in the guise of an expert, guarantee their authenticity. No comment. But this you must answer. You did guarantee the authenticity of the map and let us can't bought. It's on record. All right, I did. Then will you admit they were forged? What, are you a comic? No. You guarantee the value of the Kent map? Yes. As an expert? Yes. Then you've convicted yourself of murder. Murder? What is this? Mr. Kent was murdered, sir. Evidently for the map and letters he bought. But of all persons involved, you alone believe in the value of the map. No one else does. Therefore, you alone would have murdered Kent for the map. For the love of... Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> Chew it over, brother. Chew it over. Either way, he's got you. Okay. Okay, you... You want me to level? Here it is. Level, Hucky. Okay, boss. Thief-type talk. It means tell the truth. It's like you say, the letters were bought from Rodman. I forged the map and evidence on them. I guarantee them to Kent, the swindle. The letters are without value? Oh, sure, they're old, that's all, from 1851. Just tired family gossip and stuff. Indeed. There we have the problem again, Archie. Mr. Kent is swindled with a map and letters that are known to be worthless. He alone believes the fantasy of the treasure. There isn't any treasure, never was. Yet Cross and Halleck refunded the swindle money so eagerly. It is obvious they want those worthless documents back badly. Someone else wants them so bad he murders Mr. Kent. Why? I don't know. Ah, uh, gee, we must find the girl. There's a chance she turned to Mr. Rodman for refuge. I'm sorry you'll have to go there at once. If the girl isn't there, bring Rodman. Yes? Hello, Rodman. Remember me? I'm Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Oh. Oh, yes, of course. I came to get Gloria Kent. There's been a change in plans. Tell her to come out, please. Gloria? Well, she's not here. Why should she be? Haven't you heard? Heard what? Well, I guess you'd better come down and see Wolf. Uh, Mr. Goodwin, I'm afraid I can't. I'm rather busy. Look, Rodman, maybe you ought to know. Old man Kent was murdered. What? Yes, yes, just after you and Gloria left us. Kent murdered? Well, I... But this is awful, Mr. Goodwin. You it's... want to see Mr. Wolf now? Get your hat. Murder. Well, believe me, I never wanted this. I, I'm going to tell Nero Wolf the whole mess. Every word of it. Okay, then. Come on, let's go. Oh, yes, of course. Just a minute. I'll get my hat in the bedroom. Murdered? Kent. I never dreamed. Oh. Come on, Rodman. Come on, Rodman. Come on. What? I didn't hear you. Oh, Rodman. What the... Oh, Rodman. Oh, Rodman. Good Lord. What next? Come on, come on. This is Nero Wolf. Archie here. We've had a tough break. Yes? While I was waiting for Rodman at the front door, he went into the bedroom for his hat. The killer was there. How do you know? He cut Rodman's throat. Kill the back window was open. It's a ground floor apartment. He was out and gone before I had a chance. Archie, where were your wits? Let me alone. I've had a man murdered 20 feet from me. You think I'm cheering? Mr. Kramer is here, and he has news for us, Archie. He could not locate Cross and Halleck in their apartment. They had not been home all day. 
The maid informed him that she was waiting for her weekly salary. Well, so what? She was most angry and peppery, Mr. Kramer informs me. Red pepper? Exactly. Okay. Okay, maybe I know what you mean. I'll try to deliver the goods this time. Goodbye. I drove down to the apartment house on Gramercy Square where Cross and Halleck lived, took the elevator up to the 10th floor, found the right door, and slipped in with a pass key. Come on out. Come out wherever you are. I know you're in here. You fooled Kramer pretending to be the maid, but you didn't fool Wolf. You'd better... Sorry! Cut it out! Cut it out, you idiot! Lay off! No. Archie, Archie, you don't Archie Goodwin from Nero Wolf's office. Remember me? Go. Give me the gun, Gloria. Give it to me. Oh, that's right. Who, uh, who did you think I was? Alec. Oh, brilliant. So Wolf figured you out, huh? Oh, you are a brave girl. They killed your father. You came up here and waited for them. You were going to kill them right back, huh? Oh, that red-headed temper. And you bluffed Kramer into thinking you were the maid. I had to do something. It was the only thing I could think of. To come here and kill him. Well, you're coming home with Archie. And just remember one thing. When Wolf's working for you, don't try to do any thinking. It only gets in Wolf's way. I got Gloria Kent back to the house at 7 o'clock. I parked the car, brought her into the office, and got the shock of my life. There was a convention on. Wolf was there with Inspector Kramer representing the cops. Cross, Halleck, and Sanford were there representing the crooks. When Kramer saw Gloria, he scowled first at her and then at Wolf. So it was a slick one after all, Wolf. You didn't have the girl. You had no intention of producing her. Please, Mr. Kramer, that can wait. There are other matters more important. I dine at eight. That leaves me one hour to solve your murders. Murders? More than one? Yes, two. Elmer Rodman. But I haven't good one if you... Please, Mr. Kramer, not now. First, Miss Kent. Good evening, Miss Kent. I presume you have met these gentlemen, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford? I... I... Yeah, I'll take your purse, please. What? Well, why? I... No, don't think me as naive as Mr. Goodwin, Miss. When you left your home after the murder of your father, you took the map and letters with you. They are in your purse well, now. That's true. Archie, the purse. Thank you. We have here an interesting situation. There exists some old letters and map, forged and fraudulent. They're worth $10,000 and more to Cross and Halleck, and worth two murders to a killer. Why? There must be something of great value in the letters. Yes, such as? Something which Mr. Sanford could not see, although he worked on the document closely. Yet something which could be made manifest. What is the answer, Miss Kent? You know it? I swear I don't. Secret writing, Archie. Bring the chafing dish from the dining room. Right. Secret writing? I saw nothing when I worked on those letters. Naturally, Mr. Sandberg, the writing is invisible. The heat is an agent. It makes most forms of secret writing visible. The chafing dish, boss. Thank you, Archie. Place it before me and light it. Right. Now I open Miss Kent's purse. From it, you see, I withdraw these ancient letters which he took from her house. After her father's murder. That's not true. Archie. That's enough, Gloria. That's enough. From now on, you just listen. We remove the letters from the envelope and toast them gently. The secret ink, vintage 1851, will easily succumb to the agency of heat. Careful. Those envelopes will catch fire. Uh, hey, hey, hey. They're caught. Don't be upset, Mr. Cross, Mr. Halleck. The envelopes. Uh. They will burn safely in the dish. We can concentrate on the writing. Watch closely. I don't want to be accused of trickery. You fat fool. The envelopes are everything. Put them out, Sanford. Don't sit there. Put them out. Why, Mr. Haddock? Well, the stamps, the missionaries, they're worth a fortune. The missionary? Of course. You know that. Mr. Cross knows. So does Mr. Sanford, right? Yeah, yeah. Of course, Sanford knows, you old fool. Let me... Uh, Mr. Sanford is not alarmed. Why not, sir? I don't know what you're talking about. Fifty or a hundred thousand dollars is burning before your eyes, Mr. Sanford. Cross and Halleck are burning their fingers, putting out the flaming envelopes. And you sit there quite indifferently. Why? 
Well, I... I... You know the value of the missionary stamps on the letters you bought from Rodman. But you know these aren't the real letters. Isn't that it? Not the real letters? I told you I'm tough to crack, Wolf. You didn't fool me with those dummies. Dummies? How do you know? Mr. Cross didn't know. Mr. Haddock didn't know. How did you? Well, I... uh... I'll tell you, sir. Only one man could know I was framing Miss Kent as a decoy. Only one man could know I prepared these dummy letters and pretended to take them from her purse. And that is the killer. The man who murdered her father and stole the map and letters this morning. You, sir, Mr. Sanford. Well, I'll be... Mr. Kramer, there's your killer. You'll find the missing map and letters on him or concealed in his home or office. You won't need the evidence anyway. Look at his face. He's self-confessed. Self-confessed like fun? He was booby-trapped. No, Mr. Crane. Not a complicated case, really. Very simple. Elmer Rodman sold a packet of old family letters to the swindlers for a small sum. They used the letters to perpetrate their fraud on Miss Kent's father. And the stamps on the letters were valuable? They were a special Hawaiian issue 1851, Miss Kent. Nicknamed missionaries, because missionaries used them for writing home. They are extremely rare stamps worth upward of $25,000 each. Hey, no wonder they were worth two murders. We found five of them on Sanford. Excellent. Somewhere or other, Rodman discovered the value of the stamps after he sold the letters. In his effort to get them back, he communicated his discovery to the swindlers, Cross, Halleck, and Sanford. So that's why they refunded the money so fast. Precisely. In an effort to have the sale rescinded. Rodman sought out Kent and tried to convince him of the fraud. Alas, he would not listen to the truth, Mr. Kramer. Oh, I get it. And while the others were hassling around, Sanford tried to steal a march and quietly resorted to murder. Ah, uh, there you have it. Ha-ha! Great job, boss, great job. So Gloria not only gets her ten grand back, but uh, five times twenty-five, which is about a hundred and twenty-five thousand worth of goodies... Now, figuring your rates by the hour, that means you've done a gratis job worth about... Yes, um... Ken. I did not know what I demand a large fee for what I've done. I will not go back on my word. But I can beg for a favor. I'll only be too happy to... Wait, wait, wait. I asked something that would not be easy to grant. What is it? Will you use your red hair, your pretty face, your admirable figure, and your ample fortune to lure Mr. Goodwin away from this house tonight... I would like to enjoy my dinner in peace. Oh, that won't be difficult, Mr. Wolf. <laughs> Let's have an understanding right now, Gloria. Difficult for you or for me? I'll be delighted. <laughs> Indeed. To spend an evening with Mr. Goodwin, there is only one word for you, Miss Kent. Intrepid. You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's story by Alfred Bester was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout, produced by Edwin Fadiman, and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Wally Mayer as Archie Goodwin, and Gene Bates, Howard McNair, Jay Novello, Larry Dobkin, Bill Johnstone, and Herb Vigran. Music by Joseph Enos. Next week, at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Careworn Cup. Don Stanley speaking. The preceding was transcribed. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The chimes ring for Dennis Day and Judy Canova tomorrow night on NBC. Also, Judy Canova prepares to go operatic tomorrow because her special guest is Itzio Pinza. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The man called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. Saturday Night Chimes on NBC mean a full hour of fun with Dennis Day and Judy Canova. Dennis always appears perplexed and bewildered. But one thing that doesn't perplex him is how to make a popular ballad come to life in his thrilling tenor voice. And there's music also on the Judy Canova show, plus comedy in the mischievous Canova manner. That's Judy Canova and Dennis Day, tomorrow night over most NBC stations. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, 
The fattest and the laziest, the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolfe. It's the transcribed adventure of The Case of the Careworn Cuff with that brilliant, eccentric private detective, orchid fancier, and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolfe, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> The place is Nero Wolfe's office. At the moment, the world's greatest motionless detective is sitting in the chair which was built especially to support his 300 pounds. His eyes are closed, and he's making sounds through his nose. Archie. Archie. Archie! Yes, Mr. Wolf, what is it? The phone, if you please, Mr. Goodwin. But it's on your desk, only eight and three-quarter inches from your left elbow. All you have to do is lean forward. Found it, Archie. What do you think I am, an athlete? Hello. No, wrong number, mister. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Wolf, if that old phone awakened you. Wrong number, and I was not asleep. I was merely uh, concentrating. On what? We're out of work. There's nothing to concentrate on. May have escaped your errant attention, Archie. But there are other subjects for thought besides murder. Mm-hmm. Sure, blondes. And blondes. You're right at that, brunettes. Phooey. That's not a nice thing to say about any girl, even if she does happen to be a brunette. Archie. Yes, sir? Go away. You annoy me. Suppose I did. It would get your beer for you. Fritz. Tonight happens to be Fritz's night off. However, you can always get your beer for yourself. Don't be an idiot. There are exactly 23 steps between here and the kitchen. As you very well know, I abominate strenuous physical activity. 23 steps times two is 46. You could walk very slow. Nonsense. Now that you mention it, to... <clears throat> I happen to be mildly thirsty, Archie, would you? Now that I mention it, you'd better let the beer go for tonight. Why? Our stock is running low. You mean careless? I've been careful, because something else is also running low. What? Money? Fiddlesticks, there's plenty in the bank. Sure, but very little of it is yours. Mr. Wolf, do you remember that batch of orchids you bought last week? Of course I do, magnificent and very rare specimen. I got a magnificent bill for him this morning, too. It was uh, large? It was large. Mm -hmm. Confound it, Archie, I shall have to do some work. You turned down half a dozen cases in the last few weeks. One of them may still require me. Most of them hired other detectives. However, there is a Mr. Wenceslas who might still be in need. His problem is what? As I remember, he's being followed by midgets. <laughs> he wanted you to do something about it. Not, not that he minded the midgets so much. It was the elephants they were riding. The man needs a psychiatrist, not a detective. Anyone else? I can check my files, but I don't think... Aha! Saved by the bell. Another cliche like that, and I shall... Answer the phone yourself? Assassinate. You see what it is. Okay. Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf is in. Yes, he'll be in. He always is. What? But... Hmm. That was a Mr. Charles Porter. He was in a hurry. He's on his way over right now. Should be here in ten minutes. Prospective client, I trust? A thousand dollars worth of prospective client. Splendid, Archie, my beer. Okay, but, uh, <clears throat> look, I'm not sure you're going to accept his offer. Indeed, what does he want me to do for his paltry fee? That's the point. If I heard him right, he wants you to do nothing. The door, Archie. Yes, sir. I hear it. Mr. Porter? Naturally, I'm Charles Porter. Who else would I be? It's a large field. Uh, never mind. Come on in. I'm Archie Goodwin. Where is Wolf? Mr. Wolf is in here. Mr. Wolf, this is Mr. Porter. Good evening. Fat, aren't you? It's moderately noticeable. Out your chair for Mr. Porter. Don't bother. I'm too impatient to sit. When I have business to take care of, I take care of it quickly. Very well. Send him out of the room. Mr. Goodwin, nonsense. He's my assistant. He remains. I don't like it. 
Archie, show Mr. Porter out. Now, wait. There's no need to get temperamental. Perhaps I'm a little abrupt. Rude. I'm a worried man. And impatient. You're wasting time, Mr. Porter. I suppose I am. The reason I came to you... Young man, what are you doing with that notebook? Getting ready to make marks in it. But... No, never mind. Mr. Wolfe, you have a client named Dorothy Spencer. Have I? There's no need to be coy about it. I happen to know. Then you know. I want you to drop her. Drop her? Refuse to handle her case. Close the books on her. You know what I mean. Why should I? The girl has no money. I have. That doesn't answer my question. Perhaps this will. Appear to be a small package of dollar bills. It happens to be a thousand dollars. Archie, will you? I will. It is a thousand dollars. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Yes? You're paying me a thousand dollars in order that I refuse to act for Miss Spencer. Nothing more. That's right. What does she suspect you of? I said nothing about... Well, that is... You must know that as well as I do. Possibly. Nevertheless, what does she suspect you of? Uh, Being a blackmailer. Whereas your occupation really is... I'm a musician. Pianist. I'm appearing nightly at the Windsor Hotel. Archie, have you made out a receipt for Mr. Porter? Yep. Give it to him and show him to the door. Okay. Mr. Porter? Mr. Wolf, I want your assurance that the entire affair is definitely finished. My association with Miss Spencer, you mean? You have my assurance that it is. You will forgive a classical illusion. The Carver. Thank you. Good night. Mr. Wolf, I have a secret about Mr. Porter. He <laughs> smells. Some perfume or other. More important, his right coat cuff is more worn than his left cuff. And a cough happens to be a musical term, meaning start again from the beginning. Oh, Porter thought it meant finished. Therefore, Mr. Porter is a liar. His ignorance of common musical term indicates that he's not a musician. The worn right coat cuff that he is an office worker. That's kind of leaping to a deduction. But even if Porter's a liar, Mr. Wolf, there is something else. He, uh, he paid you $1,000 to drop a client named Dorothy Spencer. Mr. Wolf, you never had a client with that name. <laughs> that. Dorothy Spencer is not in. Anyway, she's not answering her phone. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I said... I know what you said. Ah. That a comment? I'm worried. Mr. Porter may have assumed erroneously that Dorothy Spencer had employed or was intending to employ me. That does not explain why he lied about his occupation. Maybe he didn't lie. After all, your deductions could be wrong. Phew. Okay. Take care of that. Right now. I'm phoning her. Hello. Uh, Windsor Hotel? Get me the manager's office. Thanks. Ah, uh, could, could, could you tell me if a Charles Porter plays the piano? It's. Uh huh. She sounds blonde. I see. Thanks a lot. What do you do after work? You... Oh, not so long. She goes home and beats her husband. About Porter, Archie. Bad news. He does play the piano at the Windsor in the move room. So where does that leave your deductions? Untouched, of course. Let me think. Hmm. Yes, naturally. Naturally what? I came to the conclusion that Mr. Porter was an office worker. We have just discovered that Mr. Porter is not an office worker, therefore... You were wrong. I am never wrong. Therefore, the man who is here is not Charles Porter. Mr. Wolf, do you think a man of your weight should climb out on a limb like that? Fiddlesticks. Look up Porter in the phone book and call him. Okay. I'll take a second. Uh-huh. Archie, the phone company's best friend. <clears throat> yep, here he is. What do I ask him? Um, there'll be no need to ask Mr. Porter anything, just phone. You're the boss. Yeah. I have to say something to the guy. Hello, I'd like to speak to Charles Porter. So would you. Who is... 
Oh, Stebbins, huh? Yeah, that's right, Archie. Oh. No, no, don't, don't, don't bother why I call it a coincidence. Goodbye. You know who that was? No. That was Sergeant Stebbins, Sergeant Pearly Stebbins. I might add, as though you didn't know, that Stebbins happens to be a sergeant in homicide. Indeed. You expected this. I still don't know what your conversation was about. It was about Charles Porter, who maybe was a liar, but who isn't going to tell any more lies, on account of he was just shot to death. Well, well, if it ain't Archie Goodwin. Come in, Goodwin. Thank you, Sergeant Stebbins. I've been expecting you. Oh, that's sweet of you to say that, Pearlie. <laughs> Why did you phone Porter? His right coat cuff was more worn out than his left. So for that, you had to kill him? No, actually, I killed him because he didn't know his duck couple. Hey. Yeah, hey. He don't look good anymore, eh? Guys who stop bullets with their face never look good. Pearlie, you've been robbed. I did. Hmm. That corpse is not Porter. <laughs> now, relax, Goodwin, relax. His fingerprints were on file and they check. His girlfriend says he's Porter. If he could get up and talk, he'd tell you he was Porter. And what makes you think he isn't? Well, because when he visited us earlier tonight, he looked different. Not much, but... You said girlfriend? Yes, I said girlfriend. She's in the next room mopping up. She kind of broke down when we brought her here. You brought her here? Now, don't tell me what her name is. Why shouldn't I? It's Spencer. Dorothy Spencer. Ooh, that's what I was afraid of. Sergeant, I... Oh. Ignore him. He comes with the woodwork. His name is Goodwin, Miss Spencer. Archie Goodwin. Find what you were looking for? What I was looking... Somebody's gone through this place like a minor league hurricane. You? What business is it of Of mine? None, maybe. On the other hand, Nero Wolf might have other ideas. Matter of fact, I'm sure he'd have. Miss Spencer, why don't you go see him? The address is 601 West 35th Street. I don't see why... You want your boyfriend's murderer found, don't you? Now listen, Goodwin, the police are working on this. Sure, they'll see to it nobody harms a corpse. Goodbye, Miss Spencer. Don't forget that address, 601 West 35th Street. Believe it or not, you used to be a client of ours. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you're getting to be so brilliant, it's boring. Boy. <laughs> That is, um... Uh... All right, tonight you deserve it. I'll get you another can of beer. But this is the last one. Unless you promise to do some exercise, like, uh... Like maybe standing up and sitting down five minutes a day. Thank you. <laughs> and why should I indulge in such idiotic behavior? Well, after a while, you might be able to see your shoes. I've already seen them. Oh, that was 20 years ago. Things had changed. No more buttons. Hey, that must be Dorothy Spencer. Hmm, she's undoubtedly young and beautiful. You deduced that from the way she pressed the buzzer? I deduced that from the gleam in your eye, bah. Bah, all you want. I'm going to keep that gleam shining. Hello, Miss Spencer. Come in. Thank you. Mr. Wolf. Is the large sitting down gentleman behind the desk? This is Dorothy Spencer, Mr. Wolf. You will forgive me not rising. It is due to a necessary conservation of energy rather than rudeness. Archie, a chair. Sure. Here you are, Miss Spencer. Thanks. Now then, Miss Spencer, have the police found anything but dust in Mr. Porter's closet? I... no. You were engaged to Mr. Porter? I was. That ring you're wearing, he gave it you? Yes. May I see it? Well... All right. Here. Thank you. Hmm, expensive. Very expensive. You may have it back. Miss Spencer, why are you marrying Charles Porter? I, I loved him. Hooey. Mr. Porter, according to Archie's description, was twice your age with considerably less than half your attractiveness. Love may perhaps be blind, but it is not astigmatic. I, I don't know what you mean. What were you searching for under the nose of the police? Nothing. Nothing at all. How did your fiancé earn his money? He played the piano at the... Boy, what he earned there in a year wouldn't begin to pay for the ring he gave you. Would you like to try again? I don't know how he made his money. I suggest that you do. I suggest that he earned money by the same method that he induced you to consider marrying him. Blackmail. Oh, but... Why was he blackmailing you? Old letters I'd written when I was too young to know any better. Your motives for murdering Porter would be twofold then. 
recovery of blackmail material, and the avoidance of marriage to a man you dislike. I didn't kill Charles. No doorbell, Archie. Get Miss Spencer into the kitchen once. Must be the police. Yeah, let's go, Miss Spencer. Right through that door. And stay there until I call you. Front door, Archie. Now, Mr. Wolf, do I know Dorothy Spencer's here? You know nothing. A simple role for you to play. Uh, I haven't got time to resent that insult right now, but wait until the next time you drop a collar button. Well, bless my soul, if it isn't dear old Inspector Kramer. How is the homicide department? Where's Wolf? Big surprise. He's sitting. Mr. Wolf. Good evening, Inspector. Where's Dorothy Spencer? This is not the Bureau of Missing Persons. The district attorney would like to talk to her. I should tell her so the next time we meet. Yeah, that could be right now. She's in this house. I don't see her. Mind if I look around for myself? You have a search warrant, of course. Well, it so happens, no, but... Uh... Archie, the inspector's leaving. Okay, I'm leaving. I suppose by the time I get back with a warrant, she'll be in Hoboken. Hoboken? Where's that? Look, Wolf, you can go too far. One of these days, you won't be able to talk yourself out of a... I... Ah... Trail me to the door, Goodwin, to show what a good detective you are. Oh, Inspector Kramer doesn't love us anymore. Unfortunate. Archie, take Miss Spencer to a respectable hotel. Register her under an assumed name. She is to stay there until notified otherwise. Luckily, the good inspector neglected to inform us that she was the leading suspect in a murder case. Hence, we are not accessories after the fact. And I don't want her arrested for murder as yet. Her beauty has won you over. Oh, you will then return here immediately. Okay. What are you going to be doing in the meanwhile? I, Archie, uh, shall be thinking. Hmm. Archie? No. No, not Archie. Ah, our impatient and non-musical friend came in through the window. How are you, Mr... Not Porter, of course. Where's the girl? Question is beginning to bore me. I don't know. I think she's here. So did the police. I might add that they were slightly closer to the truth. Incidentally, what makes you think she was Porter's accomplice? She must have been. Nonsense, she wasn't. Porter was blackmailing her. Just as he was blackmailing you. In her case, it was letters. In yours, a previous criminal record, perhaps, that your employers might be interested in. I want to know where she is. Maybe this would help you remember. Good heavens, don't point a pistol at me. It annoys me. Ah, the police, I should think, open the door for them like a good fellow. Oh, no. I'm leaving. But if I don't find that girl, I'll be back. Knock the bastard thing down if it isn't open. All right, well, I've got the search warrant. Also, no doubt, a fine tooth comb. Bah. By the way, Inspector. All right, boys, cover the house. All right, Inspector. Yeah, what did you want? As your men go through the house, will you have one of them shut the back window? I've just had a burglar, and I suspect he left it open. Unless the matter is attended to, the house might be filled with <laughs> fresh air. Yeah, what's the matter with that? Fresh air, deadly poison. It clogs the lungs. And may I point out that the warrant you're clutching in your hot little hand is not a lease on the house. Finish your search quickly, if you please, and then... Uh, <laughs> why not try hobo? So I just missed the inspector, huh? You did? That I can stand. I'm sorry about the burglar, though. Perhaps we can arrange to have you meet him in the morning. He left his calling card with name and address on it? He dropped his handkerchief here on my desk. Oh. Hmm. It's a handkerchief. It smells. <laughs> so it does. But, um... All of our unknown friends' clothes carry the odor. Therefore... Yeah? You will go out immediately to the nearest drugstore, buy a specimen of every cake of soap manufactured in this country. Mr. Wolf? He's there. No. I never realized just how many different brands of soap were made in this country. You should listen to the radio more often. So far, we've sniffed at 37 cakes. None of them smell like porter. Uh, let's see. 38. 
Hey, let me have it, Archie. Yes, the soap. Ah, it's labeled orchid ovals. I should say basically mislabeled. Orchids have no odor. Our task for the evening is finished. Why? All we know is the guy washes with a basely mislabeled soap. No, the odor would not have been so persistent in that case. Unquestionably, our visitor works for a soap company that makes orchid ovals. Every employee of a plant in which perfume in large quantities is used inevitably carries the odor on his clothes. Oh. And you already deduced he works in an office. Uh Uh-huh. Ah. I I go see him in the morning? You do? (laughs) You know, Mr. Wolfock, with hiring rooms for girls and paying visits to a perfume factory, I'm beginning to feel like a maiden aunt. No one would ever mistake you for a maiden aunt, Archie. Thanks. Is that another deduction? Maiden aunts rarely need a shave. <laughs> Park Elbow, good morning. One moment, please. Oh, can I do anything for you, sir? Yeah. That is, uh, <clears throat> let's postpone that question and slip in another one. I'm, I'm looking for one of your office people. A in his 40s, 5 foot 10, brown hair and eyes, speaks in a sharp, quick voice. He owes and... you money, too. Uh, who owes me money? Mr. Wheeler, the man you were describing. He owes everybody money. In spite of the fact that he's office manager and makes lots and lots of money. How much does he owe you? Hmm? Oh, not, not an awful lot. It won't break me if I don't get it. Is he in yet? Well, he was, but he went home. He was sort of sick. Sort of? Mm. He got a phone call from somebody and rushed out. Mm, too bad. Well, I'd better scram. Well, you didn't answer my question yet. I'm off at five. My name's Gwen. Goodbye. Wolf speaking. Archie here. Our unknown's name is Wheeler. He left the office this morning sick after he got a mysterious phone call. Bad, probably. Get to Dorothy Spencer at once and bring her here. Right. I'm at Wheeler's house now. Thought I'd better check. His wife's here, too. Blonde? Uh-huh. How could you tell? Fetch your smirk in your voice. Get out of there fast and don't stop to console Mrs. Wheeler. <laughs> Huh. Nobody home. Shut that door behind you, Goodwin. What? Never mind pulling triggers. I'll shut it. Oh, Archie. I would prefer silence. Keep your hands high, Goodwin. It's unhealthy. All the blood had run into my head. Archie, he murdered Charles. He did. Tart, Mr. Wheeler. You really shouldn't have it. It's against the law. Get into the bathroom, both of you. I already shaved. I phoned him. I thought maybe he had my letters. Porter couldn't keep his mouth shut about his other victims. He was going to force Dorothy to marry him. Did you find his material, Wheeler? Yes. In an office. He read it as a front. It's all burned. Now why all the melodrama? You know about me, so does she. I can't trust anyone. Get into the bathroom, I said. Look, let's not lose our heads about this. Get moving, Goodwin. I like it here. All right, then. Here is where you'll get it. Hey, 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 wait, wait, wait a minute. Something's wrong. I got shot and Wheeler fell down. I shot him, Goodwin. Stebbins. Dear Sergeant Stebbins. Oh, you little flat-footed angel. (laughs) It's lucky for you my flat feet got staked out here in time. Just for that, I'll buy you a pair of arch supports for your next birthday, but... I'm beginning not to believe this. You had it all figured out? Well, not exactly. Well, that is... Ah, I, uh... Wolf sent you here. Well, he kind of phoned in and suggested one of us shoot down here and do some rescue work. <laughs> that old devil. Hey, you're not kidding. <laughs> what are you laughing about? <laughs> Wolf wasn't sure whether you'd need rescuing from Wheeler or... <laughs> Stop killing yourself with your own jokes. <laughs> or whether Miss Spencer would need rescuing from you. <laughs> You've been a very foolish young woman, Miss Spencer. I suggest that in the future you exercise more care in your correspondence. Oh, I shall, Mr. Wolf, but how can I ever thank you? Well, one one way would be to listen wide-eyed while he explains how he solved the case. I have no intention. Oh, come on, Mr. Wolf. Stop stalling. Please, Mm. Mr. Wolf. Well, uh, 
I'd be very happy to. As a matter of fact, I'd like to see anyone try to stop me. <laughs> a man came to me, offered me $1,000 to drop a client I didn't have. Why? Because obviously he wished to direct my attention to that client. Me? You, Miss Spencer. Now then, he identified himself as Charles Porter, a musician. But I tested him and discovered that he knew nothing of music. Ha! Huh? The da capo routine. Precisely. Therefore, he was an imposter. His purpose? Yeah? To indicate by no means subtly that enmity existed between Porter and Dorothy Spencer. Huh? Thus, when Porter was found murdered, I would presumably be convinced that Dorothy Spencer, balked in her effort to enlist my aid against Porter, had resorted to most foul and bloody murder. Most foul and bloody murder is very fancy, Dorothy. Shows he likes you. Oh. I thereupon ask myself, why should an unknown seek to convince me that Dorothy Spencer was Porter's murderer? And you answered yourself? One reason only, because he himself intended to murder Porter. As he did. For which peccadillo he has, thanks to Sergeant Stebbins' accuracy with a revolver, already paid with his own life. Quadirap demonstrandum. Latin for that's what you wanted to know. I think you're wonderful, Mr. Wolf, and I'm going to... Ah, be careful. Kiss you. Hmm, Archie, Miss Spencer is a very dangerous young woman. Today I feel brave. Do you, Archie? Very brave. What are you doing tonight? Nothing. Let's do it together. Bah. Oh, is that Mr. Wolf? I said bah. Would you very much mind conducting your romance elsewhere? I would not. And do so at once. I have a very important matter to attend to. Goodbye, Mr. Wolf. Goodbye. Night, sir. Very important. Very been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was based on the characters created by Rex Stout, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Lamont Johnson as Archie Goodwin, and Jane Webb, Peter Leeds, Bill Johnstone, and Wilms Herbert. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Dear Dead Lady. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. The NBC chimes are excited about the big show. An hour and a half every Sunday night with Tallulah Bankhead as Femme C. Comedy with stars like Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Jack Carson, Groucho Marx, and a host of others. Music with Meredith Wilson, Mindy Carson, and many more. It presents drama with Mr. Jose Ferrer and many more leading stars of Broadway and Hollywood. It's the big show. Starts Sunday, November 5th on NBC. This is Chester William Bendix Riley. The Man Called X follows on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf. This Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, and drama. The best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. All this and Tallulah, too. No wonder it's The Big Show. My boss is the smartest and the stubbornest, the fattest and the laziest, 
the cleverest and the craziest, the most extravagant detective in the world, Nero Wolf. It's the adventure of the case of the dear dead lady with that brilliant eccentric private detective, orchid fancier and gargantuan gourmet, Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Nero Wolf had just come downstairs, having tended to his precious orchids. He was, as usual, seated in the library, which served as the office. He had just dialed a phone number, and with his eyes closed, was leaning back in his specially built chair, which was big enough for two, but not two of him. Market, domestic and imported delicacies. Mr. Halsbrecher, this is Nero Wolf. Oh, oh, yeah, Mr. Wolf. I was just about to ring you. Well, when... I have need of two pounds of duck liver. Ah. I do not, of course, refer to the commercialized Strasbourg pate. Well, I appreciate the order, Mr. Wolf, but. Uh... Next, my cook Fritz informs me that we will require three fine fat geese. Look, Mr. Wolf. There's a little matter of an unpaid You bill. might add 12 cases of beer, a bushel of Vermont apples, green for stuffing, and a gallon of Marquisa Patrisa Roman oil. Mr. Wolf. In addition, I... Fritz has listed six dozen eggs, four braces of Sussex woodcock, and a few pounds of Westphalian ham. You have all that? Well, I, I can get it, Mr. Wolf, but my bookkeeper... Thanks te- very much, Mr. Halsbracker. That will be all. Yeah. <clears throat> Now then, Archie. Yes, boss? You seem to be worried. Oh, I am. This means naturally that I'm supposed to handle Haltzbrecher's delivery boy when and if he shows. I had thought of leaving that simple matter to you. And what about the simple matter of the money? Money? I I hate to bring up a vulgar subject, but where is it coming from? Oh, of course. You're right, Archie. I should have said... Said what? Charge it. Boss, look, you don't realize, I know, but we're into that truffle broker for 500-odd bucks and change. All right, all right, then give him a check. Okay. Okay, I will give him a check. And I hope they'll let you keep the orchids in your cell. You're a wit, Archie. Uh Uh-huh. You know, I'm on the bank's mailing list. We got a notice this morning. You don't mean... Oh, but I do. Again? Yeah, you just can't take money out of an account, boss. Sometimes you gotta put some in. This is the only way to deal with the man I work for, and if I hadn't thrown him that scare, he wouldn't have been willing to listen when the door buzzer rang, and a prosperous-looking young guy in the kind of clothes that don't grow on trees came in and stood in front of the boss's chair, fiddling with the brim of his pork pie. My name is Oliphant, Mr. Wolf. Oliphant? Uh, yes, sir, Oliphant. I am the spiritual leader and guiding head of a small religious group known as the Seekers of the Inner Power. Ah, I see. Also a man addicted to marrying neither wisely nor well, but often. You read the papers. I do. Uh, Mr. Wolf, I am as aware of my sin-ridden past as anyone else is. The point is that I'm no longer that kind of man. Even a person such as I can see the light in time. Good. Might I ask why you've come to see me, Mr. Oliphant? I need your help, Mr. Wolf. Concerning? A certain young lady with whom I'm deeply in love. Oh, I beg you not to confuse the present emotion with any of my earlier escapades. What I feel for Miss Dana is the pure and righteous glow of an upright seeker of the inner power. I promise to look on you as thoroughly redeemed, Mr. Oliphant. Proceed. Oh, by the way, do I recognize the name of your young lady as a Park Avenue socialite, an amateur swimming champion? Yes. But she's sweet, wonderful, beautiful. I've asked her to marry me, and she's given me some hope. In time, I fully expect to make her my wife. Well, then where's the problem? The problem is the presence of another man in her life. I'm sorry, sir. I'm a detective, not a matchmaker. This isn't a question of making a match, Mr. Wolf. I have much too much respect for your talents to think of offering you such an assignment. Exactly. What do you want me to do? I want you to save Ilse Dana's life. Her life? Mr. Wolf, this other man I spoke of is insanely jealous. Not only of Ilse's present, but of her past as well. 
He has threatened to kill her. I don't doubt your earnestness in this matter, Mr. Oliphant, but how would you know? I was listening on an extension in Miss Dana's apartment a few days ago when Hunter called. Hunter? Yes, sir. Jack Hunter. Known as Jack the Babe Hunter. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I know that canvas back. Huh? Sure. He's a coffee and cake prelim waltz. Oh, he's not. He's a boxer. Archie is being fancy. Overlook it, Mr. Oliphant. Is Hunter in love with this lady of yours? I doubt it. He's a man of complete moral and spiritual corruption, I believe. Naturally, you would. But what are the facts? In my opinion, he's after her for her money. She has money? To burn. And you, Mr. Oliphant? Me. Can you also afford to burn? How much do you want? The answer to that would be astronomical. However, if you leave a check for, say, $7,000, I shall look into your matter the very moment I have completed a little research into the nutrition of the Polynesian orchid. Elephant's check gave our bank account a slight blood transfusion. I think it was the boss's plan to spend a week or two in the plant room before he got busy on the case. And he'd have done it, too, if that phone call hadn't come in about a little after nine, just after Wolf had polished off one of Fritz's dinners and was settling back with a stein of beer in his hand. Don't disturb yourself, Archie. I'll get it. Now, well, look out. You don't strain yourself, boss. You got to straighten out an elbow to reach that receiver. You have an unfortunate flair for mixing humor with impertinence, my friend. Hello, Nero Wolf speaking. This is Elsa Dana, Mr. Wolf. How do you do, Miss Dana? We were discussing you only this morning. So I've heard. Through whom? Ted Oliphant. I see. The young man seemed to be quite worried about you. The young man should tend to his own affairs. Said you were in some danger. I know what he said. And not one word of it was true. Oh? Uh, I'd like to talk to you, Mr. Wolf. I'm sure it'll be an immense pleasure. Where do you live? I have an apartment at uh, 22 Blanton Street. Could you be here soon? I could be there in a quarter of an hour, Miss Dana. By proxy, of course. The proxy, naturally, was yours truly. Ten minutes later, at twenty past nine, I walked up to Ilsa Dana's door with a nosy elevator boy giving me the double O. The reason for his interest was that her door was open and the room inside was empty except for a little twisted pile of pale pink satin, which at close range turned out to be a woman. Which woman turned out to be Ilsa Dana? And Ilsa Dana was dead. She used to be pretty. She isn't now. Yeah, strangulation doesn't help any girl's looks, son. Make anything of it? Well, the position of her body and the bloodstains on her pointed fingernails tells me that she put up a tough struggle before somebody succeeded in smothering with a pillow from the sofa over there. Yeah, that figures. When did it happen, I wonder? Yeah, the last 15 minutes, I'd guess. Say, who's been up in the elevator this evening? Nobody for her. Well, somebody came up. Well, who says not? They could have used the stairs, you know. Yeah. How well do you know Miss Dana? I know exactly zero about Miss Dana. How could you write her up and down every day and know nothing about her? It's a rule of the house to keep your mouth shut. The rule also goes when being questioned by a cop. A cop? Who's a cop? Oh, I guess you're a cello player from the Philharmonic. Look, I happen to work for a guy named Nero Wolf. Oh. Heard of him? Maybe. Well, if your memory comes alive, son, I might see my way clear to uh, spend a few dollars with you. Understand? I'll keep you in mind. Going down, mister? I spent time trying to get sense out of the superintendent and a set of chambermaids, but they were as quiet as a ballpark on Christmas Eve. Then I called the cops and told them about Oliphant and Hunter. By the time I got home, the house was dark and Nero Wolf was sleeping. Next morning, I gave him the details while he drank three bottles of beer. When I finished, he sat for a long time and then started another bottle. The prize fighter. What about the prize fighter, Archie? Hunter? Well, I, I phoned the hotel he lives in before you got up. And? They told me he wasn't in. Hmm. You know, I begin to think that Mr. Oliphant brought us a more absorbing case than he suspected. You know, I'm glad you like it. I don't like it. I don't like work of any variety. But this thing has its points. Well, what do we do next? Next, we investigate my client. What? Merely because a reformed playboy employs a detective doesn't exempt him from suspicion, Archie. 
Oh, now who's that? I'm afraid we have no choice but to open the door and see. My name is Young. Vasto Young. It's nice meeting you, Mr. Young. What do you want? I want to see Nero Wolf. About? Uh, about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. What? Will you repeat that? I want to see Mr. Wolf about a certain young lady with whom I am deeply in love. Mm -hmm. Her name, please? Ilsa Dana. Is it possible that you entertain plans of making her your wife? Why, well, I... Yes, but uh, there's a problem involved. Another man? Uh, yes. Well, and... do come in. Do come in. I think we've been waiting for you. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Here's another one. Ah, Mr. Wolf. You've come to me about Miss Ilsa Dana, sir? I have come to you, more specifically, about a man who has threatened her life. Hmm. How unusual. He's the treacherous kind. Mild-mannered, you know. As we say in my profession, he underplays it. Your profession, then, is the stage. It is, sir. Go on, you interest me deeply. I was present recently when he told her that he would certainly kill her unless she mended her sinful ways. Sinful? No one denies that Ilsa has had, uh, shall we say, a checkered career. But the man's attitude is totally fanatical. What's his particular brand of fanaticism, Mr. Young? Theodore Oliphant is a religious maniac. Well, what do you know? He's come to give Theodore a bad report card. I don't understand. I, I've come to ask Mr. Wolfe to prevent his murdering Miss Dana. Am I allowed a direct question, sir? Why, of course. Where were you between 9 and 9.20 p.m. last night? 9 and 9.20? Why do you ask? You said I was permitted a direct question. Oh, well, I was walking in the uh, park, as I remember. Do you make a habit of walking in the park? I have lately. I'm preparing for an important role in the forthcoming production. What's so important about last night? From your point of view, a great deal, sir. Well, what do you mean? Last night, Miss Ilsa Dana was murdered. What? Mr. Goodwin here discovered the body. No. I'm afraid I must insist, Mr. Young. Uh, oh, why, why are you looking at me like that? Uh, are you accusing me of... A, I a... have accused you of nothing, my dear sir. Well, now, look, you're making a mistake. Oliphant killed her. You may be sure of that. I have your word. I know him. He was trying to reform her. Wanted to make her a devout follower of his cult, the Seekers of Power. I heard him tell her to her face that if she refused redemption, he would see to it that she didn't live on in her wickedness. You could produce other witnesses. Do you know, in your own smug way... You're as detestable a character as I have ever had. All right, all right. Let's everybody take five. Yeah? Nero Wolf? He's busy. This is Archie Goodwin. You'll do, Goodwin. This is Jack the Babe Hunter. Oh? Uh, how are you? Great. Except the cops seem to want to talk to me about some murder fandango because as I get it, you name my name. You got it wrong. I doubt it. And I'm coming over there to set you straight. <laughs> Why'd you ring me in on this mess, Wolf? You knew the girl pretty well. Me and how many more? Besides, what time was she murdered? Last night, between 9 and 9.20. I see. So if you would inform the police where you were at the time, that should be that. Yeah. By the way, Mr. Hunter, where were you at the time? I don't see your badge, Wolf. I was only wondering. I haven't been near the Dana woman for over a month. But if you're really interested, I'll give you the name of the killer. Please do not keep us in suspense, Mr. Hunter. A couple of years back, Ilsa financed a guy in a big and lousy Shakespearean play that closed like a clam and nothing flat. Go on. It was money down the drain. The guy's got nerve. And he was in love with her, and he figured she'd do anything for him. So he comes back to her to finance him again. This time in Hamlet, no less. I see. I don't have to tell you what a flop that would be. You needn't tell me the actor's name either. You know? Mr. Basto Young just left here. Yeah? Well, he's your man, Wolf. He got so sore when she told him she wouldn't toss any more moolah into his broken-down career, he went off his rocker and tore it down. Your reason for thinking so? I met him on the street one day, and he started beefing to me with blood in his eyes. So I could do not to punch him. The results might have been less fatal if you'd followed your instincts, sir. Ugh, I couldn't. 
guy's built like a broomstick. He's weak as a cat. Hit him once, he'd crack like dry plaster. I see. Hmm. Hmm. What's on your mind? This man you're accusing of Miss Stainer's murder, Mr. Hunter, he was very much in love with her. She was thinking about marrying him, he said. He said? Yes, he did. I heard him, too. He was talking to his skullcap. Ilsa wasn't going to marry anybody. No? No, she couldn't. Why couldn't she? Well, but she just couldn't, that's all. So long. Well, now we got a perfect circle with everybody pointing at everybody else and nobody able to prove a thing. What Hunter says isn't impossible, Archie. You think Young did it? I don't think at all yet. But if there's anything more dangerous than a woman scorned, it's an actor scorned. We have another visitor. Yeah, who are you expecting? At this point, anybody. Hi. Oh, you. Yeah, I told you you might hear from me. Come on in. Who's this? A uh, fellow runs the elevator at 22 Blanton Street. What do you got for me, kid? Postcard. Postcard? Yeah, the cops missed it, but I spotted the edge stuck under a rug. Nice of you to have delivered it. Well, maybe he was just being curious. Curious? It's not every elevator boy who has a chance to see Nero Wolf in the flesh. Oh, him? <laughs> Come off it, High Pockets. I'm here because you mentioned something about spending a few bucks. Oh. I wouldn't cross the street to see the best gumshoe that ever breathed. Look, gumshoes don't breathe, and how would you like a sock Archie, and a... Archie, pay him and let him go. Yeah, pay me and let me go. Sure, Mr. Wolf. Here you are. Thanks. Don't mention it. Anytime, pal. Anytime. How do you like that fresh little punk? Archie, the lad has done us nobly. Yeah? Typewritten card addressed to Miss Ilsa Dina. Well, what's it say? Rather peculiar message. Have you prayed tonight? It's signed with a single letter O. Have you prayed tonight? Yes. Signed O? Exactly. Weird, isn't it? Well, what's weird about it? What could be plainer? Have you prayed tonight? Now, I ask you, who is the man in this deal who's interested in praying? All of us, I hope, are God-fearing. All right, all right. But I ask you again, what does O stand for? It could stand for O'Brien, Abitri, Omaha. What about Oliphant? Oliphant, too. Look, what, what's with this indifference? The case is cracking and you slough it off. You remember what Young said? Oliphant threatened to kill her because she wouldn't join that cockeyed movement of his. Don't exhaust yourself, Archie. We have a hard night ahead. Yes, but I don't understand. But I don't mean to stifle your imagination, my friend. But if you'd reserve your deductions for a little while, you could lend me some much-needed assistance. What do you want? I want you to become a burglar. A burglar? I want you to hurry over to the dead woman's apartment on Branton Street and ransack it. For what? How do I know? We need help. Anything may help us. Go through the place with a fine tooth comb. I tore the late Miss Dana's apartment to shreds, but I saw nothing. Then, just as I was about to give it up as a bum job, I noticed a little writing desk in the living room. Bride loosed the lock and spotted something among a pile of papers that belonged in no well-to-do flat. It was a pawn ticket, lot 8N046, and the address was a pawn shop around the corner on 6th Avenue. It wasn't more than 90 seconds later that I walked into the joint and tossed the ticket across the counter. Oh, oh yeah, this, uh, want to redeem it. And fast, up, huh, Pops? Yeah, that's nothing that's worth much, mister. No? Uh, oh, what is it? This... Small steel filing box. Oh. Anything in it? I don't know. Come to me locked. Never been able to get it open. We got it open, Wolf and I. Smashed the front end with a poker. There were some odds and ends inside. Old earrings, some thumbtacks, a cigarette lighter. Just trash. Then the boss stuck his fingers in and pulled out a plum. This is it. What do you mean, this is it? You fail to recognize this classic document? Huh? A marriage license, Archie. A marriage license. Yeah, well, whose marriage license? The wording is self-explanatory. Listen. This is to certify, etc., etc., thus licensing on this third day of May, 1946, the marriage of Miss Ilsa Dana to Mr. Johan Jaeger. Johan Jaeger? Exactly. Well, who in the world is Johan Jaeger? We'll soon see. I don't get it. 
I can understand. It's a befuddling little puzzle. It would be very easy for one to make a fatal mistake here. But of course, you won't. I won't. Three hours later, I'd herded all the suspects into the office and he sat in his chair and glared at them. Oliphant, Young, and Hunter. It was tense and tight, and the boss let it stay that way, saying not a word to anybody while he calmly sipped his beer. It was Oliphant who cracked first. I didn't kill Ilsa. I couldn't have. Jealousy is a very compelling motive, Mr. Oliphant. And you came to me, remember, complaining that there was another man in Ilsa Dana's life? Whatever I complained about him, and jealous as I was, I didn't kill her as the sacred power is my holy judge. Being unacquainted with your sacred power, I'd have to ask you for a better authority. Sacred power? Oh, it simply wouldn't have been possible for me to have done it. Why not? Yeah, why not? Because I... I was at Mickey's Night Owl Club last night from 7 until 4 a.m. Contemplating the sacred power, no doubt. That can be proved, Mr. Oliphant? Well, let me call now. Let the head waiter tell you. Hmm. Will you take your embarrassment as an indication that you're telling the truth? Hey, wait a minute. You you can't let him off like that. Don't be bothersome, Archie. Yeah, but we got that card he wrote, the one about have, have you prayed tonight, signed with his initial. He didn't write that card, Archie. Now, look. And the O is not his initial, is it, Mr. Barstow Young? Uh, I'm afraid I, I don't understand. On the contrary, I'm afraid you do. But for the record, I'll explain. Oh, Archie. Yes, boss? Hand Mr. Young that large red volume off the shelf behind Mr. Hunter's head. This one? That one, thank you. Now then, Mr. Young, you will favor me by opening the volume to page 1133. But why? Open it, sir. Good. You will now count six lines down from the top and read what you see. Have you prayed tonight? Thank you, Mr. Young. What the devil is going Mr. on? Mr. Young has just given us a reading from a tragedy. The line, have you paid tonight, is spoken by the hero to the heroine just before he murders her. The name of the heroine is Desdemona. And the hero, as I'm sure you all know, is Othello. Othello? Yeah, the O was not Oliphant, Archie. Othello, I think, was a Shakespearean play which Miss Dana financed for our Mr. Young. And knowing she would recognize the quotation as well as the threat behind it, he sent it to her to warn her that he meant to murder her. You won't have the unmitigated gall to deny that, will you, Mr. Young? No. No, I don't deny it. Do I call the police? But I didn't kill her. The fact that I sent the car doesn't mean I killed her. Well, it'll do for my money. But not for mine, Archie. What? Mr. Young couldn't have killed Miss Dana. Why not? Because he lacks the strength to strangle such a healthy young woman, a champion athlete. Wide awake and full of fight. He's rather a frail person, as we know. And smothering Miss Dana with that pillow was no easy task. She struggled. Therefore, she clawed the wrists of the murderer. I'm sure that if you examine Mr. Young's wrists, you will find no scratches or scars. Here, let me see that. Go ahead. Well, Archie? Ah, you're right. Nothing. I was sure there wouldn't be. The person who actually killed Miss Dana was a powerful physical specimen. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Hunter. In all probability, a professional athlete. A muscular man in good condition. You pointing at me? Seems quite likely, doesn't it? You're out of your head. Am I? Yeah. Yes, Adina. Var ihr Frau? Nicht wahr? Jawohl. I... I mean... You said yeah, Mr. Hunter. And you meant yeah, yes. I asked you in German if Elsa Dana was your wife. And you, in the heat of emotion, answered me yes in your mother tongue. Look, what's going on here? Allow me to present Mr. Johann Jaeger, Archie. Him? I've known it since we first saw that marriage license. You see, Jack Hunter is the English translation of our friend's real name back in Germany. Where he comes from, Mr. Johann Jaeger. Oh, what do you know? So you proved nothing. Yeah, I was married to Ilse. That's why I said she couldn't marry anybody else. But I didn't kill her. She was my wife. I loved her. Oliver told us you were insanely jealous of her. What if he did? You know better. Do we? Sure you do. You also told yourself over the phone that every word Oliphant said was a lie. Interesting. What is? How you could possibly know what Ilsa Dana told me over the phone. I haven't mentioned it to you or anybody else. Oh, well, well, you see it. I see most clearly, Mr. Yeager, that you must have been in the apartment with her listening on the extension phone... 
or you couldn't possibly have that information. And it was only a few minutes after that telephone call that Ailsa Dana was smothered to death. And I see it's about time I said good night. Wait a minute, Jager. Good work, Archie. I advise you to sit still, Mr. Johan Jaeger Hunter. I was right. I told you he threatened to kill her. But why? I've only guessed at the story. Reconstructed it, so to say. But I think you and Mr. Young are to be congratulated. On what, sir? On not having won your fair lady. You've always thought of her as a sweet, demure society girl. But actually, she was a vicious person. As bad as the man who killed her, if not worse. She tortured him cruelly for four long years. How can you say that about her? How can you doubt it, Mr. Oliphant? There must have been a great many men in her life. We know at least two definitely, you and Mr. Young. But she was in love with me. She was in love with me. I'm sorry to shatter your illusions, but she was not in love with either of you. She was using you for her purpose. What was her purpose? Tementing the man she married. That was her preoccupation day and night. She delighted in tyrannizing over him. One might in breaking a bull or taming a wild mustang. Do I come near the truth, Hunter? Yes. Until I couldn't stand it any longer. May I ask then why you married her? Why? Because I couldn't help myself. I crawled for her. I married her on the terms that nobody should ever know I was her husband. She was too good for me, she told me. That to my face, over and over. But we belonged to different worlds. But I was crazy about her, so I took it. What I've taken you wouldn't believe. Oh, I am sure I would, Mr. Hunter. I'm a very understanding man. The question is, will a jury believe you? And that we must begin to learn immediately. Archie. Yes, sir? Phone for Inspector Kramer. have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Herb Ellis as Archie Goodwin and Lee Millar, Marna Keneally, Larry Dobkin, Barney Phillips, and Jerry Hosner. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Headless Hunter. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> And don't forget, this Sunday marks the premiere of The Big Show on NBC. Not just any big show, it's The Big Show. NBC's hour and a half of comedy, music, drama, and the best of each. The Big Show will be heard every Sunday afternoon over most of these stations with Tallulah Bankhead as Mistress of Ceremonies. Your stars for this Sunday's broadcast include Jimmy Durante, Fred Allen, Ethel Merman, Frankie Lane, Mindy Carson, Meredith Wilson, Danny Thomas, and hosts of others. No wonder it's The Big Show. And Theater Guild on the air this Sunday presents Judy Garland in Miss Alice Adams. So don't forget, Tallulah Bankhead brings you the big show Sunday on NBC. Stay tuned for Nero Wolf, which follows transcribed in 30 seconds. What's on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight? Well, there's a full serving of laughs with Archie the manager, played by Ed Gardner, and his unpredictable friends, Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the waiter. It's Duffy's Tavern later this evening over most of these NBC stations. And this Sunday, the big show comes your way once again with Bob Hope, Jimmy Durante, Perry Como, Jose Ferrer, Mindy Carson, Eddie Cantor, Meredith Wilson and his orchestra, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC once again will be Tallulah Bankhead. That's this Sunday for the big show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we take you to the most famous brownstone house in New York City. The one located at number 601 West 35th Street. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. Want something, Archie? 
Would you be interested in taking on a case involving a woman who was found stabbed to death in one of New York's fancier men's clubs? Can't you see I'm already occupied, Archie? My Oncidium hybrid is ailing. But, sir, cash. C-A-S-H. Remember, you need it to live on? Well, you're actually learning to spell. You'd better learn to count. We're broke. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin. Now, if you'll just go away and stop interfering. Oh, just a minute. Yes, sir. On your way out, switch on the fan. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that one and only man of moves. The most famous detective in modern fiction. That corpulent, orchid-raising, beer-drinking gourmet who also happens to be a genius. Rex Stout's incomparable Nero Wolf, starring Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, Nero Wolf's long-suffering assistant, Archie Goodwin, tells us of the case of the careless cleaner. <laughs> We didn't know Clay Michelson very well at the time, though Mr. Wolf had hung one of the Michelson's paintings on the library wall. But then I guess we should have considered ourselves lucky not to have known him or his wife, Fila. Two weeks ago, they had a quarrel. Oh? Oh, Clay, darling. I didn't expect you home so soon. I thought you were going to the museum to see the Van Goghs. I decided not to, Fila. Oh. Well, if you were... Uh... Plan to paint this afternoon. I'll get out of the studio. I want to run some errands anyway. Why don't you make your phone call from here, Fila? Phone call? Who is he, Fila? He? Who were you waiting for this afternoon? Please, Clay, don't start that jealousy routine again. Don't try to kid me. You're being stupid, Clay. I'm stupid, all right, but I'm getting wise pretty fast. I'm through, Fila. I've had enough. I'm leaving you. So stay out of my way and keep your boyfriend out of my way, too, whoever he is, or I'll kill him. Yes? What can I do for you? Uh, uh, Sleepy. I want to have a drink and go to bed. I'm sorry, sir. The Garrison Club's a private establishment. No rooms available to the public. You think I'm drunk? Oh, no, sir. Why why do you suppose I came here? And I'm sure I wouldn't know, sir. I'll tell you why. I came here to see my old pal, Lou Saunders. That's why. You know Mr. Saunders? Do I know? Look, I paint him. Lou sells him. Mr. Saunders... Is your agent? I'm Clay Michelson. Just call Mr. Saunders. Clay, what in the world? Lou, tell this guy who I am. But I'm sorry, Mr. Saunders. It's all right, Mr. Martin. You see? Let's go have a drink. Yeah, yeah, sure, Clay. Yeah. You know what, Lou? I left Fila. Yep, I walked out on her. Is this something I can do, Mr. Saunders? Yeah, have someone fix a bed in the other room of my suite. Mr. Michelson will be staying with me. At least for tonight. <laughs> Mr. Wolf? Yes, Archie? It's Friday. Good. Fish for dinner, then. Nope. I was not referring to dinner. You were not? I can think of nothing more interesting at the moment. Oh, I can. My salary. Of course, according to the Julian Canada. We're on the Gregorian, so let's stick to it. Today is Friday. Today I get paid. Archie, there's a drop. Oh, don't exaggerate. You can't be getting the cold shutters just because I'm asking for my money. I can distinctly feel fresh air flowing into the room. Well, it's possible I might have opened a window six inches. You're insane. Shut it at once. Nope. Are you trying to blackmail me? Hmm, think it might work? Never. Then the window stays open. You're fired. I accept your offer. All you have to do is pay up. I've hired you again. Oh, Mr. Wolf, you've cleaned out the bank balance again? Well, that is... <clears throat> well, hadn't you seen those Miltonians? Would I have voluntarily given up my paycheck for them? Orchids are very beautiful, Mr. Wolf, but blondes are... The door, Archie. I am unemployed. Confound you, it may be a client, and if it is, and we can uh, extract the fee. You follow me, Archie? I'm already on my way to the door. Mr. Wolf. I've got to see him at once. Well, come in. Thank you. 
Mr. Wolf, this is... My name is Saunders, Mr. Wolf. We've met before. Yes, I remember. As a matter of fact, you sold me a painting of Michelson. Yes, well, that's why I'm here. It's about Michelson, Mr. Wolf, that I've come. Frankly, I... I think the man's about to go mad. He and his wife have split up and... and Uh, Such a splendid artist, too. A pity. I don't know what to do. He's drinking like a fish. For two weeks, I've been letting him live in part of my suite at the Garrison Club, but... uh, He's just steadily getting worse. I try a hospital... I can't. The publicity. Mr. Wolf, Clay admired you so that time we all had dinner after the painting transaction. I, I thought maybe you could talk to him. Maybe you could get him on his feet again. I'm not a doctor, Mr. Saunders. But I'm sure he'd listen to you. Excuse me a moment, Mr. Saunders. Nero Wolf speaking? Inspector Kramer. Uh, good evening, Inspector. Got a guy called Lou Saunders at your place? Garrison Club said he'd gone to your place. Yes, he's here. Well, see to it that he doesn't leave until I get there. He'd hardly do that, Inspector. I have no reason to detain Mr. Saunders. There's plenty of reason. It so happens a woman's just been murdered in his suite. Murdered? Yeah. A Miss Hilda Lundgren. What's happened? Now will you hold him? Uh, do you know a Miss uh, Hilda Lundgren, Saunders? Hilda Lundgren? I've never heard of her. She seems to have chosen your suite to be murdered in. I'd better get right over there. Mr. Saunders says to tell you he'll be right over, Inspector. Now, listen, Wolf. Good day, Inspector. Murdered? Murdered in my suite? Mr. Wolf, you've got to come with me. Uh, Mr. Goodwin will accompany you after the formality of a retainer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, anything you say. Here, here, I'll write a check. Good, uh, 500. 500? Fine. My friend and assistant, Mr. Goodwin, will go with you. I have great confidence in his ability to bring back every detail of a murder, particularly where a woman's involved. Okay, you photographers, picnic's over for tonight. Pick up your stuff and get out of here. Come on, you sound real mean today, Inspector Kramer. Well, if it isn't Nero Wolf's favorite stooge. What are you doing here, Goodwin? I got bored with my knitting. Look, I wasn't asking for humor. I'm Louis Saunders, Inspector. Saunders? Ever seen that woman before? I... Yes. Yes, I believe I have. I can't remember where, but the face looks familiar. Mmm, lovely-looking woman. Blonde and really built. Well, she ought to look familiar. She's one of the cleaning women here at the club. She is? Cleaning? Well, since one of gals like this been reduced to cleaning floors, what's happening to the world? There ought to be a law. Yeah, there is. She was killed with a knife, or haven't you had time to notice? Uh, that's not a knife, Inspector Kramer. That, that's one of Clay's Chinese letter openers. He, he... What was that? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Yes, it is a strange knife. What were you saying, Mr. Saunders? I just, just said that that looked like one of the letter openers belonging to one of my friends. Who is this Clay? Clay Michelson, the artist. But you can't possibly think he'd do a thing like this. I think everybody did it until we know otherwise. When were you last up here, Mr. Saunders? Me? Why, just a little while ago. I changed my clothes just before I went to see Mr. Wolf. She wasn't here then? Well, I don't know. I didn't come into this room, just in my part of the suite. Your part? Who occupies this room? Mr. Michelson. He's been staying with me. Strange wound, no blood. What do you think you are, Goodwin, a medical examiner? Oh, but I Yeah, 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 the killer probably wiped the blood away. Saunders, have you any idea where your artist friend might have run off to? I haven't seen Clay all afternoon. He spends a lot of time down in the bar. Well, he'd hardly sit in a bar if he's killed somebody. But... Well, why would he pick on the cleaning woman? Oh, this is no ordinary cleaning woman. Get a load of that figure. Watch She's... it, Goodwin. Watch it. You're liable to stretch your brain. But you're wrong. In spite of everything, Clay's still terribly in love with his wife. He he, he wouldn't... Uh, Hello? Uh... Where did you get in? Yeah, who's this? Clay. We're your friends, Lou. They won't serve me any more liquor down at the bar. I gotta find my flash. Mr. Michelson, may I introduce you to Inspector Kramer of the police? Uh, Who's this guy, Lou? He's Nero Wolf's assistant. Wolf? Police? Well, what do you all want? Somebody park overtime? Where's my flask? The one with my initials. I just bought it this morning. Mr. Michelson, do you know that somebody was murdered here in your room? Murdered? Why don't you guys go away and joke with somebody else? Where's my flask? You better get hold of yourself. I said there's been a murder. Understand? You serious? Yep. 
And I wouldn't be surprised if Inspector Kramer here considers you top suspect. Me? They think I did it? You better pull yourself together, Clay. Yeah, because I got a lot of questions. Excuse me, the phone. Now, sit down, Mr. Saunders. I'll answer it. Hello? 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 This is Fela. Who is this? This is Inspector Kramer. Hello? Hello? Who is Fela? Anyone know? Well, that's my wife. Your wife? I, I want to speak to her. Come back here, Michelson. Let me alone. I'm... You're not going anywhere. Now stay back there. You're wrong, Inspector. I am going somewhere. Junior's got a gun. Yes, Inspector. You should be more careful about your gun when you shove people. Now, look, Mr. Michelson. I'll I would see want... Mr. Wolf myself. Stay back, Inspector. You have no chance. We'll nab you before you get a block away. Well, then I'll just jerk these phone wires. There. And I'll lock the doors. That should hold you long enough. Good night. Hmm. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Wolf Kramer. Indeed. Clay Michelson may be on his way over there. Hold him until I get there. Hold him why? Not more than ten minutes ago, he held me up at the point of a gun. He carries a gun? It was my gun. <laughs> Careless of you, Inspector. Ah. Goodbye. <laughs> Come in. Mr. Wolf? Yes? My name is Clay Michelson. Yes, I was rather expecting you. You've got to help me. They think I murdered someone. You shouldn't have run away from the police. I, I've been drinking a lot, but, but I wouldn't murder anyone. Feel it, tell you that. No way. Was she the model in that painting of yours I purchased? What difference does that make? I tell you, they're after me for murder. You obviously loved your wife deeply at the time you painted her. Oh, here you are, Mr. Wolf. It... Michelson. Clay. Good Lord, man. The police are on their way over here. He came for my help, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I'm glad he did, Mr. Wolf. But we left Inspector Kramer talking from a phone booth. He'll be here any minute. And we have only a minute to decide why anyone would want to kill a cleaning woman. I didn't kill anybody. She was a beautiful woman, Mr. Wolf. I gather that, Archie, from your unusual interest in the case. She was stabbed with a letter opener from Mr. Michelson's house. Which might add, Mrs. Michelson, to our suspect list. Fela? You can't suspect Fela. You're very gallant, to Michelson. Just how was this beautiful young cleaning woman, this Miss Lundgren, stabbed? Um, in the heart. Her eyes were wide open. Pupils dilated with shock. And Details I... later, Archie. Kramer will be here shortly. The moment I would like to know where everyone was. Well, Mr. Saunders was here with us, you remember. I don't know where Mrs. Michelson was, but I could go see her and find out. No, it won't be necessary, Archie. Mr. Michelson, where were you? Me? Why, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't seem to remember. It's hardly what we would call helpful. I, I was drunk. Maybe I went to Fela's. I've been over there lots this week trying to talk to her. I must have gone over there. Have you ever seen the murdered woman before? No, I never saw her before in my life. I've seen her before, Mr. Wolf. Indeed, Mr. Saunders. I seem to remember your earlier statement to the contrary. Well, uh, I didn't know her name, but when I saw her, I remembered her. I understand she was quite an alcoholic. Hmm. Unfortunate woman. Beautiful woman. Well, look who's here, Inspector Kramer. Oh, here you are, Michelson. And as usual, you didn't have the courtesy to ring the bell, Inspector. And give you a chance to get this guy out of here? Nothing doing, Wolf. Now, come on. We go to headquarters. Mr. Wolf, you can't let him take me. I didn't do it. I'm afraid there's not much I can do about it, Mr. Michelson. Come on. You come along too, Saunders. I gotta get a statement from you. Of course. This way. Come on. Very well. All right. I just got an angle. Really, Archie? Sure, it's simple. Saunders has been going for this beautiful cleaning babe. Clay worms in. Saunders kills her. Perhaps there was jealousy somewhere in this case, Archie. Yeah, Wolf speaking. Mr. Wolf, this is Fela Michelson. You don't know me, but you once bought a painting from my husband. I've got to see you, Mr. Wolf. You've got to help me. Mmm. This is Michaels on ham some of this delicious beer. Another can, Archie. And now, Mrs. Michelson, may I ask how you found out there was a murder in the first place? A policeman came to see me. He told me what had happened. That they were looking for Clay. I don't know what to think. He's temperamental, he's jealous, and he's sometimes violent, but 
can't imagine anything like this. Not Clay. Maybe some of those friends of his, but... You uh, don't care for your husband's friends? No. They all live off him. They're leeches. Mrs. Magnuson, did your husband come to see you this afternoon? This afternoon? No. You're quite positive? Oh, yes. That was his alibi for the time of the murder. He said he went to see you. Of course, he was fuzzy, usual effect of alcohol on the brain cells, but... Uh... Uh, Mrs. Michelson, might I be a little indiscreet for a moment? Indiscreet? Have you been seeing some other man? I don't know what you're talking about. Please, Mrs. Michelson, I'm afraid your face gives away more than you tell. I thought we were here to talk about a murder, Mr. Wolfe. Indeed, but your husband's jealousy might well fit into that category. Oh, Clay, imagine things. You're a very beautiful woman, Mrs. Michelson. Now, if you will try telling me the truth, perhaps we can accomplish something. But I tell you... Uh... All right. So I thought I was in love with another man. Your husband suspected but didn't know, huh? No. Clay didn't know. He wouldn't have given me a divorce anyway. You sound as though you want your husband back. I did, but I didn't even know where he went. Indeed, Mrs. Michelson. Archie informs me that the murdered woman was quite lovely. What are you trying to suggest? You said yourself you wanted your husband back. Yeah, one woman jealous of another, that's always murder. Why, that's stupid. Clay wouldn't play around with a maid. That's stupid. Clay loves me. I'm not jealous of anyone. No one, do you understand? Archie. If you'll see Mrs. Michelson home... Yes, sir. Thank you. I can find my own way. I'd prefer Archie took you, Mrs. Michelson. You wanted my help, didn't you? I... Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Michelson. If you will just wait outside for a moment, please. What have you got in mind, Mr. Wolf? Try exercising your own judgment just once, Archie. You mean she's the one who's jealous? Perhaps, Archie. Perhaps she may want us to think she was jealous. Perhaps she actually doesn't want her husband back at all, only to pin a murder on him. Oh. You see, in this case, it would be simpler than divorce. Yeah? Yeah, she might just be trying to get rid of him. She might, Archie. But then she's a woman, so don't count on anything. <laughs> she might even be telling the truth. This is where I live, Mr. Goodwin. Nice. Very nice. I like Greenwich Village. I'm trying to figure out why Mr. Wolf sent you along with me. <laughs> I'm a sucker for beautiful women. <laughs> I wonder. Archie. Huh? Does Mr. Wolf believe me? He hasn't made an official statement yet. Nice furniture and things. You sound like an appraiser or, or someone looking for something. That's because it's November. Mr. Wolf sent you to search my apartment. You could be wrong. I don't... Oh. What's the matter now? Thought you said your husband hadn't been here today. He, he wasn't. And what's his flask doing among these papers on the desk? Very prettily decorated with his initials. He was looking for it at the club. Flask? I don't know what it's doing there. Yeah, sure. You're trying to help, Clay. Right into the electric chair. But... His only alibi was his being here this afternoon and you said he wasn't. Then what is his flask doing here? He said he just bought it this morning, so he must have been here today. I don't know what you're talking about. Where's your phone? Well, you've got things wrong. I don't know anything about that flask. I... The lights? Who switched off those lights? Feeler, put those lights on. Put on those lights. Oh, oh, the lights. Get to the lights. That flask. Gone. Nero Wolf speaking. Where's Feeler Michelson? Feeler, perhaps you might try the lost and found, Inspector. Now, look, I know she was over at your place. I thought you were interested in Clay Michelson. Well, I let him and Saunders go, for the present. They're clean until I get the medical examiner's report. Oh, when will it be ready, by the way? An autopsy takes time, you know that. Where's the Michelson woman? I believe she had a date with Archie. Why do you want her? I'm sure it never dawned on you, Wolf, but this cleaning woman who was killed was some dish. Maybe Mrs. Michelson was the jealous one. Your thinking is beginning to bear an amazing resemblance to Archer's, Inspector. Also, it maybe never dawned on you that Fela Michelson hasn't offered an alibi for the time of the murder. Hmm. You're right, Inspector. Yeah, you are. Come on, Wolf. Quit stalling. Where's Fela Michelson? Hmm? What? 
Oh, I really don't know, Inspector, but perhaps as a last resort, of course, you might try her home. Good night, Inspector. Ah, uh, inevitable. The moment I'm comfortable. Come in. Mr. Wolf. Oh, thank heavens you're here. I always am. Where's Mr. Goodman? I don't understand how it happened. I swear I don't. What happened? I haven't got any idea how it got there. Got where? Calm down, Mrs. Michelson. I... Uh, now, just what got where? Clay's new flask. Your assistant, Archie. He, he came home with me and that new initial flask was there. He thinks Clay was there this afternoon and that I'm trying to frame him or something. Oh, here you are. She's here, therefore. This is our gal, Mr. Wolf. She's been lying right down the line. I tell you, Clay wasn't there. Then why did you give me this clout on the head and grab the evidence and run? I didn't. I didn't hit you. I ran, but I didn't hit you. And I didn't take that flask either. Oh, next thing she'll say, there wasn't any flask. Stop gaping at Mrs. Michael Sinatra and open the door. Yeah, sure. Well, Mr. Wolf, they let Clay and me go for the... Peter. What are you doing here? After your visit this afternoon, Mr. Saunders, she decided to come down and see me. After my visit? What, what makes you think I was at Felix? It was Mr. Saunders, not your husband, who came to visit you this afternoon, wasn't it, Mrs. Michelson? I... I don't have anything to do with Mr. Saunders. Then might I ask why you called him today? I, I wasn't calling him. I was calling Clay. You told me earlier yourself that you didn't know where Mr. Michelson was. Well, I... All right. So what if it was Mr. Saunders who came this afternoon? As he has for many afternoons. What are you trying to get at, Mr. Wolf? Saunders? He and Feeler? Yes, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the artist's friend and agent, happens to be the one who was making a fool of the artist. But that's all over. I told him. That's what I was talking to Mr. Saunders about this afternoon. I didn't want Clay to know. Clay would never have come back. All to... right, so it was Feeler and me. I admit it, but that's not murder. I suggest that it is, Mr. Saunders. I suggest that one of you two murdered the cleaning woman. Whichever one of you carelessly left the whiskey flask in Feeler's apartment. This is murder, Mr. Wolf. Not a joke. Not at all a joke. You see, our cleaning woman was not murdered by the knife found in her body. She was poisoned. What do you mean? Not by the knife? Poison. She undoubtedly drank from Michelson's flask while she was working in his room at the garrison club. She was stabbed. True. However, Miss Lundgren was an alcoholic. Saunders mentioned that, and I checked with the club manager. But how does that prove there was poison in the flask? That she was poisoned? Archie, would you mind uh, repeating your description of the dead Miss Lundgren? First, uh, as to the wound. Okay. There was no blood. Someone advanced a fantastic theory about wiping the blood away. And now, Archie, the description of the body of Miss Lundgren. I mentioned the fact that her eyes were wide open... The pupils were dilated. Uh, hey, dilated pupils? Yes, Archie. The lack of blood had already made me wonder about the entire affair. When you added the dilated pupils... What's special about dilated pupils? In death, that is a common symptom of poison by a certain vegetable drug of considerable potency. But what was the point of stabbing her? The poison did the job. However, the killer later used the letter knife in an effort to deceive the police... However, he unhappily forgot that the dead don't bleed. I think you're guessing, Mr. Wolf. Am I? All I can say is that I was at the pool in the early afternoon. Hmm. You're very certain you were at the club pool when the murder was committed, Mr. Saunders? Certainly. From one until three. Excuse me, please. Wolf speaking. Inspector Kramer, medical examiner's report just came in this minute. And get a load of this wizard. The dame didn't die of stabbing at all. I know. You know? She died of drinking a fatal dose of poison known as deadly night shade. What? How do you know that? Inspector, do they know what time she died? Time? The medical examiner says 2.30. Thank you, Inspector. Oh, incidentally, if you care to drop over here, you may pick up the murderer. Goodbye. I heard him, Wolf. She died at 2.30. As I told you, I was in the pool at 2.30. Which is exactly how you prove yourself a murderer, Mr. Saunders. Oh, I prove myself... Even the police didn't know what time she died. Until just now. 
And the body wasn't found until the evening. How did you know she died between one and three? I, I, I didn't know, but... You I... probably were at the pool at the time. The maid drank the poisoned whiskey. You put in the flask of your friend Clay Michelson. I tell you, you're crazy. You planned to get rid of Clay, who stood in the way of your marrying Fila. When you came back to your room at three and found that the maid had drunk it instead, you stabbed her with Clay's letter opener to cover up the real cause of the murder and throw suspicion on Clay. Oh, this is nonsense. Ridiculous. This and then, thing. when you learned that the woman for whose love you were willing to commit murder was through with you, you took Michelson's new flask to feel his home, confident that it would be found there. Yes, and then he attacked me and stole that flask again in order to make it look like Fela had done it. Exactly, Archie. Mr. Saunders, the chances are that your fingerprints will be found on that whiskey flask, and they'll be able to trace the poison to wherever you purchased it. The chances oh, are... Oh, no, you don't. Careful now, all of you. Guns bore me, Saunders. Oh, yeah? I'm leaving. You are not... Clay! Oh. Clay! Yes, Mrs. Michelson, your husband has been there for some time. Clay, are you all right? Yeah, yeah, I'm all right. Well done, Mr. Michelson. I think you proved that an artist's life may indeed be exciting. I have been an awful fool, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Michelson, you might remember for the future that unreasoning and unjustifiable jealousy sometimes creates the very conditions that it fears. You're being very kind to me, Mr. Wolf. How can we ever thank you? By prompt remittance of your check on receipt of my bill in the morning. <laughs> Good day, Mr. and Mrs. Michelson. Good day, Mr. Wolf. Good day. What's the matter with Archie? You look glum. Yeah. I always have the lousiest luck. Meaning? A hectic case with two beautiful dames. Michelson gets one, the undertaker gets the other, and what do I get? Hey, that reminds me. You got a fee. I get paid. <laughs> You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight's transcribed story was written by Cheryl Hendricks and based on the famous characters created by Rex Stout. This is an Edwin Fadiman program, produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin, and Betty Lou Gerson, Howard McNear, Dan O'Herlihy, Vic Perrin, and Bill Johnstone. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolfe and Archie will bring you The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Three chimes mean good times on NBC. There's fun and laughs with the chimes later this evening when Ed Gardner stars in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie the manager will definitely be on hand to spread his whimsical advice where it'll do the most damage. Tomorrow night, there's action on NBC with Herbert Marshall starring as the man called X in another exciting battle against the forces of international intrigue. Next, Sam Spade. Later, William Bendix on NBC. At the first sign of a cold, take Rexall antihistamine. Bottle of 15 tablets, only 39 cents at Rexall drugstores everywhere. And now listen while the makers of Rexall drug products and 10,000 independent Rexall family druggists bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, private detective. to all from Rexall.
Now, your Rexall family druggist brings you a transcribed half hour with Richard Diamond, private detective, starring Dick Powell. Mr. Diamond? Yeah? Yeah. What's the matter? You, you got to do something for me. Hey, you're hurt. Yeah, yeah. I... Hey, hey, now, take it easy. Sit down. Oh, Sit no, down. you, you got to listen to me. You're bleeding all over the place. I'll call a doctor. No, please, please wait. But look, I've been friend... knifed. I've been knifed bad. I don't think I've got much time. Here, here take this. They're right behind me. I'm going to call a doctor. No, no, listen. Listen. Key or west. Get envelope to the... Oh. Hey, Hey, you. Oh, no. The man, whoever he was, had toppled over on his face and was very dead. He handed me a plain white envelope, sealed with no address on it. I went over to my desk to put in a called homicide when I heard someone moving around in the hall. I turned and saw the shadow of a man silhouetted against the glass section of my office door. I grabbed a pen and hurriedly scribbled the address of Lieutenant Walter Levinson, 5th Precinct Homicide, on the envelope, stuck a stamp on it, then headed for the hallway. I was about to open the door when the shadow was joined by another one. They opened it for me. Uh, Excuse me, gentlemen. Wait a minute. We want to ask Uh, you... Later, later. I I got to mail a letter. Hey, stop him! Don't let him mail that thing! They were both big men and could run. I beat them to the mail chute by a split second and dropped the envelope. They made a dive for it, and when they missed, they forgot it and started concentrating on me. Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond? Mr. Diamond, please try and sit up. What in the world happened to you? Oh, where are your wings, honey? You look as though someone had beaten you up. No, don't be silly. It's the latest thing. Hey... I'm back in my office. I found you lying here. You want me to call a doctor? No, no, call homicide. Is someone dead? Certainly. That guy right over the... What guy? Oh, dandy. Well, honey, there was a guy. In fact, he was lying just about where I'm lying, and he was dead. Look, you can see the blood. I thought that was your blood. Oh. Well, rather than try and convince you, maybe you'd like to tell me why you came up to see me. Well, my name's Nancy Lang. I want to hire you. To do what? I'm giving a big party tonight, some very wealthy guests. I just want someone around to keep an eye on things. Well, I'd like to help you, but I've got a bit of a problem with a missing body. Oh, well, that's too bad. I was prepared to pay you $500 for the evening. Uh, $500? Oh, well, so a body gets lost. Who wants to hunt a corpse when he can attend a perfectly good party? <laughs> Well, good afternoon, Sergeant Otis. Oh. oh, how are you, Diamond? Still breathing. Why don't you try it sometime? Oh, go jump in the lake. Only if you'll lend me one of your shoes to paddle around in. No. Hello, Walt. Hi, Rick. Oh, no. What happened to you? Well, two charming gorillas used me for a fast game of squash. Who were they? Never saw them before. But I got a hunch they killed the guy. Let's have a look at your mug file. I gave Walt the story and told him about the mysterious envelope he would be getting in the mail. But after two hours of checking the rogues' gallery, we came up with nothing. So I went home, shaved and changed, and went out to my client's house, where she met me in a well-appointed library. Her appointments were, uh... uh, uh... Mr. Diamond, right on time. You look much better. Well, I, I tried to wear something that wouldn't clash with my bruises. I'd like you to meet Senor Giardo. Giardo? An old friend, a very wealthy politician from South America. This is Mr. Diamond, Mr. Giardo. Uh, how do you do, sir? Uh, how are you, Mr. Giardo? Mr. Diamond is a private detective. He's here to guard the wealth. How very interesting. Kind of an official watchdog, Mr. Giardo. Well, there will certainly be enough to guard. Uh, Miss Lang's guest list is made up of some very wealthy and prominent personalities... In fact, I am very flattered to be among them. I, uh, I've seen you before. Oh, very possibly. Have you ever been to South America? A couple of times, but that's not it. My home is in Bogota. No. Well, it doesn't matter. I'll think of it. If you'll excuse us, Mr. Giardo, I want to show Mr. Diamond around the house and grounds. Uh, certainly, certainly. A pleasure meeting you, Mr. Diamond. <laughs> Mr. 
The house was my father's. He died several years ago. He used to love this garden. It's beautiful. Smell the jasmine? Yes. What made you become a private detective? Oh, I don't know. I I make a pretty good living. My own boss. I was a cop for a long time. I like to work. And that's uh, quite a fountain. Trying to give Rockefeller set a competition? It looks beautiful with the lights on. There. Yes, it certainly does. You're not the type to be a private detective. Oh, I'm definitely the type. Sure, like everything else, it gets dull sometimes, but when things start popping, it can get pretty interesting. Like this afternoon? Getting beaten up? The man you said was killed in your office? Well, he wasn't killed there. He just died there. Besides, how many guys can wake up lying on their office floor and have a beautiful girl offer them $500 to come to a party? <laughs> I see what you mean. <laughs> Don't you think you'd better get back? Your guests are probably arriving. Yes, I'll switch off the fountain light. Why don't you leave them on? Your guests would, would love it. My father used to sit and watch it for hours. I don't like to show it to everyone. Hmm. Kind of like a part of the garden died. You certainly are a strange man. Never noticed myself. Well, I have. I like you. Uh, where did you meet Mr. Guiardo? In South America. He was a good friend of my father's. Wealthy politician, huh? That's right. Mr. Diamond. It's Rick. Rick? Yeah? Oh. I, uh, I think we'd better go back to the party. I'm a fairly normal guy. Nancy was a very exciting girl. And the kiss in the garden was as nice as anybody could ask for. But there's one thing I do pride myself in. And that's a certain lack of stupidity. There was something wrong. Nothing I could put my finger on, but I sensed it. Like being lost in a dark room with a loose high-tension wire. I circulated around and nothing out of the ordinary happened. By three o'clock, the party broke up and Signor Giardo and Nancy were the only ones left. A hey, most enjoyable party, Miss Lang. Oh, thank you. It was nice of you to come, Signor Giardo. Well, I must say good night. Uh, have you remembered where you have seen me before, Mr. Diamond? Well, uh, not yet, Mr. Giardo. Oh, that's too bad. Uh, thank you again for a charming evening, Miss Lang. Uh, good night, Mr. Diamond. Good night. Good night. Oh, I'm exhausted. A little beat myself. You want some coffee? Love it. We had some coffee and Nancy drove me home. I kissed her goodnight and left with a promise to call. As I reached my floor, I could hear my phone ringing. I opened the door and stumbled into the biggest mess I'd seen in a long time. My room was a wreck. Someone had torn it to pieces. Yeah? Diamond? It's a quarter to four in the morning. What do you want, Fatty? We fished a body out of the river about an hour ago. Died from a knife wound in the back. Did he fit the description of the guy who died in my office? This one didn't fit any description. Someone was very careful to fix his face so we couldn't identify him. Check his fingerprints? You're playing around with some pretty gory individuals. They amputated his fingers. Oh. Somebody's given my room a good going over. Really took it apart. It's an odds-on bet they were after that envelope. And when you get it tomorrow morning, give me a call. It might tell us everything we want to know. Okay. What? You ever heard of a man named Guillardo, South American, supposed to be mixed up in politics? No. Why? Nothing. I met him at the party tonight. Not... Hey, what's the racket? You met this guy at a party in, in what? Rick, Rick, what's the matter? Rick, Rick, who is this? This is Lieutenant Levinson. Who is this? Mister Diamond is unconscious. What? And if you ever want to see him alive again. Listen carefully. Okay, go ahead. From Mr. Diamond's conversation, I understand you are to receive the envelope. When you do, go directly to the Staten Island Ferry. Ride on it, all day if necessary. A man will meet you and pick up the envelope. Be alone. Do not notify the police, or Mr. Diamond will surely die. <laughs> Now back 
to tonight's adventure with Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. Someone had sapped me and sapped me good. I had a dull, throbbing headache, and when I began to find my way back to consciousness, I felt my coat pulled off and my right shirt sleeve rolled up. There was a sharp pain in my upper arm, and several seconds later, my headache disappeared in a surge of heat that spread out over my back and shoulders. I tried to fight it, but it, but it was like being on a sinking ship, trying to crawl back up the slanting deck. The ship dragged me down, and I swallowed up in the black water. next thing I remembered was a blinding circle of light overhead like the sun if you were looking at it through a sheet of wrinkled cellophane. I shut my eyes and I could hear voices far off, hollow, not making much sense. The light hurt my eyes, but I, I couldn't seem to shut it out. So I tried to relax and wait, give the drug time to wear off. After what seemed like hours, the voices began to make sense. The light was easier to look at. It was just a plain ceiling lamp. As the feeling in my fingers began to return, I realized I was lying on a bed. There's a restaurant on the corner. I won't be more than ten minutes. The other man had promised to be back in ten minutes, so I had to do something in a hurry. I kept tightening my muscles, trying to get the circulation back. I had to make a try. I wasn't sure of my strength, but I had to try. I rolled off the bed. Hey! Hey, coming out of it, huh? Trying to break your neck? He leaned down to pick me up, and I hit him just below the Adam's apple with the side of my open hand. (gasps) The man choked and turned blue. He grabbed for his shoulder holster, and I kicked out with both feet. He doubled over and fell on his face. The effort had put him out of commission, but I was exhausted. I grabbed his gun, staggered for the door. But getting out of that room was like wading through an acre of glue. I made the hall somehow and started down the steps. I met the other man coming up. His arms were filled with beer and sandwiches. I shot him right through his dinner. Feel better? Yeah, yeah, Walt. Uh, a little more coffee, huh? You really had a rough time. They pumped you full of this stuff. Yeah, I'm amazed. I was out nearly 14 hours, huh? Yeah, you lost a whole day. How you managed to get down here, I don't know. Yeah, I guess I'll never know. Drink your coffee. Yeah. And uh, you gave them the envelope, huh? Yeah, about an hour before you staggered into the station. I rode that ferry all day. Five o'clock, a man came up to me, and I gave him the envelope. Oh, I was smart. I had three men on the ferry and three men at each landing to tail him. He was a little smarter. He took the envelope, stuck it in a waterproof case, and jumped overboard. Fast speedboat picked him up. No identification on the guy I shot? Eh, No record. Nothing on him by the time we got there. What did the other guy look like? I was so punchy, I couldn't tell much. You'll have a sore throat for a long time. But they were the ones who beat you up yesterday at your office. They were. When you feel like it, I want you to take a look at that guy we dragged out of the river. See if you recognize his clothes or anything. He just might be the one who died in your office. All right. Now, uh, what was in that envelope? Well, I had a photostat made before I took it to the ferry. Looks like part of a map. Here. Hmm. So this is what's caused all the trouble. Boy, it must be worth a lot. Can you make anything out of it? Water, section of land, and here's a... Oh, here's a longitude reading, but, uh... Hmm, no latitude reading. Probably on the other half. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, I've got a hunch about this. I want you to send Otis over to pick up Nancy Lang. Then take me over to the newspaper office and help me look at the files for something on a man named Guiardo. (laughs) 
You know what you're looking for? Yeah, this guy Giardo, Senor Giardo. I know I've read about him or seen his picture. I... Hey, Walt. You find something? Yeah, here he is. But his real name isn't Giardo, it's Ortiz. Yeah, look at those headlines. Julio Ortiz assassinated. Rebel leader killed after plot to take over government failed. Yeah, listen to this. Ortiz was expecting a large amount of American dollars to finance his army. Although the rumor is not confirmed, it was reported that Ortiz shipped a million dollars in gold bullion to someone in the United States. The plane was supposed to have crashed, and it is interesting to note that the recent plane crash in which two American pilots escaped, John Bishop and Bernard Combs, were found floating off Key West. Key West? Holy smoke, that's what the guy in my office tried to tell me. He said Key West before he died. Huh. Wall, don't you see? Ortiz is still alive. Maybe those two pilots double-crossed him and hid the gold. That's what that map is all about. All eight to five, that man you've got down in the morgue is one of those pilots. John Bishop or Bernard Combs. I'll have the FBI send us the files on both those guys. If one of them is John Bishop or Bernard Combs, we won't need fingerprints nor a face. We'll check their dental records, birthmarks. Uh, let's get back and see if Otis has got the lovely Nancy Lang. That's right, Lieutenant Shane in town. She's gone on a vacation, a butler said. Did he say where? Uh, no, he said he didn't know. He said this Miss Lang left town about four o'clock this afternoon. And I'll bet she's with Ortiz. Walt, when you talk to the FBI about those two pilots, have them check Nancy Lang, too. I'm going to Key West. Send any information to the chief of police there. Well, I'm glad to know you, Diamond. We just got a teletype from the lieutenant identifying the body. It was Bernard Combs, one of the pilots. Hmm. Well, here's, here's the half of the map. Tell me, does that look like any section of coastline around here? Well, no, that's hard to say. I'll have a check. Uh, you ever heard of a man named John Bishop? He's the other pilot. Oh, sure. When them two boys was found floating around, they brought them into Key West. Mm -hmm. They was in the hospital here a couple of days. Bishop still lives in Key West. Well, I hope so. He may have died here very recently. And you think this here Ortiz is in Key West, too? I'll bet on it. He wants the other half of that map and may have it by now. He's got to go after that goal. You'll need a boat and some diving equipment. Well, what makes you think the gold's in the water? This map's got a shoreline, too. Well, well, those two pilots couldn't carry a million dollars in gold bullion. It either went down with the plane or they dumped it and then bailed out and let the plane crash. Well, I'll get Bishop's address. We'll go over and have a talk with him. on the next floor. Oh, I hope you're right. Well, that's where he's been living. Right down here. Bishop? Hey, Bishop. Door's locked. You got a pass key? Yeah. Bishop, you... Lord of mercy. Yeah. Is that Bishop? Yeah, that's him. Boy, he sure is dead. Well, that accounted for the two pilots. So now all we had to do was find Julio Ortiz. It figured he now had both sections of the map, and his next move would be to hire a boat and diving equipment. There weren't many places in Key West where a man could rent a boat and diving equipment. So the chief rounded up his men, and we all started checking. It didn't take long. No, Captain. Party hiding my ship ain't come back yet. We ain't due to sail for an hour. What did the party look like? Pretty girl. Can't figure what she wants to go diving for, but I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. Mm, probably Nancy Lang. Ortiz is staying undercover until the last minute. Well, I'll spread my boys around. We'll keep out of sight. And when they show up, Skipper, you don't say nothing about us. Sure, sure. I just ran them to keep my mouth shut. About ready for that boat to sail. Well, they'll wait till the last minute. Hmm. Just imagine a million dollars in gold, just like a pirate story. Not enough killings mixed up with it to be one. Huh? Hey, hold it. That's him. 
Ah, that's Nancy Lang. But Ortiz isn't with her. Who are them two fellas? I've never seen them before. Some of Ortiz's men. They're probably checking to see if everything's clear before Ortiz comes aboard. We got as close to the schooner as we could and waited. The two men walked over and checked the diving equipment while Nancy Lang went below. We kept waiting, and still Julio Ortiz didn't show. Hey, they started an engine. I don't see Ortiz anywhere. They're casting off. We better take them. Yep. We're going to have to jump. Look out for that one. He's got a gun. I got him jump. The other guy's running forward. Stop, you! He's going over. Well, my man will pick him, huh? Yeah, I'm going below. Captain, what in the world? Hello, Nancy. How did you find me? Where's Ortiz? I don't know who you're talking about. Uh, is this the girl? Nancy Lang, meet Key West's chief of police. How do you do? Where's Ortiz? She says she doesn't know who he is. Okay, young lady, I'm going to hold you for the New York authorities. Hold me for what? Murder. John Bishop and Bernard Combs, so we can make it stick. It might go easier on you if you tell us where Ortiz is at. I still don't know any Ortiz. Guillardo, the man I met at your party. That's ridiculous. Now, look, we know all about the gold. You don't have a chance of raising it, and eventually we'll get Ortiz. Yeah, we're back at the dough. Uh, if you don't help us, Nancy, it's pretty sure you'll get life for complicity. And if I do help? I can't promise a thing, but it will make a difference with the court. Julio is waiting ten miles down the coast. We were to pick him up, then go out and raise the gold. He has the map? Yes. I'll tell the skipper to shove off again. We'll sail that ten miles and grab Ortiz. What's your connection with Ortiz, Nancy? He's my husband. A dozen police officers came aboard and hid below decks. The skipper put out to sea and sailed parallel to the coast. Nancy told me all about her husband and his history as a rebel leader in South America. I was stranded in South America with a show that folded. I married Ortiz. After the gold was lost, he faked assassination and came to the United States. We located the two pilots. My husband was suspicious, so I played up to the one who came to your office. I got him drunk one night, and he told me about the gold and his half of the map. We've gone to ten miles. I'm glad it's over with. I can see a man standing on the beach. Mr. Diamond. Yes? I was supposed to lure you into that garden. Figured. What I said at the fountain. I really... Oh, forget it. Yeah. No sense making it any tougher. We pulled into a cove and got as close to shore as possible. Then we swung a dinghy over the side. The chief and I climbed in behind Nancy. We kept our hats down over our faces and hoped Ortiz wouldn't notice until it was too late. We both rowed and kept our backs to him. Nancy sat in the stern facing us. Rick. Yeah? We headed right. I don't want to turn around. You're headed all right. Rick, my husband has always been good to me. Well, I'm glad he was good to somebody. He sure made a mess out of a couple of guys I can think of. But he was good to me. Hey, we're nearly there. Hello, darling. Hello. Julio. Yes? The police are with me. Why, you stupid little... He's running for it. Save the girl. Sure, let him go. My men will pick him up. I got a score to settle. Ortiz, stop. Okay. Well, that, that makes the assassination permanent. Again, here's your Rexall family druggist. Good health to all from Rexall. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, stars Dick Powell in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Frank Worth. Dick Powell may currently be seen in the Metro-Golden-Mayer production, Right Cross, in which he co-stars with June Allison and Ricardo Montalban. Featured in tonight's cast were Barton Yarborough, Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Wilms Herbert, Arthur Q. Bryan, and Luke Krugman. Richard Diamond, Private Detective, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle.
This is Bill Foreman inviting you to join us next week at this time when we will again bring you Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. Jordan. There's nothing I like better than a good game of poker. But I get tired of always drawing the straights that never fill. You have to keep throwing your chips on the table. Only the last card pays off if you're lucky enough to get it. This time I had to fill my straight. The stakes were too high. Again, we bring you a story of adventure with Rocky Jordan, proprietor of Cafe Tambourine, which stands in a narrow street off Cairo's native quarter within sight of the mosque Sultan Hassan. The Cafe Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men from the world's waterfronts, alive with the babble of many languages. Now, Rocky Jordan, and tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> I had spent half the night before in a poker game, and I always kept drawing straights that didn't fill. Finally, I cashed in what chips I had left, wrote out an IOU for plenty, and went home to the tambourine to bed. Even in my sleep, I kept drawing the inside straights and outside straights that never filled. I got up late the next morning, and knowing my gambling friend would soon be around for his dough, I took a bag of money out of the safe in my office. I had just sat down at my desk to count it out when Chris, my bartender, came in. Hey, Rocky. A guy named Jack wants to talk to you on the front payphone. Jack who? I don't know. Just said Jack wants to talk to you. Yeah, you said that. Why'd he call me on the payphone? Well, shall I give him your office number? Smart thinking, Chris. Do that. Sure, Rocky. Oh, uh, and there's a man been asking to see you out front. I told him he was busy. What's his name? Mr. Queen. <laughs> Jack and Queen. Not bad with the first two cards. Cards, Rocky? Uh, skip it. I still got poker in the brain. You want me to send him away? No, I'll see what he wants. Might as well take the phone call while I'm out there. I'll watch the money on my desk till I get back, huh? Sure, Rocky. Andre de Monto, city manager, not in there. Bring him to me. Bring him to me at once. As I stepped out into the cafe, it sounded like business was starting a little early. The big voice came from the big mouth of a swarthy, well-dressed Egyptian sitting at the rear end of the bar. I sidetracked over his way. I will not be treated this way. I demand respect. Where is the manager? Bring him to me. I don't tap, mister. Who are you? Name's Rocky Jordan. I own the tambourine. What's the trouble? The trouble? Everything, sir. I ask for food, and what do they bring me? Garbage. Oh, especially. Now, listen. The drinks are abominable. And where is your bartender? The service is unspeakable. Then try the hotel shepherd. Why come slumming here? No, you are insulting. Do you know who I am? I am Tom and King. Tom and King. Never heard of you. Take my advice and get some sleep. This is no time. Not, sir. I will show you what I think of the Cafe Tambourine. <laughs> okay, Kingpin. Now we go bye-bye. Come on. Uh, stop it, sir. Get your hands off me. I am warning you. I twisted Tom and King's arm behind him, escorted him the full length of the bar out the front door, and discarded him with a shove two doors down. He retreated, still shouting insults. I brushed my hands and strolled back into the cafe. This routine. I was about to take the call on the payphone when a smiling man of uncertain nationality and thick glasses stepped up. Pardon. Are you Mr. Jordan? Yeah. Ah. I am Mr. Queen. Milton Queen. Oh, sure. I forgot about you. I am a visitor in your city, Mr. Jordan. A chance acquaintance, a Mr. Uh, 
Uh, Willoughby told me to look you up when I came to Cairo. Willoughby? Oh, well, have a good time. Oh, thank you. Uh, I am to meet my nephew, Junior Queen. He should be here now. We are especially interested in the mosques of Cairo. Could you direct me to the Sultan Hassan? Oh, right down the street. See, I've got a phone call waiting. So... Oh, well, just one more thing. Perhaps you can also tell me how to get to the Mosque El Azhar. Oh, I... sorry, I lost my tourist book. Did you know the Mosque El Azhar is the first known Egyptian use of the pointed arch? <laughs> Interesting. Oh, very, very. Uh, look, what you need is a guide. You'll find at least three hiding behind every lamppost. Oh, yes. Perhaps you are right. But you being a resident here, my friend suggested that you might... Uh, if you'll excuse me, that phone call... Oh, oh, of course. Thank you very much, Mr. Jordan. You have been most kind. Most kind. I dragged myself away from Queen and went over to the payphone. Whoever Jack was, he must have gotten tired of waiting and hung up. I didn't blame him. Before the smiling tourist with the thick glasses could buttonhole me again, I headed for my office. I couldn't help thinking how well my poker hand was filling out. A jack, a queen, and now a king. Then I opened the office door. Lying face down on the floor, an ugly lump the size of an ostrich egg just behind his left ear, was Chris, my bartender. The money was gone from the desk, and the back door to the alley swung open. I ran out into the alley and up to the narrow side street. There was no one inside except a native woman. Her somber brown eyes gave me a startled look. She quickly drew a veil over her face and limped away. I've been around Cairo long enough to know not to look at a native woman twice. So I got back to the office, and while the help tried to bring Chris to his senses, I called the police and reported the robbery. It took six pitchers of water and a gin sling, but Chris finally sat up. Hey, hey, Rocky, you all right? Hey, of course I am, Chris. What happened? I don't know. Well, come on, you've got to remember. I left you here to watch the money on my desk. Huh? Oh, yeah. Well, I heard the yelling out front, so I thought you needed help. So I put the money in the safe. In the safe? Sure. Then I heard somebody come in the door behind me. I stood up and somebody grabbed me. I stepped back on somebody's foot, I think. Hard. Did you see who it was? No, I guess that's when I got slugged. You sure you put the money in the safe? Oh, I ate it there. Well, we'll have a look. What do you know? The money was all there. Every cent of it. We had a look around the office, but so far as we could tell, nothing had been touched. There was a knock at the door, but before I could answer, in walked Sergeant Greco, the Cairo police. The usual sour look on his face. What's this all about, Mr. Jordan? Uh, Greco? Where's Captain Sabaya? Captain Sabaya's busy. He sent me to get the details of the robbery. I'm sorry to disappoint you, Greco, but it uh, was all a mistake. One moment. I must make a full report. Now. How much money was involved? Oh, a few hundred pounds, more or less. But it's all here. Then what has been going on here? Nothing. Forget it. We do not take slugging so lightly, Mr. Jordan. Chris now... stumbled over his own foot or somebody didn't like his ugly face. Those things happen around here. Yeah, I didn't get a chance to turn around, but If somebody... you please, I will question you one at a time. Look, Greco, I'll put in a good word for you, Mr. Buyer. Now, if you'll just Now, leave... Mr. Jordan, did you strike No, I told you there's no complaint. Now, for the last touch, that... I will take it. Get away from that phone, Greco. It's for me. Sergeant Greco speaking. Oh? Oh, Captain Sabaya. Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, sir. Yes, yes. Jordan is here. Yeah, I'll take it. It is not at all cooperative. What? So? Yes, 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 sir. I will ask him, of course, of course. You can depend on me completely. Yes, I will handle everything at once. Of course. Don't hang up that phone. Let me talk to him. Well, Jordan. What did Sabaya want? Jordan, uh, when did you last see Ace Warner? Don't tell me I drew an ace. Answer my question. I, I, uh, played poker with him about three o'clock this morning. Remind me not to send him a greeting card this year. Why not? No, oh, you won a little too easily, I thought. But I asked for it. I'll pay him off. You won't, Jordan. Ace Warner was just found in his casino. Shot to death. Maybe somebody will give me a black tie for Christmas. I believe you own a forty-five caliber automatic, Jordan. Now, look, Greco, you can do better than that. I am instructed to conduct a routine investigation. Let me see the gun. Okay. I keep it in my desk drawer. Haven't touched it in six weeks. Well, Jordan? Here you are, Greco. And you'll find my fingerprints on it. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Having fun, Greco? He has not been fired recently. Oh, disappointed? Now, what is in this other drawer? Greco, get out of those drawers or get a search warrant. Hey. 
Uh, another gun, George. What? How did that get there? Let me see it. Uh, don't touch it. Mm -hmm. A definite smell of cordite. Uh, two shots missing. This automatic has been fired within the last 12 hours. It's a plant if I ever saw one. I would deliver this gun to Captain Sabaya for his inspection. And under the circumstances, you, Jordan, will accompany me to the Cairo jail. <laughs> Rocky Jordan will be back in just a moment. Remember, over your CBS station every Sunday night, you'll hear not only Rocky Jordan, but Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's great private eye, and The Whistler, one of the most popular shows on the air. Remember, this half hour each Sunday evening is the time for Rocky Jordan. Now back to tonight's story, Ace High Straight. <laughs> On my way to an ace high straight. A phone call from a guy named Jack who didn't wait for me to answer. A loud Egyptian named King and a smiling tourist named Queen. And finally, a murdered gambler named Ace. I wondered when the ten would show up to fill my straight. It was no secret that Ace Warner had my IOU for plenty of money, won in a poker game the night before. But when a forty-five automatic recently fired turned up in my desk drawer, I was taken to headquarters. Captain Sam Sabaya sent the gun to ballistics two doors down, kept me in his office. Jordan, I had hoped there would someday be a murder in Cairo in which you were not involved. Just keep trying, Sam. Now, you were about to give me one of your fantastic theories. Nothing fantastic about it. The killer knew I owed Ace Warner too much dough after that poker game last night. So he planted his gun in my desk to throw the blame on me. You seem quite certain that gun killed Ace Warner. What's your idea, Sam? Never mind. Go on. Somebody contrived to get me out of my office while his accomplice entered it from the alley. He didn't count on finding Chris. <laughs> Where was I? <laughs> Calm yourself, Jordan. Ballistics must fire the gun to compare bullets. Sure, sure. Uh, Jordan, supposing you are right, can you suggest who contrived to get you out of your office? It could be any one of three. Somebody named Jack called me on the front yes. phone just before this happened. Jack who? I don't know. By the time I answered, he'd hung up. Then a swarthy Egyptian named Tom and King started a phony one-man riot in the cafe. I had to throw him out. Tom and King. And the third? Well, after I got rid of King... <sighs> Sam, how many times do they have to... Go on, Jordan. Well, a tourist with thick glasses named Milton Queen buttonholed me at the door. I had trouble getting rid of him. Any one of those three could have given the accomplice plenty of time to get in the alley door to my office. One moment. Sabaya speaking. You are sure? No, no, not at present. That will be all. Caught him out, Sam? Jordan, Ace Warner was killed with the gun found in your desk drawer. I'm surprised. Now suppose you continue your story, all of it. I told you everything, Sam. How about talking to Chris? For one thing, he thinks he stepped on somebody's foot. Now, he's a big fan. I have his statement. Jordan, I will release you for the present. In the meantime, let me suggest... Did I give up a weekend of my country estate? Sure, Sam. I'll stay in Cairo. Watch me. I got out quick before Sam had changed his mind and was on my way back to the tambourine. Now all I had to do was find a ten spot to fill my straight. I also wanted a better look at a couple of cards named King and Queen. As I walked into my cafe, Chris nodded his head painfully toward a man sitting at a front table. The man got up and drooped his way toward me, like an underfed dog with its tail between its legs. The Egyptian one-man riot, Tom and King. Mr. Jordan, I've been waiting to see you. Hey, get the glasses off the bar, Chris. No, please, Mr. Jordan, I want to apologize. Why didn't you bring your whole card with you? I don't understand. Your helper who delivered the gun. Mr. Jordan, I am afraid you are confused. I created a disturbance here this morning. My actions were inexcusable. I could phrase it a different way. See, I had been drinking all night. There have been uh, things on my mind. Like murder? Oh, please, worries. Why I came to the tambourine, I do not know. A lot of people wonder that. Uh, Mr. Jordan, I am a respectable person. Mm, it's one man's opinion. You can understand why I would not want a disgraceful affair like this to reach the papers. I did considerable damage. I wish to pay for everything. 
Would uh, 100 pounds be sufficient? 100. That's your last offer? I realize that I am in no bargaining position. Then we'll, uh, give me your card. I'll send you an itemized bill. Oh, you are very kind, Mr. Jordan. And you will tell Noah? Well, that depends. Keep in touch with me, King. He handed me his card and backed out the door, bowing all the way. I asked Chris if the guy named Jack had called again. He hadn't. There was a chance I could learn something about Ace Warner to help me find my ten. So I taxied over to his gambling joint on the other side of town. A lone policeman was on guard out front, but he let me in. One of Ace's boys was in a back room testing a roulette wheel. Hello, Maxie. Uh, oh, hi, Rock. Watch your 13 coming up. Watch it. See? 13. What'd I tell you? Yeah, I see. Of course, something like that poker game I was in last night. Oh, uh, yeah, Rock. Sorry about that. We had a fix to clean out a couple of the other boys. They had some tricks, too. There was too much dough on the table. Ace couldn't afford it. You know it. Ace is dead? Yeah. 23 this time. Watch it. What do you know about the killing? I tell you, Rock. Uh, watch it now. 23 coming up. 23, just like I said. Come on, what do you know about the killing? Nothing, Rock. Not a thing. Who were his enemies? Who's the angel behind this affair? Angel? It's funny. How do you know? Know what? That was his girlfriend. He spent her in France or someplace. Quite a dish, Rocky. He was getting rid of her dough. Why? Ah, uh, he got most of it anyhow. She's too jumpy. Scared her husband show up. You know what the husband's name was? Let's see, uh... No, I forgot. Ford is time. Try to remember, Maxie. Was it King, maybe? King? Yeah, King, that's it. How do you know? I didn't. Where's Angel hiding these days? Got no idea. Hey, wait, Rock. Watch this. Thing. Sorry, Maxie. Time for the next deal. Things were beginning to gel now, but I still needed a ten to fill my straight. I figured I'd find it back-to-back -back with a king. Tom and King had given me his address down toward the river on the other side of the bazaar. It takes a taxi all day to get through the bazaar, so I walked. Ordinarily, I like to take in the bazaar, get a kick out of the snake charmers, who always play a little louder when a tourist walks by. I tossed a tattered musician a couple of piastres, and I saw a familiar-looking veiled native woman coming up from behind. She limped, like the one I saw on the side street off the tambourine that morning. I wasn't sure she saw me, so I dodged into a booth and waited for her to pass. <laughs> You like my rock? Yeah, sure, but not this time. Only two Egyptian pounds, Effendi, for this thin of it. Ah, no, not interested, sorry. I see you bargain well, Effendi. Only for you, one pound. Look, I got a rug. Now, don't bother oh, me. Stand there, you will ruin me. Half a pound and forty piastres. I'm not buying anything. Let it go of me, will you? Very well, but only for you, Effendi. Half a pound. No less, not a million less. Wait, wait, come back. By the time I got out of the booth and shook the excited peddler off, the veiled native woman was way down the street. I thought I saw her turn in somewhere, but I wasn't sure. Anyhow, I couldn't have followed her. Like I said, a foreigner doesn't look at a veiled woman twice if he values his life. So I hurried on down the street. As I passed an open-air cafe, I changed my course again. Another one of my cards had turned up. He sat at a secluded table sipping tea. Across from him sat a shy, brown-eyed boy of uncertain age. I went up to that table. By, by Mr. Jordan. Mr. Milton Queen, I believe. Uh, this, uh, this is a pleasure. Uh, may I present my nephew, Junior Queen? How do you do, sir? Oh, yes, we've met. We have? Why, oh, no, I was to meet him this morning, but he had not arrived when I talked to you. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, a logical mistake. <laughs> Ever played poker, Mr. Queen? Poker? No, no, I'm so sorry. It's so kind of you to invite me. I just thought you might know Ace Warner. Warner? Ace? No, no, I'm afraid not. But I would enjoy meeting him. There are so many, many friendly people in Cairo. <laughs> oh, Mr. Jordan, I must confess a very foolish mistake. You must? Ah, you will recall I said the Mosque El Azar was the first Egyptian example of the pointed arch? Mm hmm I was wrong. It was the Ahmed Ibn Tulun. Stupid of it, oh, but think nothing of it. See you later, Mr. Queen. You too, Junior. Goodbye, sir. Oh, won't you have some tea with us, Mr. Jordan? Uh, tea? No, no thanks. It kills the taste of the lemon. As I left the table, I wondered why I said I had met Junior before. I thought I had a good memory for faces. 
Well, they found Tom and King's address, a large brownstone modern apartment house, but King wasn't in. The clerk said he'd been out most of the day. I waited around the lobby for a while, then stepped into a phone booth and called the tambourine. Cafe tambourine. Uh, Chris, this is Rocky. That fellow named Jack ever called me back? No, never did. But somebody else called. Who? I don't know. Hey, bartender, survey. Ah, right, just a minute. He said if you wanted to find Angel, try ten dollar beer. Ten dollar beer? What else? That's all. He hung up. Oh, great. Now you can do something. What, Rocky? Hang up. Well, it looked like I finally had that ten to fill my ace eye straight. I remembered the paddle streamers along the Nile are known as Dahabias. Then I thought again. The swank little houseboats anchored along the Nile are called the same thing. A five-minute walk from King's Place took me to Dahabi at number ten. I walked up the narrow awning-covered gangplank that led to the little deck and knocked at the door. Who is it? The name's Jordan. I don't want to see anyone. Wait, I can't... Sorry, Blue Eyes, i got to talk to you. Did you say you were? Rocky Jordan. I was a friend of Ace Warner's. Oh. Well, uh, how did you find me here? Oh, I just filled a straight, and there you were. I don't understand. Straight. It... Oh. <laughs> well, if you mean you want a drink, it's on the side cabinet. Go ahead. Thanks. I believe I will. I'm uh, sorry I couldn't get it for you, but <laughs> you see my foot. Yeah, I noticed it. Why, uh... Why did you come here, Mr. Jordan? To, uh, to find your husband. My husband? Well, did you know you had one? Well, I, I have not seen him since I left Bordeaux. You had better go, Mr. Jordan. Oh, sure. But the next time you see Mr. King, tell him I said hello, huh? Mr. King? Who is he? Isn't that his name? I don't know what you are talking about. Now, kindly get out of here. Oh, I'm going. Oh, uh, one more question, Angel. What happened to your foot? A camel stepped on it. Well, it seemed almost too easy. But just in case Sam Sabaya hadn't already found the answer, I figured I'd throw in my two bits. So at the nearest payphone, I put in a hurry-up call to headquarters. Captain Sabaya speaking. Sam is Rocky. Well, Jordan, you did stay in Kyle. I'll make it short and sweet in case you still want to know who killed Ace Warner. You mean you can tell me? All wrapped up neat like a package from Santa Claus. Try a man named Tom and King at 1114 Fingal Place. Jordan, I have already talked to Mr. King. And next, look up a blue-eyed beauty named Angel. Or didn't you know Tom and King was her husband? Ah, this is news, Jordan. All right, add it up, Sam. While King got me out of my office at the tambourine with his drunk act, Angel put the gun on my desk. She still has a sore foot. That lovely creature knocked Chris out? Well, she had to. Then made her getaway disguised as an Arab woman, maybe. Ridiculous, Jordan. How do you explain Damn, that? if I figure this any farther, you'd have to put me on your payroll. Come on, better be on your way. Well, from there on, it was Sam's baby. Ten Dahabia did it. My first four cards had been people instead of a house address, but I was satisfied. I found myself walking back through the bazaar, and this time I was enjoying it. I slowed down to listen to the tattered beggar musician. I was about to put in a request for the St. Louis Blues when I saw her again. Right behind me this time. Still following me. The veiled native woman who limped. But this time I figured I knew who she was. She hesitated. Her somber brown eyes flicked my way. Then she quickened her pace and went on by. I stood there, puzzled. Then it hit me. My house of cars collapsed like a tent in a sandstorm. Rocky Jordan, the prize sucker of Cairo. Sure, I figured it. Just enough to leave a girl named Angel at the mercy of a killer and get another murder rap pinned on me. This time I didn't dare let the veiled woman get out of sight again. I turned and started after her. Three natives eyed me suspiciously and fell in behind. She saw me coming and limped faster. Then she began running. So did I. And with every step I picked up another native bent on mayhem. And there we went. The veiled woman followed by me, followed by a pack of Muslims. Right through the bizarre pirate. Rocky Jordan returns in a matter of seconds with the ending of tonight's story. Here's a note of importance to you listeners who like top flight adventure mysteries. 
Aki Jordan joins Sam Spade and the Whistler to make this CBS threesome the best mystery adventure listening on the air. Remember that this is the time you'll hear Rocky Jordan every Sunday night. And you'll want to hear, too, Sam Spade and the Whistler. Top-notch mystery on CBS. Now for the ending of tonight's story, Ace High Straight. If you're ever in Cairo and crave excitement, try following a veiled woman. You'll get it. I did better than that. I chased this woman at a dead run, past the bakers and the steak jobbers and the street vendors of the crowded bazaar. A pack of natives on my tail were beginning to close in. One big boy tried to block my path, pulled him over and gathered speed again. I picked up three blocks and 30 more natives when I caught her. She gave me quite a tussle. Let go! Let go of me! Turn around! Turn around and face me! Oh! Oh! My veil! Coming off quick and everything with it! Look her over, folks. She's not a native, and she's not a woman. He's Uncle's little nephew, Junior Queen. Right then, the cop in the corner came pushing through the crowd. I turned Junior Queen over to him for safekeeping and gave him a message for Sabaya. Within two minutes, the pack of natives had faded away like a snowman in the desert. But I kept moving. I backtracked through the bazaar, grabbed a roving taxi, and directed it to Dahabia 10 on the double. We got there in record time. I hit the pier running, crossed it, and went up the canopy gangplank that led to Angel's little houseboat on the Nile. I didn't stop to knock. It seems I was just in time. Oh, Rocky, well, you ain't here. Close the door, Mr. Jordan, and lock it. Oh, this is most convenient. <laughs> I see you found another gun, Queen. Oh, Rocky, Nathan, what's going Shut up, Angel. Yes, I know. Maxie's memory was bad. Your husband's name is Queen, not King. Oh, yes. Natural mistake. Now that you know, it makes no difference. Naturally. You killed Ace Warner. And he wants to kill me, Rocky. And I will. Oh, no. The husband Rocky. doesn't appreciate his wife leaving him. Especially when she takes his last cent and gives to a no-good gambler. Oh, no, so you he... killed him and planted the gun in my office. Then you sent me here to Angels planning to kill her after I left. You were <laughs> slow, Queen. Not at all, Jordan. Now that you are here, it will be even more simple. I don't know why you came back. Oh, just to you... clear up a mistake, Queen. I thought Angel's address filled my straight. I was wrong. I should have known I was holding the Joker all the time. A very wild Joker. Joker? Yeah. Junior Queen. Your shy little nephew. Yes. He is not my nephew. No, no, no. You hired him to disguise himself as a native woman, knowing I wouldn't dare follow him. He planted the gun on my desk. But when Sophia released me, you had Junior keep up the masquerade and tail me just in case. You narrate quite well, Jordan. What comes next? When you introduced me to Junior in the bazaar, I was sure I'd seen that brown-eyed face before. I finally remembered. It was the face on the native woman in the side street off my cafe this morning. Junior was careless with his veil. <laughs> I will reprimand him. The police will enjoy such an incredible story, Jordan. After they find Angel dead and know that you have been here. Oh, Nelson, please, no. Go ahead, Queen. Shoot her. Get it over with. Oh. What? Oh, Rocky, what are you saying? Oh, please don't What do you think Sam Sabai has been doing since he talked to Junior? To Junior? Where is he? Locked up in the Cairo jail? No. The police know everything, Queen. If you doubt me, look out the front window. Oh, I told you. It's an old trick, but it worked. As Queen turned toward the front, I reached out and knocked off his thick glass. Oh! He whirled and started firing blindly. I grabbed him and dragged him to the floor, but the bullets didn't hit anywhere near us. Just then, Sam Sabaya started pounding on the front door. Oh. Queen dropped the gun, ran through the back room. The last I saw him, he was disappearing through an open oh, window. There. Gordon, you here. Where's Milton Queen? Get out your water wings, Sam. Milton went for a swim. Greco, get after him. But, Captain, I cannot swim. It is an order, Greco. But, but, uh, all right. If... Don't worry, Greco. It's only three feet deep. You'll find Queen among the bulrushes. Now, Jordan, about Angel. Is she... No, she's not dead. She's passed out. I must have stepped on her sore foot when I pulled her down. Yes. Yes. She's suffering only mild shock. No, that's something I'm still trying to figure out, Sam. How did she hurt that foot? Her foot, Jordan? Why, I received a full report on the accident yesterday. Yeah? What happened? A camel stepped on it.
Rocky Jordan is presented from Columbia Square in Hollywood and stars Jack Moyles in the title role. Tonight's story was written by Gomer Cool and was produced and directed by Cliff Powell with original music by Milton Charles. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Time now for Rocky Jordan. Not far from the Musk Sultan Hassan in Cairo stands the Café Tambourine, run by Rocky Jordan. The Café Tambourine, crowded with forgotten men, alive with the babble of many languages. For this is Cairo, where modern adventure and intrigue unfold against a backdrop of antiquity. Tonight's story, Consignment for Naples. I should have known things were too nice and quiet. It was in the heat of the day, and my cafe tambourine was almost deserted. The cash register was as silent as the sphinx out of tourist season, so I went back to my office to get some paperwork done. I just buried my nose in a bunch of figures when the next thing I knew, a dapper Egyptian in British clothes and a red fez popped in the office door. He handed me an elaborately embossed card, sat down, snapped open his briefcase, and came out with a fistful of papers. Amut Hassan, Mr. Jordan. Great Nile Insurance Company, Cairo. Yes, I read. Well, I got lots of insurance, Mr. Hassan. Yes, that is quite obvious, Mr. Jordan. And why waste your time? If you please, my call is in regard to a certain cargo which you recently consigned to Naples by way of the Cairo Air Freight Lines. It was insured through my company. And what about it? Mr. Jordan, do you not know that the plane carrying your cargo crashed near El Alamein two days ago? I come to think about it, I did read about a plane crash, but I didn't connect it up. Your cargo was completely destroyed by fire. Mm, so that's it. Well, hardly worth your bother, Mr. Hassan. Didn't amount to much. That is a matter of opinion. Sort of a thank you gift I was sending to a friend in Naples. Some cases of brandy dates. Mr. Jordan, what was in the cases is not our affair. My company has thoroughly reviewed the situation and decided to pay you in full for the loss. I have the check here. Ah, you are on the job. We prefer to have the matter settled quickly. Now... Hey, wait a minute. This check's made out for 500 pounds, $2,000. The full amount of the coverage. But I only shipped five cases. 150 cases, Mr. Jordan. Insured for 500 pounds. <laughs> you need a bookkeeper. If you please, the figures are quite clear. Will you accept the check, Mr. Jordan? Yeah, that's the way you want it. Very well. Now, if you will sign these papers. Sure, anything to please. Uh, here and, uh... Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah. All right, what next, Mr. Hassan? That will be all. Here is your check. Thank you. Uh, and now, Mr. Jordan. Yeah? Understand, I speak only for myself when I say that this has been the most disgusting affair in my experience. What? Just what are you talking about? I will about? not discuss it. I wish only to say that I think you are a low, contemptible, despicable dog. Good day, Mr. Jordan. His remarks had a subtle edge that left me wondering. And suddenly it occurred to me that this could well be the start of a big deal. I hadn't shipped 150 cases, only five, and they were insured for exactly $20. So right there, I decided to stop staring at the check in my hand and find out what the bank thought about it. I was just to pick up the phone when I saw her in the door. American, 1949 model. Just the right lines from her smart shoes to the little feather in her hat. I liked everything about her, especially her brown eyes. But they didn't return the compliment. Mr. Jordan? Yeah. So, you are Mr. Jordan. That's me, lady. You must think you're very clever. Yeah. I've always gotten along. Don't bother to hide the check, Mr. Jordan. I saw him give it to you. You get big eyes, lady. Look, uh, suppose we complete the introductions. Helga. Anne Helga. Well, just what do you want, Miss Helga? 
I'm not asking for anything. I can hardly expect one decent thing from you. People can go on starving, but as long as you get your few filthy dollars, you wouldn't care. You ever try talking sense? I never made more sense in my life. I only wish I could find words to express how much I despise you. I like you, too. Mr. Jordan, I just want you to know that it won't be as easy as you think. I'm not giving up yet. Anything else? No. That's all. Just remember what I said. Bye. Not just yet, lady. Mr. Jordan, let me go. Uh, sit down and clear this up. Start from the beginning, Miss Helga. What's it all about? You will let me out of here. No. Oh, yeah. You put up a good argument, Miss Helga. It takes a gun to convince your kind, doesn't it, Mr. Jordan? Uh, Twenty-two. Just your size. It can kill. Now may I go, Mr. Jordan? Sure, run right along. But I'm still wondering why the visit. I just had to tell you to your face how much I loathed you. Anne Helga backed out into the cafe, stuffed the gun in her bag, stumbled against a the table, then turned and ran toward the door. When everybody starts hating me that much, I get curious. So I decided to follow along. I had my eye on the girl, so I didn't see the big fellow getting up from a table until it was too late. <coughs> Hey, watch it, sir. You're the one man in the whole place, and you have to get in my way. Is that the way you treat your customers, okay, sir? Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Here, just drop this. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, bad cold, you know. Don't stay too close. And they say bourbon helps. Yeah, I've been trying that. When I finally got to the front door, the street was deserted. Anne Helga was gone. The big guy I'd bumped moved past me and out into the street, walking fast. In spite of the heat, he was wearing a heavy muffler around his neck. I watched him round the corner, and again I realized I was holding that check in midair. So right then I made tracks for the bank. By that time, I almost expected the teller behind the window to bite my head off. Well, 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 good afternoon, Mr. Jordan. How's that? I say good afternoon. You don't hate me, Archie? Oh, I say, why should I, old boy? Uh, what can I do for you? Oh, yeah, why don't you take a look at this check? Oh, of course, uh, that's what I'm here for, you know. And what do you make of it? A rather sizable sum. You want this all in cash, Mr. Jordan? Now, don't tell me the check's okay. Oh, most assuredly. I venture the Great Nile Insurance Company can spare a few hundred pounds. But you're sure? What about the signature? Oh, perfectly genuine. I've handled many of those these checks. I say, you you look a bit disappointed. Oh, just surprised. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, you forgot to endorse it. Well, never mind. I think I'll hold on to it for a while. Oh, but I assure you, Mr. Jordan, <laughs> our money is also genuine. Well, I'll, I'll give it a try sometime. The check was good, and that made even less sense. If somebody is promoting a new insurance racket, this was the smoothest job yet. Well, I figured the logical place to fill in some blank spaces was the office of the Cairo Air Freight Lines. So, 15 minutes later, I was talking to a man at the desk. Yeah, I remember you, Jordan. I shipped some cases of brandy dates out of here for Naples a couple of days ago. The plane crashed. I know all about it, all about it. So, what's it this time? You and the insurance company better get together. They paid me exactly 480 pounds too much for the loss. And you're complaining? A lot of people are complaining. Let's straighten it out. Look, Jordan, just leave me out of it. Okay, mister. Just as soon as you show the invoice for all that stuff with my signature. Think I haven't got it? I've been waiting for something like this. Look it over, Jordan. Just like that. 150 cases consigned to Naples, insured for 500 pounds. And there's your signature on the bottom. What is this? You know I only brought in five cases. Yeah? And what about the guy that brought in the other 145? You tell me. Just a half hour before the plane took off. Said you wanted them added to your consignment. How did these figures get changed? You had it all figured out, didn't you? Instead of five cases, just put a one in front and a zero after it, and you've got 150. Fix the insurance the same way. <laughs> zero, zero after the five, and you've got 500 pounds. Saved you coming down and signing another invoice, he said. Just what did this guy look like? Big fella, gray hair, had a bad cold? No, a little ragged guy with red hair, no cold. Where do I find out some more about the plane crash? Talk to the pilot. He crash-landed before the plane burned. He's, uh, he's back in Cairo. Oh, where? Get it from the office. I ain't information. The man in the office didn't like me either. But he finally told me the pilot was Andy Barker, lived at the Marmaduke Hotel. Well, I was fast becoming Cairo's number one heel. 
But my number one boy on the heel parade was a little ragged fellow with red hair. Till I could dig him out, I was off to the Marmaduke Hotel to see what the pilot could tell me. The room clerk did a take when I asked for Andy Barker's room number, but he gave it to me. It took me a couple of minutes to get up a noisy elevator to the third floor and then find Barker's room. But I didn't have to knock. The door was wide open. And there in the center of the room, lying sprawled face down, was a man with a handful of rug. A whiff of Egyptian cigarette smoke turned my head to a chair in the corner. Calmly seated there was Captain Sam Sabaya, Cairo Police. Well, Jordan, your usual timely entrance. Uh, waiting for me, Sam? The room clerk is cooperative. Come in, close the door. Is uh, this Andy Barker? It is. Why? I wanted to talk to him. Oh, you may talk to him, but I fear he, he will get no answers. You see, uh, he... Don't tell me. Now, what did you wish to talk to this man about? About the crash of his cargo plane in the desert. And your interest? Some of my stuff was on the plane. What stuff? Brandy dates. Jordan, must I be eternally patient with you? Brandy dates, indeed. That's what it was, Sam. Don't you believe me? Perhaps I do, and perhaps not. Well, let's hear your idea. Enough, Jordan. What was on the plane, or for what reason it was on its way to Naples, was not my concern. But murder it is something else. Well, you think it ties up? The moment I do. Now, what do you know of this Andy Barker? Not a thing, Sam. I never saw him before. I just got his name at the Cairo Air Freight office. Jordan, touch nothing. Oh, uh, just looking, Sam. Mm, lipstick on cigarettes in the ashtray. Powder on the floor where a compact might have dropped. Yes, I see all that. Uh, at least it clears me. Do not be too sure, Jordan. Oh, I get it, Sam. You hate me, too. My personal feelings have nothing to do with it. You may go for now, but kindly remain available oh, for... Oh, hold further... it, Sam. Get me out of the dark. What's it all about? I said that is all, Jordan. Good day. Yeah, even my best friends wouldn't tell me. So I got out, and for once I was in luck. As I stepped out of the hotel into the street, a little figure ducked away quick and scrambled down the street. He was little, ragged, with red hair. Just the guy I wanted to see. He, he kept it down a crooked side street and... Finally, I grabbed him and slammed him against the sandstone wall. No, no, let go. What's the name, little man? It's none of your business. Spit it out. Who are you? Don't, please. Parson. Leon Parson. Okay, Parson, you got a lot to tell me. Tell you? I think you're crazy. Murder always upsets me. Murder? I know nothing of murder, nothing. Then try this. A lot of cases consigned in my name for Naples. What was in them? Why should I know what was... That help your memory? Let's have it, Parson. What'd you have put on that plane? It, it was nothing. Uh, wait, wait. Only food. I don't buy that easy. It is true. De dehydrated food, that is all. Dehydrated food? Cute little trick to get the stuff in the Italian black market, right, Parson? What difference does it make? It is not your affair. Who are you working for? Only for myself. Uh, cut it, little man. You're not the brains. No, no, no. stop it, George. Who's behind it? I... Her name is Helga. Anne Helga? Yeah, I met her before. <laughs> she was using you, Jordan. Using you very well. Until the plane crashed. Did she kill Andy Barker? What do you think? You're going to tell me, then the police. Uh, maybe I will. They know the consignment was in your name. What about it? Everybody knows the stuff was in your name. When Andy Barker let it leak out, it was black market, so who else would kill him but you, Jordan? Why, you... Yeah, yeah. Hit me some more. But where you're going, you won't be able to hit anybody for a long time. You are listening to Consignment for Naples, tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan. Every Sunday night on the Pacific Coast from 8 through 9.30, CBS brings you high adventure and thrilling mystery designed to keep you absorbed in skillfully woven tales until the last surprising moment. Following Rocky Jordan, stay tuned for The Whistler. Then at nine, you'll enjoy Sam Spade and another exciting half hour. Take a voyage into mystery every Sunday night from 8 until 9.30. Now we return you to Cairo and tonight's adventure with Rocky Jordan, consignment for Naples. Nine 
Naturally, I was the last to find out that my name was on a big shipment of dehydrated foods bound for the Italian black market. But when the plane carrying the stuff crashed and burned in the desert, things started happening fast. The pilot lived, but only long enough to get back to Cairo and start spilling. So somebody killed him. Well, Leon Passon told me a woman named Ann Helga was running the show, so she was the one I had to find. There are only about a million and a half people around Cairo, so I had myself a job. I spent an hour or so checking the steamship and airlines with no luck. Next, I went to the American consulate. You are correct in assuming that one Ann Helga is in Egypt. However, on November 23rd, she moved to Karnak. Her passport expires December 3rd, 1949, Mr. Jordan. That helped a lot. Next, I tried Ali Ben Maroud, one of Cairo's know-it-all for a price boys. No, Fendi. At the moment, I know of no such person by that name. However, for a nominal figure, I can produce many women who would answer her description. After a couple of more tries with the same result, I talked to my old friend Bob Hall, a reporter for the Cairo Gazette. Ann Helga. Brown hair and eyes. Blue dress. No Rocky. But I know a redhead that'll make you forget her. Ah, that's the way it went. I scouted a dozen of the big hotels and was about to give up with the last one when I hit pay dirt. Not Miss Helga, but the big man with a bad cold. We'd met before, right after Ann's visit to my tambourine. I decided to play my hunch and follow the big fellow into the bar. <laughs> hey, better not sit too close, mister. I've got a cold. Let's try some more bourbon. Huh? Oh, Mr. Jordan. You wish to see me? Yeah. Where's Ann Helga? <laughs> you must be confused. I'm Craig Norris. We met in your cafe this morning. Little accident. Sure. Convenient, wasn't it? It kept me from following her out of the place. Nothing of the cafe. <laughs> Back a little farther. Germs. You're lying, Norris. Germs are no germs. I'm staying with you till I get it. Yeah. Very well. You do know, don't you? This is most embarrassing, Mr. Jordan. I'll bet it is. I, uh, I did follow a lady into your cafe. Uh, you're a man of the world, Jordan. You will understand. Yeah? I'm a businessman, importer, traveling away from home. Lonesome. Well, this Miss, um, Helga, did you say? Anne Helga. Uh, anyhow, she's most charming. I, too, lost trace of her after she left the tambourine. You uh, a friend of hers? Uh, not exactly. I assure you I will bother her no more. In fact, I have a plane ticket for Calcutta, leaving in the morning. Uh, okay, Norris. You're straightforward, Jordan. I like you for that. How about having dinner with me? No, no, thanks. Can I tell you what I will do? Yes, <laughs> When I find Anne, I'll give her your regards. Norris had made it sound pretty convincing, so I decided to give it up as a bad job. After spending the whole day looking for the phantom lady, it was time to lay the problem in the ample lap of Captain Sam Sabaya. It was late when I got to headquarters, but Sam was there behind his desk sipping a hot cup of thick black coffee, Egyptian style. He uh, seemed to be enjoying it more than he did me. Jordan, when I'm ready to see you, I will send for you. I want you to help find a girl, Sam. American, smooth number, name's Ann Helga. Indeed, and for what reason? She's all tied up with that plane crash. Of course, and the brandy date. Now get this, Sam. That plane was loaded with dehydrated foods for the Italian black market. Somebody managed to add them to my consignment of dates. Had nothing to do with it. Hmm. Most interesting. And about Miss Helga. She's behind the whole operation. So you see why i got to find her. Of course, Jordan. However, I fear that I have priority on this woman. Why? There is strong evidence that she shot Andy Barker. The lipstick, cigarettes, powder on the floor. He was shot with a twenty-two revolver. No, you'll have to do better than that. Of course, Jordan, of course. You know, there is a witness who saw her enter Barker's room shortly before his death. Who's the witness, Sam? A most interesting character, short and ragged, with bright red hair. Named Leon Passon? Jordan, you had nothing to do with this affair, and yet you seem to know everything. Nothing I haven't told you, Sam. Indeed. First I knew about the load on that plane was when the insurance company sent me a check this morning to cover the loss. Yeah, here's the check. Have a look at it. Hmm, 500 pounds. Uh. 
Jordan, let me suggest that you spend the money very quickly. Why, sir? A further investigation suggests that the plane Andy Barker crashed in the desert was carrying no cargo at all. <laughs> Now the whole thing was screwy. A plane crashes with a cargo that isn't there. Leon Passon threatens to pin the pilot's killing on me, then turns it on Ann Helga. Well, from then on, Sabaya could have them both. I went back to the tambourine. Chris had closed up long ago, so I let myself in the front way. Then I went back to the office, figuring to put the check in the safe. I groped around for the door and flicked on the light. You keep late hours, Mr. Jordan. <laughs> There she was, the girl I'd turned Cairo upside down trying to find, Ann Helga, with a familiar twenty-two leveled at my belt buckle. I've been waiting a long time. Well, I'm flattered. I think you understand, Mr. Jordan. No, I don't. That gun, Ann. This is all wrong. And why? You fixed me up good, planning that hot cargo in my name. I'm the fall guy, so why is the gun on me? Should be the other way around. I told you I wasn't giving up. Now, where's the food? I should know. Where did you store it after you took it off the plane? Stand quietly and tell me. Look, one of us is all mixed up. Why don't you just... Don't sit... touch the light. Uh, now then, lady, drop it. No, please, I won't. Drop it. Just leave it there, Ann. Very well. Pick up the gun. Kill me with it. That would be so like you. You don't take care of yourself so good, Ann. You had a chance to shoot. I... I couldn't shoot anyone. I'm beginning to believe you. Now, give me the story right from the top. Don't you already know? No, not yet. What about the dehydrated food? Where did it come from? I, I bought it all myself. Army surplus, which had been stored since the war in Somaliland. I'd hoped to get it to Italy. They need food so badly. And why all the hocus-pocus sending it in my name? Mr. Jordan, I... Well, I'll confess that getting the food onto that plane in your name was my idea, but I was at my wit's end. Twice before I attempted to ship quantities of food through proper channels and... Both times it fell into the black market. Well, you like taking chances, don't you? It might have worked, except for Leon Passon. Was he working for you? Yes, but he sold out. Perhaps to you. Uh, not me, lady. Anyhow, the pilot was bought out for a few pounds. They moved the food off the plane and back into Cairo. Where, I don't know. Were you in Andy Barker's room this afternoon? Yes. I accused him of deliberately crashing and burning the plane to cover up for the missing cargo. He was frightened and about to go to the police. Only he was killed before he had a chance. Sam Sabaya thinks you killed him. Did you? Shouldn't I be asking you that question? All right, I'll give you an answer. See this check from the insurance company? I know, for 500 pounds. What are you doing? Tearing it up. That convince you? Well, I'm not sure. There's still the missing food. Okay, let's both clean it up by taking it to the police. Very well. Now, Rocky? Let's go in. What about my gun? Oh, leave it there. Oh, by the way, uh, how'd you get in here tonight? I hid before closing time. Mm, i got to tell Chris to be more careful. Oh, just a second. Ann, look out! The shots came in through the door glass. I rolled Ann to the floor, and two seconds later was up looking out into the dark. The light of a passing car caught the back of a running figure halfway down the block. I told Ann to wait there for me, and for the second time that day, I was off to the races. The guy was way up ahead of me, and the dark street swallowed him up. But a native card seller named Baragit down at the corner told me he'd seen somebody running toward the Sharia El Nar. And when I got there, I flipped a paper boy a couple of piastres and he pointed down to the docks along the Nile. He wasn't far ahead when I reached the docks. A lone riverboat was tied up in front of an old warehouse. I caught a glimpse of somebody ducking in a window. I counted ten and went in after him. The moonbeam from a window played on a stack of cases along the wall. I didn't have to look any closer to know that they were full of dehydrated foods. I kept in the dark, trying to spot my little man, oh, and then... No! Oh, no! A shout snapped me toward the next room way too fast. When I reached the door, the reception was waiting for me. The stars lit up and faded, and the familiar black curtain settled in. I don't know how long I was out... But when I opened my eyes, it was quiet again. A huddled figure lay two yards away, a knife still in his back. I took a quick look. It was Leon Passon. Then I noticed something else. The place was empty. Every single case of food had disappeared. And through an open door, I saw the riverboat slowly pulling away. I pulled myself up and took just a couple of steps when my foot found something on the floor. I picked it up. 
It was a little metal tube about two inches long. When my nose caught the aroma, I had my last answer. That got me moving. The first thing I did was find a payphone and put in a call to the tambourine. I waited a long time for an answer. Ann, where you been? I I wasn't sure I should answer. Rocky, where are you? What's happening? Oh, we'll save the details. Listen, watch your step, but meet me at the Continental Savoy Hotel as quick as you can. But Rocky... Ah, uh, never mind. Just be there, Ann. In less than 20 minutes, I walked into the lobby, Continental Savoy, and Ann Helga was there waiting for me. I took her elbow and pushed her onto an elevator. We got off at the fourth floor and headed down the hall. We had just rounded the corner when a familiar figure carrying a big suitcase came out of 423. He didn't get any farther. Now here, now here. What's the meaning of this? Back inside, Norris. No, 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 stop this at once. Oh, oh, it's you again, Jordan. Yeah, a couple of old friends. I set down the suitcase. You're not going anywhere. Well, what is this? Some sort of joke? Biggest joke of the year. Recognize the lady, Mr. Norris? Ann Helga. You wanted a date with her. I fixed it up. Why, I... We're not too close, Jordan. But Rocky, who is he? Craig Norris. Taking off for Calcutta. Right, Norris? Uh, yes, I was just leaving. Let's see the plane ticket. Coat pocket? Now, no, no, look here. This has gone far enough, Jordan. You said Calcutta. Look at the ticket, Ann. To Naples, Italy. Naples? Why, I, I changed my plan. My <coughs> health, you know. I'm beginning to understand. You're the man who had the food taken from that plane. Where is it now, Mr. Norris? I can tell you that. You can prove nothing. Mr. Jordan, I suggest that we talk this over. Yeah, let's do. Oh, uh, by the way, you dropped something in the scuffle, Norris. This yours? Why, uh, yes. Just an inhalant tube. My cold, cold, you know. Sure. (laughs) Only I didn't pick it up here. I found it beside the dead body of Leon Passon down in the warehouse by the Nile. What happened? Passon start getting in your way? I'll never have to answer that. Rocky, look out! His hand went for the bulge in his outside pocket, and I moved in. All I did was shove an old St. Louis trick. His suitcase was on the floor right behind him, and he stumbled back and down hard. I went with him, but I came up first with his gun in my hand. No, 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 no. Uh, Want to look at this, Ann? Twenty-two. Just like yours. Then he killed Andy Barker, too. Sure. All right, get up, Norris. Yes, 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 of course. What are you going to do now, Jordan? I think I'll let you do it. Get over there and pick up the phone. Now, dial 4378. But why? Quick, Norris. But I... I don't understand. You will. Just hang on. Police headquarters. Captain Sabai speaking. The police? Hello, hello. Speak up. Talk to him, Norris. What will I say, Jordan? Just tell him to come and get you. Hello, hello. Who is this? Hello. Captain Sabai, this is Craig Norris. Continental Savoy Hotel. Come and get me. Sam made it in a hurry. Well, this time he saw a lot of things my way. After Norris was salted away and Sam got the story on Leon Passon, there was still plenty of time to send a launch down the river to intercept the boat making its way toward the Mediterranean. And with some extra help, Anne Helga finally got her cargo through to its rightful destination in Naples. Me... I only got one thing. That's all. It's CBS again at this same time next week for another story of adventure and intrigue when we take you back to Cairo and the Cafe Tambourine run by Rocky Jordan. Jack Moyles plays the title role with tonight's story based on an idea by Bernard Gerard and written by Gomer Cool and Larry Roman. Rocky Jordan is produced and directed by Cliff Howell with original music by Richard Arant. Larry Thor speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. Come on, Mellard. Stop pouting. Enjoy yourself. It's earlier than you think. Monterey at Christmas time is delightful. Carmel is most enchanting. Salinas, I enjoy. But to haul us way over to some unexplored cannibal country is too much. <laughs> Did you hear that, Rembrandt? Cannibal country, he calls it. Mallard, me boy. This may come as a shock, but San Juan Batista was founded by the Franciscan Fathers in 1797. I remember it as though it were yesterday. Don't let him bother you, Ducky. Mallard can't stand his wonderful air. He misses the gas fumes of the big city. That's not that candy, but I do want to get back. Relax, Max. You had a chance to take two days off, so make the most of them. Uh, what's the name of this town again? San Juan Batista. You'll love it, Mallard, dear, really. The mission, all the old buildings still standing. Oh, you'll adore it. Honestly, you will. Look, Rembrandt, old friend, I may like a thing, but I'll be hanged if I'll adore it. As you will, minion. Oh. How much farther, Candy? We're just entering the town now. I thought we'd take a look at the mission first. Okay. Hey, this is a cute little town at that. That's my boy. I knew you'd warm up once I got you over here. You know, strictly from a police angle, you might be interested in knowing that Joaquin Murrieta visited here more than once. So did Three Finger Jack. Where's my shooting iron? I'll get the varmints. <laughs> Take it easy, hop along. We're approaching the mission. Oh, for golly sakes. It's a big one. Isn't it beautiful, Mallard? And don't you get a whole flood of thoughts going through your head when you look at it? Yeah. With a little imagination, one could almost see the native Indians walking back and forth, coming into town for the evening vespers. I only hope the mission's open. Well, let's find out. Good idea. I think I see one of those fathers around the front, Candy. You can ask him. Thank you, Ducky. Yes, let's go. Good afternoon, Father. Mm hmm. Oh. oh, good afternoon, young lady. Can you tell me if the mission is open this afternoon? Oh, yes, most certainly. <laughs> Do forgive me if I appear somewhat startled. I was picking these red berries and I failed to hear you drive. I'm sorry, Father. Oh, that's quite all right. I fear my thoughts were wandering. Uh, pardon me, may I introduce Mr. Watson? How do you do, Father? And this Watson? gentleman is Lieutenant Mellard. How are you, sir? Uh, Lieutenant? No, what? not military, Father. I'm with the San Francisco police. The police? Oh, no, Father, we're not here on business. <sighs> I was wondering. I thought for a moment that Father Philip might have reported me. Reported you? For well, what, Father? At lunchtime, I made a frightful mistake. By, uh, <clears throat> error, I ate his apple. <laughs> right under his very nose, too. <laughs> oh, pardon me. I'm Father Paulino. I'm very happy to know you, Father. My name is Candy Matson. I have some free time. I would be pleased to show you about. May I? We'd be delighted, Father Paulino. <sighs> I think uh, we can start with the yard. It gets dark so early this time of year. Father Paulino... Father Paulino. Why, it's uh, Miguel Torres. What could be wrong? Oh, Father Paulino, it is there. Miguel, my son, what is it? What has happened? Oh, the most awful thing you ever hear of. Vicente, he just shot himself. Merciful heaven. Is he badly hurt, Miguel? Oh, I think... I think he is dying, Father. No, 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 no. The poor boy. Where is he? At his house. Excuse me, Miss Matson. I must leave immediately. Would my car be of any help, Father? Uh, the car. Yes, thank you. From Studio A in San Francisco's Radio City, the National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Tragedy in the sleepy little California mission town of San Juan Batista. But it wasn't the first time, 
If you look around the side of the mission, you'll see that the place marks the mass grave of 12,000 Indians who died in a smallpox epidemic years ago. San Juan has seen knifings, too, and other shootings. It had lived a rowdy life in the dim years gone by, and obviously the rowdiness was still alive in a minor sort of fashion. We got in the car, and with Miguel directing us in broken English and Latin gestures, we made our way out on a dirt road about three miles outside of town near the granite quarry. We finally pulled up in front of a one-story wooden house that must have been built before the turn of the century. We went inside, and there was the prone form of a Mexican boy of about 21 or two. There he is, Father. Is, is he all right? I don't know, Miguel. I'll have to see. He's gone, isn't he, Father? Yes. May his soul dwell eternally in peace. He, he, he is dead? Miguel, listen to me. His flesh is cold, yes, but his soul still lives. Do you understand what I'm saying, my son? <laughs> yes, Father Paulino. Wait a moment. Mallard. Hmm? Look. Here where he was shot. Well, well. If Vicente knocked himself off, he certainly did it the hard way. You're not kidding. Miss Matson, would you mind very much if we brought the body back in with us to the mission? I'm afraid we can't, Father. Would you step over here? I have something to tell you. Certainly, Miss Matson. You wear a look of concern. Is there something wrong? I'm afraid there is, Father Paulino. Well, what do you mean? Well, it looks very much as though this wasn't self-inflicted. What? You don't mean that... Oh, Miss Madsen, are you sure of what you're saying? Reasonably so, Father. You see, a, a gun held at close range leaves powder marks. Vicente's wound is as clean as a whistle. Well, I... I don't know what to say. I'm sorry, Father, but... That's why we can't remove the body. We'll have to call the sheriff's office in Hollister. Can you tell me where I can find a phone? Yes, there's one at the mission. If you don't mind, I'll stay here. I have work to do. Father Paulino was right. He had work to do. The ecclesiastical kind... And he did it in a simple and impressive way. San Juan Batista, with a population of a little over 600, and we run plop into a murder. Mallard said he'd go back to the mission and make the call, and left. Forty-five minutes later, the undersheriff of San Benito County drove up with Mallard. He asked the standard questions, but learned nothing. We went over the house with a fine-tooth comb, but we came up with a blank. There being nothing else to do at the moment, the men put the body in the sheriff's car, and he drove back to Hollister, and we returned to the mission. Would you uh, care to take a stroll about the gardens, Miss Matson? It's most peaceful. Makes a wonderful place for clear thinking. Well, yes, Father, I, I'd love to. Mallard? Well, you go ahead, Candy. I promised the sheriff I'd take a look around town for him. Oh, sure. Want to come along with me, Rembrandt? Yes, I believe I will... If you don't mind, Candy. No, no, not at all. One thing before you go. You will be my guests for dinner, won't you? That's most gracious of you, Father. What do you think, Candy? I think it would be charming. Okay. We'll see you back in a little while, then. <sighs> this is a tragic thing, Miss Matson. Vicente was a splendid lad and a good Christian. I know how you must feel, Father. I never could understand why there must be things of this sort in the world. Not only between individuals, but countries and nations as well. It is hard to comprehend. The more I try to reason, the more confused I become. About Vicente, Father, who do you suppose could have done it? I don't know. I, I really don't. How about Miguel? What? Oh, no, Miss Matson. Why, he and Vicente were like brothers. Brothers sometimes quarrel, you know. Uh, not in this case. Miguel is a good boy. Why, he works here at the mission. You'll pardon me, Father, but in my business I find I have to be doubtful at times. What is your business, Miss Matson? 
I'm a private investigator, Father. How very curious. Yes, I, I suppose it is, but in a sense, you're a policeman too, Father. I? Yes. You police the soul, don't you? Ride herd on the, on the thoughts and actions of men? Why, yes. I'd never thought of it that way before. Yes, in a sense, I suppose I do wear a badge. I wear the badge of righteousness. The star of God. Father Paulino was a wonderful man. As we walked about the mission gardens, he spoke of many things, but in parallels, all connected in some way with the killing of poor Vicente. The time passed swiftly. I was so engrossed in listening to the kindly voice of the man, and before I knew it, Mallard and Rembrandt had returned, and it was time for dinner. Miguel did the cooking and waited on the table. The dinner was a masterpiece of simplicity, and if it hadn't been for the tragedy of the afternoon, I would have been enjoying a serenity I'd never known before. Did Vicente live out there all by himself, Father? Yes, the house belonged to him. He's a descendant of one of the original families of San Juan. His great, great, great grandfather owned one of the largest ranchos in California. It stretched from here to the Pacific Ocean. And that's a lot of property. Indeed. Uh, you see, it was given to him by the King of Spain under one of the original Spanish land grants. I understand there still are some in existence. Yes, I believe there are. But they've all been chopped up and sold in much smaller parcels. Did Vicente work, Father? Oh, yes, he was a good worker. Seasonally, in the artichoke fields and the lettuce fields, in the off-seasons, he did odd jobs about the town. Uh, speaking of town, Father, do you know a woman named Rose Taylor? Why do you ask that? Do you? Yes. Why do you mention the name? There's a little bar down the street. Yes, I know. The frailties of mankind. The fellow who runs the place says there's been talk about Vicente being kind of loco over the Taylor girl. I'd heard something of the sort, too. I was going to speak to him about it on Sunday. How long has she been here, Father? She arrived about two months ago. I'm afraid she's been a disturbing influence on our little village ever since. Did you talk to her, Mallard? No. Where does she live, Father? In a small cottage over on 2nd and Polk Street. I think we ought to take a little walk over there, don't you, Mallard? Right as rain, Cupcake. I dropped by her place before dinner, but she wasn't in. Oh, you know where it is, then? Mm hmm Good. Please don't think it's rude, Father, but it's something we have to follow through on. I understand, Miss Matson. <laughs> We got up from the table and went outside the mission. We pulled our coats closely about us, and little jets of steam came from our mouths as we breathed the crisp evening air. We'd only gone about a dozen steps or so, and we were stopped by a voice from behind. Please, Senorita Matson, Senor. Huh? Why, it's Miguel. What is it, Miguel? Something wrong? I hear you talking inside. You are going over to see Senorita Taylor? That's right. Oh, please, no. See, Senorita Taylor, she is a good girl. She would not to hurt anyone. That's not what Father Paulino seems to think. Oh, the good father, he does not know much about the outside. All his life, he lives in the mission. He is, uh, how would you say, is secluded? The good father may be secluded, Miguel. But I have a strong hunch he knows more about what's going on around here than anyone in town. Oh, but please, you believe me? Senorita Taylor, she is a good person. Look, Miguel, you want to find out who killed Vicente, don't you? Oh, see, si, see. Si. Well, that's what we're trying to do. Now, you be a good boy, Miguel, and don't get yourself all in the stew. We left Miguel and walked over a couple of blocks to Second and Polk Street. We found the cottage and saw a light in the front window. Mallard knocked. And what opened the door would have been a delight on any movie screen, if you like your beauty the hard way. Rose Taylor, it was obvious, could raise an awful lot of havoc with the local swains. Something you wanted? 
Yes, we'd like to talk to you for a moment, if you don't mind. Yes, I do mind. I'm kind of busy. I'm sorry, Miss Taylor, but you'll have to unbusy yourself. This is the police. Police. Always the police. Why can't you let me alone? You've uh, been in trouble before? Mm, nothing serious. Might be this time. You know a kid named Vicente? Yeah, I heard what happened. These crazy kids. They have a yen for knifings and shootings. Don't they just? This is Lieutenant Mallard. He tells me he was by here this afternoon and you weren't in. That's right. I went into Salinas to do some shopping. We can prove that, can we? Absolutely. Well, well, what have we here? A very cozy little thirty-two revolver. And also nicely cleaned and oiled. You always keep it this immaculate, Miss Taylor? Certainly. When some character gets too much tequila under the belt, you don't know what's going to happen. And the suitcase on the bed. Are you getting ready to go somewhere? Wait. If you're trying to make out that I knocked off his center, you're just whistling Dixie in four flats. Look, a telegram. If you'll take the time and the courtesy to read it, you'll find that my sister in Los Angeles is a very sick girl. I was going down to spend a week or so with her. What is this, a convention hall? Come in. Buenas noches, senorita. Miguel, beat it. I'm busy. I am sorry. I, I am sorry. I have a message for senorita Matson and for you, senor. Father Paulino sent me. A message? What is it, Miguel? The sheriff in Hollister just called on the telephone. He said to tell senor Mallard that the bullet that killed Vicente was from a thirty-two caliber gun. <laughs> From San Francisco, the National Broadcasting Company is presenting Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Well, now, a 32 slug had killed Vicente, and Miss Taylor owned a 32 gun. It looked practically tailor made. However, I've seen coincidences like this before that have gone up in thin smoke. Mallard plucked the rose and asked her to return to the mission. And right there, I got me a king-sized idea. I excused myself, went to the little bar, and from the owner, I found out where the local banker lived. Five minutes later, I was in his living room talking to him, a gentleman named Banta. Yes, it's terrible. I only heard about it a half hour ago. Vicente was a splendid lad. That's what I've heard. Well, the reason I'm here, Mr. Banta, is to inquire about his financial status. Did he do any banking at all? Oh, yes. Up to about five or six weeks ago. Uh Uh-oh. Can you tell me more? Well, he had a savings account of approximately $2,800. Suddenly, he began making withdrawals. Two hundred, three hundred at a time. Yesterday, he made another withdrawal. He left a total of $400 in his account. Well, what do you know about that? Well, he said he was having trouble with his props this year. The rain and all that. Mm Mm-hmm. What about Miguel Torres? Now, that's a very strange thing. He had an account of $900. That's practically gone, too. I assumed he was helping his friend Vicente. I smell a very well-shaped rodent. Name of Taylor. Thanks, Mr. Banta. You've been a great help. Things seem to be taking shape. It looked like the old story of a no-good playing both ends against the middle. Both ends being Vicente and Miguel. The no good? Rose Taylor. Scattered pieces of the puzzle were beginning to fall in place. Father Paulino. At first I couldn't believe it. And I wondered what his reaction would be. Next step, the bartender at the village pub. I walked in and caught him at a good time. The place was empty. Good evening. What can I do for you? A package of cigarettes, please. Sure. Sure. How are these? No, no, the, the others, if you will. All right. Thank there you, you are. Mm-hmm. Anything else? Mm-hmm. Information. Yeah, what do you want to know? Miguel Torres and a kid named Vicente. Did they come in here often? Who are you? Private investigator. Here, my merit badge. Yeah, that's a new one, the lady cop. Ah, oh, the world is ever-changing, Buster. Uh, now the answer. Yeah, they used to come in about once a week. Usually on Saturday nights. Drink much? Nah, good kids, both of them. 
When were they in here last? Well, let's see. Yeah, night before last. Any arguments? Ah, uh, they're so soft-spoken, those kind of guys, it's hard to tell. But now that you mention it, I think there was a bit of a rhubarb going on. Who was taking the lead? Tories. I gather he was sort of griped about something. Not too loud, not much fire. Mm, that's when it gets dangerous. And they weren't drunk? Nope. And I can spot a lush at 40 paces. They each had a beer and left. Thanks, mister. Here, buy yourself a cup of Christmas cheer. Well, thank you. Click. Another piece of the puzzle in place. And all roads led right back to the mission. With the exception of the late Vicente, we had the full cast of characters front stage center. And a neat little bit of intrigue it was, too. As I drew near, the warm lights of the mission were streaking through the windows, contrasting greatly to the thoughts that were going around in my head. I walked in. Father Paulino was sitting over his desk, his head buried on his arms. Mallard was leaning back in a chair watching Rose Taylor, who in turn was smoking a cigarette and pacing the room. Rembrandt was reading a copy of the National Geographic. All heads snapped to me as I entered. Hi, right, Cupcake. Have fun? Of sorts. What's new here? Oh, waiting for the sheriff from Hollister. He's going to book the Taylor lady on suspicion of murder. That way he can hold her. I think I have somebody else for him to hold. Father Paulino? Yes, Miss Matson. I think you know what I'm about to say. Yes. Yes, I think I do. Where is he? In the next room. I'll call him. Miguel, my son. See, si, Father. Come in here, please. See? Si. Miss Matson wants to talk to you. You're here in the mission now, Miguel. You're standing right under the cross. You can't lie. You killed Vicente, didn't you? Yes. Why? I love her. I give her everything I have. My love, my heart, my money, everything. She tell me that she is mine, all mine. That we will be married right here in the mission by the good Father Paulino. Then last week... I find she is also making the pretend love to Vicente. I almost went crazy. You told Vicente to stay away. See, si, that is right. But last night, I stand across the street from Senorita Rose's house. Vicente was there. And as they say goodnight on the front porch, she kissed him and pat his cheek, just as she did to me. And so you shot him this afternoon. With a thirty-eight. And when the sheriff called, you told us it was a thirty-two, knowing that Rose also had a thirty-two. See. Si. That is right. But you would never get me for it. Mallard, Father, come on, don't let him get away. There he goes, up on that wall. Miguel, stop. You can't run away for the rest of your life. I have no life, Father. Miguel, watch out. You're going to... Oh! Oh! Done for. Broken back. Is. Is the pain bad, my son? <laughs> no, Father. Am, am I dying? Yes, Miguel. You see, I told you I had no life left. The bells, you hear them, Father? Yes. They're ringing, Miguel. Time for the complaint. You will pray for me, Father Paulino? Of course. Merciful Jesus, all-knowing, all-seeing, look down upon us this night so close upon thine own natal day. This boy I'm holding in my arms, Miguel Torres, <laughs> he has trespassed upon thy commandments. In thine infinite mercy, I seek his forgiveness. Thank you, Father. Thank you. He's gone, Father Polino. Yes. Requiem has gone in body. May his soul rest in peace. Amen. 
Where is she? The tailor woman. I'm right here, Father. Look upon this boy I'm holding here. The second death in a matter of hours. And all because of you. I know. In the eyes of the law, you are guiltless. You pulled no trigger to cause the death of a senti. Miguel fell off a wall to his death. But it was because of you. I... I I realize that now. Do you? Really? Yes, Father. And perhaps in this hour of dark tragedy, something has been salvaged after all. This is the Yuletide, the anniversary of the birth of Christ. In his infinite wisdom, the Almighty is charitable. Rose Taylor, seek his forgiveness. Leave San Juan Batista. I'm sure Miguel and Vicente would want it that way. Start anew. Lead a penitent life. It is not too late. Tell me, child, do you recall Mary Magdalene? I do, Father. Need I say more? No. Someone help me with Miguel. We will carry him back to the chapel and finish the compliment there. I will, Father. Thank you. Yes, There's a remarkable man, Candy. More than you know, Miller, dear. Peace on earth, goodwill toward men and woman. In these troublesome times, there is a brilliant, shining example of what we have to hold on to. You know, I wish there was a Father Paulino in every country of the world. We'd have more time for raising kids than for killing them. My point exactly. Come on, Mellor, dear. Let's get back to San Francisco. I have a special star to put on my Christmas tree tonight. For all the Father Polinos that ever lived. Listen again next week at this same time. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. And a very Merry Christmas to you all. Featured in the story were Hal Burdick as Father Polino, Lou Tobin as Miguel Torres, and Jane Bennett Carnell as Rose Taylor. Henry Leff is Lieutenant Ray Mallard, and Jack Thomas plays Rembrandt Watson. The program stars Natalie Masters as Candy, and is written and directed by Monty Masters. Sound effects are created by Bill Brownell, and Eloise Rowan is heard at the organ. Our engineer was Clarence Stevens. The characters in the story were entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. The program comes to you from San Francisco. This is Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC. The National Broadcasting Company. And now, 
Tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, we bring you a transcribed story of a man who used a gun once too often. So now, starring Mr. Joseph Kearns, here is tonight's suspense play, Hold Up. Tim, what are you staring at? Never mind, Hazel. Open the cash register. Quick. Unlock the safety catch on the gun. Hear me? Tim, what's wrong? Never mind. Do what I say. Now get away from the counter. Quick. I'll take care of everything. I'd like a pack of cigarettes. Um, any special brand? Yeah, yeah, give me the ones with the green. Okay, stay where you are, you both. This is a holdup. I, uh, haven't got much Just give here. me what you got, and hurry. Had a gun you got in your pocket? Just don't, don't you try and find out, mister. Okay. All my receipts are in here. Stand away. I'll get it. Yeah, you'll get it. Tim, please. Stay away from here. Tim, don't, can't you see he's already dead? He's over there, officer. What happened here, a shooting match? No. Five bullet holes, all in the head. Oh, he tried to hold me up. What was I supposed to do? Where's his gun? In his pocket. Just pointed it through his jacket. The right pocket. No gun here. Maybe the left. Nope. I know he had something in his right pocket. This? A, a fountain pen. That's your gun. You ever see the boy before? No. First time I saw him is tonight. My husband saw the boy standing outside our store a few moments before it happened. Look, I'll handle this, Hazel. If you don't mind, I'd like to hear what your wife has to say. Well, Tim had a feeling something was wrong. We both saw the boy standing outside looking in at us. And then he decided to come in. That's when Tim told me to unlock the safety catch on the gun in the cash register. Mm. You've had experience with hold-up men before, haven't you, Mr. Chase? Twice. You people were in on them both. Yeah, yeah, I remember. Pretty rough on them, aren't you? If you mean I don't give them a chance to rob me, yeah. Good shot, too. You don't miss. I didn't miss over there. Shooting Japs, then. Shooting Hoods, now. What's the difference? The guy who shoots first gets to talk afterwards. How much money did you have on the premises? Fifteen dollars and change. The rest was over at the house. And you shoot it out for that? Listen, I'm not in business to give money to hoodlums. Gun or no gun. A oh, thief's a thief. Better off dead. Tim, please. No. I want it known to any of these punks who want to stick me up. They better come in shooting. Because that's the way I'll meet them. Did you notice if anyone was with the boy? No, no. I, I, I didn't see anyone. No, there was no one we could see. Mr. Chase, you'll have to come downtown to make a full report. Just routine. Yeah, yeah, sure. Hazel, you close up when the cops are through here. Captain Runyon, this is Mr. Chase. Hold-up shooting on the east side. You wanted to see him? Oh, yeah. Definitely a hold-up attempt, although no gun was found on or near the hold-up man. Check the victim out yet? No, not yet. But it's a kid, 19 or 20. Thanks, Bill. I'll call you in a few minutes. Chase? Won't you sit down? Oh, yeah, sure. 
cigarette? No, I don't smoke. Thanks, anyway. Oh, that's all right. Chase, we've uh, met before, haven't we? Yes, sir, about uh, more eight months ago. Yeah, that was the Hendricks shooting, right? That's right. Hold up a tent. Well, about six or seven months before that, there was the... Uh, let's see. Oh. oh, yes, the Delano killing. Hold up, too. I remember. In each case, the hold-up man was shot and killed. So that's wrong? No. But I'd say very foolish. Look, they were trying to rob me. I killed them. What was I supposed to do? Just give them the money and wish them luck? Perhaps. What? For every hold-up man you've shot it out with, I can show you in our files a dozen dead heroes. They shot it out, too, but they were killed for their pains. <laughs> Not me, and I never will be, because I, I know how to use a gun. And I know those punks, too. They're all yellow when things are equal. I know. I've killed three of them. And I'll kill three more and three uh, more no, after that. Chase, listen, what I'm trying to say is this. Our job is to apprehend the bandit. It's not your job. You're not being paid to risk your life or shoot up your neighborhood. If there's any shooting needed, we'll do it. I, I don't get you, cops. A man shoots a bandit while defending his property and, and then you, you give me a lecture. Uh, let me put it this way. Someday you'll find a gunman who'll be a little faster than you. Then what? <laughs> that day will never come. You know why? Because I know my guns. My wife thought I might be killed when I was in the Pacific, but I killed instead. Me and guns have got an understanding. Neither has failed the other yet. You're a very sure man, aren't you, Mr. Chase? Yeah, I try to be. If I'm not mistaken, you've got a boy almost that kid's age, haven't you? So? Well, I was just thinking out loud. The terrible price the young sometimes have to pay is for a living. Hey, look, Captain, I don't feel sorry. Do you? I didn't know the boy, I couldn't say. Except, like you, I have a boy almost his age, too. So. Captain Runyon. Hmm? Yes. It will be out in a moment. I'll have a statement to make then. The newsmen want to talk with you. Take some pictures, you mind? Oh, sure, why not? <laughs> oh, yes, I forgot. We've, we've been all over the front pages together before. Twice, in fact. It makes you an old hand at meeting the press. <laughs> Maybe that's why these hoods keep trying to hold me up. It's a game. Yeah, they read about me. They all want to see if they can take me. Well, Mr. Chase, some might say that you should get a medal for shooting these hold-up men. And then again, if it were me, I'd find me a business where I didn't need a cocked gun to ensure my profits. I manage. Yes, I guess you do. Are you ready? Sure. Oh, here he is. Gentlemen, let's make this a short session, will you? Sure, Cap. Uh, Mr. Chase, doesn't a gun pointed at you scare you? Huh. Oh, maybe at first, but if I have a gun, too, uh, I feel a little more equal. The fear's gone. Well, do you feel your money is more important than your life when you choose to shoot it out with a hold-up man? It's not a question of which is more important. I never worry. Handling a gun is a matter of re reflex. And when there's two of you facing each other... And who has the best aim? Well, have you ever thought of moving away from where you are because of your store being the target for so many holdups? Why should I? I've got a right to make a living because a man with a gun wants to take my living away from me. Should I just give it to him? Do you feel your service experience gives you this assurance you have with guns? Maybe. Well, when you see death all the time, it becomes less of a shock to you. Less important after a while. And so do people. Well, Captain here says a citizen shouldn't try to apprehend a gunman single-handed, but leave that job to the police. I don't have time to wait for the police. Besides, when a man's wrong, he's wrong. I'd rather have him dead wrong. <laughs> Gentlemen, if I may, I'd like to clarify the department's position. Oh, go ahead, Cap. Thank you. We ask all citizens that when faced with an armed holdup in which the other party has a deadly weapon, that they do not resist, but rather that they observe the party closely and be able to identify them when apprehended. Uh, Mr. Chase, could you tell us more about that? Uh, gentlemen, the entire incident is on report, as well as all statements made. You can get the rest of your story there. Y you can talk with Mr. Chase at his home or store if you wish to interview him further. Now, let let's have your pictures. Okay, now, Mr. Uh, Chase, will you stand here yeah, at the center of the desk? Right here, please. Oh, that's that's good. Good. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, one more. How about one more? Well, anything more on the kid? No, he's in fingerprints now. Kind of gives you an odd sensation. Something you can't describe, this meeting a killer with legal guns, that is. I get you, Cap. He's a cold one, all right. It's lousy. man who has an excuse to kill like he does. 
Jerry's defending his home as rights, but somehow it's still wrong. Three in a row, all shots through the head. Not one bullet laid his way. Every homicide justifiable. What's the big book say? Be careful, then. The wages of sin. Tim, you've been up all night. Why don't we close today? No, no, no. Business as usual. We ought to get a lot of new customers with all this in the papers. I only hope Jerry doesn't read it. You hope Jerry doesn't read about me, my own son? He should be proud. He will be proud. Dad's not afraid. Dad went through a war and he came back. He can still take care of himself. And Jerry will be like me. To meet the world face to face. He won't take anything from anybody. I wonder. Well, what's the matter with you? Well, I'm sick of all this. The newspapers, people coming in congratulating you. For what? Oh, you're just upset, that's all. Tim, this is no good, all of this. Jerry's coming home from his first year at college. And he comes home to murder. Uh, Hazel, I don't like that kind of talk. Well, what do you call it? Well, he'd have shot me. All of them would have shot you, is that it? Hey, whose side are you on? Protect ourselves, yes, but you know that none of those people... Hazel, we're in business. I've got to protect that business. That's why I've always got a gun handy. Is it, Tim? Oh, Captain Run. Oh, Mr. Chase. How do you do, Mr. Chase? Fine, thank you. I'd like to have a little chat with you and the missus, if I might, Mr. Chase. Of course. I know that you've both been through a lot, but I feel this is important. We have very good reason to believe that the man shot here last night did have an accomplice. Oh, uh-huh. is that right? Yes. A brother. When did you find out? This morning. When we got back positive identification of the boy from Washington. Two and two still make four. He had a brother who was released from state's prison only last week. Hmm. What was his trouble? Robbery and attempted murder. And you people think that maybe he was outside last night? Yes. Yeah. A woman who lives a few doors down from your store said she saw a car pull out about the same time she heard gunshots. So maybe he ditched his brother and doesn't want any part of us. Maybe. Maybe not. We're not paid to act on assumptions, but to always presume the worst. We're going to place a stake out near your store for the next few nights. What if I don't want the police around my store? I don't understand. It's bad for business. I can take care of myself. That isn't the object, Mr. Chase. Our job is to catch this fellow. And if you have to be a decoy, we'd like to protect you and your wife as well as catch our man. Oh, this guy doesn't want any part You're of me. You're presuming a lot, Mr. Chase. This man is a killer, too. Though I don't like to say this, he may try to avenge his brother. If I were you, I'd treat every stranger who came into my store for the next few days as the man who might not just want to rob you, but perhaps to kill you. <laughs> You are listening to Hold Up, tonight's presentation on radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. A double-barreled dramatic treat is Gunsmoke. Written with style and acted with a flourish, every drama on Gunsmoke is one that adults will enjoy. For the adventures of United States Marshal Matt Dillon are stories about people who might have been real. Every Saturday, every Sunday, hitch your wagon to the star's address and let us take you back to the early days in Dodge City and set you down right smack in the middle of an exciting situation on Gunsmoke. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Joseph Kearns, starring in tonight's production, Hold Up. A tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Tim, 
Why don't we close up the store until the police catch this fellow they're looking for? Oh, don't be silly. Cops always look for the worst. The kid was probably alone. So some old lady up the block hears a car pull out just as I shoot. So that means we have to start running? Oh, just the same, I don't like this. Oh, Hazel, why don't you quit worrying and start getting things ready for Jerry? He'll be home in a day or two. You read his letter. <laughs> oh, yes, you're right. It'll be good to have him home. Forget all that's happened. Doing so fine at school. It's hard to believe he's in college. Well, it's not hard for me, what with all the bills. Oh, Tia. I don't begrudge him his schooling, Hazel. It's just that I hope maybe he'd have stayed home a year or two to help me with the store. Well, now, your schooling's more important. Oh, yeah, 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 maybe so. You know, Tim, I-, I can't help but think. That boy the other night, he was just Jerry's age. He was nowhere like Jerry. He was a thief, a hoodlum. He was going to rob us. Yes, I know, but... Maybe there were many reasons why. Hazel, didn't I tell you forget it? Look, check the beer. I think we're running low. I have to put in an order tomorrow. And then go on home for the rest of the night. I'll close up. No. I'm staying. Oh, now you're being silly. Silly or not, I'm staying. It's been practically the whole day now, and it's getting late. Nothing's happened since the captain was here. Nothing is going to happen. Tim, you remember what he said about every customer. Look, if we start closing our doors in the face of every customer because some policeman thinks he might be out to kill me, we might as well close up for good. Tim, this isn't a matter to shrug off. We... Evening. Uh, well, uh, can I help you? If you can't find out what you want, just, uh... Just ask. I will. Oh, uh, those are real good apples. Hood River apples. We do have wonderful apples. Uh, you know the Hood River apples? Yes, ma'am. Looks like we're going to have a storm. And it's been so nice all week. Uh, Hazel, why don't you phone... Do you have any pomegranates? Uh, I think so, over in the corner by the vegetable racks. Hazel, I was asking, why didn't you uh, phone the depot to see what trains are doing tonight? Maybe Jerry will be in earlier than we think. Would you mind waiting a minute or two before you get on that telephone? I'd like some help here. Oh, I can help you, sir. Hazel, you go on and make the call. Both of you run this store? Yeah, yeah. Then why don't both of you help me? Yeah, yeah, of course. I don't know what I want exactly. I just moved into a place near here, and I was thinking of stocking up a food supply. Oh, We'll be glad to help you. I'm surprised you people are still open for business. So soon after what happened. (laughs) Well, business as usual, you know. No, I don't. I guess those things happen to a lot of people. Besides, the police are pretty efficient. So are you. By what the papers say. It was unfortunate. For the kid... Yeah. We're going to close very soon now, sir, if I can help you. You can. How about you and your wife picking out a lot of canned goods for me? Anything you think a bachelor might need to set up housekeeping. This is all new to me. I'd be glad to. I'll just take a moment to make this call, and and then I'll be with you, dear. I thought you said you were in a hurry to close. Picking out all the things I want might take some time. Why don't you... uh, have your wife call later, huh? Uh, Hazel, come on and help me with this gentleman. All right. Thanks. How much is your coffee? In the ground coffee, sir? I don't care. Uh, a dollar three a pound. Okay. Now, you pick up, like I say, what a person needs to keep eating a week. Hazel, okay, so you better take care of the butter and milk, and I'll handle the canned goods, You folks have got a nice little store here. We like it. Maybe that's why you don't like people sticking you up, I guess, huh? How about beans and corned beef and some tuna? Sure. All right, uh, two of each be enough? Yeah. Excuse my curiosity, but what did this kid say that held you up the other night? Why, I don't remember exactly. If a person held me up, I'd sure remember everything that happened. I'd always remember. 
Did this kid show you his gun? Thought you read about it in the papers. I did. Sometimes I forget details. I never met a man who'd stand up to a man. I mean, a kid. With a gun who was about to hold him up. I do remember the papers saying the only shots fired were yours. Clean through the head. Real clean, too. Will there be anything else, sir? Yeah. How about some of those apples you folks were talking about a little while ago? I'll get them, Tim. Okay. You want all your groceries in boxes or shopping bags? Boxes. All right. Have a car to carry all this stuff? Yeah. Down the street a ways. I'll help you. No. I can manage. Well, now, let's see. That comes to... Uh... paper said you only had $15 in your cash register when that kid held you up. <laughs> You'll have a lot more after you finish with my bill, huh? There, uh, that'll be, uh, $23.44. All righty. Hazel, you can get ready to close up after this gentleman leaves. Right after I called here. We're expecting our son home from college any day now. We thought he might be coming sooner than he said. You know, boys, always anxious. Yeah. That kid the other night was anxious, too. But he got over it quick, didn't he? Hello? Oh, Captain Runyon. What? Oh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Yeah. Captain Runyon, you there? I'm sorry for the interruption. I was just finishing up with a customer. Can I help you? Yeah? Yeah? Well, what time? No sooner? Oh, oh, nothing. Okay, thanks, Captain. What do you want, Jim? He just called to say that a team of detectives are being assigned from midnight on. Around our house, too. Damn. <laughs> Didn't I tell you about not worrying? That man that just left, he worried me. Yeah, he's a queer one, all right. But like I said, we just can't be jumping every time a customer comes in the door. Besides, tomorrow we'll all feel less jumpy. Well, I'll call the depot now. No, no, never mind. Now, Jerry won't be coming home with a storm coming up. Oh, let's close up. Tim. Hmm? There's a car pulled up on the other side of the street. They turned their lights off. So what? Probably someone who lives around here. Why would they stop outside the store? Oh, no, you're just... They're just sitting in the car. They aren't going to get out. Well, would you in all this rain? They... They just keep looking over here. Huh? What... What do you mean, they? It's only one person. I don't like it, Tim. It, it doesn't look right. Hey, quit your worrying, will you? Wish we wouldn't have been so independent when the captain offered us protection. No one's going to bother us. I still haven't forgotten how to shoot. Tim. Tim, I'll call the police. Have him come out. Now, don't be silly. Tim. He's getting out of the car. He's, he's crossing the street. He's coming here. All right, Hazel, turn out the lights. Now, you throw the latch on the door. We're closed, that's all. I'll get the gun out of the register. Tim, he's coming to the door. Let me call the police, please. No, no, no. I'll handle this. Hey, open up. Come on, open up. Tim, don't, please. Shut up. Stay there. Tim, no. No. Okay, you can call the police now. Is he dead? 
is he? I don't know. Tim. Tim, turn him over. Why? Turn him over. I, I want to see his face. Jerry. Jerry. Oh, he must have got that car he was telling us about. I didn't know. I didn't expect him tonight. I didn't know. Mr. Joseph Kern starred in tonight's presentation of Hold Up. Next week, we bring you a story of flight to freedom and how it ended. It is called Security Agent. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is transcribed and directed in Hollywood by Anthony Ellis. Tonight's script was written for Suspense by Jules Maitland. The music was composed and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Alice Backus, Leonard Weinrib, Shepard Menken, Larry Thor, Byron Kane, Frank Kirstel, and Sam Edwards. The foot soldier in the fight for justice anywhere is the man on the beat. But in a big city, a policeman has many other responsibilities in addition to the big one of maintaining law and order. For no matter what the situation, the man in blue is likely to be the first one called when help is needed. Is a neighbor too noisy, a customer abusive, a woman ill, or a little boy lost? No matter what the reason, someone is sure to call the police. And in each call the men of the precinct answer, there is sure to be an intensely human story. For drama as rich in emotion as it is in excitement and action, listen for 21st Precinct every Thursday night. Don't miss it tomorrow over most of these same stations. Stay tuned for five minutes of CBS News to be followed over most of these same stations by My Son Jeep. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. 
Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now, the Whistler's strange story. Windfall. The man stood at the railing of the Jefferson Bridge, looking over the rail, hesitant, undecided. In a way, it was a foolish move, but on the other hand, he didn't know. He finally made up his mind, put his foot on the rail, and then stopped suddenly at the sound of steps. Oh. Uh, good evening, officer. What's the matter, buddy? Uh, n- nothing. I was just uh, looking at the view. Hmm. Thought you might be planning something foolish. <laughs> What if I give you that idea? Well, it's been done before, not far from this spot. Ah, I'd better be getting on. So long. So long. A half minute later, he made up his mind. Disappeared over the side. It was a good gamble. The hat he'd seen on the ground near the bridge timbers was nearly new. He smiled to himself started to try it on, and then saw something that stopped him in his tracks, frozen. Not six feet away was the battered body of a man, sprawled on the ground near one of the bridge stanchions. He paused for a minute, thinking, and then moved quickly to the body and searched the pockets. He wasn't lucky this time. There was no money, no identification, not even a pocket handkerchief. And then as he fumbled for a name tag inside the hat, he discovered something else. Stuck under the sweatband was a slim, black-covered checkbook. He just had time to stuff it in his pocket when the sound of steps on the bridge above told him the strolling officer had returned. There was only one thing to do now, call the officer, and he did it. After a brief examination... Can't figure it out. Not a mark of identification on him. Nothing in his pockets. (laughs) You didn't touch him, did you? Oh, I know better than that. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I climbed down here after that hat there. I see. Is it, uh, suicide? Not in my book. He didn't get battered up this bad jumping off any bridge. Uh, We can't do anything for him now. I guess that's, uh, up to the next of kin. If we ever find out who the guy is. A lot of them end up with a blank tag on their big toe, you know. Well, I better call in. You stick around, buddy. They may want to ask you some questions. And that's how it began, Ted, with a dead man and a checkbook. Later, when you're alone, you examine it closely. Find it's a standard one in a local bank, with seven stubs showing large withdrawals. And your heart almost stops. It's a windfall, Ted. The stub shows a balance of over $104,000. Your head begins to spin. It's staggering, isn't it, Ted? You wonder what'll happen if the dead man goes unidentified. The strange man who carried his checkbook in the sweatband of his hat. Who bothered to keep check stubs with a bank balance of more than $100,000. If you can learn who he is, learn how to forge his signature. You try to stop thinking about it. Try to force it from your mind. But it keeps coming back again and again. Even while you answer more questions during the inquest at the coroner's office, that figure, $104,000, keeps lighting up in your brain over and over again like a neon sign. If the man's unidentified, Ted, if you can find a copy of his signature, $104,000. You, sir. Hmm? Oh, yes, Mr. Coroner. The inquest is over. You can go now. Your name is... Ted Lacarno. Ted Lacarno. Okay. Police know how to get in touch with you. We'll call you again if we need you. Nothing more we can do now. Uh, you mean you've uh, found who he is? No. Nope. Worse yet, there's no way to trace him. Of course, these things take time, you know. Sometimes a few days, sometimes a week or a month before somebody misses a man and checks with us. Then, uh, uh, what, uh, what's the verdict? Eh, the usual. Victim unidentified. Death at hands of person or persons unknown. 
Tough, huh? Yeah. Tough. With the prologue of Windfall, the Signal Oil Company is bringing you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, since this spring marks the 25th anniversary of Signal Oil, it's interesting to look back on a formula for serving you better that Signal has followed ever since the very beginning. First of all, Signal products have always been sold only through dealer-owned stations. The reason? Signal believes that a man with his own money invested in his own business has extra incentive to give your car more conscientious, more thorough service that spells long, trouble-free miles. Secondly, because you want top-quality products for your car, each individual Signal service station is backed by a young, progressive organization, now serving almost 2,000 Signal dealers with resources to bring you every latest advance in petroleum science. Obviously, drivers like this combination of personal service at dealer-owned signal stations plus fine-quality signal products. For signal has grown and grown year after year from a mere handful of stations serving Southern California to an organization now serving six western states from Canada to Mexico. If you haven't discovered how much extra pleasure this signal formula can add to driving, stop by your neighborhood signal station soon. See for yourself why every day more and more drivers are joining the switch to signal. And now, back to the whistler. Yes, Ted. It began with the dead man you found under the Jefferson Bridge with a checkbook in his hatband. A man lying now on a slab in the morgue, unidentified. It's a windfall, Ted, if you can find out who he is and get a copy of his signature. You sit alone in your hotel room after the inquest, going over the stubs in the book. There are seven of them. Payments to a jewelry firm, a dress shop, several to cash. But the one that interests you is the bottom one. $350 to the Briarcliff Apartments. Next morning, freshly shaven, wearing a clean shirt, your suit carefully pressed, you enter the Briarcliff Apartments. The manager is a little startled when you tell him you're an OPA investigator and want to go over his records. It doesn't take long to discover a $350 apartment. There's only one. I'm sorry, I don't have things quite up to date, Mr. Anderson. Don't worry about it. Uh, everything seems to be in order. Uh, this uh, schedule covers the whole building? Yes, that's right. Uh, our apartments run 220 and 280, except this one, of course. Uh, $350. Uh, what does this cover? Here, the penthouse. Oh, I see. Uh, who lives there? Uh, Miss Harriet Stark. Uh huh. Oh, apparently you haven't received a payment from her this month. Oh, I'm afraid not. She's a little behind this month. Oh, well, it doesn't make any difference. Uh, thank you uh, very much. I'd better be getting along now. How do you do? Miss Stark? That's right. My name is Anderson, OPA. Mind if I come in? Not at all. I'll come right to the point, Miss Stark. We have reason to believe the rents in this building are over schedule. I understand that you're paying $350. That's right. Uh, do you have any evidence of those payments, canceled checks and so on? I think so. Sit down, won't you? Uh, no, thank you. I'd better not. I can only stay a minute. I just happen to have this check for the current month's rent. I intended to drop it off at the manager's office. Here you are. Uh, oh, Edward Reese. Uh, I see. Uh, if you don't mind, I'll take it along. It'll be returned to you, of course. Wait a but... minute. Yes? Don't go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm in a hurry, and I... Well, I wouldn't be in too big a hurry if I were you. No? No. You see, I want you to tell me why you really came here. I happen to know that 350 is official schedule for this apartment because I've checked it myself. Now, do you want to let your hair down, or shall I call the OPA office? You're doing pretty well. Why don't you go on? 
You're a blackmailer, aren't you? You're the man Edward was afraid of. Edward Reese? Who else? He was afraid of a blackmailer, huh? Why? Suppose you tell me. I don't know the answer to that one, but he had a good reason to be afraid. You see, Edward Reese is dead. Dead? Yes, I found his body night before last under the Jefferson Bridge. It's down at the morgue now, unidentified. Well, I guess it's up to me to call them. Oh, wait a minute. Don't do anything rash. What do you mean? I, uh, I had a good reason for coming here, Miss Stark. Did you? You uh, seem to have done pretty well up to now. Uh, Where do you go from here? I don't see what that has to do with you. You didn't answer the question. What happens now that Reese is dead? Do you uh, check out, forget it, or do you take a look to see if there are any more uh, golden eggs around? Look, mister. Locarno. Ted Locarno. Before you go any further, take a look at this. Edward Reese's checkbook. I found it in his hat under the bridge. There's a balance of $104,000 in the account. And nobody knows that he's dead. Uh, Does that uh, suggest anything to you? I don't know. I... We couldn't get away with anything like this. (laughs) Thanks, baby. You just passed the exam. Only one thing bothers you, doesn't it? Can we get away with it? I... I don't know. Answer that one, will you? Can we get away with it? That's all that matters to you now, isn't it? Yes. That's all that matters. Good. Ah, let me see that check again. Edward Reese. (laughs) Standard Spencerian. Probably picked it up in the fifth grade and never changed it. I'll have that signature down cold in 24 hours. You're pretty sure of yourself. All I need is a little practice. Sure. But how about that body in the morgue? What if someone identifies it? So it's a gamble. I don't know about you, but with a payoff like that, I'll take a flyer. We hold off a few days. If no one tags him, we go move in. It's as simple as that. Is it? Now, what's bothering you? Oh, I'm just wondering. I, I know. You're wondering what's to prevent you from learning to forge that signature and draw checks on the account yourself. Maybe. Well, there's only one thing. That's me. This is a two-way deal, baby. Let's have that understood right now. Okay? Okay. Yes, Ted, you need each other. But this plenty to share, $104,000. You spend all that night practicing the signature. Over and over, you write the name Edward Reese. Ten times a hundred, a thousand. By morning, you can sign the name as if it were your own. And with a little luck, it might as well be. You leave your room and buy a newspaper. Scan it hungrily as you gulp your coffee. On page six in the lower right column, you find an obscure item that almost knocks you over. You can't wait to get to Harriet. Let her read it, too. The battered body found beneath the Jefferson Bridge was identified last night by Mrs. Rosa Montalvo. Oh. Read on, read on. Uh, Rosa Montalvo, uh, who told police it was that of her husband, Jerry. Ted, they think Reese is Montalvo. Yeah, that makes everything perfect. It's clear sailing now, and we can take our time. Edward won't be missed for weeks, Ted. He never let people know when he came to the city. Yeah, there's one thing. His bank statements. Is there anyone they go to? No, no, it's a separate account. The statements are sent to a post office box. I have the key. Ah. (laughs) Mister, all you have to do now is start writing checks. The desk's right over there. Oh, wait a minute. It's not that easy. We're not breaking into a piggy bank. I thought you said yourself they think he's alive. Oh, look, sweetheart, you don't just walk into a bank and try to cash a check for 10,000 bucks. The teller would jump out of his cage. But... It's a business of transferring credit from one account to another. We got to work for this, baby. Set up phony corporations, letterheads, statements, invoices, right down the line. You seem to know your business. They call me the bright boy who never got a break. (laughs) I, uh, got one now. (laughs) Well, what's our next move? Well, we'll need some cash to get things started. How much you got on hand? Not much. The check stubs say different. I live well. It goes fast. Oh. How much is not much? About $85. Yeah, you do live well. 
All right, we'll have to take a chance. You think the bank would hold still if you tried to cash one of Reese's checks for a grand? I don't know. I've never... Well, t- you'll know tomorrow. It's a gamble, but we've got to try. Uh, meanwhile, I can use about 20 of that 85 bucks of yours. Uh, how about it? Okay. Until tomorrow. Even thousand, eh? That's right. Excuse me a moment, Miss Stark. I'll have to speak to the cashier. Yes, Austin? Uh, Miss Stark over there. She wants to cash this, sir. Miss Stark? Oh, yes. Huh. Well, Reese's account is good for him. Then it's uh, all right? I think so. Here, I'll initial it. Thank you, sir. you mean about cashing checks? I thought I'd die in there. You did beautifully, Angel. And it's the last time you'll have to worry about it. We'll be in business within a week. See, it's like I told you last week, baby. We're in business. It wasn't easy. Establishing identity in a bank is a neat trick, but I made it. Ted, you're wonderful. Yeah, three dummy corporations. All of them are you and me. <laughs> E.C., look at this. E.C. Layton Jewelry Company, $700. Malcolm Dittmar Furrier, $1,250. Atkins Brothers, $920. <laughs> Not bad, huh? I wish I was actually getting some of those things. Oh, honey, once we got all that dough spread around on these accounts, we can get it out and skip before anybody here begins to wonder about Edward Reese. Well, it can't be soon enough for me. Oh, now, don't get anxious, sweetheart. We're doing great. In another week, we'll really begin to cash in. That... You expecting anybody? Relax, I'll get rid of them. Yes? Excuse me, ma'am, but I'm from the Mary Ann Flower Shop. Oh, yes. The flower. We hate to trouble you, but there's a considerable balance that hasn't been taken care of, and Mary Ann thought that you'd want it called your attention. Well, of course. How much is it? It's $69. Just a minute. Oh, Edward? Yeah. Write the gentleman a check, will you, darling? Oh, uh, can't they send a bill? Please, darling. I forgot to give it to you, and they've been very patient as it is. It's only $69. Pretty, please. Uh, okay, sweetheart, save that talk for something expensive. Uh, go get my pen. Yes, hmm? dear. Uh, they, uh, they think it grows on trees. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, I suppose it does for some people, sir. Yeah, yeah, I suppose it does. Yes, Ted, it does grow on trees, at least for you and Harriet. Everything's going smoothly so far, perfect. You're able to relax, to feel more sure of yourself. It's almost as if you are Edward Reese, not only because of the money, but a growing interest in Harriet. She's an exciting girl, isn't she, Ted? Very exciting. Perhaps that's why you're thinking so much about your appearance lately. Why you walk into a clothing store near the end of the week and get fitted for a new suit. The clerk is gone for some time after you make your purchase. You're standing in front of the mirror when he comes back, embarrassed and apologetic. Uh, Mr. McConnell, I'm terribly sorry, but the check this Mr. Reese gave you, it's... Oh, uh, what's the matter with it? Well, just as a matter of routine, of course, we called the bank, and I'm afraid your friend hasn't sufficient funds to cover it. What? I hope it's only a mistake, sir, that you know him well enough. Oh, yes, yes, I know him well enough. And I'd better go and see him right away. What did you do with it, Harriet? Where's the money? I tell you, I don't know anything about it. Over 80000 left in that account, and they couldn't cover a check for 200 That wasn't smart, baby, not at all. I don't know what you're talking about. No? Now, why the suitcase? When people start packing, they're going somewhere. Well, I was nervous about staying here, Ted. This apartment makes me nervous. You couldn't wait. You got anxious. No, You Ted. never stopped figuring it from the first day I walked in here. You could practice that signature, too. Ted, please, it's I'm... It's no go, baby. I won't be played for a sucker. It's more than the money. Ted. You had me hooked all the way. But that's over. And so are you, sweetheart. No. So are you. Ted, no! You stand there for a moment looking down at her like a man in a nightmare. 
The red rage in your mind slowly subsiding, leaving you free to think. And you have to think fast, Ted. So you got that money somehow. You're sure of it. It's here in the apartment somewhere. You go through the half-packed suitcase first, and then tear a room apart, searching frantically. You've almost combed the apartment when... The door. Someone's at the door. You walk quickly through the kitchen to the trade entrance, let yourself out cautiously, glance down the corridor to the front door. The little man from Mary Ann's flower shop is standing there patiently. You slip around the corner, down the fire stairs, and out of the building. Twenty minutes later, you're entering the dingy lobby of your hotel. The man at the desk looks up nervously. And a moment later, you know why. When a plain clothesman moves up quickly. Ted Lacano? Yes? I want to talk to you down at headquarters. Well, what's the matter? I haven't... Just routine. Some questions about that guy you found under the bridge. They've arrested a suspect. Oh, Oh, well, look, do they have to talk to me? I've got an appointment. It won't take long, buddy. But I've told them all I know. They want to hear it again. Okay, but let's make it quick, huh? I got a car right outside. The whole thing shouldn't take more than an hour. You're still all right, Ted. That is, if you can talk to the police quickly, answer their questions and be on your way. As you ride across town in the police car, you hope that the little man from the flower shop didn't get into Harriet's apartment or raise any kind of fuss. At headquarters, the lieutenant in charge is almost apologetic. You run through the story, telling it exactly the way you did the first time. The lieutenant seems satisfied. You didn't move the body or touch anything, Locarno. Not a thing. I know better than that. Just called the officer on the beat, is that it? Right. Uh, that seems to cover it all. You see, we didn't have much to go on in this case. Yes, Sergeant? We still haven't been able to talk to the Stark dame. We've called and Conway's been over to her apartment twice. She's not at home. We've got to talk to her, Sergeant. Break into the apartment if you have to. Bring her in. Okay. Well, I, uh, I guess I can be running along, huh, Lieutenant? Uh, just one more thing, Locarno. There's a stenographer in the next room here. Would you mind repeating the story to her? <laughs> The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Right now, however, I'd like to say a word about the current trend back to good old-fashioned value in buying. Frankly, we at Signal are delighted to see this. After all, Signal gasoline, the famous go-farther gasoline, has long been the choice of drivers who appreciate extra value. And for two good reasons. One, of course, is Signal's good mileage. And number two is the thing which makes that good mileage possible. Signal superior performance. Here's what I mean. In order to put that thrilling knock-free power back of your accelerator, Signal gasoline has to help your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you enjoy extra mileage. So you see, mileage is the result of the same features a gasoline must have to give you superior performance. That's why Signal says, in gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And remember, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the whistler. So you have to fight it through for another five minutes, Ted. And a police station is the last place in the world you'd choose right now with a picture of Harriet lying dead in her apartment still fresh in your mind. It's too bad, isn't it, Ted? Everything would have been so different if she hadn't insisted on taking it all. The untapped balance in Edward Reese's fabulous checkbook would have bought the world for both of you. But you have to forget that now. Concentrate on the matter at hand. Tell your story and get out of the police station before the lieutenant's men break into the apartment. Before anything develops that will link you to the murder of Harriet Stark. You follow the lieutenant to the door of the stenographer's office. Only take you a minute, Placarno. Mary Ann Oh, Flower wait, Shop. lieutenant. Mary Ann Flower Shop. That's right. When I read all about Miss Reese in the papers, I went right up to Miss Stark's apartment. Nobody answered. 
So I thought I'd come down here and take it up directly with Mr. Reese. Well, I'm sorry. You can't see Mr. Oh, she's now. busy, Lieutenant. I'll, uh, I'll come back. This guy isn't important. Uh, no, no, later. Look, I tell you, it's all right. That guy isn't a witness. He's just been pestering us to let him talk to Edward Reese. Reese? Yeah, he's the suspect I told you about. Knocked off that guy you found under the bridge. You've, uh, arrested him? You've got Reese here? In the tank. And we've got all we need to hang him. But I... I haven't heard the last of me, young lady. I'll get to Mr. Reese. Might seem small to you people, but when a $69 check bounces, it means a great deal to Mary Ann Flores. And believe me... Uh... Why, Mr. Reese, hello. I've been begging them to let me see you. Huh? Did... Did I say something wrong? Why are you looking at Mr. Reese? The man's made a mistake, Lieutenant. You know my name is Locarno. You were there. That night in the apartment. Here. I have the check you signed. Edward Reese. Let's see that check. Of course. He signed this? Now, wait a minute. I... How long has this been going on, Locarno? I tell you, I don't know anything about it. No. Now, just a minute, Lieutenant. I'm not going to stand here and have someone tell me I'm lying. He was in Miss Stark's apartment that night. He wrote this check. He did, huh? Well, oh, what's wrong, Locarno? You look a little pale. Ever take a crack at forgery before, Locarno? You know, I'd have given you credit for more sense. How did you figure to get away with it? Reese would get wise the minute he saw his bank statement. Reese is dead. He's the guy I found under the bridge. Uh, don't you read the papers. The guy's name was Montalvo. His wife identified him. She made a mistake. We checked it. It's Montalvo right down to his bridge work. He'd been blackmailing Reese for months. Wait a minute. You mean he... Sure. Reese got fed up with blackmail and killed Montalvo. We picked Reese up last night after he cleaned out his bank account and tried to get out of the country. The bank account? Then that's what happened to it. He was a clumsy operator, too, Locarno. Huh? Yeah. Reese made as big a mistake as you did. He left his hat at the scene of the crime. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 8. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Frank Lovejoy and Francis Cheney. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch, story by Joel Malone and Harold Swanton, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. And Signal Gasoline is tops, too. Tops in quality. 
It takes extra quality, you know, to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story. Caesar's wife. It made a strange picture that morning. Frank Conway standing in front of the mirror in his luxurious hotel suite. Strange because Joe, his personal barber, who had just finished trimming his hair now, did nothing but stand there behind him holding a towel, watching as Conway shaved himself with an electric razor, wondering what to do with his hands, feeling as awkward and helpless on this occasion as on every one of the many other Monday morning routines, the weekly command performance at 8 o'clock sharp in Conway's suite. Kirby Morton, the other man in the room, was more relaxed. After many years with Conway, he'd learned to accept anything. Joe? Yes, sir, Mr. Morton. I wouldn't stand behind the boss like that. You make him nervous. What makes you think I'm nervous, Kirby? I don't know. Woman's intuition, maybe. Just got the idea from the way you talked to Judge Faulkner yesterday. Well, forget Faulkner. Well, after hey, all... quit staring in the mirror, Joe. Go on over there and sit down until I'm through shaving. See, Joe? Well, uh, you just tell me when you're ready. Well, you're hard to please, Frank. Oh? Yeah. A couple of weeks ago, you used your power to get a judge of your own elected to Superior Court. A masterpiece of finagling. Today, his honor, Judge Faulkner, calls you up to say thank you, and suddenly you're allergic to telephone. I'll give his honor to be Judge Faulkner plenty of time to thank me when he's on the bench. I'm sure you will. You don't have to jump down my throat because you're off your feed today. Okay, okay, Kirby, I'm sorry. Oh, here, Joe, take this electric razor. Uh, sure, Mr. Conway. Uh, now, Joe, put on a little powder, comb the hair. Not today. Uh, but, uh, Mr. Conway, I got beautiful new toilet water. Joe! Uh, yes, Mr. Conway. Uh, maybe tomorrow morning. Yeah, tomorrow you feel best. You know, Kirby, sometimes I don't think you're very smart. Oh, Shooting look. your mouth off about me electing judges in front of Joe. Oh, he's been with you for years. He can talk, can't he? He won't talk. He worships you. Sure. Sure, everybody worships me. Barbers, boot blacks, and fat-headed ward healers like Faulkner. I'm sick of it. I'm sick of all the loving I get just because people are afraid of me or I've got something they want. <laughs> Stay with me, raisins. Comfort me with apples, for I am sick of love. What's that? Solomon. Oh. You ought to read him sometime. Bestseller in his day. Well, I've got other things to do. Yeah, I guess you have. Well, are you going to tell me what's eating you or not? There's nothing wrong with me. You're making it hard for me, Frank. Put yourself in my shoes. Press agent for Mr. Big of the Rackets. Colorful character, the walking question mark. A guy who can swing elections and collect payoffs, but... uh, who can't stand the sight of blood or the feel of a razor against his face. Shut up, Kirby. And I can't say a word to the papers. Can't even ask questions. Front man to a guy I don't even know. I said shut up. Okay. So I shut up? You have a right to be irritated with Kirby, haven't you, Frank? Yes. In the years he has served you, he certainly should have learned that your strange fear of sharp objects, of things that cut and scratch, is something no one asks about ever. The big secret, the thing that makes you a walking question mark, belongs to you and only one other man in the world. A few minutes later, as you and Kirby are about to settle down to work, he gets on another subject just as irritating. Eh, yeah, Frank, if I didn't know you better, I'd say you had woman trouble. You got all the symptoms. Maybe you're right, Kirby. <laughs> you're a little old for that now, aren't you, Frank? I think so. Ah, uh, Gloria's a great girl. You wouldn't want a better wife. If you ask me... I didn't ask you. Now, look, Wait a Frank. minute, wait a minute. Frank, darling. Gloria, what do you mean by walking in like that? Listen to him, Kirby. You'd never know he had the top floor of this hotel practically sealed off for his private use. Now, just the same, I've just told you... Just the same, darling. Stop growling. I just dropped by to tell you I had a date for lunch. Oh? Uh, that's nice. 
Anybody I know? Oh, yes, I think so. Mitzi Raymond. You remember her. Used to be in the chorus with me at the Hermosa Club. <laughs> you don't expect Frank to remember anything that far back, do you, Gloria? Oh, you make me feel like something out of the <laughs> Floridora sextet. Resent that for me, will you, Frank? Now kiss me. I've got to hurry. Sure. Your face is so smooth, darling. Well, see you later, honey. Wonderful girl. Yeah. What were you saying about... Forget it. I don't want to talk about it now. Come on, let's get this work cleared up. I've got a feeling I'm going to have an important date for lunch. And another thing, let those guys at the Black Cat know their take was 20% under last month. They uh, know it already. That's all right. Tell them again. Tell them I'm very unhappy about it, and the figures better be up by the first. I'll get it. Expecting someone? Yeah. We'll see about that lunch appointment. Oh, hello, Sally. Uh, Mr. Conway, I did what you yeah, said. It's and... okay, okay. Well, okay, Sally, you can talk in front of Kirby. Uh, yeah. Well, well, I followed Mrs. Conway like you said. Uh, she went to a little French restaurant, the, the Maison, something or other, in 46th Street. Go on. Well, uh, she... She met someone there. Who? Oh, he's a nice-looking guy in a gray suit. They, they took a table in the corner. I'll and fill they... in the missing words. Thanks, Sully. I, I watched That's him... That's all but... I want to know. Go on, get out. Oh, okay, Mr. Con. Well. Yeah. What does that mean? That's, uh... Mitzi, he was talking about. Used to dance in the line at the Hermosa. I, I can't believe that Gloria... Kirby, was... you're a whiz at quotations. You know the one about Caesar's wife? Huh? I ran across it just the other day. Caesar's wife should be above suspicion. What did Caesar do about it, Kirby? He left her. She got off easy, didn't she? Uh, don't go jumping at conclusions. Yeah. Caesar didn't have much pride, Kirby. There's only one thing to do in a case like this. Now, now wait a minute, Frank. You've got to give her the benefit of the I've doubt. I've given her enough. I've given her everything. Well, it's about time she gave something to me. Her life? No. Not hers. But you don't know this guy. You aren't sure. I know what the book says. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's. That's all, Kirby. It's as simple as that. With the prologue of Caesar's wife, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now a word to you drivers who want to be sure you're getting the tops in quality when you buy gasoline. Just consider the fact, the only way any gasoline can put superior performance into your car is by helping your motor run more efficiently. And when your motor runs more efficiently, naturally you get better mileage. So, better quality in gasoline not only means better performance, but also better mileage. That's why we're so proud of Signal's good mileage. And it's why we say to be sure of tops in gasoline quality, there are just two things to remember. One, it takes extra quality to go farther. And two, signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now back to the whistler. Yes, Frank, render unto Caesar the things that are our Caesar's. And as you ride with Kirby Morton across town to the little French restaurant on 46th Street, the gnawing suspicion inside you has given way to a dull, sure feeling that there's only one solution now, one way to take care of the man who has dared to fall in love with Caesar's wife. 
Gloria had been so clever about it, so positive that the meetings, the casual hellos in the hotel lobby, the whispered telephone conversations were unnoticed. But Kirby is still right, Frank. You've got to be sure. You've got to see for yourself what's going on. In the restaurant, the two of you stand by the hat check stand, looking back into the cozy little bar in the rear. May I help you, Monsieur? We're just looking around. I have a nice table near the window. I told you we're just looking around. Why don't me, Monsieur? Well, satisfied, Kirby? Why? I don't know. Frank. There they are. Look at him. He's bringing her a drink from the bar. Your boy was right. He's a good-looking Joe. Yeah. Personality with shoulders and coat lapels to match. Look, Frank. He could be your brother. She's an only child. Oh, it's too bad. She's laughing. He must have said something funny. Maybe I ought to rustle up a couple of new jokes. Take it easy. Come on, come on. I've seen enough. You got to make sure. Don't worry, Kirby. Before we're through, brother, I'll be sure. Never seen you like this before, Frank, going to all this trouble, tapping Gloria's telephone and everything. Relax, Kirby. I'm handling this personally. I want to hear just how interesting lapels can be. Okay. Guess we just sit around and wait, as I say, I almost forgot. Hmm? Judge Faulkner's outside waiting to see you. Well, he can keep on waiting. Oh, get my tailor in here. Huh? Like I said. Okay. Come in, Roberts. Mr. Conway's ready for you now. Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Mr. Conway, now this will only take a minute. I just want you to slip on this coat and we'll take a quick look, eh? All right. Help me into it. Yes, sir. Now, there. There, that's it. Uh, careful of the lining. It's only basted, you know. Uh-huh. Say, uh, uh, what about these lapels? The lapels? Yeah. Oh, well, I have them pinned back, but they're the latest thing, Mr. Conway. I made certain... Well, I saw some lapels about, uh, about this wide and out to here. Oh? <laughs> Sharp. That's the way I want them. Oh, but with this type of garment... Never mind. I know what I want. Uh, of course, Mr. Conway. I was only trying Look to... Out! <laughs> what are you trying to do to me? Get away! Uh, Mr. Conway, I, I don't understand. Look at this pin sticking right out. The pin? What harm can it be? Skip it and take this thing off me, do you hear? I don't want the suit. Throw it in the ash can. Frank, he's... Pay him off. Get him out of here. I don't want to hear anymore. You yeah. better go, Robert. But, but the material... Just send the bill over I... to me. Come on. Well, all right, Mr. Kirby, though. I hate to do business this way. It's all right. See you later, Robert. Don't worry about it. Frank, I don't get it. Well, you don't have to. But it was only a pin the poor guy Skip didn't it. meet. No, no, I won't. A few days ago, it was a pair of scissors that upset. Last week was an ordinary can opener. I don't I see... I thought I made it clear, Kirby. You don't have to see anything. But we're friends. I ought to know you well enough But you to... don't. Nobody knows me that well. Now, let's forget it, huh? I've got other things to attend to. <laughs> doesn't add up for me, Frank, listening in on your own wife's shh, phone call. Shh. She's getting on the phone now. Hello? Hello, Gloria? Hello, Alan. This is it, all right. Alan, I have the money for you. Oh, swell. Look, I don't want you to think I was in a hurry for it. The money isn't important. You know that. Yeah, I know. Say, uh, I was thinking I might go out of town for the weekend. Would it be all right with you? Oh. Well, is it awfully important? Well, it... It isn't a matter of life and death. You know how I feel, Alan, about your being here. It means so much to me, just to know that you're around. I understand. Oh, I don't want you to get the idea that I think I own you, but... No, no. And I got you a room right here in the hotel. Look, Gloria, forget I even brought it up, huh? I'll stick around. Would you? Oh, that's perfect. Oh, uh, you better jot down my new room number. They moved me again. It's 1438. 1438. I'll remember. I'll be in till after six. Then I'm going to have dinner at Luigi's. Fine. I'll try to meet you there if I can slip away from the party we're going to. And I'll have the money for you. Okay. Bye now. Bye. Dirty little double crosser. What is it, Frank? What they talk about? She belongs to me, Kirby. Do you understand? Me. Oh, Frank, you're all upset. You better upset. Talk to her. No. No, I'm not, Kirby. I'm just as calm as I'll have to be. 
What are you looking for? This. What the... Frank, a gun? What's got into you? You haven't touched a gun all the years I've been with you. Longer than that, Kirby. But I keep telling you this is a personal matter. Very personal. You're talking foolish. That's hoodlum stuff. Now, listen, if this thing has to be done, I can drop a word. You'll drop words to nobody, Kirby. Caesar's wife, do you remember? Frank, you can't do this. And you can't stop me. Now, get that judge in here. It's been an hour. He's probably gone. I don't think so. Have a look, anyway. No, no, you can't talk to him now. Not when you're in this frame of mind. No? All right, Kirby, I'll get him myself. Judge and I are going to have a little talk. Come in, Your Honor. Sorry to keep you waiting so long. Oh, that's all right, Frank. I, I was perfectly comfortable. Oh, uh, you know Kirby Morton, don't you, Judge? Oh, oh, yes, we've met. Hello, Judge. Sit down. Sit down, I'll fix you a drink. Uh, no, no, thanks. I just dropped by to thank you for, um, for the way everything worked out. Oh, it's my pleasure, Your Honor. <laughs> yes, and beautifully handled, Frank. Beautifully handled. Well, we try to keep things running smooth. I figure you're going to be an asset, Judge. The people and, uh, to me. Well, I should say so. Anything I can ever do, Frank. Yeah, I'm glad we understand one another. That cuts out a good deal of unnecessary conversation, huh? <laughs> Judge, uh, I think we should have a little celebration. Nothing fancy. Maybe a quiet dinner. Oh, I'm delighted. We'll say it's your home tonight. Well, I, I'm sure Mrs. Faulkner would be honored. Good. About six o'clock, huh? Uh, six. I think that can be arranged. Uh, it is arranged. And, Judge... Yes? I'm going to be late. I... I don't quite understand. Well, you'll never have to quite understand. As far as you're concerned, Mr. and Mrs. Faulkner, I arrived at six sharp. But... Uh, I... Frank, you're my friend. I I'd do anything for you. Only, if I got into any mix-ups... There'll be no mix-ups I... for you from now on, Judge. Just do as you're told. Oh, yes, I... I think I understand. Oh. Uh, dot of six. Stayed all evening. You know, Judge, you're a very smart guy. Both on and off the bench. <laughs> and now, Your Honor, I think you'd better run along. Work things out with Mrs. Faulkner? You know the ladies, they like to plan their social activities. Oh, yes, of course, I... I will be running along. Uh, good day, Mr. Morton. Uh, see you tonight, Frank. At six. <laughs> A judge for an alibi. Is that the way it's going to be, Frank? Yes, Kirby. That's exactly the way it's going to be. It's a good thing you found use for him so soon. What do you mean by that? Because it won't take long for the people to find out he's a phony, and after he's thrown out of office, he won't be much use to you. Look, Kirby, if you're trying to stop oh, me... Oh, no, Frank. I know better than that. You've made your decision. Nothing I can say will stop you now. Yes, Frank, you've made your decision, haven't you? And you lose little time in completing the arrangement. Gloria isn't going to have any trouble slipping out. No, because you want it that way. You want her to keep her appointment at Luigi's. To be waiting for the man who will never appear. It's almost six o'clock before you're alone with Gloria. And it isn't easy to think of the brutal thing you're going to do. Gloria is so beautiful, isn't she, Frank? As she sits at a mirror combing her hair, she seems so devoted, so innocent. You're getting dressed kind of early tonight, aren't you, Gloria? Uh-huh. You don't mind if I spend a little extra time making myself beautiful for you, do you, darling? No. No, I've always wanted you to make yourself beautiful for me. Frank, what's the matter? You sound, well, strange. Do I? Yes. Is there something bothering you? Something on your mind? Nothing that can't be cleared up, Gloria. I think that after tonight, everything will be all right again. Yes, Frank. After tonight, everything will be all right again. 
And you'll be careful. Because it means so much to both of you, so much to the future. That's what's in your mind. You wait quietly until a little before six, and then let yourself out of the suite. The corridor outside is deserted, and you walk swiftly to the automatic elevator, press the button for the 14th floor. Riding down, you pat gently at the gun nestled in its holster under your coat. It's going to be quick and businesslike, isn't it, Frank? No time for a dangerous struggle. Smooth, the way you've always run things. At room 1438, you slip a pass key into the lock. Let yourself in quietly. I'd enjoy that drink if I were you, Alan. Huh? What? Go on. It's as good a way as any to die, enjoying a last drink. Mr. Conway. That's right, Mr. Conway, not Mrs. What? What's the matter? What are you talking about? Sorry, Ellen. I'm all through talking. No. No, wait. You don't know what you're doing. I... It... He stumbles and falls forward, a strange look on his face. The glass in his hand smashing into fragments on the tabletop by your side as you step back quickly. It's all over, isn't it, Frank? Quick, smooth, businesslike. Just the way you figured it. A few minutes later, you're out of his room and stepping into the automatic elevator again. You smile as you reach to press the button. Then you freeze, staring at the back of your hand. A long red line, Frank. A chance cut by the shattering glass Alan dropped. You stare at it, horrified. Because there it is, Frank. The answer to your unusual personality. Your big secret. Hemophilia. The weakness you've guarded so faithfully from everyone but your personal physician. Yes, Frank. The smallest cut or scratch can kill you. Let you bleed to death. It's the thing that's kept you away from violence, isn't it, Frank? Forced you to have things done smoothly, businesslike. Because a tiny accident like this can cost your life. No! No, I'll... I'll bleed to death. I gotta get help. I gotta get help! The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Meantime, here's good news. Brand new 1947 road maps are now at signal service stations just in time for your summer trips. And friends, uh, pardon my enthusiasm, but these new signal maps are without a doubt the finest I've ever seen. Prepared by Rand McNally, they have all the latest road changes and conditions, as well as many places of interest not included on ordinary maps. Jumbo in size and printed in full color, they're easy to read and have the new accordion fold easy handling. In addition, these new signal maps have handy extra features, such as enlarged sections of metropolitan areas. Also a radio log showing where on the dial you'll find your favorite programs as you travel. Plus a western state's mileage chart and a list of interesting places to see. Yes, Signal Oil Company has gone all out to bring you the finest road map obtainable. And now they're yours for the asking at any signal service station. And now, back to the Whistler. So the murder of the young man in the gray suit went off exactly as you planned it, Frank. And he's lying dead now on the floor of room 1438, where you left him. More than that, When the investigation is held, Judge Faulkner himself will be ready to tell the police you were at his home having dinner at the time of the killing. But one little fact, a thing you couldn't have figured on, a thing that would have made no difference to almost anyone but you, has turned it all into a nightmare. Yes, Frank, the man you killed happened to be holding a half-empty drinking glass in his hand when you fired And the flying piece of glass that cut the back of your hand can be as disastrous as final as a bullet in the head. An hour later, back in your private suite, 
You can't understand why Mannheim, your private physician, is so calm. Will you hurry up, Doc? Take it easy, Frank. What do you mean, take it easy? Look, look, you've got to do something. Listen, Frank, you must try to relax. <sighs> All we have to do is wait. Wait? Man, you're crazy. Listen, I know what can happen to me. I know about hemophilia. I've been reading about it all my life. But it's not going to happen. You're right. And you don't know how lucky you are. You need more than an ordinary transfusion. You're an unusual type and need a special type of blood. And if we had to find that type in a hurry, we knew we'd never have a chance. It's... We? Gloria and I. Gloria? She doesn't know... She does know, Frank. Because it was such an obsession with you, we never told you. It was she who... Oh, uh, that's what I'm waiting for. Yes, this is Mannheim. What's that? Good Lord. What are you saying? Yes, I know. What's that? Frank, I... I don't know how to tell you this. Tell me what? The man Gloria had moved into the hotel... The one she hired, just to be near you all the time. The one with the right blood type. Hired. Gloria hired a man? Yes. Alan Whitcomb. Oh, no. No! He's dead, Frank. Murdered. They just found him down in his room. Down in 1438. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Each Monday at this same time, brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you, to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. Featured in tonight's story were Gerald Moore and Barbara Luddy with Willard Waterman. The Whistler was produced by Gordon T. Hughes with music by Wilbur Hatch, story by David Victor and Herbert Little, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The WBBM Air Theater, Wrigley Building, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Hi, Johnny. Frank Preston, Baltimore Liability. Oh, hi, Frank. How's it going? Okay, I guess, Johnny. Say, are uh, you tied up? No, not at the moment. What is it? A bad check artist out on the West Coast has been giving us a lot of headaches lately. Uh-huh. Hotel in Monterey, another one at Santa Cruz, and this morning I had a wire from one of our clients who runs a place in Santa Barbara. $4,500 worth of claims already, and all in five days. Sounds like a very busy man. Uh, that's something else. It isn't a man, it's a woman. A woman? And you've got to stop her, Johnny. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment... It's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. 
So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Baltimore Liability and Trust Corporation, 418 Virginia Boulevard, Baltimore, Maryland. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Emily Braddock matter. Expense account item one, $158.16. Plain fare and incidentals, Hartford to Santa Barbara. My mid-morning arrival was timed for the sun and the sea to show off a sizable and pleasantly crowded harbor, some sprawling hotels, two lush green golf courses, and acres and acres of snug, expensive homes. At the police station, my contact, a Sergeant Lopez, was out, so I went over to the Harbor Inn and met the victimized hotel operator, Glenn Sheridan. Tall, gray-haired, slacks, sports shirt, suntan, and sandals. <laughs> On the face of it, you'd think I'd been in the hotel business 20 minutes instead of 20 years, the way that woman took me. Well, she's done the same thing in several other nice hotels up and down the coast, if that's any comfort. Well, it isn't. I suppose the thing that bothers me most is that if she walked through that door right now and told me none of it was true, I'd probably believe her. She was that good. Mr. Dollar, she was the best. Why, she pranced in here as big as life, and I probably didn't have a nickel in her purse. What's more, for the whole four days she was here, she didn't break her stride once. What do you mean? Well, only the best of everything. Oh. She gave you a check for $813, is that right? Uh, painfully right. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And I took it, no questions. <laughs> Every night in the dining room, she'd order champagne, special dishes. I've seen my share of grifters and bad check artists, but she tops them all. Perfume, clothes, luggage, conversation... And a very pretty woman, Dollar. Beautiful, in fact. She checked in alone, registered as Mrs. Robert Payne Beverly Hills, right? Mm-hmm. Did it strike you as odd that a woman would check into a place like this, a resort hotel, alone? No, she wasn't alone long. She met other people. Became friends with at least a half a dozen guests in the place. Uh-huh. The way she was throwing my money around, why not? She picked up all the tabs. Well, ordinarily, I'd have been suspicious under those circumstances, Mr. Dollar, but she threw me off right from the very start. Well, how's that, Mr. Sheridan? Well, she showed up about midnight, came in a cab that was just loaded down with expensive luggage. Probably wrote a bad check for that someplace. Yeah, probably. She came swinging in the lobby with a cabbie following her and told the night clerk she wanted to see me. When I came down to the desk, she yelled, Sherry! Ran up and kissed me and asked how my wife was. Can you beat that? Nope. She acted as though we knew each other. And one of those tricks your mind plays on you in this business, I actually thought I remembered her from someplace. I see. She registered as Mrs. Robert Payne. Said she was on her way back from Lake Tahoe. Wanted to rest up. Something about just getting a divorce and being awarded 3000 a month alimony. That impressed me. Well, it didn't impress anyone, Mr. Sheridan. Well, I did make a check. She gave her home address as Beverly Hills, and there was a Robert Payne listed there. Later on, I found out he's in Europe with his wife and children. But his name was in the book. Yeah, and that was enough for me. Oh, she had a wonderful four days here, I'll say that for. Getting back to that part about her looking familiar. Well, there's nothing in that, Dollar. I did think I had seen her before, and of course she helped me think it, but I was too embarrassed to press the matter with her, I guess. Do you have a copy of her hotel account? I'd like to look it over. Yeah. The police have the check she gave me. It was drawn on a bank in Beverly Hills. Was it uh, personalized? No. Maybe I should have thought something of that, huh? Uh -huh. Well, here's this much. I can't stand to look it over. It makes me kind of sick. Eight hundred and thirteen dollars. I spent another hour with Mr. Sheridan as he distastefully covered the items on the bill she'd paid with a bad check. Later that afternoon, I met with Sergeant Lopez, who reported a woman answering the same description had passed bad checks in Burlingame, Santa Maria, and Ojai. Expense account item two, $114.85. 
transportation to Monterey and Santa Cruz, where I interviewed the other two clients who had filed claims. Their stories were much the same as Sheridan's. Expense account item three, $4.15. Long-distance phone call. That you, Johnny? Yeah, Frank. All the claims are pretty solid. The police have no line Don't on this... Don't come home. Oh? Hop down to Malibu Beach. She's done it again. At a place called the Seaside Inn. The guy who runs it found out it was bad 15 minutes after she left. That was this morning. I don't expect any miracles, but if you get down there right away, maybe you can get on her trail. Well, I'll try. Expense account item four, $38 even. Transportation Santa Barbara to Malibu. I didn't even bother to listen to a disgruntled hotel proprietor repeat a story I knew so well. I went directly to the sheriff's station and Sergeant Pell's. Well, that's about the picture. She was at the inn for four days and checked out this morning. She used the name Bradley. Ellen Bradley. She can't be too far ahead of you now. No. There might be a break on this one, too. While she was at the inn, she took up with one of our local residents, a man by the name of Garland. Lives over in the colony. He drove her into town this morning. Have you talked to him? I can't find him anywhere. He has a house over in the colony. The colony? Yeah, uh, that's uh, down the road a piece. They call it that because a lot of movie stars built beach homes there a long time ago. Movie colony, you know? Oh, yeah. Is this Garland an actor? (laughs) Yeah, when he gets work, which isn't very often, I guess. Mainly, he keeps suntanned. We're trying to locate him now, and as soon as we do it... Oh, sure, then. Sure. Sergeant Pell. Yeah, right away. Garland's home now. I went with Sergeant Pells to talk with Garland, who was in trunks and sunglasses in front of his house. A healthy, muscular, handsome man in his mid-thirties. He was a little stunned by the news we brought him. Ellen, a phony? Sergeant, are you sure about this? Well, you can ask the man at the seaside inn. He got the check. And Mr. Dollar here has been looking all over the state for it. Uh-huh. Well, come on, let's go up into the house. All right. I thought I knew her pretty well. Did you meet her out here, or did you know her before? Oh, I met her at the Seaside Inn the first night she was here. Go ahead. Thank you. Now, sit down. Like something to drink? Uh, no, thank you. Not now, thanks. understand you drove her into Los Angeles. That's right. I took her in this morning. Where did you take her? The Beverly Glen Hotel. Did she check in there? No, she just dumped all her luggage. She told me she didn't know whether or not she'd have to go to Chicago tonight. Something about a house she owned there that had to be rented or sold. Did you leave her there? No, she made a phone call. Said she had to meet a lawyer. Yeah? She say where? Yeah, a bar in Hollywood. Uh, Topper on Coinga. So I drove her over there and left her. When was this? Oh, three hours ago. About one o'clock, I guess. Uh, how was she dressed? Uh, black strapless job. Uh-huh. Did she mention any names, tell you anything about herself? Yeah, she told me that six months ago, a little two-year-old boy was killed in an automobile accident. She said that was the thing that broke up her marriage to this Bradley guy. Uh Uh-huh. Said she needed to believe in something again, that she needed someone to believe in her. Well, I figured her for a pretty nice person, just having a little fling. Even with what you've told me, I believe that part of it. Why? Because she told me... She cried a little when she was telling me. Oh, I don't care how you look at me. I, I don't think anyone could invent a story that tragic without some sort of basis. Well, maybe you've got a point, Garland, but a good liar can see a story in a newspaper, adapt it to his own needs, and uh, maybe even cry a little about it. Well, I still believe it. You know, Mr. Dollar, you ought to try believing what people tell you sometime. Yeah, I'll try it. Next time I have two weeks off. What? In my business, they call that a vacation. Well, what'll it be, gents? Police. Uh-huh. I'd like to talk to the man who was on duty here at one o'clock this afternoon. Oh, that's me, Sergeant. My name's Lenny Pollard. Anything wrong? No, just routine. Well, can I get you something? No, to... thank you. We're trying to locate a woman who's been using the name Ellen Bradley. We were told she was in here around one o'clock today. Uh, I don't recognize that name. About 5'5", five, five, dark brown hair, brown eyes. Wore a black strapless summer dress when last seen. 
30 or under. Uh-huh. No, no one like that. One o'clock's a pretty quiet time. In fact, all afternoon's been quiet. No woman like that's been in here at all. You've been here all the time? Yeah, on duty since 11 o'clock. That's when we open. Uh, you sure this is the right place, the top one? Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry. Wish I could help you. When we got to the Beverly Glen Hotel, a worried clerk was still wondering what to do with the 14 pieces of luggage Ellen Bradley had left there earlier. No, she hadn't phoned in and given him any instructions. No, she was not registered at the hotel. Sergeant Pels made arrangements for a man to cover the lobby in case she showed up to claim her things. By 8 the next morning, the Central Identification Bureau in Sacramento made a positive identification on a thumbprint taken from her room at the Seaside Hotel. She was identified as Emily Miles Braddock. Her nearest living relative was a sister, Elaine. Address 112 East Orange Avenue, Los Angeles. You! You down there? Yes. Who are you looking for? Elaine Braddock. Are you Miss Braddock? What do you want? I'd like to talk to you for a minute. Well, I don't want to buy nothing. I'm not selling anything. I'm an insurance investigator. You sure you got the right party? Elaine Braddock? Come on up, mister. Just open the door and come on up. Come on in. Come on in. Wanted to see me? Here I am. What do you want to see me about? The gray-haired woman who had cackled at me from the second story was sitting in a wheelchair by the window. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm here about your sister. Oh, Emily, huh? Yes, we're trying to find her. Has she been around here? We know she's in the Los Angeles area. Emily was here a little bit yesterday afternoon. Where she's gone now, I don't know. Have no idea. How long was she here? Oh, she stayed maybe two or three hours. I hope I don't ever see her again. She's no good. Well, how did she get here? By car? Cab? I don't know. Just standing at the door yesterday, the same as you, all of a sudden. Well, how did she leave? Walked. Tried to borrow some money from me, but I wouldn't give her none, so she had to walk. Did she make any phone calls or see anybody else while she was here? Well, she made a call. Any idea who it was? No. Did you happen to hear anything she said on the phone? No. Showing up here just like that after not writing or letting me hear from her all the time she was away. Getting herself in trouble with the police. Being in jail. Ten years ago when I got hurt, she promised she'd take care of me. Look how she's done it. I have to live on the county. You know that? I got to live on the county and nobody cares about me. Is she, is she in bad trouble? I'm afraid so. Well, how bad is it, mister? Oh, ten years, maybe. Ten years? Ten years? Yeah, two was bad enough, but ten. What'd you say your name was? Dollar. Mr. Dollar, I hope you don't catch her. Even if she kills someone, I hope you don't catch her. And I hate her. You're only young a little while, and that's all you got. Ten years in prison, and she'd... She'd come out worse off than I am. <laughs> Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley's Spearmint Gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying sports and other activities. Wrigley's Spearmint Gum tastes good any time. And the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, 
you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. That afternoon, a follow-up came on Emily Miles Braddock. The completed folder included a mug shot that showed a woman of 30 years with dark brown hair, wide-set eyes, a well-formed nose and mouth. I took it with me when I went back to see Tom Garland. Oh, hi. Hi. Mind if I come in? Oh, what now? Your friend. Oh, what about her? I've been thinking about what you told me about her yesterday. That's nice. Here. Take a look at this. That's her, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's her. Can we talk now? Okay, come on in. Her name's Emily Braddock, not Ellen Bradley. Up until two months ago, she was in the state correction home for women, serving a two-year term for grand theft. Here, take your picture back. I'm not pushing my weight showing it to you, Garland. But you're a little stubborn about what you want to believe about her. If she lost a baby, as she told you, she was in prison when it happened. I thought I'd better prove this lie. All right, so you proved it. You mind if I sit down? No, help yourself. Thanks. Well, do you have anything else to tell me? Well, I suppose I do, since you don't want to seem to... You don't seem to want to tell me anything. I've been on this case almost a week now. In that time, I've talked to eight different men who have met Emily Braddock... And one woman who knew her by her real name and for what she really is. Garland, every one of those people came out on the short end of things with her. Just a minute, Joe. I've looked at this mug shot. I've heard these men describe her, and I think I can understand why. It's not hard to imagine this face set off with a nice hairdo, some earrings, makeup, and the works. This sister of hers I met this morning lives in a very crummy neighborhood. A family home. She's all Emily has left. Or vice versa. Emily walked out on her. Well, if it's as bad as you say it is, why shouldn't she? For one reason, her sister is a hopeless cripple. But even she would protect Emily. You're my only hope. What? This woman can get away from us right now. She's smart and clever. She can go right on doing the same thing she's been doing all along. Oh, she'll get caught eventually. But... But because I know her and she passed a few bad checks doesn't mean that I'm responsible in any way. You know that. You're right, it doesn't. But you're involved just the same. You're different from a hotel man who's been tilted. You're a boyfriend. True, just a four-day boyfriend. But a woman like that can do a lot of damage in four days' time. Why are you here, Dollar? What do you want? I'm here to disillusion you, Garland. Because I don't think you're disillusioned enough right now. Now, wait a minute. I you're don't a perfect stranger that... to me. I don't know you from a Grand Rapids chair. But I'm doing you a favor telling you that Emily Braddock is a crook and a thief and a forger... And that everything she ever told you was a lie. Now and then a woman walks into a man's life that he'd sell his soul for. But don't ever do any business along those lines with this baby, because all she'll do is give you a bad check for it. She's trouble in a great big way, Garland. And you know it as well as I do. Well, what do you want me to do? Apologize for meeting her? I'll be satisfied if you tell me why you lied. Garland, Emily Braddock never went to that bar you were talking about earlier. You didn't drop her off there. No one there had even seen her. And she's the kind who could walk into the World Series with 50,000 other people around and still be noticed. Where is she now? I don't know. I won't buy that. Not from you. Now, let's try once more. Where is she? What did you do with her after you dropped the luggage off at the Beverly Glen Hotel? Where did you take her? She phoned you from her sister's house yesterday afternoon, didn't she? Right after I'd been here with Sergeant Pelz. Garland... You should see that sister. Ellen's in Santa Monica. Where? At a little hotel called El Tonquis. She's registered there as Evelyn Brady. Where's your phone? It's over there. Operator. Sheriff's office, please. Thank you. Dollar? Yeah? Dollar, could it be fixed so that she wouldn't know that I told you? Could be. 
All of this beats me. I, I don't understand it. What? Oh, what you've told me is true, I know, but... An hour ago, she called me up and said, Tom, I love you. That sounded true, too. I, I told her I loved her, and now I'm turning her in. What kind of a crazy world do we live in? Twenty minutes later, Sergeant Pels and I were in the rickety elevator in the El Tanquis Hotel. A place as dingy and old as the Spanish name it bore. A little different from the swank hotels where our suspect had lived so gaily. Pels was thinking of it, too. Yeah, some joint this is. Yeah. What was it, 518? Yeah, it's down this way, I think. This one kind of harpoons you a little, huh? Hmm. Yeah, I suppose so. There are a lot worse things than passing bad checks and telling lies. But the way she handled it, no one even raised an eyebrow. Yeah. Yeah, I heard it. Yes? Emily Braddock. Beg your pardon? I said, is your name Emily Braddock? You must have the wrong room. My name's Evelyn Brady. Sorry, miss. You're the one we want. I'll have to change into a dress. I'll check the room. Excuse me. What's this all about? I think you already know. I have no idea. What is it all about? Bad checks. There must be some mistake. All right, miss. Go ahead and change. We'll wait out here. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. We'll have to keep this open a little bit. Oh? You can dress behind it if you want. If that doesn't suit you, well, we'll take you down like you are. Thanks again. Two windows on the outside, no ledge. Firelighters across the court. Any luggage? A little makeup kit. Dollar? Yeah? Now that you've seen her, what do you think? Well, I'm only human. Too bad she's a crook. Emily Braddock was held at the sheriff's office in Malibu. The officers who questioned her reported that she steadfastly refused to admit any part of some 16 counts that had been filed against her. I wasn't surprised to learn this, but I was surprised when she sent word that she'd like to see me before I left town. Hi. Here you're about ready to beat it. Uh-huh. You're the one who talked to him, aren't you? Talked to who? Tommy Garland. He told you where I was, didn't he? Sure, he did. I thought you wanted to tell me something. You thought wrong. The same as all these others around here. I'm not going to tell you or anybody else anything. Police are like hotel men. You figure out their little system and then you beat it. If you say so. I don't have a lot of time. We could be pretty good friends, you and I, if this hadn't come up. I mean, a drink or something together. We'd have looked nice. Oh, look, Emily. You're the one who got him to tell where I was. And he asked you to fix it so I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah, Tommy would do that, I know. What I don't know is what you said to him. How did you get him to tell? Is that all you're interested in? It's not asking anything. Well, I told him just what you are. A thief. A crook. That sold him? Well, he told me where to find you. I guess it did. <laughs> I must be slipping. He slept a long time ago. When you walked out on that sister of yours, when you thought you could talk and look your way into anything you wanted. I didn't know I thought that, but if you say so, whatever I've got, it's worked. Has it? Two years, the last time. Whatever you get this time will be longer, no matter what you say or don't say. I'm not in a courtroom yet. That's where it happens. Not in a lousy jail. We'll see about that. You're just as bad and just as dumb as the worst of them. Any day you believe that. Like it says in the manual, when a woman suspect is to be interrogated, remember that the strongest appeal to her is in her family connections and moral outlook. Question her regarding these. Stinking cops. Just stinking cops. You never give up, do you? Hardly ever. Stinking cop. <laughs> Mm 
Emily Braddock goes to trial next month. I won't be there. But six clients of Baltimore liability will be. Expense account item five. Miscellaneous, $265. Item six, same as item one. Transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $738.32. Remarks. The next time I go after a check artist, I hope it isn't a good-looking woman who feels that there's no one in the world she can't dominate. This last one scared me, even if she was behind bars. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment... Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar... Brought to you by Wrigley Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by E. Jack Newman with music by Milton Charles. Featured in tonight's cast were James McCallion, John McIntyre, Bill Conrad, Stacey Harris, Jeanette Nolan, and Joan Banks. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. WBBM-FM, Chicago. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, John Lund as... Johnny Dollar. Philip Martin, Johnny. Hold on, Mr. Martin. Got a job for you. Fine. A man named Carl Nelson is insured with our company. He was killed. How? Shot to death. Got a police record. Small-time hoodlum. Beneficiary is a woman named Gilkerson. Maud Gilkerson. Uh-huh. She disappeared. Police think it probably has something to do with Nelson's death. Want to see what you can find out? Sure. All right. Get down to New York as soon as you can. Contact Lieutenant Korchak at 11th Precinct Homicide. He'll give you all the help he can. I'll get right on it. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you John Lund in another adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For refreshing taste, plus chewing enjoyment... Treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. When your mouth and throat feel hot and dry, a stick of Wrigley's Spearmint gives you quick, long-lasting refreshment. The lively, full-bodied Spearmint flavor cools your mouth and freshens your taste. The chewing itself helps keep your throat pleasantly moist. Best of all, you can chew and enjoy refreshing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum almost any time and any place. Keep a package handy right in your purse or pocket so you can chew a stick whenever you want it. For refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Millions enjoy it, and you will too. (laughs) 
Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Columbia All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Nelson matter. Expense account item one, $15.36, train fare and incidentals between Hartford and New York City. I arrived at 2.30 in the afternoon and after registering at the hotel, went directly to the 11th Precinct Police Station where I introduced myself to Lieutenant Korchak of Homicide. How much does your company insure the frog for? The frog? Uh, Nelson. He was called the frog. He, he looked like one. Oh? <laughs> he was insured for 10000 And Maud Gilkerson gets the money. Do you think she had something to do with the killing? Well, I think she knows something about it. Any theories about why he was killed? Nothing definite. The frog was a hood, long record, did time twice, been in every racket from the numbers to stick-ups. You know, you don't generally get anything definite on a killing like this. Some of the boys wanted him dead. Who or why is hard to tell. He's been associated with Ellis Hartje for the past year or so. That's pretty big company. Yeah, Hartje's about as big as it come. Probably got unhappy with a frog and had him eliminated. Have you questioned Hartje? Sure, but just as a matter of routine. If Hartje had something to do with it, it's going to be tough to prove. Well, I guess the first thing to do is find the beneficiary, Maud Gilkerson. Well, that's not going to be easy. We've done a lot of looking. Well, I got a friend in town that just might be of some help. Do I know him? Probably, but I'd rather not mention who it is. He doesn't get along very well with cops. <laughs> not many people do. My friend's got a king-size allergy. But for the right people and the right price, he can be very informative. Well, good luck, Dollar. Thanks. I'll let you know if I come up with anything. Expense account item two, two dollars and thirty-five cents cab fare from the precinct to Skid Row and Hetz Hilarity, a saloon that always looked as though it wanted to collapse when the sun hit it too hard. Inside, I found Wilbur Truitt sitting at the almost deserted bar, sipping muscatel through a glass straw. Ah. Hello, Wilbur. Bucko. You are indeed a sight for sore eyes. And, Bucko, my eyes are sore. Pull up a Heppelwhite and rest yourself. Can I buy you a drink? Oh, noble prince, a king among kings. You've come in the nick. Can you buy me a drink? If it were not so early in the day and my spine not yet limber, I would bend and kiss your feet. I'll just take a rain check. Innkeeper, a flagon of your best amber tonic. Oh, Bucko, I've missed you. Do you realize what with economic conditions such as they are, that your absence has been the bane of my existence? Goodwill is a thing of the past. Wilbur. I once looked upon mankind with a warm smile and a kind heart. But I find it difficult to keep from becoming a complete cynic. People are pinching pennies completely out of shape. Soon the exchequer will be filled with a gigantic mass of unrecognizable copper. Why, a year ago I was averaging as much as 50 cents a day. A whole bottle. Maybe it's your pitch. My pitch? Sir, my pitch is a thing of beauty. An excursus of cogent puissance. A compassionate discourse on human suffering. Okay, My okay. pitch would tear the heart out of Mephistopheles himself. Wilbur. Uh, yes, Bucko. Where can I find Maud Gilkerson? You know why my eyes are sore, Bucko? No. Why are your eyes sore, Wilbur? I had to brave the morning sun. Things had become so desperate, I pawned my dark glasses. Oh, I'm sorry. If things don't improve, I may have to part with my glass straw. The only sure method of deriving substance when in the throes of the shakes. Maud Gilkerson is worth a bottle. Granted. In fact, I'd venture to guess that the lady is worth uh, two bottles. Mm -hmm, you're probably right. I'll have to call her. I'm staying at the Yorkshire. She may not want to see you. Tell her I've got 10000 for her. 
I beg your pardon. Tell her the frog left a $10,000 insurance policy and she's the beneficiary. Good Lord, perhaps I was wrong. There are still a few good deeds left in the world. Sure. I just gave you two quarts worth. Expense account item three. $2.60 for a cab back to the hotel where I went up to my room and smoked a half a dozen cigarettes while I waited for Wilbur Truett to call. Around 4.30 in the afternoon, the phone finally rang. Johnny Dollar. Bucko? Yeah, Wilbur? I finally contacted the party. She's not happy. Did you tell her about the insurance? The first words out of my mouth. But it seems Mr. Nelson's insurance is not enough to bring color to her cheeks and a smile to her ashen lips. What does she want? Some insurance of her own. What do you mean? She's hiding because her life's in danger. She has no money to leave town. She'll make a deal with you. Go on. Enough money to leave the country. You said town. A logical progression. The town first, then the country. Believe me, Bucko, her plight is worth considering. What will she give me in exchange for the money? That is her own personal secret. But she told me to tell you it's worth every cent. All right. Go to 107 River Street, the last room at the back of the hall. Tell her Wilbur sent you. Right. Thanks, Wilbur. I put on my hat and coat, crossed the room, and opened the door to go out into the hall. But I didn't make it. There, standing on the other side of the door, about to knock, were two ugly-looking men dressed in loud jackets. Your name, Dollar? Yeah? Mind if we come in? What'd happen if I did? We'd come in. That's what I thought. Then why'd you ask? I make little bets with myself. I want to talk with you for a few minutes, Dallin. Okay. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. Want some advice? Not especially. Make a little bet with yourself. You're going to get it anyway. I'm a lap in front of you. Then here it is. When Bert asks you a civil question, give him a civil answer. Okay. Ask me a civil question, Bert. What are you doing in New York? It's a nice town. <coughs> oh! Why, you... Hold it. He'll just belt you again. With a broken arm? <laughs> You're pretty tough, huh? All in how you look at it. If breaking his arm is being tough, then that's the best name for it. Okay. We don't want any trouble. <laughs> that's a funny line. I won't ask you no more questions. That'll save some time. I'm just going to tell you. Lay off a Nelson killing. You understand? Yeah. You said lay off the Nelson killing. Good boy. Because if you keep nosing around, somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Understand? Yeah. You said somebody will just have to come down and investigate the dollar killing. Fine, fine. Now that you understand, we'll be going. Nice meeting you both, informally, like this. Expense account item four. $3.25 for another cab that took me down to 107 River Street. The address was an old two-story frame house that faced the water. I went in and walked down the dark hall to the back room. Who is it? Wilbur sent me. What's your name? Dollar. Come in. Are you Maud Gilkerson? Yeah. Wilbur said you'd make a deal. That's right. But I want to know what I'm getting in return. Look, Sonny. Take my word for it. You get more than you're paying for. Now, how much did you bring? I got a couple of hundred. A couple of hundred? That's all I had on me. If you want more, I'll have to get it. Sonny, I gotta get out of the country. This is enough to get you out of town. If what you've got is worth it, I'll send you the rest. Not on your life. When I leave this room, nobody's ever gonna hear from old Mort again. You've got 10000 coming from Nelson's insurance policy. Uh, how long will it take to get it? Well, that depends. First, I've got to report on Nelson's death I and... gotta get out of here as soon as I can. Another day or so, they'll find me. Well, it'll take at least three weeks before... Three weeks? Sonny, if I stay here, I'll be buried in three weeks. What are you scared of? Dying. I don't like the idea. I don't blame you. 
How soon can you get me some more money? How much more? Five hundred. What am I buying? I'm not telling you anything until I get the money. Okay, then we'll just forget it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm not trying to be tough, but what I got is too hot to go around shooting my face off about. How do I know if I tell you that you won't take it to the cops? You don't? Well, Wilbur said I could trust you. That's right. Okay, okay. I'll tell you. But give me the 200 on account. There you are. Okay, thanks. Uh, you want a drink? No, thanks. Mind if I have one? Go ahead. I don't usually take this stuff, but uh, I, I need it. <coughs> oh, Frog left me 10,000, huh? That's right. Uh, nice guy. Nasty disposition, but he was okay. You didn't know him, huh? No. Well, he's been with the outfit about a year now. The outfit? Boss Hotchie. Alice Hotchie? Yeah. The frog done pretty well for himself. Until lately. Yeah, he, he always worried they'd hit him in the head. He was always planning they shouldn't. You know how it is with small guys like the frog. You never know when something goes wrong and the outfit sends word to hit you in the head. Frog always worried about getting hit in the head. Ah, but he was smart. While he was alive. Yeah, yeah. He figured as long as he was smart like he was, he'd fix it so hard she would never be able to hit him. Frog was in on most of the stuff hotchie has been setting up in this town. Not big in it, you know, but in it. And he kept his eyes open. Found out too much and they killed him for it? Yeah, but it wasn't only what he found out. It was what he collected. Collected? Enough evidence to send Hotchie and his boys away for a hundred years. Maybe the chair, even. Did Hotchie know it? Sure. Frog told him when he found out he was hot. He told Hotchie if he got killed, the stuff would go to the D.A. And you've got it. I got it. Why didn't you give it to the D.A.? Well, even if they send Hotchie up, he's got friends. I'd be dead before he went to trial. You want another 500 for... And that's dirt cheap. Especially when the dirt's liable to be in my face. How long do I have to get it? Well, just as soon as you can. Like I said, I ain't got much longer. You found me and you ain't got connections like Hotchie. Oh, they'll find me. I'll have the 500 in an hour. Okay, okay. I'll make arrangements. Uh, wait a second. Here. What is it? What does it look like? It's a key. You've been okay with me, so I'll trust you. It's a key to a locker in Grand Central. Number 415. That's where the package is. Friends, no matter what kind of work you do, it's a real help to chew delicious Wrigley Spearmint gum right while you're working. When you're warm or tired, for instance, the lively, full-bodied spearmint flavor is really refreshing. It helps keep your mouth and throat feeling cool and moist. Chewing on that smooth, good-tasting piece of Wrigley Spearmint makes the time pass more pleasantly, too. It seems to make your work go smoother and easier. Keep a package or two of Wrigley Spearmint chewing gum handy all the time. Enjoy chewing Wrigley Spearmint while you're working and at other times. That's Wrigley's Spearmint chewing gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> And now, with our star, John Lund, we bring you the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. After Maud Gilkerson gave me the key to the locker in Grand Central, I left the old house on River Street and started back for town. It was getting dark, and there were no cabs in that section, so I headed west for the busy traffic. I'd only gone about a hundred yards when a car pulled away from the curb about a half block behind me. A big black car with the lights off. I thought about the key in my pocket and the evidence in the locker that would send the biggest hoodlum in the country away for life. I had to get rid of the key before they caught up with me. I turned a corner, and there, a few feet in front of me, was a blind man. A beggar sitting with his legs folded and on his lap a tin cup with a stack of pencils. Bless you. Thanks. I'm going to need it. Hold it, Tyler. 
Well, good evening. Get in the car. Get in. In the back seat. Just don't take advice, do you, Dollar? You didn't say anything about taking a walk. I told you to lay off the Nelson killing. Who says I didn't? You dug up Maud Gilkinson. Who? <clears throat> oh, I told you. When Bert asks you a civil question... Give him a, a civil, civil answer. answer. Okay. So I dug up Maud Gilkerson. So what? What'd she give you? A lot of double talk. She gave me nothing. I think you're lying. But we let a couple of the boys off to talk to her. They'll find out. What happens in the meantime? We drive around while the goon searches you. Then we go see someone who wants to have a little talk with you. Okay, goon. Search him. Get down on the floor. Is that your name, goon? Get down there. I should have guessed. What? Oh, nothing. Nothing. Bert drove us around, the goon made me strip down to my socks while he searched my clothes. When he didn't find what he was looking for, he swatted me across the back of the neck, told me to get dressed, then Bert drove us across town to a big apartment house that overlooked the river. Bert parked in the basement garage, and I was led into an elevator that took us to the penthouse. Ellis Harji, the czar of the underworld, looked up from his evening paper. This is Dollar, boss. Did he find more? Yeah. Ernie and Frank are with it. Uh-huh. Well, sit down, Mr. Dollar. All right. Bert told me he and the gun paid you a little visit this afternoon, eh? If you can call that a little visit. The gun get rough? Don't tell me he can do something else. <laughs> You're kind of fresh, huh? I'm ripe enough to know I don't like getting pushed around. Sometimes you've got to take a pushing around to understand things. I don't take a pushing around from you or anyone else, Harjee. You think you've got a choice? Not at the moment, no. If I want you to take a beating, you take one. I'll make up for it. You ain't making up for anything. Now, you've got to understand, I'm running things, see? You ain't going to say nothing about what happens or what don't happen. So you just try and relax and take what comes, huh? You cooperate. It's going to be nice. He didn't have anything on him. Nothing, huh? I went over him good. He didn't have nothing. She tell you where it is, Dollar? What? You know what I'm talking about. Whatever it is, the frog left for Maud Gilkerson. I found Maud Gilkerson to tell her Nelson left her $10,000. She didn't say nothing about me. Not a thing. She didn't say anything but thanks and get out. He was in with her for about 10 minutes. So it took her 10 minutes to say thanks and get out, huh? Look, what do you think she said to me? That's what I want you to tell me, Dollar. How can I tell you something when there's nothing to tell? I located Maud Gilkerson to tell her that Nelson... Okay, 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 you said that. I don't know what you're so worried about me for. Or an old dame like Maud. What can we do to a big man like you? Make me mad. Nello. Yeah. No. All right, take care of it. Yeah. Now, that was Ernie. Maud, tell him anything? Yeah. She told him that she gave Dollar a key. Is that right, Dollar? She gave you a key? She told him she gave him a key to a locker in Grand Central Station. Is that right, Dollar? She told him the locker number was 415. The stuff was in a locker. Is that right, Dollar? Do me any good to say no? No. The goons searched me. He didn't have no key on him, boss. All right. All right, where is it, Dollar? I haven't got it. Take him somewhere and find out what he done with it. Yeah. Let's go, Dollar. You're making a mistake, Archie. Nice meeting you, Mr. Dollar. The goon and Bert took me back down in the elevator hustled me into the car and drove me back across town to a warehouse in the Bowery. In a small room on the second floor of the warehouse, the goon went to work while Bert stood by with a gun. Where's the key, Dollar? I don't know. <laughs> and you're the guy that was going to bust my arm. 
It'd be a whole lot easier if you'd just tell us. I can't tell you about something I haven't got. <clears throat> oh. The goon worked on me until I passed out. Then he threw some water in my face and started working on me again. Oh, he knew his job. It hurt, but it didn't kill me. When I was coming to for the third time, the phone rang. And Bert left the room to answer it. I knew this was the only chance I was going to get. When the goon leaned over me with a bucket of water, I grabbed the cuffs of his trouser legs and pulled. I staggered up to my feet as the goon started up off his back. I kicked him as hard as I could in the face. I grabbed the heavy bucket and stumbled over to the door. Just as Bert came back from the phone call. Hey, goon. Ask me a civil question, Bert. I tied them up as best I could, then took Bert's gun and the car keys. I found my way out of the warehouse, climbed in the big black sedan, and drove across town to the block that ran into River Street. All the way, I kept my fingers crossed that the blind man with the tin cup and pencils would still be there. Pardon me. Yes? I came by here a little while ago and dropped a key in your cup. Oh, yes, I found it. Uh, uh, here it is. I'd like to buy it back. Buy it? Yeah. Here. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, I guess I'd better be going. It's beginning to rain. No, it isn't. It's just bleeding out. I wheeled the big car back across town to the 11th precinct and caught Lieutenant Korchak just going off duty. He took one look at my face, mumbled something about careless truck drivers, and sat down to listen to my story. Bird and the goon? Yeah. I left them in a warehouse. They won't stay tied up long. The boys that picked up Maud Gilkerson were named Ernie and Frank. Ernie Phillips and Frank Seller. I'll have them picked up. This key could bust this town wide open. I hope you're right, Dollar. A lot of people have tried to get Harjie. Now, let's go down to Grand Central. Right. Oh, uh, about Maud Gilkerson. What about her? They uh, fished her out of the river about an hour ago. Yeah, okay. Give me the key. Here. R.G. knows about this locker. Ernie and Frank forced Maud to tell them before they killed her. You sure? They called R.G. while I was in his apartment. He told me. Ah, well, let's see what we've got. Huh. A package. Korchak, look out! Huh? I'd seen them just as they came around the corner. The goon was grinning through the teeth I'd kicked out, and Bert had a big lump on the side of his head where I'd nailed him with a bucket. Everyone came out with their guns all at once. Korchak jumped to one side, and I dropped to my stomach while I squeezed out all six shots from the gun I'd taken away from Bert. When the smoke cleared, Korchak was down, but he was smiling. He'd caught one high on the shoulder, but Bert and the goon were through being bad boys. The goon was dead, and Bert didn't have far to go to catch up. The wagon cleaned it up, and Korchak and I got ourselves patched up at emergency. They wanted to keep us in for observation, but Korchak had waited too long to get Harji, and nothing was going to stop him from making the arrest. I didn't want to miss it either. Korchak collected a squad, and we paid a visit to the penthouse. Think he skipped? Stakeout said he hasn't left the building. Come on, Harji, open up! This is Korchak, and I got a present for you. Get back. Come on in, Korchak. I got a little something for you, too. You know, I'm kind of glad he wanted it this way. I'll shoot the lock, and then we go in. All right, hit the door. You all right, Dollar? Yeah, sure. Is he dead? He sure is.
Expense account items five and six. The $200 I gave to Maud, which they never recovered, and a dollar fifty for the two bottles I gave to Wilbur, who recovered three days later. The contribution to the blind man is on me. Expense account items seven and eight. Seventy-five dollars and ninety-five cents. Hotel bill, train fare, and incidentals back to Hartford. Expense account total, three hundred and one dollars and one cent, and multiple bruises. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment, treat yourself to delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The taste of fresh spearmint is cooling and delightful, and there's lots of it in every stick of Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. It freshens your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and sweetens your breath besides. You'll enjoy the good chewing, too, because Wrigley's Spearmint is so smooth and pleasant to chew on. There's nothing else quite like it. Next time you're at the store, stop at your friendly merchant's display of chewing gum and get a few packages of good-tasting Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Always keep some handy for refreshing taste plus chewing enjoyment. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. <laughs> Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars John Lund in the title role and was written by Blake Edwards with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Rodman, Joseph Kearns, Herb Butterfield, Jim Nusser, James McCallion, Martha Wentworth, and Bill Conrad. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Jaime Del Valle. <laughs> The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley's Spearmint Gum every day. This is Charles Lyon inviting you to join us again next week at this same time when from Hollywood, John Lund returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. In the era uh, when the girl who was um, up to the minute was expected to display an hourglass figure, a buxom soprano christened Helen Porter Mitchell was the toast of New York and every capital in Europe. Today, in a way, she still is. You will see what I mean in the course of this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the makers of Underwood typewriters. In 1893, just one year before the debut of the very first Underwood typewriter, Music-loving New Yorkers thronged to the Metropolitan Opera House for the American debut of the soprano who was already the darling of Europe. She came, she sang, she conquered. However, the particular incident which affects our dictionaries had to do not with the high C, but with low calories. As many soprano before and since, this noteworthy lady worried considerably about her weight. For many months during her tenure as prima donna of London's Covent Garden, she engaged the services of a masseuse, who came to our house in London every morning. But alas, it wasn't enough. She had to go on a strict diet, too. And herein lies her entrance into our dictionaries today. After one Covent Garden triumph, she went off to celebrate with a party of friends in the dining room of the Hotel Savoy. Exercising a great self-control, she shook her head at pheasant under glass and asked the waiter instead for a plain order of unbuttered toast. Somehow or other, the toast order was shunted off to an inexperienced assistant. When the prima donna received her snack, it was dry, thin, and hard. But instead of reacting to this with a temper tantrum, the soprano not only quietly ate the toast, but asked for another order of it, exactly the same. And now I suspect you know how this lady at the opera fits into our dictionaries, and in some case, our diets. I'll type the expression out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with a golden touch. It was Melba Toast. After the turn of the century, prima donna Nellie Melba. The singer was born 
Helen Porter Mitchell in Australia back in the 60s, but when she made her opera debut in Brussels in 1887, she adopted the stage name Melba after the city of Melbourne in Australia. As any lover of rich desserts knows, Madame Nelly was responsible for the naming not only of the diet dish of Melba toast, but also a high-calorie concoction of vanilla ice cream peaches and claret sauce originated by the great French chef Escoffier, in short, Peach Melba. All of which means that Madame Melba was the only opera singer in history to be the toast of the town and also its dessert. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment. You may live among completely modern furnishings in a 1959 model split-level house in the newest housing development in town. But your vocabulary, nonetheless, contains a touch of ancient Greek design. We'll be exploring this relationship between the creation of an Athenian architect over 2,000 years ago and our present-day speech on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, leaders in the field of typewriters and business machines for more than 60 years. 2,300 years ago, among the favorite sightseeing spots of the thriving Greek city of Athens was the bustling local marketplace. One of the favorite sites there? An open colonnade at the north side of the market decorated with colorful panoramic scenes of great moments in Greek history. The paintings were big, impressive, and created by a famous Greek artist named Polygnotus. But the tourists, in truth, weren't nearly as interested in the pictures as in the Athenian citizens who strolled on a covered porch in front of them. Just as Hollywood sightseers flock to a restaurant where they have a chance of seeing Marilyn Monroe in person, so did these visitors hang about the porch on the north side of the Athens marketplace. Since Athens was at its peak quite a few years before the invention of motion pictures, the sightseers came not to ogle at movie stars, but at another sort of celebrity, philosophers. The professional thinking men in these filterless days of ancient Greece did most of their thinking in public places, in stores or temples or public bars or perhaps on street corners. Beginning in about 300 BC, a goodly number of them made their headquarters every day on the open public porch where Polygnotus illustrious battle paintings were displayed. They talked, they argued, and interested citizens were welcome to listen all they liked. In time, the influence of these thinkers spread far beyond Greece. But no matter where they lived, the followers of this philosophical school referred to themselves as if they had developed their ideas in the shelter of an Athenian marketplace colonnade. To people who seem to follow these philosophical ideas today, we give the same name. I'll type it out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with the golden touch. The word is stoic, currently used to describe someone who seems not to be affected by passion or feeling, someone who's indifferent to either pleasure or pain. We get the word stoic from the school of ancient thinkers who established indifference to pleasure and pain as a philosophical goal. The ancient thinkers got their name because they hung out inside a painted porch in the Athens marketplace, such a porch in Greek being a stoa. On tap for next edition of Word Detective is the story of a murder case which greatly shocked the citizens of the 12th century and gave us a word. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment. 2,000 years ago, in the crowded marketplace of an ancient North African city, the soldiers of Caesar Augustus sampled an exotic new delicacy from the East. This was the start of a chain of events which led to a treat on our tables and a word in our dictionaries. You'll hear more of that word on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of this station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, for more than 60 years a leader in the field of typewriters and business machines. During the years when the sprawling Roman Empire fanned out to include most of North Africa, the Emperor Caesar Augustus signed an imperial edict which elevated a bustling Mediterranean seaport called Tanja to the status of a free city. We know this ancient Moorish metropolis as Tangier. In Caesar's time, it was a rich and cultured metropolis, an important stop on Arab trade routes from the Far East. Uh, the gate of the city which led to the, the produce-packed stalls of the marketplace gave local citizens access to a selection of the most exotic wares in the world. Spices from Ceylon, steel from Damascus, and at some point during Tanja's long history, nobody quite knows when, 
The squatting marketplace moors added to their display a strange but delicious new fruit, delivered to the West African port by Arab caravans from the Malay archipelago half a world away. Within a short time after the fruit from the east was first put on sale in the marketplace, it was not only being served on West African tables, but also being cultivated in thick West African groves. When Caesar's foreign-based GIs visited the Tanja marketplace, this same cycle started all over again. They came, they saw, they tasted, and conquered by the experience, started their own flourishing fruit groves back home in Italy. Tucked into the toe of a Christmas stocking or adding color to the fruit centerpiece of a Thanksgiving table, we're apt to think of the fruit now as being all American. But when we add it to our shopping lists, we still refer to it as if we were ordering not from a neighborhood a grocery store, but from the honey-scented stalls of a crowded North African marketplace. Maybe you know now the word which all this is leading up to. I'll type it out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with the golden touch. The word is tangerine, meaning literally a native of Tangier. This red-tinged member of the orange family, distinguished by its easily detached rind, actually originated somewhere in tropical Asia. We know it as a tangerine because 2,000 years ago, a group of African-based Roman soldiers went shopping in a Moorish market for souvenirs for the folks back home. On tomorrow's edition of Word Detective, we're off to the races in search of not just one word history, but a whole bundle of them. Now don't go away. I'll be back in a moment. 117 years ago, an ambitious young man from Belgium set off for Paris in search of fame and fortune. He didn't do too well in the fortune department, but fared a bit better with regard to fame. His name is still a part of our language today. You'll hear exactly how and why on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service of the station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, for more than 60 years, a leader in the field of typewriters and business machines. He was the son of an inventor and set off for Paris in the year 1842, with ambitions of being an inventor himself. He worked out plans for a new invention in his father's workshop in Brussels. All he had to do now, he reasoned, was finish this invention, patent it, sell it to the French army, and voila, his fortune would be made. He finished his invention on schedule, had it patented, demonstrated it to General de Rumini, aide-de-camp of King Louis-Philippe, and won the general's recommendation that it be adopted officially by the French army. Then came the problems. No military appropriations debate in Congress ever stirred up more controversy than did this suggestion of the generals that present army equipment be scrapped and replaced by that provided by the young inventor from Belgium. Military men ranted, editorial writers raved, and finally it was decided to arrange a special competition utilizing old equipment and new. When this test was over, the Committee of Impartial Judges issued a unanimous decision. The models of the Belgian inventor were much superior to any currently in use. And so the ambitious young inventor from Belgium signed his name to a contract giving him exclusive right to the manufacture of his invention for soldiers of the French army. Within a very few years, the invention was adopted by the armed forces of Great Britain, too, and then in the United States. Now, surrounded by such 20th century developments as radar, jet engines, and guided missiles, this invention, patented in Paris in 1846, is still on hand in army supply depots, and still, of course, in our dictionaries. I'll type the word out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter, the only typewriter with the golden touch. The invention of the young man from Brussels was the saxophone, named for its inventor, Adolf Sax. We think of the saxophone primarily as a dance band instrument, but its inventor conceived it originally as an exciting new tonal addition for military marching bands. Young Adolf Sax was handy with his hands and had a talent for invention, but unfortunately was not a very good businessman. He never did make the fortune he dreamed of, but there were other compensations. By the time Adolf Sachs died in the 1890s, his invention was one of the most popular instruments of the musical scene, which it still is. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment. Could be you've never once been in the gleeful position of totaling up your winnings after betting a 30 to 1 long shot at the racetrack. Even so, the world of paramutual machines and daily doubles 
has made you richer in one respect, your vocabulary. We'll be presenting a few examples on this edition of Word Detective, prepared as an educational service on this station in cooperation with the Underwood Corporation, for more than 60 years a leader in the field of typewriters and business machines. Aqueduct, Hylia, Pimlico, Santa Anita, and Belmont Park may be as remote from your world as the craters of the moon. But it would be quite unusual if you'd never used such expressions as neck and neck, photo finish, on the nose, or dark horse, all of which had their origins in the environments of the racetrack. Each of these terms shows its racetrack background very clearly. But there's one very popular American expression which most people don't suspect came out of the straw-covered horse stalls behind the racetrack grandstands. We inherit this particular phrase from old-time American horse trainers who discovered that their high-strung thoroughbred charges grew considerably calmer if some other animal moved in with them as a regular stall mate. These emotionally stabilizing stable companions stayed with the thoroughbreds all through their training period and went along on track-to-track -track travels too, for it was particularly important for a horse to maintain a calm equilibrium on the day of a big race. And now, enter the villain. On more than one occasion, so racetrack legends say, unscrupulous gamblers sneaked into the stalls a few days before a race and made off with the animal, which was the steady companion of a horse ranked as a favorite. Without his long-time stall buddy as a calming influence, the horse would go to the post in the nervous twit and finish far out of the running, and the gamblers, with gloating smiles, would tilt up their winnings. If I tell you now that one animal very often used to fill this role of calming companion was a goat, perhaps you can guess what expression it was that this old-time horse trainer's custom brought into our language. I'll type it out for you right now on my Underwood typewriter. The only typewriter with the golden touch. The expression was to get one's goat, which, according to one school of entomological thought, had its origin in the old-time horse trainer's habit of calming down a high-strung thoroughbred by giving him a goat as a roommate. To get a horse's goat was to make him nervous and unable to function at his best, and in our time the expression has this same meaning to bewilder, confuse, or baffle, to irritate, annoy, or vex. The only difference is that nowadays, when we use the expression, getting his goat, we are talking not about a horse, but a human being. Don't go away now. I'll be back in a moment. The National Broadcasting Company's Department of Special Events, cooperating with the United States Navy, is presenting in a series of four programs a report to the people of the United States on the progress of its Navy in the war being fought in five oceans. Report title, Battle Station. Tonight, the Battle of the Atlantic, Part 2. It's a familiar human failing for a futile challenger entering the ring for a return bout to tip his hand, to speak of new stratagems, of new powers. It rallies his supporters to confidence. This time it'll be different, he says. I got the champ figured out. I'll work in with my left hand inside his right hand lead, and I got a heavier punch this time. A paper hanger entered a war with much that same sort of a statement. In 1918, Germany was defeated in 1918 because of the failure of the U-boat. Today our U-boat fleet is powerful. We will not fail again. Right from the feed box, to mix the metaphor, straight from the horse's mouth. And containing a high percentage of truth from a man never noted for his veracity. Germany defeated in 1918 because the U-boat failed. 
25% true. Today, Germany's U-boat fleet is powerful. True. Germany will not fail again. We shall see. How has the battle gone? The Battle of the Atlantic. Anxious millions have followed its progress from bad... January, ships sunk, 32 ships. To a little better... February 1943, 20 ships. To worse... March 1943, 25 ships. But what of the enemy? What are his numbers? What is the state of the morale of the enemy's men beneath the sea? Illustration. Naval officers talk to a member of a captured U-boat crew. He speaks fair English. Lived in this country a few years. Would you rather talk in German or in English? I can speak either language. However the tide of battle has gone for the men beneath the sea, the arrogance remains. Name? Rank? Manfred Holtz. Radio man. How long have you been on the service? Seven years. The Führer's U-boat fleet is not manned by novices. The officers nod. Seven years of experience is not rare in Dernitz's U-boat fleet. Hitler began to build his weapons for the Battle of the Atlantic in 1935 and to train his men. How much action have you seen on the Atlantic? All of it. I have fought in the Atlantic since the start of the war. If you give me a chart, I will show you where our sinkings have been accomplished. Get a chart for him. Yes, sir. He's not trying to be helpful. Their invisibility in battle robs them of the glory they believe should be theirs. This fellow now would like to boast... And perhaps to mislead. Here's the chart. Now, if you intend to waste our time with some of the fairy tales they broadcast over your radio... No, no. You will recognize the actions I report. Ah. That's where we got the first of your ships. Off Cape Cod. On what date was that? Oh, sometime late in January. It was very easy then. Simply to follow. Then at dusk. Boom! <laughs> well, if it was so easy, why didn't you keep it up? Oh, there was no use taking chances close to your shore when there was unprotected shipping elsewhere. A uh, plane patrol gave you trouble? Some. Some. And our coastwise convoys? Some. Some. As I say, the chances were uh, unnative. Needless. Yeah. Needless when there was unconvoyed shipping elsewhere. And you haven't had such a good time lately. Oh, there is some trouble, but... We are not entirely helpless against convoys. No, do you believe that? Do you know how many men you've lost? No, and neither do you. And in this, he is partially correct. Unofficial estimates in April placed the Nazi losses then at 12,000 trained officers and men lost or taken prisoner. But this man doesn't know. Only Admiral Dernitz knows accurately. Where is your control center located? If you should find out, I would like to know. Somewhere in France is the Allied guess. The Nazis boast frequently that Allied bombers fly over it regularly, their camouflaged U-boat control center. How many U-boats do you think you have left? I would be interested in knowing that, too. No, he doesn't know. Between four and five hundred is a frequent guess. A hundred and fifty of them on the hunting ground simultaneously. But what of this fellow's morale? Do you think you have a chance of winning the war? There's not the slightest doubt we shall. Yes, in March, the Nazi U-boat crews still had the highest morale of the German fighting forces. They were tough, hardened, and they were winning the Battle of the Atlantic last March. This meant postponement of the dreaded Second Front in Europe for it could not be launched until the steady flow of material of war across the Atlantic was assured. Yes, their morale was high in March, for in February, they had had good news. This is Berlin calling, the overseas service of the Reichsrundfunkgesellschaft. Here's an important announcement from the Führer's headquarters. Vice Admiral Karl Dönitz has been appointed by the Führer to succeed Admiral Erich Rehler as Grand Admiral of the German Navy. Here's a recording of the historic pledge Grand Admiral Dönitz has made to our Führer. Die gesamte deutsche Kriegsmarine wird in Zukunft in den Dienst des unbeschränkten U-Boot-Krieges gestellt werden. The entire German Navy will henceforth be put into the service of inexorable U-Boat warfare. 
Morale was high in the Nazi U-boat fleet in March. The moment of the supreme test had arrived, and their victory was in sight. It was all out now on both sides. London has announced new attacks by the Allied Air Forces on Nazi submarine bases at Saint-Nazaire and Lorient. Blows aimed where they would hurt. For Danitz's raiders must hold up at least two weeks for overhauling and restocking between each sally into the hunting ground. Many weeks longer for repairs to depth-bombed submarines. Blows aimed where they would hurt. In the United States, convoy escort vessels were coming down the ways in unnumbered scores. This, too, was an answer to all-out submarine warfare. The showdown in April. The battle will be won or lost here... Los Fire Or here A naval officer turns the dial of a submarine locator sounding device You've got one, sir I got something Bridge Getting something on the sound detector 500 yards broad on the starboard bow. Right. Progress is tearing the cloak of invisibility from the raiders beneath the sea. You are hearing first a tone sent out by the escort vessel, then that tone as it returns, reflected from the hull of a submarine. And the U-boat, lying beneath the surface, is like an ostrich, with its head buried in the sand. Set. Fire! The Battle of April. And the United Nations waited for word of its outcome. No figures, but by the first week of May, cautious words of the outcome began to be heard. From Washington. A statement by Admiral Ernest J. King, United States Commander-in-Chief. An officer not noted for his optimism in the matter of U-boat warfare. The submarine menace is being dealt with. We expect to bring it under control now in four to six months' time. Then from London. Winston Churchill. Never hasty in his declarations, in substance announced... In May, for the first time, the Allies destroyed more submarines than the Nazis can build in a month. This has been our goal in the anti-submarine campaign. In fact, we did not expect to attain... This rate of destruction until 1944. And then, from of all places, Berlin. An official Nazi publication not given to understating successes nor to overstate failure. However untiring U-boats fight against the American convoys in the Atlantic and the Mediterranean, it is not possible to strangle enemy supply lines. <laughs> Who won the Battle of April? Losses in April, 14 ships. Much lower than March. The Battle of May? Losses in May, 9 ships. Lower still. June. How went the battle in June? A joint British-United States statement. June losses from submarine attack were the lowest since the United States entered the war. Fewer submarines are appearing in the Atlantic. They almost never attack the main convoys. But the sinkings of Axis submarines continue substantial and satisfactory. Substantial and satisfactory. How with Grand Admiral Dönitz's gastric ulcer? He had boasted that he knew all the answers. Is he at a loss for an answer to the July questions? A professionally blithe voice from Berlin answers... Our Admiralty announces that the Reich U-boat fleet has been summoned to home bases to be equipped with a new secret weapon promised by Grand Admiral Dönitz as the answer to increased Anglo-American shipping. What the new secret weapon is has not been hinted at. A little doubt is allowed that it will be. Secret weapon. A timely variation on an old theme. Yes, the U-boat fleet disappeared from its old hunting grounds. 
while the United States' not-so-secret weapons continue to take to the air, to the sea. And old techniques received new polish. The weapons? DD, DE, SC, PBY, YP, PC, K2, the cutter. Destroyers, destroyer escorts, sub-chasers, patrol planes, converted yachts, patrol ships, blimps. K2 is a blimp. At the start of the war, there were just four. Today, there are many more. Their specifications and performance an open secret. Their effectiveness, well known to the raiders that lurk below the waves. K2, 250 feet long, can cruise up to 2,000 miles at 55 miles an hour. With a crew of eight, armament including machine guns, bombs, and depth charges. They have the ability to patrol 2,000 square miles of ocean every 12 hours, have a visibility of five miles in all directions, can see as deep as 70 feet below the surface. K-2s hover over the clues, oil smears, air bubbles, the glow of the U-boat at night, the feather of the submarine's wake. The K-2s were there over the Atlantic as the battles of April, May, and June were fought. Now, of D.D., D.E., P.C. P.C.s are patrol ships, 170 footers of steel construction. And where are they built? On the shores of the Great Lakes, along the New England coast and inland. These are the sub-chasers, direct in line of descent from the famous Cinderella boats of the First World War. P.C. has greater speed than its forebear, greater maneuverability, and its gunpower is rapid fire. It's a match for any submarine in a duel. P.C. was there, fighting the Battle of the Atlantic in April, May, June, July. P.C. is there now. All were there. All the weapons, old and new. Here is the destroyer escort, an effective weapon that did its part. Illustration? The USS Vigilant in bright daylight is patrolling her position in the convoy screen. The crew is alert, more so than usual. Okay, Joe, you can grab your sleep now. This is your watch? Uh-huh. Had any excitement? Two depth charge attacks. You didn't sleep through them, did you? No, no, I mean you had any excitement since then. Nah, but the skipper figures the U-boats are still around, waiting for a chance to slip inside the escort ring. Well, if they're going to try, I got my special brand of hell ready for them. Get your sleep, Joe. No sleep for Joe. Not for a while. For the phone from sound man to the bridge speaks. Contact, Captain. Broad on the starboard bow. Range 500 yards. How good is it? Very good. Pretty sure it's a submarine. Come right to 015. Right to 015, sir. General quarters, Captain. Not this run. All depth charges ready, sir. Very good. The engine room telegraph on the ship's bridge shows her going full speed. All hands are tense as she reaches the estimated point of dropping her ash cans. It's the skipper's judgment when and where to drop them. The sound man has been feeding him information as to the bearing and distance of the hidden submarine. Suddenly from the captain... Right full rudder. Right full rudder, sir. Intently, the skipper has his eyes glued on the stopwatch, watching that second hand closely. Stand by to drop depth charges. Drop one. One drop. The second hand moves a few points on his stopwatch. Fire throwers. Both throwers fire. Drop two. Two drop. Drop three. Three drop. The charges explode at their set depths, and the DE bounces on the waters upheaved from below. The men cling to railings and stanchions until the spray off the fantail has fallen, and the sea slowly recovers from the shock of explosions underwater. What's the matter, Joe? Can't you sleep? Are you kidding? Hey, do you think we got a nibble? Oh, no. 
Just waiting to see. That slob submarine didn't surface by mistake or something, did it? No, no, it was under. Picked up the contact on the sound device. Man, oh, man, would I like to see one of them babies come up with oil spouting out of it. Submarine breaking water off port quarter. Submarine breaking water off port quarter. <laughs> Less than 600 yards away lies the long, gray hull of a Nazi U-boat. Its decks awash. The skipper on the deck trains high-powered glasses on the quarry. Men coming from its conning tower. Think they're quitting, Captain? All deck guns open fire! Oh, so they want to fight, eh? on the DE speak deeply and solemnly and often of destruction. The rain shortens and the shells find their marks in the plates of the submarine and the 20 millimeter slug slice across the U-boat deck. Then the sub settles, points its bow toward the sky and dives to the bottom. The new destroyer escorts along with the valiant older types of ships have struck their blows in the showdown fight. No, these are not secret weapons. Theirs are not cosmic punches. Workmanship, design, and the indefinable, the intangible, the uppercase X in the equation of power account for their successes. The uppercase X, what is it? Call it TM. Not an official designation for this scale-tipping fighting weapon, but let's call it TM. Gurnets cannot produce the TM... Not as well, not as many. This is just one phase in the development of TM. A large room, large and dark, and there's the tingle of alertness in the air, not seen, for it is very dark, just sensed. Stage one. Gradually, there is a suggestion of light filling the room. This is the interior of a room. There is a ceiling overhead, yet the haze of dusk fills the room. Stage two. Dusk is wiped out in just a moment. And the room is flooded with the luminescence of moonlight. And with the introduction of this light, young men can be seen staring unblinkingly into the void. Stage three. Moonlight gives way to the gray of dawn. This is a phase, a feature of the development of the Navy's most vital weapon. TM. Trained men. In special courses of training directed by the commander-in-chief of the Atlantic Fleet, they are learning, being trained, to see in near darkness. To be armed in combat with a vital power. Trained eyesight. These are TM, successor to the ersatz product now rapidly vanishing in obsolescence, the totalitarian Superman. These are trained free men, Navy weapons that have proved their worth. Navy gospel. Ships without well-trained men are only ships. Ships with well-trained men are men of war. The eyes that have sighted the subs, the hands that have set the courses, set the fuses fired the guns, have written the record that proves the worth of the Navy's intangible, the uppercase X in the equation of power, trained men. Yes, we have one of these men here in the studio tonight. He is Joseph K. Brainerd, Seaman First Class, Regular Navy. Where are you from, Joe? Wycliffe, Ohio. That's just east of Cleveland. Well, I guess battle stations means more to you than just the name of a radio program. It sure does. It means life or death to us in the Navy. When general quarters are sounded and we rush to our battle stations, we know that we must get there in a few seconds, whether we're dressed or not, regardless of what we've been doing. Not only our own lives, but the life of our ship depends on every man doing his own job in time of danger. What about the rest of the time, Joe? There isn't any other time. Any moment may be dangerous on a ship at sea in time of war. That's why the Navy takes such great pains to train us for action. That's why we study so long and so hard. Why we go through drills. Well, we get every detail of our job down pat and go over it time and time again. A ship is run by teamwork, teamwork involving every man aboard. At times, does the training get tiresome? No question about it. At times, we get tired of standing watch for hours without anything happening, especially when you're bitterly cold and you're soaking wet from spray coming over the bow and it's dark and there may be a German submarine 400 yards away and you can't see it. If you try to relax for five minutes... That can be a bad five minutes. Why, Joe? You might come to with a start and see a suspicious-looking object out there in the water. It might turn out to be an empty barrel, or the wake of a porpoise, or even a funny breaking wave or a low cloud in the horizon. But if there's the least bit of doubt in your mind, you pass the word and immediately sound general quarters. 
Then a guy's off watch come piling up on deck. Some with their pants or shoes off, but all of them with their life jackets on, ready for anything. What happens if it's a false alarm? Nothing. Nobody squawks about being pulled out of bed or away from chow or the card game. They know it might have been a submarine, and that they might have been in the water by then. They just say, that's okay, boy, you keep your eye on the water. And if you see something else funny, just give us another buzz. We'll be right back up. These false alarms and the day-by-day routine on shipboard must get you down at times. Not exactly, but the tenseness of waiting is bad sometimes. It's a tight feeling, exactly like the feeling you get in a dressing room before a football game. But it goes away as soon as general quarters sound and you're ready to do your assignment. But aside from the calls to battle station, every day is pretty much the same. It's a routine of four hours on watch and eight off. No matter between any day in the week, we're always surprised when we're reminded that it's Sunday and time for church services. Maybe nothing will happen all day, but it's still important to be ready for anything. And your listeners are mighty glad that you are ready. Thank you, Seaman Joe Brainerd. Now on our list of forces in the battle, ESF. ESF. No, not a surface ship, not a secret device, not a secret technique. ESF is the Eastern Sea Frontier, whose defense is controlled by closely integrated frontier units directing the fine science of U-boat detection, directing the task forces that smash the marauders. Somewhere on the Atlantic coast is located the headquarters of the Eastern Sea Frontier, one of the several sea frontiers doing equally valiant work in the Battle of the Atlantic. Hitler would sell what's left of his soul to have a man here even for a few minutes. For on the wall of the plotting room, a huge map of the Atlantic is dotted with small, numbered, colored shapes of celluloid that show at a glance the situation of every convoy, every ship, every patrol plane, every blimp that plies the waters of the Atlantic, and the location of every reported enemy U-boat. This is the nerve center. Seated at a long table facing the map, silent naval officers, each a specialist in his phase of U-boat eradication. It is only a matter of seconds that the report of a sighted sub is flashed by radio and telephone to this center. And a matter of only a few seconds more for these silent men to dispatch planes and surface craft to the attack. This is the headquarters of the United States Navy's Eastern Sea Frontier, a vital, powerful force in the Battle of the Atlantic. The Battle of July is ended, and the United Nations await the significant news of its outcome. The tenth of each month has been the assigned day for the joint release of United States and British communiques on the tide of battle. Two days overdue now, the report may have come with a distinguished recent visitor to Canada, Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Our history of the Battle of the Atlantic has been brought to the present moment, with just one more development to add. It was a month ago that Grand Admiral Carl Dönitz called his pack home to be refitted with a secret weapon. A week ago, the German radio fairly crackled with its news. This is Berlin calling. Our Admiralty has announced its latest masterstroke in the inexorable U-boat warfare against the Anglo-American forces. The Reich submarines have been equipped with a device that will prevent their detection. Make them completely invisible. A direct answer was forthcoming from the London radio. This is London. The British Admiralty has just announced an attack by a pack of 30 submarines on an Allied convoy. Two of the U-boats are reported definitely sunk, and one other is quite likely sunk. None of the ships of the convoy nor of the escort vessels was damaged. It will be for some future historian to record whether it will be the Allied Navies or the Axis Naval Command who adds the final perfecting Philip that makes the Axis U-boat completely invisible. But the Battle of the Atlantic goes on. The final score has not been written. Final victory will take more ships, more planes. American workers in the factories have helped bring the battle to the present favorable turn. It is in the workers' power to help bring the final victory. Keep sending the weapons, America. Your Navy will put them to good use.
This has been the second in a series of four programs prepared by the Special Events Department of NBC in cooperation with the United States Navy. The script was written by Charles Gussman. The music was composed and scored by Leo Kempinski and the orchestra directed by Joseph Stopak. The production was under the direction of Joseph Mansfield. Next Thursday at this time, Battle Stations tells the story of the development of the Navy's air arm, of the pioneering that has given the air arm its striking power, the first launching of an aircraft from ship deck, the first landing of an aircraft on ship's deck, pioneering with the catapult, with dive bombing, the first air crossing of the Atlantic. Next week on Battle Stations. <laughs> Costello speaking, Battle Stations was presented in New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. The Electric Company's public information program brings you your better living radio theater in its salute to the American home, its family, and its way of life in this bright American future. Tubes in your radio, the power behind this station which brings you this program, the nightlight at your child's bedside, the giant motors that drive the machines to mold our steel and power your production lines, the current that pops your family toaster, foods, aircraft, railroads, automobiles, and ships. Electricity always at hand, day or night, with its economy for lower cost to you, with rising efficiency through its own research, with its growth to match the nation's needs at all times. Electricity is at work to bring you better living. This is your narrator, Wendell Niles. And now we bring you a half hour to death. A dramatic story of a nationwide search by telephone for the antidote to a household poison. This is the sixth in a series of broadcasts at this time to show you how Americans in a free nation have worked to bring you better living today. In fact, the highest standard of living in the world. Later you will hear from today's guest, Mr. E.M. Blakesley, President of the United States Independent Telephone Association. And now your better living radio theater presents today's story, A Half Hour to Death. Operator. Operator, this is an emergency. I'm trying to find Dr. Ralph Collins, but no one answers at his home or his office. Can you find him? It's my little girl. <laughs> How many times a day do telephone conversations start like this throughout the United States? From farm, home, and city apartment alike. Of course, there are times when parents, being what they are, the trouble is not as severe as they first imagined. But in our story today, a child's life does hang in the balance. And we present it to show you in how many different ways the telephone services are available. Today, the telephone reaches almost every corner of America. It carries the news of the ladies' aid meeting an exchange of ideas between leaders in business and in government. It has become so much a part of the home that children use it as freely as adults, never stopping to think of the way in which it works, of the never-ending source of electricity behind it. Electrical power lights homes, office, farms, and factories. And through today's communication systems, it illuminates men's thoughts. This in the short space of little more than 70 years. Some of you can remember those days before the telephone. Doctor has to be at the Hobart's farm. If he's not there, I don't know which farm to go to next. I've already covered most of them around here. But I know little Josie can't wait much longer.
In a few years, such rides, such worries were unnecessary. Early in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell took out his first patents on the telephone. Bell and his colleague, Thomas Watson, fashioned an electric machine which carried one human voice to another, first in only one direction, then in both directions. By 1900, there were almost one million telephones in use. Long-distance lines reached out to Chicago and Omaha. Bell's original patents were licensed to other companies besides his own. And this allowed the rise of local telephone exchanges, which burgeoned with the years until in 1952, for example, there were more than 48 million telephones in use, an average of over 180 million completed conversations each day. And to almost every one of us who uses the telephone, new wonders of communication to remote points. Have you experienced what it is like to have a whole telephone network at your fingertips? I sincerely hope your experience won't be like that of George and Peggy Parks, but just in case it should be. You're home early, George. Yeah, traffic wasn't so bad this afternoon. <laughs> have a good day. Oh, well, a baby cried a lot, but he's sleeping now. Where's Kathy? She's playing in the backyard. I've got something for her, a special present. Will you go on inside and change the comfortable clothes and I'll call her? She certainly is your child. <laughs> Yours, too. Well, of course. But the way she goes around fixing things. When she grows up, her husband's going to have a handyman worth her weight in tools. She's been pretending to fix her wagon all day. Oh, not with my good tools. No, certainly not. She uses that old wood mallet you gave her to play with. She goes in and out of the garage, pretending it's a new tool each time. <laughs> I'll go find her. It's time for supper anyway. George! George! Be down in a moment, Peg. George, come right away. It's Kathy. Something wrong? I found her lying on the garage floor, terribly sick. I think she's taking something she shouldn't. There's a small bottle on your workbench lying beside her. <laughs> Operator. Operator, this is an emergency. I'm trying to find Dr. Ralph Collins, but no one answers at his home or his office. Can you find him? It's my little girl. Have you tried him at the hospital, sir? Yes, he's not there. Do you know whether he has a telephone in his car? In his car? I... I don't know. One moment, please. Please hurry. Mobile service. This is an emergency call. Please call Dr. Ralph Collins. Yes, I'll wait. What's happening? Who's she ringing, operator? Mobile service is trying to contact Dr. Collins in his car, sir. Can't you get him? Dr. Collins cannot be reached at the moment. He will call as soon as he returns to his car. Dr. Collins will call back? How does she know he'll call back? It's another wonder of mobile service, that rapidly growing part of modern telephone communication which extends service to trains, trucks, and private automobiles like Dr. Collins's. A small high-frequency radio receiver and transmitter have been set up in the rear luggage compartment. The call from mobile service goes by telephone wire to a low-powered radio transmitter in the vicinity. And from there, the signal has gone out to Dr. Collins's car. Dr. Collins arranged for the installation a year ago when another older doctor retired and moved away leaving him as the only doctor in a large summer resort community. When George's call came through to his car, the car was parked outside a house ten miles away where Dr. Collins was working on another emergency case. But now here he comes, and as soon as he steps into his car, he notices a red light glowing by his telephone handset. Though the bell stopped minutes ago, this light tells Dr. Collins a call has come in for him. Mobile service. This is JZ 39907. You have a call for me? Operator. Thank you, mobile service. One moment, please. Hello? Mrs. Parks speaking. Mrs. Parks? Dr. Collins, you call me? Oh, doctor, yes. Yes, George called you. It's Kathy. What about her, Mrs. Parks? She was playing in the garage, and we think she drank some soldering acid George had on his workbench. She's terribly ill. George just brought her into the house. How long ago do you think she drank it? Well, it may have been 15 minutes, perhaps an hour ago. I'm sure I saw her playing about an hour ago. Do you have the bottle with you now? Yes. Well, we must have an antidote for... What's printed on the label? The label's gone. 
Well, then call the place where you bought it and get the formula so I can get an antidote right away. I'm in Monroe Township now. I'll drive right over. What did he say, Peg? He's coming right over, but he needs the formula for the acid. George, call the place where you got it. Do you know where? Sure, Johnson's Hardware. Operator. Operator, can you give me Johnson's Hardware store? This is an emergency. I'll dial them for you, sir. Johnson Hardware. This is George Parks. I bought some soldering acid last week, and my little girl drank some of it. I need the formula on the label so our doctor can get an antidote. Just a minute, just a minute, Mr. Parks. Somebody came in earlier today and asked for that acid. We're clean out. You sure? Positive. Looked all over the store, even after he'd gone. Well, where do you get the stuff? What company? Golly, Mr. Parks, the boss is gone, and I don't know who we buy the acid from. He might know, though. Where is Mr. Johnson? He went out on somebody's fishing schooner, middle of the afternoon. I, I think it's the mermaid. Mermaid? Thanks. Operator. This is Parks again. I've got to reach Mr. Johnson of Johnson's Hardware. He's on board the schooner Mermaid. Can the Coast Guard get him? It's urgent, very urgent, you know. I'll try to get Mr. Johnson for you. Another facet of today's wonders of electricity and the telephone, ship to shore service. But when George Parks talked to Mr. Johnson aboard the Mermaid, he found the hardware store owner didn't know the formula either. But he did know the name of the company that made the acid. In this race against death, George called the company offices, even though it was undoubtedly past closing hours. Only the watchman was on hand. tried to get the company president at a hotel 300 miles away where he had a business meeting. But the company president wasn't there either. But George did learn that he was flying back from the meeting. The president told George that the only man who could give him the formula was the company's chemist. So the search started all over again. No one answers, operator. Try that other number. All right, Mr. Parks, I will. And she did try that other number, and another, and still another, where finally she found the company chemist was aboard a crack train speeding across the country a thousand miles away. Yes, yes, that's the formula, doctor. Yes, that should make an effective antidote. Did you reach me in time? Oh, I'm glad, very glad. She ought to be out of danger in no time, huh? Oh, that's fine. And say, uh, I want to meet that young lady sometime. She's the first one who ever drank any of my formula. In less than a half hour, the parks had traveled thousands of miles thanks to the telephone and the magic of electric power which supplies the current for these modern wonders. Wherever the telephone goes, there, too, goes electricity. We hope that you and your family will face no such emergency as the parks. But day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in all kinds of weather, the telephone and electric power, which you take for granted so readily, are there at your command. Now, here is our guest of the Better Living Radio Theater for today, Mr. E.M. Blakesley, President of the United States Independent Telephone Association. Electric power and the telephone industry continue to play a big part in bringing this nation better living and making it strong. Today, the telephone is taken for granted, and yet it continues to save seconds, minutes, and hours daily. In doing so, it helps get things done quickly and more efficiently. Think of it, an average of 181 million calls made a day. Without the telephone, our business and social life would go backwards and slow down to a horse and buggy pace. 
Yet this industry's research and development goes forward and each day brings newer and better things. What of the future? Like electric power, with its expansion and daily use, so too is this industry serving our citizens and helping to provide better living to all Americans daily. Thank you, Mr. Blakesley. You've been listening to Mr. E.M. Blakesley, President of the United States Independent Telephone Association. The Better Living Radio Theater has brought you a half hour to death, the sixth in a series of broadcasts at this time, presented by this station and the Electric Company's Public Information Program. Now this is your narrator, Wendell Niles, inviting you to be with us again at the same time next week when the Better Living Radio Theater will present another program in this series. Until then, wishing you better living. Yukon 28209. Yes, this is Candy Matson. The National Broadcasting Company presents Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. Ladies and gentlemen, before we commence tonight's Candy Matson story, it's a very great pleasure to welcome as our distinguished guest this evening the widely read radio columnist of the San Francisco Examiner who conducts his own radio column under the title Day and Night with Radio and Television. Mr. Dwight Newton. Thank you, Dudley Manlove. Recently, I conducted a popularity poll to determine our readers' favorite radio program originating in San Francisco. Heading the list and a top-heavy favorite was your Candy Madsen program. In behalf of the Examiner readers who participated in the poll, I am happy to present this award, which reads as follows. 1950 San Francisco Examiner Favorite Program Award. This certifies that readers of the San Francisco Examiner have voted Candy Matson their favorite local radio program in a poll conducted by the underside writer of the column Day and Night with Radio and Television. Congratulations to all who participate on the Candy Matson program, to Monty Masters, who writes and directs it, and to you, Natalie Masters, the Candy Matson star. Thank you, Dwight Newton. We're doubly proud of this award tonight because next week's program will mark Candy Matson's first birthday. From all of us here at NBC in San Francisco to Dwight Newton, the San Francisco Examiner, and most of all, you, the listeners, who've made this award possible, our very sincere thanks. We continue now with Candy Matson, Yukon 2, 8209. Just a moment, I'll be right there. How do you do? Uh, you, you are Candy Matson, aren't you? Yes, that's right. And who are you? Willa Gray. Come in, won't you, Willa? Is there something I can do for you? I, I don't quite know how to explain this. It's my brother. Your brother? Maybe you've heard of him, Miss Matson. Gordon Gray? Why, sure. The songwriter? That's right. Who doesn't know him? He's written almost as many hit songs as Irving Berlin. What about him, Willa? Well, like many people I know, Gordon is a crime student for relaxation. He reads all the books, listens to all the radio programs, and naturally he's heard and read a great deal about you. Well, I'm flattered. When... I suggested talking to you. He agreed immediately. Talking to me, Willa? What about? Well, it's his mental condition, Miss Matson. He's suddenly become extremely childish. All day long he sits at the piano playing nothing but uncoordinated notes. Are you sure they're uncoordinated or is it some new style he's trying to develop? 
Miss Matson. You're familiar with Gordon's work. Songs like Lazy Old June, The Tenderness of You. What he's doing now is just musical gibberish. How well I remember Lazy Old June. I was just a kid in high school at the time. Are you living with your brother, Willa? No, I'm not. Just as well, too. I don't think I could take it. Why do you say that? These foolish notes he plays. He says he's working on a thing to be called Symphony of Death. That someone is going to kill him. Why? Now you've got me interested. I hope so, Miss Matson. He won't talk to me. Every time I drop by, Gordon just sits at the piano, laughing horribly and playing these kindergarten notes. As I said, he's a great fan of yours. Won't you go and just speak to my brother? Sure, I'll see him. Gordon Gray with a shattered mind. What a pity, if true. Think of all the jukeboxes that would have to settle for promissory notes. Candy Matson, San Francisco's well-known gal private investigator. Merely trying to get her penthouse on Telegraph Hill cleaned, and she walks into a stack of memories. Memories created by a songwriter named Gordon Gray. Symphony of Death. It never became a popular composition, but it will always be on Candy's all-time hit parade, a tune she'll never forget. Because it brought about a very strange chain of events and a fascinating finish to the entire story. Oh, and the in-between department? Well, here she is, the gal who never suffers from gaposis, Candy Maxson. When I went into the cold, hard world to make a living for myself, Gordon Gray was an American institution. That's when he wrote his never-to-be-forgotten The Rhapsody of You. I'd had no idea that Gray was in San Francisco. The last I'd heard, he was in New York, working on the score of a brand-new musical. So when his sister confronted me like that, naturally, I was caught a bit off base. She wrote Gordon's address for me, and like the rabbity little elf she seemed, ducked out as abruptly as she came. Then I dressed, drove over to an apartment house on Powell Street, just down from the family club. I pressed the button. It blew an ugly little noise back at me. I entered and went up the stairs to 221. The door opened. Yes? Mr. Gray? Yes, that's right. I didn't call you on the phone. I thought I'd just more or less barge in on you. I'm Candy Matson. Candy Matson? Do come in. Oh, please, do come in. Thank you. So, my little sister finally got up enough gumption to call you. Yes, she came by this afternoon. She, we had quite a nice little chat. A nice chat? With my sister? Impossible. A little mouse doesn't know how to put one word after another. Oh, here, here. Do sit down, won't you? Place is a mess. I've got manuscript all over the floor, the high boy, the whatnot. Everywhere. A uh, highball, spot of sherry? Thank you, no, not right at the moment. As you say. <laughs> I beg your pardon? It's nothing, really. <laughs> I'm just thinking of my monstrous joke. I'm going to be killed, you know. Yes, so your sister said. Oh. Uh, uh, Do you mind... My sister, young... <laughs> She's young enough to marry a grandchild. Do you know what? She thinks I'm slipping my cable. Do you mind if I call you Gordon? I'd love it. Providing I can call you Candy. I'd despise myself in the AM if you didn't. Candy, you're just as delightful as I had you pictured. Thanks, Gordon. Now, frankly, what do you think? Are you uh, slipping your cable? Of all the idiotic... Of course not. Willa seems convinced you are. Willa's a mere babe, a suckling. What about this new thing you're working on, Gordon? This, this symphony of death. She told you about that, too, huh? That's part of my monstrous joke, Candy. Want to confide in me? Let me know what this joke is? I don't mind in the least. You have brains. Not many people have brains in this world, Candy. But you do. And because you have brains, I'm going to give you a challenge. Okay, let me have it. Oh, no. <laughs> the challenge will only come after he kills me. He who are you referring to, Gordon? <laughs> That's part of the challenge, Candy. I see. Do you really believe that someone's out to kill you? But of course. That's the delicious part of the whole thing. I'm going to be killed. It can't be avoided. That's why I'm writing my symphony of death. Oh. Oh, sure. Now I see. You're making fun of me, Candy. No, no, I'm not, Gordon. Really. It's just that, well, I've never met anyone who was happy about the prospect of getting knocked off. I don't mind, actually. 
I've lived a full life. I've seen the world, me lots of money. I've been wined and dined by people in all walks of life. My music will live after me. That's all I care about. Now I can understand. There, you see. That's why I like you. You have brains. Uh, shall I play my new composition for you? If you like. Very well. You will discover after I'm dead. It's all part of my monstrous joke. <laughs> Excuse me. Pay no attention to the technique, Andy, my dear. My fingers aren't quite as supple as they used to be. <laughs> there, what do you think of it? Gordon, I think it's a great, monstrous joke. I knew you'd see it. It's part of the joke. You're very sharp. I knew it. That's part of the joke, and you can see it. You pay wonderful compliments, Gordon. Thank you. But don't you think this symphony of death is a complete departure from your usual style? From something like, well, the Rhapsody of You, for instance? Certainly, certainly. It's because of him. I had to write something dedicated to him, didn't I? Well, to scramble a dangling participle, who's him? The man who's going to kill me. <laughs> As I left, I tried to shake the picture of a cackling man playing one-fingered doodles on the keyboard, but I couldn't. The impression was indelible. When I arrived home, I was greeted by the sight of a familiar auto parked out in front. It was my number one boy, Inspector Ray Mallard of San Francisco Homicide. I invited him up to sit a spell and chew the fat. What's new, Cupcake? I haven't seen you for several days. Seems like weeks. Ha! Ah, a compliment. That means you're after something. I am not. Can't I ever say something nice without you misconstruing? Oh, okay, okay. Compliment accepted. Good. What brings you around here this time of day, Mellor, dear? Aren't you on duty? That's the trouble. I've been on duty for almost 48 hours straight. I have to take a little breather for myself. Working on a deal? Yeah, a hot one. No leads, no clues, no nothing. For a slight consideration, I might be inclined to help you crack the case, Sherlock. Huh. By the way, what are you working on? Nothing but hope and what's left of the bank account. You mean to say the great lady private eye is temporarily at liberty? I mean to say just exactly that. Well, if I'm any judge of your business ability, you've got enough money tucked away to buy the Philadelphia Athletics from Connie Mack. <laughs> what do you do with all your loot, Candy? Sew it in hair mattresses and sleep on it. <laughs> oh, excuse me a moment, Mallory. Sure, go right ahead. Oh, hello, Willa. I didn't expect to see you so soon. I hope you won't think me a nuisance, but I just had to see you. I understand. Come in. No, thanks. You've been to see Gordon. I just spoke with him on the phone and he told me. Yes, that's right. What do you think, Miss Matson? Very sad, Willa. How long has he been like this? Just a week or so. He flew in from New York and I could see the change in him right away. How long ago did he leave for New York? He left Hollywood for New York last month. Was he all right then? Oh, yes. Just fine. He seemed so happy. He just finished writing the music for the new show in the East. But when he got there, the backers, as they say in show business, told him the music was no good. He said he'd return to the coast and redo it. But instead of going back to Hollywood, he came here, took that apartment on Powell Street, and he's been holed up there ever since. Do you think being told his music was no good had anything to do with his present condition? Oh, I'm sure of it, Miss Matson. He's always been such... So a sensitive person. No, no, Willa. I've known several people who snapped momentarily under a terrific strain. Maybe it's not as serious as you think. But what am I going to do? Well, first, he needs aid. Immediately. I know a Judge Conway here in town. I think he'll help you get Gordon committed to a sanitarium where he'll get the finest medical aid available. A sanitarium? Oh, no, Miss Matson. That would kill Gordon. Well, it's either that or have him get progressively worse. I suppose you're right. Could you, I mean, would you talk to Gordon? Explain what must be done? I don't think I'm capable. Sure, I'll do it, Willa. You sit tight and I'll call you just as soon as I speak with Judge Conway. Thank you. Thank you so much. I, I imagine I should inquire as to how much you charge for your services. No, forget it, Willa. Getting Gordon Gray back to normal will be pay enough. You're, you're just wonderful, Miss Matson. Goodbye. 
Poor kid. So helpless. Poor kid is right. I couldn't help overhearing. She's about 90% mouse. She and Gordon must have been poured right out of the same mold as far as sensitivity is concerned. Is that the Gordon Gray Candy? The famous songwriter? That's the one. And he's cracked up? Mm Mm-hmm. Downright shame. Well, thanks, pal. Just the sight of you has picked me up considerably. I'll be getting back to the grind. Nellie, dear, hold me tight for just a moment, will you? Sure. Don't let Gordon Gray get you down a cupcake. Well, it wasn't a very pretty sight. And I've got to face him again. Thanks for the hug, Mallard. I'll return it someday. Mallard released his grip and left. I snapped my ribs back in place and sealed myself for the ordeal ahead of me. It wasn't going to be easy, but it had to be done. So once again I found myself ducking down Green Street, over Powell, across California, and down the roller coaster of a hill to Gordon's apartment. He answered the door, and I was met with just as much enthusiasm as before. Candy Matson, I was wondering where you'd been. You've been gone for ages, darling. Do come in. I've got a surprise for you. When did you get back from Europe? When did I get back? Oh, just a day or so ago. Your letters were wonderful. I especially adored the one from Naples. What a time you must have had. Yes. Yes, quite a time, Gordon. How's the new symphony coming along? That's the surprise, my dear. It's completed. Long last, it's finished. To be perfectly frank, Candy, I I think it's great. I've been in touch with Toscanini. He's going to give it its premiere performance at Carnegie next month. I've already sent him the revised manuscript. Can you picture it, Candy? A hushed crowd. Maestro wraps his baton. The orchestra comes to full attention. Then that magnificent, firm downbeat of Toscanini's and Symphony of Death is making its debut. First, the Allegretto. Then, the Molto Andante. The audience is at first inclined to scoff, to think that Gordon Gray could write serious music. From lazy old June to symphony of death. Too much of a step, they'd say. Then, Toscanini glides into the conmoto. The audience tenses, not believing their ears. Little by little, they understand what Gordon Gray is trying to express. Then, as if it were not enough, Toscanini moves into the breathtaking finale. It soars, it moves. It transports everyone in Carnegie Hall into another world. And abruptly... Symphony of Death. The Symphony of Death is over. The audience arises as one. They they shout for Gordon Gray, the composer. History's being made. More shots for the composer. But Gordon Gray isn't there. Gordon Gray's dead. Because of him. Gordon, listen to me. (laughs) (laughs) Because of him. The world will have to be denied any further music from the pen of Gordon Gray. I said listen to me, Gordon. Hmm? Oh. What? I want to talk to you. And you've got to listen very carefully. You're sick. You need help. Your sister and I are arranging to have you sent to a home nearby. They'll have you on your feet in short order. Sent away? Yes. That means he will visit me sooner than I planned. Very well, Candy. Tell Willa to do whatever she thinks best. I won't give her any trouble. It's for your own good, Gordon. Believe me. I know. Candy, you never went to Europe, did you? You were here earlier this afternoon. Isn't that right? That's right. (laughs) You just went along with the gag. That's right, Gordon. Yeah. You'll be here sooner. Much sooner than I expected. Gordon Gray went into the other room and lay down on his studio couch, face down. That's when I tiptoed out of the apartment. If 
only I could have peeked into the future, I'd never have left. Because that was the last time Gordon Gray was seen alive. I went home, fixed myself something to eat. Turned the radio on low and sat down with a book called That Frail Vessel. A book about the behavior of the human mind. Out of one corner of my ear, I heard it. It was the 10 o'clock news over NBC with Sam Hayes. And there it was. The body of Gordon Gray had been found in his apartment. The book clattered out of my hands and I sat there for a moment stunned. But only for a moment. Another second, I was driving over to pick up an old pal of mine, Rembrandt Watson. There was a good reason for it. Rembrandt studying to play the cello. On the way over, I noticed the headlines. The police had the net out for Gordon's sister, Willa. Rembrandt was home. He was agreeable to going to Gordon Gray's apartment with me. And before you could bat an eyelash, providing your batting average was good, we were in said apartment alone. My word, girl. What a garish-looking place. It didn't belong to Gordon personally, Rembrandt. He was merely renting it. He still doesn't deny the fact that it's garish. Can't be the truth now. Why did you want me to come to this Victorian mausoleum with you? Just a hunch, Ducky. Are you still taking cello lessons? Taking them? Girl, don't be ridiculous. I'm now giving them. Even better. <laughs> Just as I thought. The boys in blue haven't touched anything. The manuscript for Symphony of Death is still on the piano. Can you play single notes on the piano, Rembrandt? Well, I can try. Good. Run your hangnails over this. Hmm. Strange. This isn't music. Just a series of notes with no meter, phrasing, or regard for the proper time for the bar. Exactly. Play it just the way it's written. Very well. And call out the notes as you go along. I think I'm beginning to understand Gordon's symphony of death. As you say, B, A, B, and for no reason at all is a rest candy. D, A, D, and a rest. Go ahead. E, G, G, and another rest. Mm-hmm. And then it goes D, E, A, D, the long gap in the manuscript. You know what that spells musically, Ducky? Bad egg dead. Utter confusion. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I don't think so. As we say in the movies, continue on. F, A, G, G, E, D. No timing at all. That spells fagged. So am I. However, it goes on like this. D, E, A, F. Another rest, then B, E, E. Finny. What? Through. It's the poop. Finish. Let's see now. Bad egg dead. Fagged. Death. B. Candy love. If you're going to the notes of the musical scale, you could spell practically anything out of A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, even from a tune like Ragma. But this means something. I know it does. Gordon told me it was going to be a challenge. What? Who's there? Don't be alarmed, Miss Matson. It's only me, Willa. Willa, how did you get in here? Don't you know the police are looking all over town for you? Let them look. I don't care. My brother's dead. I read it in the papers. How did you get in here, Willa? The cops are surrounding the place. I just walked in through the front door. Oh, wait till Mallard hears about this. Willa, you didn't kill Gordon, did you? No, Miss Matson. I didn't. Honestly, I didn't. I believe you, Willa. Because I think I know who did kill your brother. You do? Tell me. Oh, please, tell me. Down at the Hall of Justice. Okay, let's go. Oh, Rembrandt, bring along that bust of Beethoven sitting on the piano, will you? Oh, pleasure, dear. I'll be glad to. <clears throat> Candy, this thing must weigh at least 15 pounds. Well, you're the only man in the group. Oh? Oh. <clears throat> Very well. Come along, bust. Hall of Justice or likewise. <laughs> Candy, what are you doing here at a time like this? Can't you see I'm busy? Sure, I only want to see you busier. This is Willa Gray, remember her? Just the girl we're looking well, for. Well, save your breath, Mallard. Willa's innocent. She had nothing to do with Gordon Gray's death. Okay, you know so much. Who in tarnation did? Put that bust of Beethoven on Mallard's desk, Rembrandt. I was wondering how long I'd have to hold this thing. What in the name of Schenectady do I want with that? There sits your murderer. Candy, are you out of your head? No, it's so complex it's simple, Mallard. Gordon Gray works like a beaver for two months writing a musical score for a new Broadway show. He takes the score to New York. The producers tell him it's no good. It's the first time it's ever happened to Gordon. It does something to his mind. It broods, 
He comes to San Francisco, his mental condition becomes worse. So is yours. Where you're concerned, yes. But let me finish. Here, take a look at this. Uh, bad, egg, dead. Fag, deaf, D. Okay, I give up. What does it mean? Bad, egg, dead. Gordon Gray is referring to himself. Fag, that means he had come to the end of his rope. His musical knowledge and creative ability were running dry. Gray had nothing more to live for. Okay, Miss Edgar Allan Poe. What does deaf B mean? Well, that had me stumped for a while, too. Then I got to looking at this bust of Beethoven standing on the piano. It seemed to dominate the entire room. Then I put two and two together and got Ludwig von Beethoven. B was an abbreviation of Beethoven. Beethoven was deaf. Deaf B. I don't get it. You will. Beethoven is going to hit an all-time low. The answer lies inside that plaster bust, I'm sure. Stand back, Mallard. I'm about to splatter a genius. Take a look. Good gravy. A small fortune in greenbacks. That's right. And a note, too, if these eyes don't deceive me. Mm. Congratulations, whoever you might be. You learned the true meaning of my symphony of death. You've also just executed my killer, von Beethoven. Now perhaps he knows how it feels to be cracked up, too. Thanks for participating in my little joke, my last charade. This is my entire estate. Put it to whatever good use you may see fit. Gordon Gray. <laughs> oh, Rembrandt, do me a favor. Take Willa outside. The poor kid's pretty badly shot. It certainly does. Come along, young lady. I still don't get it, Candy. It's easy to fill in the gaps now, Mallard. Gordon's music was falling apart. He knew it. So he started swiping melodies from obscure Beethoven themes. But Gordon, with only his flair for writing popular music, couldn't grasp what Beethoven had originally intended. Consequently, the things he wrote were terrible. The more he copied, the more he realized that Beethoven was becoming an all-ruling obsession. It was Beethoven in the morning, Beethoven at night, Beethoven 24 hours a day until it drove Gordon completely out of his mind. That I can understand, but what's this joke he mentioned? Well, he was a great mystery fan. That's why he wrote this gibberish thing called Symphony of Death. A group of notes that spelled out bad, egg, dead, fagged, death, be, and so on. All part of his warped mental condition. Well, that makes sense. Except for one thing. How did Gordon Gray die exactly when he wanted to die? Mallard, dear, I now know there are some mighty strange things in this world. Even a completely sick mind such as Gordon's has great powers of concentration. Gordon was like a, a captain without a ship. Like a man who's been married 50 years who suddenly has no wife. You probably won't believe it, Mallard, but Gordon Gray, knowing that his mind was shot, and knowing, too, that every last bar of creative music had been drained from his heart, his soul, willed himself to die. Fantastic? Not necessarily so. There are many stories about animals who have done the same thing. And if animals can do it, why can't a human being with a so-called higher plane of intelligence do it, too? So that's what Gordon had done. Taken his life savings, sealed them into a plaster bust of Beethoven, along with his last laugh note, and sat himself down to die. In Gordon's mind, Beethoven had killed him. I can understand why, too. For just before we left his apartment, I found another manuscript. I had Rembrandt run over it. Note for note, it was the Moonlight Sonata, backwards. But in one respect, Gordon had outscored the old masters. He had completed his symphony of death, and Beethoven was in little pieces. That left him one up on another old master, a fellow named Franz Schubert. He'd left one entirely unfinished. <laughs> The 
characters in tonight's story are entirely fictitious. Any resemblance to actual people is purely coincidental. Actors heard this evening were Phyllis Skelton as Willa Gray. John Grover was her brother, Gordon Gray. Jack Thomas as Rembrandt Watson. And Henry Leff as Inspector Ray Mallard. From the star of our program, Natalie Masters, and from her husband, Monty Masters, who writes and directs Candy Matson, and from the staff of the National Broadcasting Company, we wish to express our deep thanks and sincere appreciation to the San Francisco Examiner and Dwight Newton, radio columnist of the Examiner, for tonight's presentation, naming Candy Matson as the number one program in the San Francisco Metropolitan Bay Area. <laughs> Listen again next week at the same time for excitement and adventure. Just dial... Candy Matson, Yukon 28209. The program came to you from San Francisco. Dudley Manlove speaking. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective. The people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton motor oil, Union Oil Company, present... The Adventures of Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis. If Mike Shane were a painter, right now he might be gazing raptly from his office window at the sun setting directly into San Francisco's Golden Gate. If Mike Shane were a poet, he might be gazing dreamily at Phyllis Knight, his office associate. Being simply a very practical private detective, Mike's eyes are focused upon a typewritten letter on his desk while he and Phyllis share the telephone talking to the inspector of homicide. And it goes this way, Inspector. Dear Mr. Shane... My life is in great danger. I dare not come to your office for fear I shall be followed. This note is to acquaint you with the fact so that when I telephone to you, you may come instantly without question and well armed. And it's signed with the initials R.E.M. Hmm. When'd you get it, Mike? A week ago Tuesday, Inspector. No return address given, and it's typed on the very cheapest paper. Sounds a little different from the usual crackpot thing, Mike. But I think that's all it is. Mm. Our department gets a dozen of those letters every day. Mm, I know, Inspector, but this afternoon I got a phone call from the guy. Still wouldn't give his name. Said he was in really desperate peril now. He was going to risk coming to see Mike anyway at 4 o'clock. And so? Well, it's 6 o'clock and we're still waiting. And forget it, Mike. Guy's just a screwball. If it really been serious, he'd have gotten in touch with the police. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. Oh, uh, by the way, Mike, what are you doing this evening? Oh, Mike and I are going to go to dinner and maybe a movie. You want to make it a force? Well, my wife is spending the night down on the peninsula with her folks. Okay, Inspector. Look, I'm going back to my apartment and change shirts. Say, uh, what do you say you meet us there in a few minutes, huh? I'm on my way there right now. <laughs> Hope you kids don't mind my inviting myself along like this. Oh, nonsense. We love to have you. But I make one condition. No shop talk from you kids tonight. Deal. Oh, 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 oh. Well, it'll be a painfully quiet evening, then. <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Any mail in my box? Uh, uh-uh. No, not today. All right, make yourselves to home, children. It won't yeah. take me a minute to shave and put on a clean shirt. What under the story... Mike! Huh? There on the floor. Holy... Mike, what do you want... Where did you get it? It's a head. A mummified human head. Yeah, it's been shrunk. The head's no larger than a baseball. And the skin, it's almost black. That long hair. Oh, it gives me the shudders. Mike, how in the devil did it get in here? Somebody pulling a gag on you? Blamed if I know, Inspector. From what I've read, I'd say it's a trophy of some headhunting tribe. Probably Sarawak or uh, Borneo. The cheekbones look more like an Indian's to me. Mm. 
You know, they say they have headhunters in Martinique and up the Amazon. You're right, Phil. It's a South American Indian. But how did it get in here? The front door was locked. Well, the same goes for the windows. Unless maybe the one in the bedroom. Inspector? Yeah? Hmm? Yes. Look. <gasps> Look on my bed. A body. These slight markings on the throat are conclusive, Mike. He was strangled. Yeah. And with a good deal of finesse. It was done with something, some soft noose, uh, a garot, a garot or something. First we find a mummified Indian head and then a man strangled. Well, kids, there must be a connection between the two. Yeah, Phil, but what? Did the killer leave the head for Mike or did this man drop it? Hey. Hey, there's something on the floor. Yeah. Huh? The man's wallet. The driver's license gives his name as R.E. McIntyre, 1198 California Street, born April 5th, 1896, listed as married. R.E. McIntyre. R.E. Inspector. Yeah, Mike. The initials on that letter, R.E.M., R.E. McIntyre. This is our man. Yeah, but what in the blazes was he doing in your bedroom? I thought he was to meet you at your office. Well, maybe he was being followed, Inspector. Decided he'd be safer if he could hide in Mike's apartment till Mike came home. Oh, yeah. it's dizzy any way you look at it. There's almost a hundred dollars here in his wallet. He's dressed like a Knob Hill millionaire. Yet he wrote to me on the cheap paper a schoolboy would use. Yeah, let's go through his pockets and see what else we can find. Okay. First, the wallet. Here. A gold pen and pencil, initialed R-E-M. Yeah. Here's a checkbook. Key ring. Gold knife. A couple of dollars in small change. One pack of cigarettes. Match folder. That's all. Yeah, it doesn't tell us anything. Hand me the phone, Mike. I'm going to call headquarters for the squad, and after they get here... We're leaving for 1198 California Street and the lady who is Mrs. McIntyre. When did I last see my husband? Well, we ate luncheon at the Palace Hotel, and... Then Mr. McIntyre said he had some business to attend to. What time was that, Mrs. McIntyre? Mm, I would say two o'clock. Well, that's just about when he telephoned the office. He told me he was coming to see Mike at four o'clock. Did uh, your husband tell you, Mrs. McIntyre, that his life was in danger? That apparently he was being followed everywhere he went? Mr. McIntyre never talked over his affairs with me. However, I, I did notice that the past several weeks he seemed very nervous. I thought he was brooding over some business matter. And just what was his business? Mining. He and his partner, Anthony Locke, own a big tin mine in South America. South America? That's where the dried Indian head came from. It did mean something. Mrs. McIntyre, do you know if your husband had any enemies? I've answered that. Mr. McIntyre did not talk over his affairs with me. Mm -hmm. Well, he certainly provided a beautiful and expensive home. Mrs. McIntyre, can you explain why he should write us that letter on the cheapest sort of paper and then sign only his initials? <laughs> Max done that trick before. Mm hmm? Uh -huh. He wanted you to think he was a poor man, so you might work for him at less money. Oh. He would even introduce himself by some false name that would fit his initials. <laughs> yes, he thought that much of a nickel. Except when he could spend it on himself, huh? I presume, Mrs. McIntyre, your husband left the will. Mr. Shane, I'm getting very weary of repeating this. Mm? My husband did not talk over his business with me. Of course he had a will. And of course I'm the beneficiary. You must realize, Mrs. McIntyre, that I we're... realize that for one half hour I've been subjected to highly impertinent questions. I know nothing which can help the police department. And there the matter ends. Mike, for two cents I'd go back to the house and haul that royal lady down to headquarters. I think she'd decide to answer our question. Look, let's forget her for the time being, Inspector. We've got to talk to McIntyre's business partner, Anthony Locke. Hey, kids, I just saw a man duck behind that front gate. You did? Okay, let's have a look. Hey, he got in that car. Quick, we'll follow him. Here, jump in. Thanks. Mike started. He's getting away. He's gotten away, Angel. The wires have been pulled loose from my ignition switch. We'll return to the adventures of Michael Shane in just a moment. 
Many motorists have been amazed at the way the new 76 gasoline performs in traffic and on hills. Well, the reason is simple. It's because the new 76 contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline Union Oil Company's refineries produce for the Air Forces. That means the new 76 gasoline for your car is packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice its instant response as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like its quieter, faster action. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the powerful new 76 gasoline. Nearly all Union Oil Minuteman stations have the new 76 on hand now. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. Tonight, a triple mystery dogs Mike and Phyllis. Why was a mummified Indian head left in Mike's apartment? Why was a man strangled to death in Mike's bed? Who pulled the ignition wires loose in Mike's automobile? Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have gone to the home of the murdered man's partner, Anthony Locke. The dining room door opens. Mr. Locke asks if you would please join him in the dining room. Why, certainly. Thank you. Ah, good evening. I was just beginning my dinner. Hope you haven't eaten. I'll have water set extra plates. I'm afraid you don't understand, sir. I'm the inspector of homicide. This is Mr. Shane and Miss Knight, private detectives. Oh, really? Well, I uh, misunderstood, Waters. Bit hard of hearing, you know. Too much quinine, touch of malaria. Sit down, sit down. I despise eating alone. Happy to have your company. Mr. Locke, this is not a social call. No, can't recall inviting you. Don't know what you're doing here. But uh, how about some terrapin soup? It's excellent tonight. Sir, I'm from the police department. Your partner, Mr. McIntyre, has been killed. Murdered. Strangled to death. When? Tonight, in my apartment. What? And in the next room, we found a dried, mummified human head. Uh, Mr. Locke? Mr. Locke, are you all right? The sign of death. You know what it means? Yes. Yes, McIntyre came to me with an anonymous letter. It said he was going to die. When was this? Uh, about ten days ago. I tried to get him to go to the police. He wouldn't. Finally, he said he'd hire a private detective. We both knew who sent the letter. But I didn't think he'd actually kill. Hmm? That's what that head means. He? Who? Please, Mr. Locke. His name is Ferd Stockle. He lives in Bolivia. McIntyre and I bought our plantation from him about five years ago. Mm -hmm. It was just jungle and bare mountains. Then we dug the tin mine. Stockle said we cheated him out of it. He swore he'd get even. <laughs> this scar on my cheek. He did that with a machete. Then you think he's in San Francisco? He must be. The letter was postmarked from here. But, gentlemen, this isn't the end. I have received the same letter. The hmm? same death threat? Yes. Okay, let's have a look at that letter. Well, that's a strange thing. I had it on my desk, then suddenly it disappeared. Then we better move fast. I want a description of this third stock. Well, I can give you that. He's about five feet seven. He has black hair, black eyes, very dark skin. Mm -hmm. uh, he'd be about uh, 40 now. He speaks English with a peculiar hissing accent. Good. Now, Mike, we better get moving. But, but, but how can you catch him? What can you do? Plenty. We're going back to headquarters and broadcast a general alarm. All right, boys. That's the man's description. Get that on the radio right away. See that all squad cars are contacted. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Smith. Your men will cover all airports, train depots, bridge control stations, and highways. He may try to skip town. Yes, sir. Russell and you boys go over the registrations at all hotels. See if you can get me the immigration authorities. Yes, yes sir. All right. That's all. Get busy. Inspector, we made an inventory of everything in McIntyre's pocket. So did we, Sergeant. Oh, then you know about the folder of matches. Matches? What about it? Address on the cover there. That's the third-rate place down in the Embarcadero. Hardly a place for a rich man like McIntyre. Mm, you're right, Sergeant. Not only right, Inspector. I suggest we visit that third-rate hotel on the Embarcadero right now. <laughs> That's what I said. Ain't nobody name of Ferd Starkle registered here. Well, he may be under another name. 
You got any man registered from South America? Hey, let me think now. South America? Well, yeah. Yeah, room 307. That great big guy with the beard signed in from Lima, Peru. When? Oh, maybe two weeks ago. Name's Ed Badger, he says. Two weeks ago. Mm. Time fits if the description doesn't. Okay, I guess this time we walk up. Yes, I come up from Lima. What about it? Before that, Mr. Badger, by any chance were you in Bolivia? Oh, now I'm on. You've been talking to McIntyre. What's Mac doing, running to the police just because I, uh... Oh, uh, well, I, uh, I thought he had some sense. You were going to say just because you what? Well, now, gents, it was a good deal. I figured Mr. McIntyre and Mr. Locke wouldn't mind owning the second tin mine down in Old Boliv. I could fix it so they'd get hold of a really big one. Mm -hmm. A few thousands played in the right place, you know. <laughs> but if Mac is going to turn Sunday school boy on me... Mr. Badger, you, uh, you work for McIntyre and Locke? I was boss of the mine, madam, until, uh... They were looking for an excuse to get rid of me. Mm -hmm. But Edge Badger is not one to hold hard feelings. When did you last see McIntyre? Well, he come to the hotel here yesterday. Now, I'm not one to do Mac Dirt. You ought to know that. So if you gentlemen will give me an idea what this is all about. Mr. McIntyre has been murdered. Been be oh, that's not so good. No, no. Uh, Mr. Badger, you mind telling us where you've been for the past three hours? Oh, I see what you mean. Well, I've uh, been right here in my room. And, uh, oh, maybe a couple of trips to the bar. Did Mr. McIntyre tell you that he'd received a letter threatening his life? No. A letter, eh? So that's what was worrying old Mac. I figured he was having trouble with his wife. While you were down in Bolivia, Mr. Badger, did you know a man named Starkle? Third Starkle? Oh, did I know Third? There's a cutthroat for you. Oh? Now, if you were to ask me if Third Starkle would kill Mac, I'd say yes. I, Mac, and Locke really crossed him up once. Uh, have you seen him in San Francisco? Here? No. He's down in Bolivia. When did you last see him there? Why, a couple of months ago, I say. Yeah. You mean you think he's in town? I wouldn't like that, gents. He's a bad one. You said a moment ago you thought McIntyre was having trouble with his wife. Uh, where did you get that idea? Well, I, uh, I, I only thought. I don't know. Go on, go on, please. Well, I, I don't know anything. Mac just said something about his wife nagging him. I, I hope you gentlemen won't tattle that to her. I may have to do business with her and lock. Hey, you won't say anything, will you? That's for us to decide. Uh, Mr. Badger, is there anything further you can tell us? Anything else that comes to your mind? No, I can't think of anything. Mm-hmm. Inspector, yeah, I Mike. think I've got a slightly different angle on this case. I'd like to go back to McIntyre's house and have a look at his private papers, whether Mrs. McIntyre likes it or not. I mean, I know what you're thinking, Mike. You figure Ed Badger is in this deeper than he'll admit. Now you want to get some proof in black and white. Well, that's part of it. Yeah, he told us just what he wanted us to hear and no more. Mm -hmm. So he's a shady character. But probably he's never risen above petty larceny and confidence games. You know, he doesn't look like the... The type, yes. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. You know, someday, Angel, the inspector and I are going to take you down to Rogue's Gallery and show you the pictures of every convicted murderer for the past ten years. You'll say most of them look uh, as innocent as the inspector uh, or myself. That's no recommendation. Oh, get her. <laughs> Here we are, kids. I'll pull up in the driveway. Stop and... the car. Quick. What? There's that man, the man who tore the wires out of Mike's car. Yeah, he's running down the walk. Hey, you, stop. Stop or I'll shoot. That stopped him. Come on. Inspector, if you've hit him. Don't worry, I aimed at the pavement. He's pretty shaky in the legs. What's the big idea? Try to kill a man. Listen, if I wanted to hit you, I couldn't miss at that short range. You can't get away with this. Sticking up a guy right... I'll have the law on you. You're talking to him, buddy. I'm inspector of homicide. Now, we want to know why you were sneaking around outside this house. And why you pulled the wires loose in our car. I'm a private detective. I was paid to watch this house. Who paid you? McIntyre. I'm watching his wife. Oh, is that so? Then, Inspector, suppose we give him a chance to do uh, more than watch her. Suppose we make him talk to her. <laughs> The 
man's lying. Why would my husband hire a detective to watch me? Well, we don't know that he is a detective. I got a license. Here, see for yourself. Mm-hmm. Your name Andy Blackmore? Yeah. License was issued last month. I never heard of him before. So what? I never heard of you before. I'm new in San Francisco. Mr. Blackmore, when did Mr. McIntyre hire you to shadow his wife? Last week. It's preposterous, I tell you. He's lying. My orders were to watch her and a fellow named Locke. Well, get McIntyre. He'll tell you if I'm lying or not. McIntyre was dead. But murdered. He's what? Mr. Blackmore, just what were you supposed to find out about Mrs. McIntyre and Locke? Well, I don't know. I was supposed to keep track of her and everybody she was in contact with, especially Locke. And what happens? I get myself half strangled to death and then you shoot at me. Wait a minute, hold on. Who strangled you when? Oh, some big guy with a beard. He was leaving here a couple of nights ago and when I... Hello? Is the inspector there? Yes, he's here. It's for you, Inspector. Thank you. Hello? Inspector? Yes? Mr. Locke just phoned headquarters. Says he's discovered a very important clue. All right, Sergeant. Tell him we'll be right over. You meet us there. Mike, I... I don't like this at all. Mr. Locke's front door open, the electric lights off. Not only off, there's no electricity at all. Listen, you guys aren't going to mix me up in this. I'm going out and waiting in the car. You're staying right here, mister. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. Not a sound. Where are the servants? I want to find the telephone. Mike, throw your flashlight around. Oh, Mike. Huh? Throw it this way. I just kicked something. It, it, it rolled. There it is. A head. Another head. Yeah. And right behind it. On the couch. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. Mr. Locke. In just a moment, we'll return to Mike and Phyllis in their adventures. We don't say that driving with the new 76 gasoline will eliminate all your traffic problems, but we do say it will make your driving a lot more pleasant. Even the oldest cars perk up and come alive when you put in the new 76. That's because this new post-war fuel contains components of the same 100-octane gasoline that Union Oil Company's refineries are producing for the air forces. That means it's packed with extra power, greater than pre-war. You'll notice this as soon as you come down on the accelerator. You'll like the quieter, faster action of the powerful new 76 gasoline. And you'll like its price, too. For 76 is a non-premium gasoline and still sells at regular prices everywhere. So for a real thrill in driving, put in a tank full of the new Super 76. The new 76 gasoline is now going on sale at all Union Oil Minuteman stations. Just look for the sign of the big orange and blue 76. Thank you. In the darkened house of Anthony Locke, Mike, Phyllis, and the inspector have discovered a second mummified human head. But this time, the murderer has failed. Our trio have arrived just in time. Anthony Locke himself has been revived. In the yellow light of Mike's flashlight, the victim gasps out his story. Uh, thank heavens you got here. You thought he had killed me. Well, we did, too. Uh, the garage was still wrapped around your neck. Did you see who it was? No. I, it, it was Starkle. Ferd Starkle. It must have been. But you couldn't see him. No. No, I came home and, and found the servants gone. I got scared. I phoned the police. And then I heard a window smash. Where? The breakfast room. In there. Suddenly, the lights went out. Somebody grabbed me. I felt something tighten around my throat. That's the last I remember. Well, he left you for dead, then ran out the front door and left it open. Well, it must have happened in the past 15 minutes. You were all right when you phoned us. Yes. Oh, please, that, that flashlight hurts my eyes. You can light the candles on the mantel. Uh, I'll light them. Who, who's that man? They're beside you. Andy Blackmore. I'm a private detective. He claims McIntyre hired him to shadow Mrs. McIntyre and you. McIntyre hired him to... No, no, he's lying. I tell you it's the truth. Now, listen, you guys aren't going to rope me into this. Mr. Locke, 
Mr. Locke, you said on the phone that you had discovered some important clue. Yes, I, I found the letter. Good. Oh. The letter threatening my life. I, I, I've got it in my pocket. Good. It may be the key to the whole case. No, I'm sure I... No, it's gone. I, I had it right here in my pocket. He took it. Doggone, just when we thought uh, we... You've got to catch Starkle. You've got to. He's mad. He'll try again. We'll do our best, Mr. Locke. But I'm worried about these missing servants... How many are in your employ? The butler and the French cook. Why would they disappear? Is that the front door? Inspector! It's the sergeant. Oh. And Ed Badger. And why not? Gentlemen, I was suspicious. I couldn't see any lights except a couple of candles. Because somebody pulled the light switch. And tried to murder Mr. Locke. To mur- No, Mr. Locke, too. Are you all right now, sir? He is. But uh, what were you doing outside? Why, I was coming to see him. After you gentlemen left me at the hotel, I... Figured I'd better talk over my business with him personally. He's the man I was trailing the other night. He's the one that tried to strangle me. You again. Now, look here, friend. Remember what I told you about messing the things that don't concern you? Inspector. Yeah, Mike. Before the trail gets hot, uh, we'd better look for clues. The killer may have dropped something. Right. Let's start with a broken window. Mr. Locke said it was in the next room. Mm -hmm. There's the glass scattered all around the window. Yeah. Double sliding window. Now, let's raise it and check for footprints outside. And a luck. Cement paving. Oh. He smashed the glass, crawled through the window, but he didn't cut himself or snag his clothes. Well, let's look around the room. Mike, let me have that flashlight a minute. Well, what is it, Angel? Look. Look, this window has an upper and lower half. Yeah. And the bottom half is smashed. Yeah, but there are little pieces of glass scattered along the wooden frame here on the top of the lower half. Mm. Now, how, how could glass from below the frame get on top of the frame? Angel, Angel, you hit it. Hmm? The top half of the window was lowered first. And when it was raised again, the glass was transferred from one frame to the other. Then that window was smashed from the inside. Wait a minute, kids, wait a minute. Remember Mr. Locke said he got a threatening letter just like McIntyre's? Yeah, the one he just said was stolen for the second time. But only McIntyre did anything about it. I see what you mean. Mm -hmm. Well, Mr. Locke. Yes? Mr. Locke, where is the uh, power switch that turns on the electric lights? Why, right down in the basement. And immediately after the window was smashed, the lights went out and somebody grabbed you? Yes. Mr. Locke, it would take several minutes to get from that window down into the basement, then fumble back upstairs in the dark. What? Why, why uh... You why... faked the whole thing. You broke that window yourself. You got rid of the servant. No, no, it was Ferd Starkle. He you was... built up a dramatic story for us to swallow. What? But your own partner didn't believe it. That's why McIntyre hired a detective to watch his wife and you. You were the one who insisted on going to the police about McIntyre's threatening letter. But you also got a letter. You never went to the police. You didn't hire a detective. Because you knew there was no danger, Mr. Locke. Because you are the murderer. No, no, no. Somebody followed McIntyre to Shane's apartment. Somebody climbed through the window and strangled him. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Thank you. As sweet a confession as I ever heard. None of us told you that the killer got into my apartment through the window, but you're perfectly correct. Well, Inspector, I guess that's all the proof the DA will ask of you. <laughs> We haven't had a single bite of dinner tonight. Oh, my stomach won't let me forget it. Oh. The inspector told me he'd meet us at Fisherman's Wharf as soon as he finishes at headquarters. I hope he can find out where Locke got those gruesome Indian heads. Oh, he probably brought them with him from South America. Oh, maybe so. Anyway, Mike, I think I can guess Locke's motive for the killing. He was in love with Mrs. McIntyre. He wanted the husband out of the way. Uh-huh. Locke's elaborate build-up was just to disguise a very simple, sordid murder. Now, I don't believe Mrs. McIntyre had the slightest interest in Locke, or even suspected his intentions. Well, it just goes to show you, Angel, when some men are in love, they'll stop at nothing. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's not my problem. Hmm? Mm. It's when some men are in love and will do nothing. Why, Angel...
tune in again next week at 8 o'clock for another adventure with Michael Shane, Private Detective, starring Wally Mayer and Kathy Lewis, with Joe Forte as the inspector. Tonight's story was written by Richard DeGraff and based on the character created by Brett Halliday. Music was composed and directed by Bernard Katz. This is John Lang saying goodnight for the people who make the new 76 gasoline and Triton Motor Oil, Union Oil Company. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. The makers of Camel Cigarettes present Dick Powell as Richard Diamond, Private Detective. How mild can a cigarette be? One puff won't tell you. One sniff won't tell you. It takes day in, day out smoking to find out how mild a cigarette is, how well it agrees with your throat. Make the sensible cigarette test, the thorough test. Smoke only camels for 30 days and see just how mild a cigarette can be. Here, transcribed, is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. It was cold out, and it had been raining. When it got a little warmer, it would probably snow. The whole city was covered with a heavy sheet of ice, and the steam heat in my office gurgled and clouded up the windows. I was feeling pretty good. I was warm. I'd had one client in the past week, and my bank account was on its way to recovery, and a good breakfast in the drugstore downstairs had made me comfortable and drowsy. I put my feet up on the desk, leaned back in my chair, and closed my eyes. Diamond. Mr. Diamond? I must have been napping and didn't know it. I hadn't heard the door open, but there he stood, framed in the door, resting his weight on the jam, and looking across the room at me with tired eyes. Mr. Diamond? Uh, yes, uh, what can I do for you? My name is Abel Gunther. I want to hire you. All right, Mr. Gunther, I charge a hundred a day in expenses. I don't think I can pay it. I can pay you some, but I don't think I can pay you that much. Well, that's my fee for you or Rockefeller. I got expenses. I see. Well, I'll keep looking. I need help. Perhaps you could recommend someone? Uh, You'll pardon me for saying so, but you don't look too well, Mr. Gunther. I'm pretty sick, Mr. Dan. Maybe you'd better sit down and tell me what your problem is. I can't afford the money. That's all right. Tell me about it anyway. I think I had better sit down. Yes, you better. What's wrong? You got the flu or something? No, no. I'm afraid it's a little more serious. Would you really like to hear my story? I think I really would. I'm a farmer, Mr. Diamond. My home is Haiti, near Saint-Lazare. Haiti? Yes. The West Indies. I, I was born there, raised there. My parents died when I was 13. I have a wife. She's there now, and she's the main reason I have come here seeking help. My wife is dying, Mr. Diamond. I must get help quickly before it is too late. I have a farm. He kept talking, telling me about his life on Haiti. He told me about his farm, a fairly good-sized farm by his description. 
He told me how in the past two years things began to go wrong on his farm. And soon all the farms in the area fires. were also having the trouble. The cane fields would burn every year. Then it was the cattle. One by one they became sick. Then my wife and now me. And you don't know what's wrong with either of you, huh? Yes and no. My Christian religion fights it, but my life on Haiti has taught me deep respect for it. Respect for what? Voodoo, Mr. Diamond. Oh, I, I know just what you're thinking. But a doctor in Haiti has examined my wife and can find nothing wrong. Well, I don't particularly believe in anything like that, Mr. Gunther. But if you do, why have you come to me? I said I have a healthy respect for it. I don't entirely believe it, but some of the things I've seen make it difficult to disbelieve. I came to you because I suspect a possibility of something more. Immediately after my wife was taken ill, I received an offer from my farm, a very low offer from a Saint-Léger banker. I investigated, found it had been made in the interests of one Arthur Cotswold. Arthur Cotswold? Katie's biggest planter. Oh. How about the other farmers? They received offers like mine. Being the oldest farmer, the rest looked to me for guidance. I told them to wait. Then I came here to hire someone to look into the matter. Would you like some water? No. No, thank you. I'm all right. Uh, anyone else become ill besides you and your wife? Yes. Several others. I I have $368 in my ticket home. The money is yours if you will go to Haiti and investigate. Have you been to a doctor here in New York? No. Mr. Diamond here's directions how to get to my farm. My servant, little Shiva, is there. No one knows I came. Mr. Gunther. <laughs> Mr. Gunther. Homicide. Hello, Walt. Oh, Rick. Yeah. Better get up to my office. I've got a dead man for you. Are you kidding? That's what Gunther told me. Voodoo? Voodoo smoodoo. That's what the man said. Now, steady, boy. Oh, stop it, Walt. You know I don't believe it. But you're going down to Haiti. Well, somebody's got to tell the wife. The local authorities can do that. Hey. Now, what's the matter? The local authorities in Haiti. Why didn't Gunther go to them if he thought there was something phony about the setup? You want an opinion? If you can strain one out. Well, Gunther probably didn't go to the Haiti authorities because he knew they'd think just what you're thinking. Okay, so I'm crazy. Well, Gunther died in my office. He came a long way for help, and the poor guy wanted to give me his last $368. So I'm going to Haiti. I'll send you a zombie. Walt promised to send a wire and care of the authorities in saint Leger as soon as he got an autopsy report on Mr. Gunther, and I headed to the airline's ticket office. By 8 o'clock that evening, I was in an airline's flagship at 12,000 feet heading for the West Indies and Haiti. The trip wasn't bad. We landed in Miami, where I grabbed a cup of coffee and then climbed aboard a clipper for Port-au-Prince. At Port-au-Prince, I took a bus to saint Leger, and from there a beaten-up taxi to the Gunther Farm, about 10 miles into the country. As we neared the farm, I could see a crowd of people standing around in front of the house... And as I climbed out of the cab and approached them, they turned and their hushed conversations were suddenly stilled. I didn't know what it was. No one said a word. But something was wrong. I could feel it. I walked through the crowd to the house and stopped cold as the door opened. Who are you? I'd never seen anything like him. He was a native and he ducked his head as he stepped out of the door to face me. He was a good seven feet tall, or maybe more. He must have weighed close to 300. He stood on his bare feet, his long, muscled arms hanging loosely at his sides, and looked at me with dark, shining eyes. Me, little Chiva, who are you? Oh, me, very little Richard Diamond. Mr. Gunther hired me to come here. You from New York? Oh, yes. Mr. Gunther couldn't come back. He died. That's right. How did you know? You come in? Uh, sure. What are all those people doing out there? Their friends, madam. She died too. Little Chiva led the way into the bedroom where Mrs. Gunther lay on the bed covered with a fresh white sheet. Her eyes closed in death. 
her face drawn and tired. Little Shiva told me she had died the day before, about three in the afternoon, and a cold chill ran up my back. I remembered her husband lying on the floor of my office about three o'clock in the afternoon, the day before. What do you do here? Uh, Mr. Gunther wanted me to find out why the cattle are getting sick, why the fields are burning, why he and his wife became ill. Bad voodoo. Well, he thought it might have something to do with a man named Cotswold. He big man. What are those drums? For madam and mister. They voodoo. Good voodoo. Give blessing for spirit for madam and mister. Oh. You, uh... You see, little Chiva, the mister, uh... Mr. Gunther wanted me to help him. He paid me money to help him and died asking for help. I'm going to try and do what I can. The madam and Mr. Good people teach little Chiva. They take little Chiva when he's small boy and make good life. You good man, little Chiva help you. Right then, I inherited little Chiva. And if there was going to be any trouble, the giant servant would certainly help to make up the difference. The first thing I wanted to do was contact the local authorities in saint Leger. And little Chiva told me my man was one Inspector Laplanche. A very fine person, Mr. Gunther. I'm sorry he's dead. Well, how did everybody know he was dead? On Haiti, things of such nature are never a secret. The natives know. Voodoo? Being a stranger to Haiti, Mr. Diamond, I expect you to be a skeptic. But uh, you believe in voodoo? Let us say I've been in Haiti too long not to believe. Well, Gunther thought the whole thing might have something to do with a man named Cotswold. I would suggest you forget Mr. Cotswold. Then I suggest you give me a good reason to forget him. Mr. Cotswold is a very big man on Haiti, the largest plantation owner in the West Indies, and a self-made man with a considerable temper. Well, thanks for the advice, Inspector. But supposing I come up with something incriminating. If Mr. Cotswold has breached the law, it would certainly be my duty to arrest him. But I am not considering the arrest. More, the necessary steps that would have to be taken to prove the guilt. Dangerous steps, Mr. Diamond. One might trip on those steps. And break his neck. Yes. <laughs> you like the middle of the road, huh? It is much easier to see what is ahead. It's possible to get run down from behind. I do as much as I can to prevent that possibility. Example... My suggestion, you forget, Mr. Cotswold. I left the philosophical inspector and went outside where little Chiva had been waiting. Every time I looked at Chiva, it was like a little kid spotting the Empire State for the first time. He smiled a mouthful of white teeth as he said, The inspector, he say forget Mr. Cotswold. That's right. What do you think, little Chiva? I think I do what you want. You know what I want? You want to go see Cotswold? Hmm. Think I'm crazy? You're not afraid. You're not strong like little Chiva. But little Chiva, think of all the men he know. You would fight hardest. I don't like to fight little Chiva. Little Chiva know that. We go see Cotswold. Little Chiva led the way up a long, narrow road surrounded on both sides by high sugarcane fields. Somewhere from... Not too far away, I heard the drums start again. Little Chiva stopped, looked off to the north. He began moving his shoulders, slowly keeping time to the steady rhythm of the drums. He began to sing softly. Oh, hey, oh, hey, say Papa New keep a passe. Oh, hey, oh, hey. Say, Papa, new keep a passe. What does that mean, little Jiva? It means in your language, it is our Papa who passes. Papa? Papa Dambala, the great source. Voodoo? Yes. Later I must leave you. Today is Wednesday. This is the day of Papa Dambala. Oh, hey, oh, hey. Say, Papa. He continued his little chant until we reached the beginning of a long high fence running along next to the narrow road. Chiva leaned down and swung a gate open. Then we walked up the path that led through the Cotswold property until we reached the house. There, sitting back between two huge trees, 
was the Cotswold Mansion. I walked up to the front door alone. Mr. Diamond. Yes, Shiva? Watch out for Mr. Jocelyn. He guard Cotswold. Thanks, I'll do that. What do you want? I want to see Cotswold. You do, eh? What are you doing here, little Chiva? I wait for Mister. He found himself a new governor, what? You must be that fellow Diamond. Mm, I must be. Well, come in. Mr. Cotswold has been expecting you. He introduced himself as Jocelyn and led the way into a large panel study. And I met the big man himself, Arthur Cotswold. The drums stopped. Today is Wednesday. It belongs to the great god Dambala. Uh, so I understand. Most days of the week are significant in voodoo. Will you have a drink, Mr. Diamond? No, thank you. Jocelyn, mix me his gin and tonic. Yes, Mr. Cotswold. Thursday and Saturday belong to Uzele Frida, the goddess of love. I'll have to remember that. I know why you are here, Mr. Diamond. I'm glad you do. For some reason, Gunther and the rest of the miserable farmers think I'm responsible for their trouble. Of course you're not. I simply tried to help them. With their cattle sick and their crops gone, I had my banker make them an offer. Have any of your cattle taken sick? None. Pretty strange. Haiti is a strange land. Now, you're not going to start talking voodoo. You're a stranger, Mr. Diamond. There are many things that you would not understand, and I would certainly not try and convert you. Well, I appreciate your interest. But I intend to find out why Gunther and his wife died. At this point, I would most certainly give you advice on. Go home, Mr. Diamond. Leave well enough alone. After I come up with an answer. Mr. Diamond, I am not a patient man. I have gone out of my way to give you some healthy advice. Heed it. For your sake, heed it. No, thanks. I'll let you know what I find out. You persist in this investigation? I always persist. In fact, I'm the persistentist. Before we continue with Richard Diamond, here are a few words about smoking enjoyment. The things we look for most in a cigarette are mildness and flavor. You'll find both of these things in camels. Day after day and pack after pack. No other cigarette has camels' rich, full flavor. The flavor of costly tobaccos, properly aged and expertly blended. And no other cigarette gives you this proof of mildness. In a coast-to-coast -coast test of hundreds of people who smoked only camels for 30 days, noted throat specialists reported not one single case of throat irritation due to smoking camels. Make your own 30-day camel test. Not just a puff, not just a sniff, but normal smoking for about a month. You'll enjoy every puff, and you'll know without question how mild camels are, how well they agree with your throat. Yes, and you'll see why. More people smoke camels than any other cigarette. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke camels and see. And now, back to Richard Diamond, Private Detective, starring Dick Powell. I left Arthur Cotswold, cooling his fit with a gin and tonic, went back to Cheever, and he led me back to town. On the way, I got an idea. When we arrived in town, I sent little Cheever back to the Gunther farm. Then I went in to talk to Inspector Laplanche. The inspector had received a wire from one Lieutenant Walt Levinson, 5th Precinct, New York Police. Well, I had no idea the New York Police were interested in this affair. They're always interested when someone drops dead. No. Here's something pretty interesting, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Mr. Gunther died of a disease known as brucellosis, commonly known in cattle as Bang's disease. Ever heard of it? I am not a medical man, Mr. Diamond. Mm. Well, it's undulant fever. Both Gunther and his wife probably caught it from their sick cattle. What do you intend to do? Well, I think those cattle were infected deliberately, and the cane fields burned purposely. If the cattle were infected deliberately, there must be some of the brucellosis still around, and I'm going to find it. Maybe at Mr. Cotswold's. I think you'd better issue a search warrant and come with me. Mr. Diamond, 
The middle of the road, remember? I think you'd better forget the middle of the road, Inspector. Unless you want me to get in touch with the authorities and have you held as a material witness in a murder case. I... I will issue the warrant. I kind of thought you would. I will issue it, but you certainly do not think it will be enough to get you into the Cotswold house? No, but it'll make it legal. I sent little Cheever back to collect some of his friends. They're going to help us get in that house, Inspector. I will have no part of violence. Oh, they won't even be with us. It would be easy to search the Cotswold place if Cotswold was out fighting a fire. Fire? Just a harmless fire, Inspector. But far enough away so that Cotswold will think it's his cane fields. Oh, well, then I will certainly issue the warrant, Mr. Diamond. As long as we are going to do everything open and above board, I will certainly issue it. Hmm. Welcome back to the gutter, Inspector. The view isn't much, but you can't miss where you're going. Let's go get little Cheever. What are all those natives doing at the Gunthers? I don't know. It looks like something's wrong. We piled out of the car and pushed our way through the crowd of natives. Inside the house, we found what was wrong. Lying in the middle of the room was little Chiefa. He was almost dead when I knelt beside him. I... I... I talked to friends. They light fire for you. Thanks, Chiefa. Now... Dumbalo, where do take me? He's been stabbed. And he cut him in two. They got him from behind. Never would have faced him. You stay. You see, wait till in on tete your mort. See what? It is a ritual. It means taking the spirit from the head of the dead. He wants you to see it. You stay. You believe voodoo. All right, Shiva. I'll stay. Now, who did this to you? Nazi. In back. <sighs> He's dead. The next few hours I'll never forget. The inspector knew what was coming and he wanted no part of it, so he waited outside. I don't know whether I can describe it, but I'll try. And even though I saw it with my own eyes, I still don't quite believe it. The natives came into the house and picked up the little Chiva. They placed him on a bench and the ceremony began. Some of them had already obtained the necessary items used for weighty law and on Tati Yum Mort. They included several live pigeons, olive oil, 30 pieces of fat pine wood, a pair of chickens, some coarse cornmeal and a saddle blanket, and a large white plate. Little Chiva's body was covered by the blanket and then the pigeons were killed and cooked without seasoning. The cornmeal was roasted, then placed in the white plate. The thirty slivers of pine wood were lighted and carried by the natives like candles. Then one of the natives took the white plate with the meal in one hand and the pot with the chicken in the other and approached the fire chanting a strange dirge. I nearly ran out of the screaming Mimis. As he finished the last line of the chant, the dead body of little Chiva sat straight up with straining eyes, bowed its head, and fell back. You look a little pale, Mr. Dunn. Well, I can't understand why. Probably because my blood's hiding in my feet. What do you think of voodoo now? Well, let's forget it, shall we? I haven't got the money for a good rest home. Yeah. We are close to the Cotswoldas. Good. Let's park it here and wait until the fire starts. The inspector and I sat in the car and waited while the moon climbed up over the clouds and the drums in the distance tangled my nerves into complete knots. After about an hour of waiting, a dull glow to the south started the expected commotion in the Cotswold household, and we climbed out of the car. Fire, Mr. Cotswold! The cane field! Fire! Hit the servants! Hit every man out there to fight that fire! It had worked. The inspector and I stayed to the shadows until the last man went running out of the house. Then we went in. We worked as fast as we could. We took the place apart. 
And I must say, the timid inspector had really gotten out of the middle of the road. He tore the place apart like he'd spent most of his time on a wrecking crew. I have not found a thing. Oh, the house is clean. Uh, there's a barn. Then let's go. We went out of the house and headed for the barn about 50 yards away. The drums were louder now, and the dull glow of the fire had nearly vanished. It was obvious that the inspector and I had to work fast. He took one end of the barn and I took the other. We worked toward each other. Just about the time I was ready to give the whole thing up. Diamond! Diamond! Inspector, you find something? This a hypodermic for cattle. That's not enough. This bottle hidden under this box? Well, it's more like it. Let's get it back to town and have it analyzed. That won't be necessary, Mr. Diamond. Cotswold. It was Cotswold. And he had three things on his side that made the situation very uncomfortable. His bodyguard, Jocelyn, and two guns. They stepped through the open door and moved up to us. I see you found my secret, Mr. Diamond. This is the stuff you've been infecting the cattle with. And this is what killed the Gunthers. That's correct. You see, you should have really taken my advice and returned to the States. You'll be held for murder, Cotswold. Who will convict me, Mr. Diamond? No evidence, no one to testify. I'm surprised at you, Inspector. I thought you had more sense. Sometimes a man finds his pride and does the best thing. You know, of course, I can't allow either of you to live. No, we had a hunch. Now, tell me something. Who killed little Cheever? He was getting to be a nuisance. I had Jocelyn here attend to the matter. <laughs> What's that? Diamond. Mr. Cotswold, look! Well, now, I want to tell you, I'd seen a lot that day, but that was just a little too much. The howl had come from the open door, and standing in it, framed against the yellow moon... It's him! It's the Jeeva! No! No! But there he was. And he looked even bigger as he shuffled toward the two men, his arms swinging at his sides like two giant sledgehammers. He was going all the way. He hadn't just come back from the dead to sit up. He was taking a walk. Get away! Get away! You're dead! Shoot him! Shoot him! But Jocelyn was too terrified to even raise his arm. The big native reached out, grabbed him with both hands, and crushed him like an egg. For a minute, I was too stunned to move. Then when I saw Cotswold bring up his gun, I threw the bottle. It stopped him long enough for the big native to drop Jocelyn's limp body and charge in. Like an idiot, I had some stupid reason for wanting Cotswold alive, so I tried to head Cheever off. Ever try to stop a freight train with both hands out? He brushed me off, and I crashed into the wall just as he grabbed Cotswold. No! No! He picked him up, raised him high over his head, and threw him the length of the barn. Diamond... He's coming over here. Now, look, 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 old boy. It's, 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 it's me. It's me, Diamond. Little Cheever, please, I... Me, not little Cheever. It... What? I should have guessed. Should have guessed what? What is this? This is Big Cheever. Big Cheever? We, oui, me little Cheever's brother. Me pay back for kill little Cheever. Oh, good gosh. I never thought I... We, oui, me Big Cheever. Come, I take you back to Gunther House. Little Cheever, say you good man. I'd be your servant. Well, if you don't mind, I just think I'll head back for the States and lie in a warm tub of mud for the next six months. I... Oh, uh, tell me something, Big Cheever. What do you want? You don't have a big brother, do you? Dick Powell will return in just a minute. More doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette, according to a repeated nationwide survey. Doctors in every branch of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country, have again been asked what cigarette they smoked. Again, the brand name most was camel. Yes, according to this survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Friends, try camels and discover for yourself the reasons behind camels' great popularity. You'll enjoy Camel's rich flavor and cool mildness pack after pack and week after week. How mild, how mild, how mild, how mild, how mild can a cigarette be? Make the Camel 30-day test and you'll see. Smoke Camels and see. Here's Dick Powell with a special message. Thank you. Friends, nothing can boost your morale like a gift, especially if you're in a hospital bed. That's why the camel people send gift cigarettes each week to hospitalized servicemen and veterans in this country and overseas. This week, camels are on their way to Veterans Hospitals, Rutland Heights, Massachusetts, and Lyons, New Jersey. 
U.S. Naval Hospital, Quantico, Virginia, and to all hospitals operated by the Far East Command of the U.S. Air Force. Now until next week, enjoy camels. I always do. Men, has your pipe got your tongue? Well, switch to Prince Albert, the national joy smoke. P.A.'s choice tobacco is specially treated to ensure against tongue bite. Yes, and it's crimp cut, too, for smooth, burning, and cool smoking. Get Prince Albert, rich, flavorful, and with a delightful natural fragrance. It's America's largest-selling smoking tobacco. Listen next week for another exciting transcribed adventure of Richard Diamond starring Dick Powell. This is your FBI, the official broadcast from the files of the FBI, follows immediately. Stay tuned. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the American Broadcasting Company. There's a full serving of laughs on the menu at Duffy's Tavern tonight with Archie the Manager, played by Ed Gardner. Archie's colleagues in comedy are Miss Duffy, Clifton Finnegan, and Eddie the Waiter. This Sunday, the big show comes your way once again on NBC. And just listen to a few of the stars who'll be with you. Fred Allen... Jack Carson, Mindy Carson, Ed Archie Gardner, Ed Wynn, and many, many more. And, of course, your MC will be Tallulah Bankhead. Listen Sunday for The Big Show. Ladies and gentlemen, that phone bell means exciting adventure. Hello? Hello. The handsome young man answering Hello? the phone is Archie Goodwin. The mountain of a man engrossed in deep thought in the oversized armchair is Nero Wolfe. Hey, boss. Oh, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf. There's a guy on the phone wants us to take a case. Seems that someone was mad at a guy who was mad, and now this guy on the phone is mad, wants us to find out who did the killing. What do you say, Mr. Wolf? We need the money. <laughs> Hello? Yes, Mr. Wolf says he'll be happy to take the case. Just present yourself and a check for $2,000 at 601 West 35th Street at 11 o'clock. Mr. Wolf can't wait till you get here. He's dying to go to work. Goodbye. Uh, greatest detective in the world. The only trouble is... He is. Yes, listeners, Archie is so right. He is the greatest detective in the world. And the fattest and the least energetic. He's Nero Wolf, created by Rex Stout, and brought to you over this NBC network in a new series of adventures by Mr. Sidney Greenstreet. Tonight, it's The Case of the Beautiful Archer. Well, that's a good title. And it was a good case, too. It began in the consulting room of Dr. Raynard Townley of the Townley Sanitarium, uh, skipping a jump north of Nyack, New York, when a very lovely young lovely glared across the desk at the good doctor. Shall we pretend you don't know who I am, Dr. Townley? How could we possibly do that, my dear Diana Lawrence? Twenty-three years old, daughter of one of our better-known sculptors, Michael Lawrence. You were born in Johannesburg, educated in London and Paris, and live at present a hundred yards from here in your father's cottage on Berry Hill Lane. How's that? It's intended to be staggering, isn't it? You take no cream or sugar in your coffee, were winner of the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947, and have an exceedingly high temper. Let's stop the nonsense. You have an inpatient here named Willard Garth. Well, Willard Garth happens to be my fiancé. Yes, he has mentioned the fact during his analysis. And, um, well, has he by any chance mentioned his reasons for suddenly refusing to see me during the past five weeks? He didn't have to, Miss Lawrence. Well, what do you mean? I mean that I recommended he give you up as a bad job. What? Yeah, well, I suppose you had some purpose in saying what you did. Of course. I'm the boy's doctor. Uh, you think you're in love with Willard Garth, I know. But actually, you're infatuated with the Garth millions. You take a lot on yourself, don't you, Doctor? I consider it important to relieve Willard of all painful external pressure. You've done well for Willard, Dr. Townley. Relieving him of me? I think so. Now, let's see you relieve yourself of me. You, uh, 
purchased the gun for this occasion, Miss Lawrence? Yes. And what exactly do you hope to accomplish with it? A quick and complete reversal of your decision about me. I'm not as easy to handle as Willard is, you see. And if you intend to ruin my life, then I intend to end yours, here and now. The phone is ringing. Let it ring. Hmm? Just as you say. It's the house phone, Miss Lawrence. It may be Willard, you know. Oh, Willard? Yes, he uh, usually phones me from his room at about this time every day. Oh. Well, all, all right. Answer it, but be careful what you say. You're in command, it seems. Hello? Oh, why, hello. I thought it would be you, Willard. Look, my boy, Diana Lawrence is here. I've had a talk with her, and I've reconsidered my opinion. Yes, yes, I'm quite serious. If you're at all sensible, you see her regularly and plan on a marriage as soon as you're discharged. Yes. Oh, you do? Very well, I'll see if she'll talk to you. Uh, Miss Lawrence. Yes? Uh, do you want to speak with him? Uh, give me the phone. Of course. Here you are, and I'll no, take this what gun. You... There we are. Now, stand away, Miss Lawrence. But, 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 but Willard, Willard's on the phone. Willard is not on the phone. No one was on the phone. The ring came from the push-button bell under my desk here. Oh. Sometimes I find it convenient to interrupt my consultations with a phone call. Oh, you... You smug, deceitful, self-sufficient... Murder is a vexatious business. You'll be grateful to me one day. All right. Give me my gun and let me go. The gun, I'm afraid, stays with me. Here in this Majolica cabinet. I'd scarcely feel justified in trusting you with it. And now... With your permission, or without it, the interview is ended. Later that day, the phone in the Lawrence house on Barry Hill Lane began to jingle. And this time, it was no phony. Hello? Diana? Yes? Willard, darling. Diana, darling, it's Willard. Imagine... Has the doctor let you use the telephone just as if you were a great big adult? Oh, I've got to see you, sweetheart, and, and I didn't call you to argue. Love, beauty, understanding, that's what matters, isn't it? Isn't it? Do I hear the overtones of a change of heart? Oh, Diana, what's happened wasn't my fault. He poisoned me against you. Then why don't you walk out of that amateur nut house and stand up like a man? I probably shall, Diana. Now, please listen to me. He's letting me have the limousine tonight from 8 until 12. I want us to go for a ride and, and talk and talk and talk until everything is clear. Clear as a bell, my baby. Don't tell me he's trusting you to drive. Oh, no. No, one of the handyman here will show for us. Oh, say you'll come, Diana. Will you? Say it. Say yes. Say you will. Well, yes, Willard. I'll be glad to. Oh, eight o'clock, then? Eight. Oh, bless you. Bless you, my angel. <laughs> Oh, oh! so that's it. You want my father's money. That's what you love, not me. Willard, the chauffeur will hear you. It's the way Townley says it is. He's right. He's right. Oh, why did I let you talk me into this? What a fool I was to have come at all. You're sick inside, Willard. So utterly, hopelessly sick. Oh. Oh, so now I'm... I'm hopelessly sick. Yes. Yes, you are. Oh, you, you're trying to confuse me. Take advantage of me. Wind me around your finger. Just because I love you too much. That's it. That's my illness. Of course, I see it now. You. You're the thing I must get rid of. You with your beautiful, beautiful face and your twisted values. You're at the bottom of all my agony. Willard! Willard! Wait, wait. I'm saving myself. I'm saving myself. Once you're dead, the sickness is ended. I'll be safe. I'll be safe. Wait. Wait. Dr. Townley? Yes. Come in. Mr. Wolf's been expecting you. Come in, Dr. Townley. Come in. Have a chair. Thank you, Mr. Wolf. 
I'm so happy you've agreed to take this case. Have a glass of beer. Oh, no, no. Uh, never at this time of the morning, thank you. Well, Doctor, the newspapers check with what you told me. The girl and young Garth went out for a ride in your limousine last night. The car was driven by one of your handymen. But that's right. Haynes, his name is. And they never came back. Young Garth was found dead in the car with two bullets in him. The girl was gone and also Haynes, the handyman chauffeur. Huh? Correct, sir. Have you any idea where he could be? No, sir. And the young lady, tell me about her. She's Diana Lawrence, daughter of Michael Lawrence. The sculptor? The sculptor. She lives with him in a small cottage near my sanatorium on Berry Hill Lane. An extremely aggressive and self-centered female with more than a slight flair for violence. Your description might easily lead me to suspect her of this murder, sir. Well, I'm aware of that. And I don't think you'd be far off the mark. As I told you on the phone, she tried to murder me yesterday morning. Hmm. The police have made no headway in locating her? No. The homicide division has contacted her father, but uh, he's remained quite noncommittal. He simply says that uh, he's sure she's incapable of killing a fly and that he hasn't laid eyes on her since 8 o'clock last night. Highly suspicious behavior. She was unquestionably in the car with young Garth when he was murdered. Hmm. She wasn't alone in the car with him. You were uh, referring to Haynes? Yes, but he can't be found either, remember? It appears that he failed to list his address on his job application. But somehow, Mr. Wolf, I'm quite sure he'll show up this afternoon. Somehow, Dr. Townley, if I were you, I wouldn't be quite so sure. We must begin by facing the initial problem of locating our suspects. Archie. Yes, sir. Get out the car and drive up to the house on Berry Hill Lane. And then? There you will ask Mr. Michael Lawrence to be sensible enough to cooperate with us in finding his daughter. And if the answer is no? I recommend, Archie, that you flatly refuse to take it. Mr. Lawrence was no simple baby to handle. He was in a studio when I walked in, chiseling on a statue of a boy and a girl, both wearing less clothes than the law allows. And before I got a chance to state my name, he commenced giving me a free lecture on the marble work of art. She's good. Really good. She's practically superb. The Ariadne. The what, Ariadne? The girl in the statue. Oh. That's Ariadne. Tragic nymph of Greek mythology. Don't tell me you're not familiar with Apollo and Ariadne. All right, I won't. The Apollo, on the other hand, is unfinished. The face, you see, it, uh, <clears throat> it lacks something. The passion of yearning, Olympian desire. And yet, you know, the two figures have motion. Like your daughter? Eh? Your daughter, Diana, she's got motion also. As I hear it, she's been in motion ever since she murdered Willard Garth last night in the back end of a limousine. <laughs> so you're another flatfoot? Uh, not exactly. I'm paid in private by Nero Wolf. Nero Wolf? Yeah. You don't mean that a creditable man like Wolf thinks Diana killed young Gar? Well, he'd like to talk over the possibility with her. How laughable. Look at that face. Is there anything of the murderous in a face like that? In a face like what? Oh, I'm sorry. Diana posed for the Ariadne, you see. And the likeness is exact. Do you think a girl of this type, classic, sensitive, civilized, could descend to the clumsy, brute level of murder? Well, it's... It's a little hard to imagine. There. Even you agree with me. On the other hand... Shall we discuss the other hand over a cup of coffee? I'm quite exhausted. If you insist. I do. Sit down and inhale the atmosphere of culture at its source. There's a pot warming on the stove. Pot of what? Coffee or culture? <laughs> huh. Well, wait to see what he means. Oh. Should never ignore a phone call. Knows might be something important. Yes? It's Diana, Father. Oh, uh. Oh, yes, Diana. It's, it's all over the papers. Yes, I know. Well, I, I don't think they'll find me where I am. And I'm staying here until things quiet down a little. Where are you, honey? Uh, what did you say? I said, where are you? You said, honey. Daddy, you never call me honey. Uh, I know, it's because I'm excited. Where are you, sweetheart? Not a soul in the world. Where are you? Well, you know where Tyne Pike turns off to the left beyond Bartsville? Yes. Well, I'm... Call me later, Angel. But, Father, I... Oh. Oh, 
get that motorman's number. You will live, my friend, but not long if you don't control your curiosity. With that mallet you hit me, what was the big idea? Do you really have to ask that question? Why don't you try to trick my daughter into disclosing her whereabouts? The police are pretty interested in her whereabouts. Then let them find her. But you can't be surprised, my friend, if I choose to protect Diana's interests. So he's working on an Apollo and Ariadne, is he, Archie? Who cares about Apollo and Ariadne? The point is how he worked on my gourd. That, of course, is unfortunate, my boy, but... Did you get that piece? Mm Mm-hmm. Hello? Inspector Kramer. Hold it. For you. Here. Thanks. Yes? Wolf? Ah, how are you, Inspector? I hear you're in on the Garth killing. Not very deeply, I am afraid. We are still trying to locate the Lawrence girl. Well, you can forget about that. Yeah? Yes. We've already located her and released her on a habeas corpus. That sounds interesting. Her father had a lawyer on her heads before she was in here ten minutes. Too bad you couldn't have held on to her. Oh, I don't know. I'm not so sure we want her. Why not? Well, first of all, it's not likely she did it. No? No. Ballistic stated that the bullets that killed Willard Garth were not fired from point-blank range. And she was sitting beside him on the back seat. I see. Also, we found the murder weapon in the grass near where the limousine was parked. And she admitted it was hers. That sounds like a poor reason to release him. Well, the point is she wasn't in possession of the gun when the killing happened. At least so she says. No, who was? That doctor. What doctor? Townley. The guy who runs that sanitarium. According to her, he took the gun away from her for safekeeping at noon yesterday. There was a little more talk between them, something about fresh cigar ashes that were found in the dashboard ashtray of the limousine. After that, the boss hung up and exerted himself enough to put a call through to the Townley Sanatorium. I'm afraid the doctor is very busy just now. So am I, and my business happens to be highly important. Well, I'll say you call, Mr. And I'll ask him to contact you just as soon as he has a free moment. Do you happen to have a free moment, miss? Why, well, yes, sir. Could you spend it by telling me if that handyman, Mr. Haynes, is being located? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, he has. One of the staff just found out where he lives, Mr. Wolf. Well? He has a little cottage at 206 Dockside Road. That's out near Sheep's Head Bay. Thank you. Archie. I'm going someplace, I suppose. You are? You're going to Sheep's Head Bay. Hello there. Hmm? Looking for a guy I can't find. Oh? Yeah, his name is Haynes. Stopped at the cottage up there, but there's no one there. I saw you here on the wharf fishing, so I... What did you say his name is? Haynes. H-A-I-N-E-S. Oh, oh, Haynes. Yeah, Yeah, do you know him? Well, there's a fellow named Hines used to fish out here. No, 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 not Hines. Haynes. Couldn't be Huntingburg? No, it couldn't be. The name is Haynes. H-A-I-N... Haynes! Give me a hand here, eh? <laughs> well, what do you know? <laughs> Funny, huh? That guy seems to think my name is Haynes. Yeah, so do I. You do? Yes, I... <laughs> I got back to our house, soaked to the skin and minus Haynes, and just in time to see the boss in the exhausting process of walking across the room to answer the phone. Hello? This is Dr. Townley. You called me. So I did. About the murder? More specifically, about the statement from Diana Lawrence that you removed a firearm from her possession yesterday morning. That's quite correct. It's here in my Majolica cabinet. Is it? Of course it is. I suggest you check. Just a moment. Wolf. Yeah? I'd like to see you at once. The gun, I suppose, has vanished. But how did you know? Because it is at ballistics, Doctor. It turned out to be the gun that killed Willard Garth. I... I see. Do you? Yes. And I understand everything now. It's all so crystal clear. Just how crystal clear? I'm quite certain, Mr. Wolf, that I can put my finger on the killer. And I think it'd be well if you came here immediately. No, I'm afraid it's impossible, sir. Uh, there's an important operation scheduled, and I simply cannot leave. What do you suggest? Well, is it outside the realm of possibility that you come here? Is it, Mr. 
Wolf? Hello, Mr. Wolf. Mr. Wolf? When my boss has to leave the house, it's a major tragedy. Sometimes he rages, sometimes he curses the whole detective business, lock, stock, and barrel. And sometimes he keeps very quiet and grips the side of the car desperately and tries not to inhale any fresh air. This was one of the quiet times. Just go slowly, Archie, but get there as quickly as you can. Oh, you don't want a chauffeur, Mr. Wolf. What you need is a magician. Keep your eye on the road and don't strain yourself to make superfluous witticisms. Why don't you try relaxing a little? I hear there hasn't been a man-eating tiger sighted on the Sawmill River Parkway in the last 500 years. Your liberty is out of order. Don't try to make light of a deplorable situation. Here's the sanatorium. And there's Dr. Townley coming to meet us. It's terribly nice of you to have come, Mr. Wolf. I've heard about your aversion to traveling, and I appreciate your going to the trouble. Don't mention it. Oh, Archie, help me out with my other eye. Yeah. Uh, there we are. Mm. Now, calm down. You're all in one piece. I think you'll find the trip highly profitable, Mr. Wolf. You'll consider it time very well. Hey. Hey, what's the matter? What is it? What happened? He's been shot. Hardly likely there wasn't a sound. This kind of shot doesn't make a sound, boss. What do you mean? Better take a look for yourself. There's an arrow in his back, and he's dead. We remembered that Dr. Townley had said Diana Lawrence had won the Women's National Archery Tournament for 1947. The Lawrence house was visible through the trees a hundred yards away. So we started for it and the sculptor's studio. There's no one around. So this is his latest effort to follow an Ariadne. Yeah. Huh? Done a little work on it since I was here. The Apollo's face is more finished and... Hey, boss. Yes? You know, somehow or other, Apollo looks a little familiar. I wouldn't be surprised, Archie. I think if you examine it closely... Ah, our host. You remember me, don't you? I met you once at a dinner party at your house, the time they opened the new museum on 67th Street. Of course, of course, Mr. Lawrence. And to what do I owe the honor? It's not much of an honor. Dr. Townley has been murdered. No. I am afraid Mr. Goodwin is being accurate. He's been murdered with a bow and arrow. And what does that mean to you, Mr. Lawrence? I'm sorry. I've been a fool. An awful fool. You can't blame yourself too much. If you'd cooperated with the police instead of looking out for your daughter's interest, the man would still be alive. But I assure you that... Where's the girl? She should be here now. She phoned me a while ago and said she was coming by for passage money to Rio. You were looking for me? Boss, Diana. Put the gun down, Angel. And tie a rope around my neck? Might I inquire if your plan is to kill us all, Miss Lawrence? Oh, what would yours be if the world was after you for something you didn't do? Wouldn't you be willing to risk persuading a jury of that? Thanks, no. I'll skip that chance. Father, Father, get me the money. Diana, sweetheart, don't make me a part of your murders. That's asking too much of love. Do, don't you know I'm not guilty? No, no, Diana, I don't. Leave that gun away, Diana. Haynes. Looks like I walked in on the nose. That's him, boss, the guy who soused me. Take a little of your own advice. Relax, Archie. What do you want here, Mr. Haynes? I want to give up and try to straighten out this little deal. Mr. Lawrence. Yes? Here's your money back. You got a right to call me a Welcher. I promised I wouldn't give evidence against the girl, and you paid my price. But enough is enough, and right here and now I'm unloading. Just what does this mean? It means I saw her do it. <gasps> oh, you, you stupid, lying, rotten! Oh, oh yeah! It's, 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 grab her, Archie! Grab her! Get the pair of them out of here! <laughs> What can I say to myself now? What can I do? I'm sorry, Mr. Lawrence, but it's not necessary to eat your heart out. Many fathers before you have done their best and failed. But I had a special duty toward Diana. Special duty? Yes. I... Well, you see, you find it out sooner or later, so I'd best tell you now. I'm not a real father. I adopted her nine years ago when she was 14. I see. And I should never have done it. 
I realize now that I wasn't equal to the task. Well, 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 all's not lost yet. They may not convict her, you know. Eh? I said they may not convict her. But how could they fail to convict her? She killed Garth, didn't she? Did she? She shot him. But the gun was in Townley's possession. She could easily have stolen that. She could have broken into his office later. It wasn't locked. What wasn't locked? The Majolica cabinet. I mean... I believe you mean what you said, Lawrence. The Majolica cabinet. For the life of me, I can't see how you could know whether it was locked or not, unless you had the experience of opening it. Could it be that you went looking for the gun yourself after Townley said he had confiscated it? That you killed Townley with a bow and arrow which you handle as well as your daughter because he was just on the point of telling me that you knew where the gun was and that you were the likeliest murder suspect? You must be mad. Oh, sir, not I. <laughs> but you are mad and more than a little. You hated Will Edgar. It was you who were making the marriage impossible. You loathed him, and in the end, you kill him. How could I have killed him? I'll tell you a little secret, Mr. Lawrence. The police found cigar ash in the dashboard tray of the death car. Chemical analysis showed that the ash was from an El Adoro cigar. What have you got in your left hand, sir? In my... Uh, an El Adoro cigar. And in my right hand, a derringer. Powerful and admirable little weapon, Lawrence. I suggest you show proper respect for it by dropping all this here and now. You don't wish to hear me say the rest, that you were horribly in love with Diana, your own adopted daughter, in love and hopelessly, eternally frustrated? You begrudge me the triumph of accusing you of having bribed Haynes to let you take his place at the driver's seat of the limousine? And further bribed and threatened him into putting on his show of many pranks and false confessions to confuse us all beyond measure? You said I love Diana. Would I do all this to her if I did? Oh, but of course, such love as yours is really hate. You were content to see her dead rather than relinquish her. Like all miserly, small-hearted men, you would rather kill the thing you love than muster the generosity necessary to seeing it attain happiness. That's enough out of you. I should think it was much too much. It is. Archie, my boy, I'm grateful to you, both for coming back into the house when you did and for being such a good shot. Hope you remember that next time you feel like insulting me. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me, what's with that cigar ash routine? Who told you the ashes in the limousine were from an Eladoro, boss? I never heard anything about that. <laughs> As a matter of fact, neither did I. No one could possibly have determined the brand by any chemical means in existence. I knew that, you see, and I took the long chance that Lawrence didn't. Uh huh. But I still don't get the mainspring of the deal. How did you know he was in love with Diana? That, uh, that was genius, I have to admit it. You see, it all hinged on the statue of Apollo and Ariadne. According to the Greek myth, Apollo fell deeply in love with the nymph, but because they were of different worlds, he was condemned to pursue her always and never to catch her. Well, what's that got to do with the price of eggs? Isn't it perfectly obvious? Didn't he tell you that Diana had posed for the Ariadne? Yeah, but I still don't... And you yourself remarked on the fact that the finished Apollo looked somehow familiar, didn't you, Archie? Yeah. Yeah, I did, boss. Don't you know why that was? You mean that... I mean that Michael Lawrence unconsciously revealed the true state of his heart. He didn't intend to, I suppose. But precisely and accurately, he chiseled the features of the tortured god in his very own image. Oh. And speaking of torture... Yeah, Will we be home in time for dinner? Oh, boss, you can't be that hungry. Oh, yeah, I am. Good heavens, Archie. Do you realize that I haven't eaten since lunch? You have been listening to The New Adventures of Nero Wolf, starring Sidney Greenstreet. <laughs> Tonight's transcribed story by Peter Berry was based on the characters created by Rex Stout. 
This is an Edwin Fadiman program produced and directed by J. Donald Wilson. In the cast were Larry Dobkin as Archie Goodwin and Gigi Pearson, Ted Von Els, Bill Johnstone, Peter Leeds, and Jay Novello. Next week at this same time, Nero Wolf and Archie will bring you The Case of the Brave Rabbit. Don Stanley speaking. There's fun and laughs later tonight when Ed Archie Gardner stars as Archie the Manager in Duffy's Tavern. As usual, Duffy won't be there, but Archie will be there, armed with his own whimsical version of the English language. Another Friday favorite you'll hear later is The Delightful Life of Riley, starring William Bendix as Chester A. Riley. Do you know what's in store for you for the next half an hour, ladies and gentlemen? Oh, you'll never guess. (laughs) Up the pole! Yes, it's the first in a new series of adventures with Claude Dampier, John Pertwee, Betty Paul, Roger Snowden, the five Smith brothers, Stanley Black and the orchestra, and of course that crazy couple, Jimmy Jewell and Ben Warren. Since we last heard from our two heroes, they've moved into an apartment over a disused fire station. And our story begins there, one brisk morning in early autumn. Jimmy is cleaning his teeth. All right, all right, all right. Stop gargling. That'll be quiet enough of that noise, James. Oh, will it? Of course it will. That's no way... <laughs> That is no way to say hello to the ladies and gentlemen. And that? Of course not. Tell them I. If you're going to sing at all, if you're going to sing at all, you should sing a little song like this. Tell them I. Oh, welcome to you all, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Sweet ladies and gentlemen. Sweet ladies and gentlemen. Oh, welcome to you all. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's better out than in, isn't it? <laughs> well, I wish you'd come out of the bathroom, James. You know, you've been in there for hours. Am I? Yes, and tell me, why are you getting all dressed up this morning? Well, I don't like to tell you. Oh, go on. <laughs> no, I'm shy. Go on. Tell Benny what it... I know, I know. No, I shan't tell you, I shan't tell you. Oh, yes, you will, and oh, I... No more, no more. I've guessed it. It's something to do with Betty. No, oh, you're so clever, Ben. Go to the top of the class. She's calling round to see me this morning. You mean to say you've asked a pretty young girl like Betty round to this dirty old fire station? Yes, it's her birthday on Saturday. And I want to find out what she liked for the present, so there. Well, mm. listen, why don't you ask her yourself? I can't, Ben. Why not? You ask her. Oh, no, no. Every time I see Betty, I go all to pieces. Oh, you don't. Mm, I wish I was more the kind of man she admires. Really? I wish I were a film star. Oh, it's not I'm all... I'm so Robert Taylor. Oh, that's not all been wonderful being a film star, Oh, Jimmy. I'd love to be Robert Taylor. Don't you realise that one day you're kissing Betty Grable, Lana Turner, Dorothy Moore, the next day you're just a has-been. Mm, but, brother, just look where you has been. <laughs> Hello. Someone at the door. Oh, it'll be Betty. It'll be Betty. Don't worry. Don't. I'm gonna faint. I'm oh, gonna faint. I'm no, gonna no. faint. No, you're not. Yeah, I can't stand it. I'm gonna catch me. Catch no, me. no. Oh, go on, catch me. Oh no. I want to be calm. Oh, stop <laughs> it. Listen, I wish you'd stop larking about, Jimmy. Well, out the way. Go, go and open the door, Ben. Oh, I, I will. I will. Hello, Ben. Oh, good. Good morning, Betty. Hello, Jimmy. <laughs> Hello, Betty. Won't you? Come. <laughs> Come in. But I am in. Yes, you are in, aren't you, in? <laughs> Take a seat, Betty, darling. I uh, I think Jimmy wants to ask you something. Really, Jimmy? Yes, you see, Betty. Saturday's your, your birthday. And yes. At such a time, I feel that the time has come yes. for it to be the right time for the time. What is the time, Ben? <laughs> Ten o'clock. Good gracious, no bed's made. <laughs> well, I feel I'd like... That is, if you don't mind. Oh, you tell her, Ben. Oh, don't be silly. You tell her. Well, I just want to tell you I'd like to give you a little present. Oh. That's all, a little present. Oh, oh Jimmy Kim. Oh, she called me Jimmy Kim. <laughs> Catch me, Ben. Oh, oh, stop knocking about. I don't want Betty to know I'm living with an idiot. Why not? She knows I'm living with oh, one. shut up. <laughs> oh, 
Oh, it's most awfully sweet of you, Jimmy, to want to give me a present, but but my cousin, Roderick Forge Bellows, has brought me nearly everything I need. Roderick Forge Bellows? Mm. What, that windbag? Oh, you mustn't say that, Jimmy. He thinks a lot of me and is the most generous man I know. Yes, but surely there's something Jimmy could get for you, Betty. Well, the... That's one little thing, but it, oh, it's, it's much too expensive for Jimmy to name buy. Name it, he could... name it. Just name it, that's all, you can have it. Oh. I'll show Roderick Forge Bellows he's not the only man who knows how to treat a girl. <sighs> Very well, then. I'd like the ring I've seen in the jewelers down the road. It shall be yours. Oh, Jimmy, I could kiss you for being so sweet. Help yourself. Mm. <laughs> mm. Mm. Oh. oh, Jimmy. <sighs> Where did you learn to kiss like that? Siphoning petrol. Well, I must be on my way now. Oh, thank you so much for promising to get me the ring, Jimmy. Think nothing, think nothing of it, think nothing of it. But how shall I know which ring it is? Oh, you can't miss it. Can't it's I? in the middle window in a little velvet case, Mark. Really? 50 pounds. Oh. So long, Ben. Cheerio. Goodbye, Jimmy, you sweet, sweet boy. Oh, she called me a sweet, sweet boy. Oh, I'm going to get a ring, and it's in the middle window, and it's marked 50 pounds. It's marked 50 pounds. <laughs> ben! What? She said the ring was m- 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 marked 50 pounds. Well, that's what I thought she said. But I haven't got 50 pounds. I'm going to faint. Do you want to be caught? Yes. I think I've been caught already. <laughs> Well, if you don't get the ring for Betty, her cousin Roderick will. No, I've just got to get that 50 pounds, even if it means selling everything I possess. Jimmy, that would still leave you 48 pounds, 10 shillings short. <laughs> Hello, maybe that's Betty back. Perhaps she left something behind. Well, open the door quickly, Ben. She might have called to say she was only joking about the ring. OK. What's your mate? Oh, Bertie! Bertie! Well, 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 Burpee. Fancy seeing you again. Yes. Where have you been doing all these months? Working? No, no, no. Only mugs work. No, I've been doing the old currency lock. You know, all the rhino. Oh, you've been in the bun factory? No, not that sort of currents. I mean, the old do re me. Well, this sounds very interesting, Mr. Burp. Did you uh, you do well? Oh, yes, I'll say I did. You did? First of all, I took me 35 pounds in English money over to France. Yes. And they gave me 40,000 French francs. Go on, then. Go on, yes. Then I took me francs over to Holland... And they gave me 10,000 Dutch guilders. That's good. Yes, and I took the guilders to Russia. Did you? They gave me 50,000 rubles. Did they? Then I had away all my rubles. You know what they gave me when I got back to England? No, what? Six months. <laughs> <laughs> Poor old Burpee. Oh, well, never mind, mates. I've got a smashing job now, you know. A Have smashing you? job now? Oh, I've got a smashing job. What, what is it? it? I'm an agent. An agent? Yes, an agent. What, a ten percenter? No, that's it. I'm, no, no, no. I'm an agent for the Elk Yourself football pool. So oh, I'm, no. I'm just calling around the houses, pick up some new clients. Oh. Now, wait a minute. How about, how about you two boys having a bash? Oh, no, Burpee. I'm never lucky with football pools. Oh, yeah, but listen, mates. Only last week, with one of my fear nothing forecasts, a bloke won 50,000 nicker. 50,000 pounds? Yes. Here. Yeah. Just think what I could buy better with that, Ben. Well, all right, then. Could. It's all right, then. Sign this here paper, Mr. Jewell. Yes. And I'll fill in your coupon for you. There. Right. right oh, pass me the paper, Burpee. Pass me a pen. Here you are, then. Here you are, James. There you are. are. Jimmy. That's it. Jewel. That's fine. That's not, it, not Burpee. Jimmy, now, Jewel. go on. Give me the £50,000. Well, hold on, mate. Hold on. You've got to send the coupon in first. Have you? Now, what do you, what do you want as your bank list? Well, I'll take Barclays. Yeah, and I'll take the Midland. And I'll be in Scotland before you. No, 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 no. Now, look, when you're doing... Listen, now, when you're doing football pools, yes. you've got to have bankers in permutations and combinations. Well, fancy bankers playing football p- in the combination. No, no. I'll bet they don't half feel the overdraft. Oh, come on, Pete, <laughs> listen. Now, look, we'll take teams one, three, and seven as your bankers. One, one three, and seven, That's eh? it. Now, yes. that's one across. Yeah, one across. Two down. Two down. Uh, six up, you jump on minus four and a half foot of call your ball. Yes. yes. Take an Aussie Tarsie. Yes. Drop us an Arby and then chain that up with a chine screw. Yes. Chine screw, yes. Multiply that by 4,344. That means you want me exactly ten pounds. Your money's back if you're not satisfied, eh? Of course, but if it that's a make... lot of money to pay for a page of penny results. Yeah. Well, well you, you get your money back if you're not satisfied, don't Ooh. you? I've also given you a line of drawers. Oh, well, we didn't ask for any drawers. OK, I'll take your drawers off. Oh, yeah, I'll source it then. <laughs> and look, listen, now, look, don't laugh about because there's not much time. Now, look, ten pounds... Wins the fortune. Yes. Money back if not satisfied. Eh? Come on, give him the money, Barney. Here you are, Mr. Burp. Okay, come on. And listen, if you boys win, 
I'll bring your cheque along in person Monday. If we win? But you said we were bound to win. Well, you see, it's right, so you should, but there's many a slip twixt the cup final and the lip, you know. Well, then give us back our ten pounds. Give it your back? Yes. Yes, you said we could have our money back. If not satisfied. Well, that's right. Why? But I am satisfied. Very satisfied indeed. <laughs> so long, mate. Goodbye. Hello. 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 How do you do, everyone? This is Mr. and Mrs. Smith's Five Little Boys who are saying to you... <laughs> Everybody, darling, and everybody calls you darling too. You, you don't know what you're saying, it's just a game you're playing. But you'll find someone else can play the game as well as you. If you call everybody darling, then love won't come and knocking at your door. And as the years go by, you sit and wonder why Nobody calls you darling anymore You called me baby darling years ago Years ago, years ago, years ago You said that I was very nice to know Nice to know, nice to know I learned more than what love was, I thought was new but all my love has only taught me how to love you. You said that you would love me in return. In return, in return, in return. Don't tell me you were fooling after all. But if you turn away, you'll be sorry someday. You left behind a broken door. You call everybody down. Around six o'clock the following Saturday afternoon, we find Jimmy and Ben, with their heads almost buried in their wireless set, impatiently waiting for the football results. <gasps> oh, I'm so excited. Are you really? Yes. Just suppose we win £50,000, Ben. Oh, I can't Be quiet, be quiet, or we'll miss the results. <laughs> now, here it. are the results of matches played this afternoon. Oh. Oh, uh, just a moment. I've mislaid the slip of paper. Oh, well, hurry up, you twerp. <laughs> Find it. I don't know what these announcers are coming to. I don't really. Ah, now we're all set. Good. That's right. Yes. Um, Arsenal, one. One. Chelsea, two. That's right, yes. Right, right. Blackburn, three. Millwall, three. Oh, A draw. that's right, right, yes, right. right. Yes. Notts, Forest, one. Birmingham, four. That's right, right that's right. right, right. We got right, that yes. right, yes. Brentford, Swip. Queen's Park, Rangers, Nip. <laughs> What? What did he say? Brentford Swip, Queen's Park Rangers, Nip. What the dickens is he talking about? Why, I'm so sorry, I had the paper upside down. Oh, my oh. Brentford Six, Queen's Park Rangers, Nine. Right, we got it right, 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 right. right. Portsmouth Five. Yes. Bristol, uh, Bristol. Well, what Five. happened to Bristol? Come, Come on. on. I, uh, I can't quite see if this is a three. Or an eight. Well, put your blinking glasses on! <laughs> Bristol, eight. Right, only Ooh, one more to go. More to go. One yes, more to one go. Oh, the suspense is killing me. It's oh, killing me. It's it'll be all right now. Come on. Now, Rob Ned. Uh, Rob Ned. 
You'd probably like to know the result of the match between Manchester City and Clapham United. Of course we would, you twerk. Get on with it. Come on, come on. Unfortunately, owing to the late arrival of the Manchester coach... Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. I'm afraid the match is still in progress. Well, well, so what? And we shall not have the result for some 15 minutes yet. However, at half-time, the score was Manchester City, 18. <laughs> Clapham United... Two. Oh, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it, that's it. That's it, that's it. Oh, we gave Manchester City the winner with a half-time score of 18-2. They can't possibly lose. Oh, we're rich at last, we're rich at last. Hooray, 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 hooray. Hooray. Come on, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll call for Betsy, take her out, pick up the ring at the jewelers before they close. Okay, okay. Come on, come on, come on. On our way, we'll buy a new car, yes. some clothes. Yes, A case of champagne. Yes, we'll Boys! What's wrong? No, boys, don't rush me so. Oh, come on, come on. Come on, Betty, come on. Breath, well, I'm sorry, Betty, but we must get to the jewellers before it closes. Yes, then we can pick the ring, I promise you, for your birthday. Oh, that is nice of you, Jimmy. I never really thought you'd get it for me. <laughs> Neither did he. <laughs> ah, here we are. Here's the jowlers. In we go. Here's the jowlers. <laughs> <laughs> Any, anyone at home there at the jowlers? That's down behind the counter up there. Say, is that a man or a grandfather's clock with a hat on? Hello, boys. Bloody hot plate! <laughs> well, he's the jowler, eh? Yes, <laughs> You're the last person we expected to see, Hotty. <laughs> oh, yes, oh, my. <laughs> my word, you've no idea how I've missed you all. Have you? Oh, I've missed all the dear old faces I used to shake hands with. <laughs> oh. Say, Betty, you remember old Horace Hotplate the mayor, don't you? Oh, no one could ever forget Mr. Hotplate. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's the pity of it. Yes. By the way, Hotty, how's the Lady Mayoress? Yes, that's fine. <laughs> no, I said, how is the Lady Mayoress? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I said, what you said? <laughs> yes, that was him speaking. Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, well, of course, the Lady Mary's has got much fatter since I saw you last. You oh, know? you mean she's got bigger in the interim? Oh, yes. And in the outter rim, too. Aye, aye, aye. aye. He started. He's still asking to be done, this geezer. Well, listen, we've called in to buy a ring for Betty's birthday, Mr. Hotplate. Yes. So maybe you'd show us a few. Oh, certainly. The ring I want in the middle window. Fifty pounds. Oh, ho, ho, I wouldn't insult you with a cheap ring like that, Hotty. Hotty. We want some expensive ones, please. Show us the expensive ones. Oh, oh well. What had you in mind? Never mind that. Just show us the rings, will you? <laughs> I'm sorry. No, I meant what about... What price did you wish to pay? Now, here's a lovely ring for a lady. Look at that. A hundred pounds. Oh, it's beautiful. A hundred pounds? I said an expensive ring, Hotty. Oh, oh yeah. well, here's one for five hundred pounds. Oh, no, I can't possibly tut, let tut, you... Tut, 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 and a couple of tuts. <laughs> When Jimmy Jewell says he's going to buy a ring, Jimmy Jewell buys a ring. But my dear Jimmy Jewell, oh, listen, the whole thing... certainly is... is a beautiful diamond. Yes, isn't it? I got that diamond direct from Amster. Amster? Yes. You mean Amsterdam? The, oh, Mr. Warris, your language, please. Oh, shut up. Oh, that's a shocking No, No, I bought this ring from the Raja of Staines. Well, who is the Raja of Staines? Oh, of course he is. I know he is, but I said, who is the Roger of Staines? Oh, you'll never guess what. <laughs> oh, go oh, on, tell oh, us. Tell us. Oh, it, it's me. Uh, yes, yes. We shall definitely have to do you. <laughs> what a beautiful stone. Now, wait a minute, Hotty. Are you sure that's a genuine diamond? Of course it's genuine. Good. Good gracious, I'll show you. But I'll just draw it across the shop window. Look. <laughs> Oh, oh dear, that I lose more windows that way than you could ever imagine. All right, Hottie, all right, we'll take it, we'll take it. Oh, what? Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Kins, you are the world's most darling, gorgeous, adorable, generous man. <laughs> That's me right enough. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what price Roderick Forge bellows now? Good gracious, is he up for sale? Oh, shut up. What? I'll be quiet, Hottie. 
And find a nice case to put the ring in, will you? Very well, Mr. Jewel. And whilst I'm here, I may as well take one of those diamond tie pins and, uh... Yes, Well, I'll just have a gold cigarette case for myself as well. Certainly, Mr. Jewel. Mm. Now, I'll just slip into the office and make out your bill, what? Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm afraid it'll be rather a big one, you know? Oh, that's all right, Hottie. Yeah. <laughs> and a box of cigars for yourself, oh, will you? Just thank you, Mr. Cigar, Jewel. Yeah. Um... <laughs> Whilst I'm in the office, perhaps you'd like to listen to the wireless. Yes, please, Mr. Hopley. Yeah, so there you are, then. See you in a moment. <laughs> Jimmy Kinzer, thanks again for the ring, darling. Oh, that's all right, it's Betty. I, I really do oh, like All right, it. shut <laughs> up, shut up. I want to listen to the wireless. Well, before the next part of the program, here's the final score of the Manchester versus Clapham United match, which has just come in. <laughs> Poor old Clapham. Uh, <laughs> they got a beating today, all right. The <laughs> score is Manchester 18. Good old Manchester. Clapham United 18. Good old... What? what? You heard? What? Uh, oh. Clapham United, who at half time were losing 2 18, made a sensational recovery and scored 16 goals to equalise in the second half. Oh, oh no. no! Yes! Ah, there you are, gentlemen. Now, here's your little bill exactly £2,000. Oh! <laughs> It's now Sunday evening and our saddened heroes are sitting in their flat, realising once again the folly of counting chickens before they're hatched. Tell me once again, man, how much are we in debt? Well, with Betty's ring, the car, the groceries and the two cases of champagne, I make it we owe exactly five thousand pounds, three shillings and sixpence. Oh, we haven't even got the three and sixpence. <laughs> what are we going to do? Oh, any moment now, Jimmy, the world will fall about our ears. Never mind, Ben. You've got just the ears to support it. Oh, anyway... <laughs> We won't run away like common thieves. No, we'll take a taxi like push thieves. Listen, <laughs> listen, Jimmy, I've just thought of something. Have you? If you'd have put a cross on your football coupon instead of a one, you'd have had an all-correct forecast, wouldn't you? Yes, just one teensy-weensy stroke makes all the difference between being a millionaire and going to jail. Well, listen, Jimmy, come across to the window. Okay. Now look out of this window. Yes. Yeah. Do you see anything interesting? No, she just pulled the blinds down. No, no, you idiots. <laughs> that big building on the corner... Do you know what that is? What? That's Pool House, you twerp. Is it? The officers have helped yourself pools. Get away. Listen. What it, about it? It's Sunday night. Is it? And the pools aren't checked till tomorrow. Well? Well, don't you see? If we can get inside Pool House and find your entry form, yes. we can alter the one to an X. And you've got it right. I've got it right? Yes. I'm smart, aren't I? You certainly are. Mm. All you've got to do is to go in there, alter that coupon, and you're a millionaire. Mm, you mean we win £50,000? Yes. And then I can pay for Betty's ring, can't I? Of course you can. And all our troubles will be over, won't they? Naturally. Mm. You'll do it then, won't you? No. Oh, yes, you will. <laughs> Come on, James, put your hat and coat on and follow me. All right, but I still don't like it. Oh, don't fuss, though, don't fuss. Here we are at Pool House. We'd better go around the back. What for? To see if anyone's left a window open, you fathead. Well, I don't care if anybody's left a window open. Oh, look, look. There's a window open on the second floor. Is there? Yes. Oh, Ben, you're so observant. Perhaps there's a pipe up there. So what? I don't feel like smoking. No, 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 no. A water pipe. Well, I don't feel like blowing bubbles either. Oh, it's too bad, you know. The pipe doesn't reach far enough. Now, if only we had something to reach that window. If only we had. What's that thing you're leaning against? Oh, it's only an old ladder. Only an old ladder? Give me the ladder, stupid. Oh, I wonder if you have left a ladder leaning against never the wall. Never mind, I... never mind. Bring it over here. Right. right. Now, come on, up you go. Well, don't rush me. You know I'm scared of heights. Go on, up you go. Look out, I'm going to fall. I'm falling. Catch me. You can't fall off now. Oh, yes, we can. Oh, steady. <laughs> Oh, you are an idiot. Someone will hear us. Here, 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 here. Here. 
Here. Here. Aye, aye, right, here. here. Now we're in trouble, then. Here comes a copper. Here. Oh, don't worry, don't worry. I'll handle it. Now, then, what's all this here? here? Good evening, Sergeant. <laughs> it's a nice evening for a stroll, Never isn't it? Never mind about that. Never mind. What's all this here? Well, what's all this here what, officer? Here. Oh, I saw you two men climbing up that there ladder. <laughs> oh, you policemen are so smart. <laughs> you don't miss a thing, do you? Oh, oh, say we don't. Now then, what's the idea of going up a ladder at this time of night, eh? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, your worship, huh? <laughs> we've uh, we've lost our little ginger pussy. Your lit, Your little ginger pussy? Yes, our little ginger pussy took a penneth up the ladder, he did, honest. You right. see, uh, there's uh, another cat on the second floor, <laughs> and our little ginger pussy is very keen on him, and tonight he uh, went up the ladder to find her. Yes. <laughs> well, I got a cat at home, and you wouldn't catch him crawling up no ladder, not for love nor money. Well, I don't think our ginger pussy was after money. <laughs> You, uh, you will let us go up and get our pussy cat, won't you, Judge, eh? Oh, rescuing cats is a man's work. So it is. Yes. Now, you stay and hold the ladder, and I'll go up. Well, if, you, if we're going to hold the ladder for the policeman, can I go home now, Harry? No, you cannot go home. Oh, go on, Harry. Let me go home, Harry, eh? Will you, Harry, eh? Let me go home now, Harry, eh? I want to go home now, Harry. Can I go home, Harry? Can I, Harry, eh? If Harry, eh? Jimmy doesn't turn it up, Jimmy and Harry will find themselves in clink. What with you and you are I I are will you are I will you are I will you are I will you are I are is mocking Jimmy now I Oh shut up Now now look here What Now listen now just you two stand here and hold this ladder while I go up Okay and don't you move away till I come down again It's awfully good of you to rescue our pussycat Mr policeman but we'd much rather Hold the ladder I said Oh, all right, right sir. Now hold it steady, mind. Hold it steady. I'll all still right. have your cat down. All right. Now what do we do, Ben? I'm shivering standing here holding this ladder. Well, listen, we've got to get up the ladder ourselves and try and get back again before the policeman. Come on. What a carry on, innit? Oh, here we are. Come on, here up we I go. am, honestly. Oh, stop muttering and chuffing oh, to yourself. Shut up yourself, then. Come on, then. through the window. Right. 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 I don't see the policeman anywhere. I don't want to. Shh, come on, quickly, down this corridor. We must find the post room. Well, don't rush me. You're all... Oh, you're a thing, you. Come on, now. Hang on while I strike a match. Yes. Ah, there we are now. We're okay. Here's the post room. Right. In we go. Yes. Shh. Quietly, 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 quietly. Shh. I say they are untidy in here. Envelopes and papers all over the place. Well, that copper don't come in. Shh, stop talking and look for your entry form. Sniff, then. Sniff? Yes. What for? Well, when you smell carbolic... Yes. That'll be my entry form. Oh, stop messing about. Ah, here it is, under this desk. That's the idea. Oh, now that me ankle... Oh, don't make so much noise and hurry up and alter your entry oh, form. me ankle... Come on, alter it. Yeah, then it's all correct now. Oh, thank goodness for that. Now, all we've got to do now is to go down the ladder and get back to the flat. I wish we'd never left it. I'm black and blue all over. I've sprayed me ankle and I've caught pneumonia. Oh, stop. I feel then. awful. I do, really. Never mind, James. Just think how you'll feel tomorrow when Burpee comes round with that nice fat check. Well, after we've, what we've done tonight, I think we deserve it. Well, come on back to the flat for a nice hot bath and a nice cup of tea. All right. Here we go. Hello? Speaking to the tailor? Yes, yes, I know Mr. Jewell promised you your money today. Yes, I know it's Monday afternoon, but don't worry. We'll be along with it soon, don't worry. Oh, I do wish Burpee had head over that check, Jimmy. The phone's been ringing all day with people asking for their money. I know. Oh, that'll be him. There we are. I'll go now. Come on. Come on, come on, then. That's the idea. Watch your mate. Hello, Mr. Burke. Thank goodness you've come. On behalf of the help yourself, Pools. I've much pleasure in telling you, Mr. Jewell. You sent an all correct forecast. Congratulations. Oh, wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Have you got the money with you? Yes, well, now, then, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. It's all right. <clears throat> now, according to Rule 68... Rule 68? Yes, the winner of the pool... Yes. ...get half of all the money we receive. Good. Yes, yes, yes. Good, well, yes. well, last week, the winner got £50,000. As I told you. Well, well, well what about it? Come on. Well, this morning, when I knew you had an all-correct result, Mr. Jewell... Yes? I was so happy... Because I was so looking forward to paying you out £50,000, like I told you. Well, go on, go on. Well, just a minute, mate. I'm out of breath. I ran all the way here to give you the good news as soon as possible. That is kind of you, Mr. Burke. That's all right, it's nothing. Well, you're soaking wet, too. Yes, all right. You know, you really shouldn't have come out in the pouring rain. That's all right, it's nothing. Really? Yes, I'd have been here before, but we've had a bit of trouble at the pool house. Trouble? Yes, it's nothing, don't worry. Last night, a man dressed up as a rosa. He broke in and stole the entry money out of the offices. A man dressed up as a rosa? A copper? Oh, how dreadful. Oh, don't worry, it's nothing, but of course, your half share of what's left is... Rather small. Well, how much is our half share of what's left? Well, I'll keep telling you. It's nothing. Cheerio, mate. Better luck next time. Oh, no!
You've been listening to the first in a new series of Up the Pole programs. With Jimmy Jewell and Ben Morris, Claude Dampier, John Pertwee, Betty Paul, Roger Snowden, the Five Smith Brothers, and the dance orchestra conducted by Stanley Black. The script was written by Ronnie Hanbury and produced by George Inns.